Talmud, Mastul and ACHAPTER are mission all may slaughter and their slaughtering is valid except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor lest they invalidate their slaughtering and if any of these slaughtered while others were standing over them their slaughtering is valid standing over them their slaughtering is valid Gemara the expression all may slaughter implies a right in the first instance yet the expression and their slaughtering is valid implies merely a sanction after the act are. Ah, the son of Rabbah said to Arashi, Is it correct that the expression all may implies a right in the first instance? If so, consider the mission all may change whether man or woman is that also a right in the first instance? Is it not written he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad or a bad for a good? No, for there the mission goes on to explain not that a person is allowed to change but only that if he has changed the change is effective and he receives 40 stripes then. Consider this mission all may bow another's valuation and their valuation may be bowed by others and they may bow another's worth and their worth may be bowed by others. Is that also a right in the first instance? Is it not written and if thou shalt forbear to bow it shall be no sin in the end it is further written better it is that thou shouldest not bow than that thou shouldest bow and not pay and it has been taught better than both is he who does not bow at all this is the opinion of our Mahir. Arjuna says better than both is he who bows and pays now even Arjuna refers only to the case of one who says behold let this be a sacrifice Talmud, Mastul and be but not to the case of one who says behold I take it upon me to bring a sacrifice does then the expression all may never imply right in the first instance what then of the statements all must observe the law of Sukkah and all must observe the law of Ksitsis do these not imply a duty in the first instance no I do not say so. Of the expression all must then take this case all lay the hand upon the head of the sacrifice whether man or woman does this not mean a duty in the first instance surely it is written and he shall lay his hand and it shall be accepted for him the truth of the matter is all may sometimes implies a right in the first instance and sometimes implies a sanction after the act this being so in the case of our Mishnah why should you say that it is a right in the first instance and Consequently raise a difficulty say rather it is a sanction after the act and there will be no difficulty he replied my difficulty is the expression and their slaughtering is valid since it states and their slaughtering is valid which is obviously a sanction after the act all may slaughter must be right in the first instance for otherwise why is it necessary to state the sanction after the act twice Rabbi Biola said this is the interpretation of the mission all may slaughter even an unclean person may slaughter a common beast an unclean person may slaughter a common beast surely this is obvious what is meant is this an unclean person may slaughter a common beast in connection with which the cleanness proper to hallowed things has been observed and the tana is of the opinion that common things kept in the cleanness proper to hallowed things are regarded as hallowed how does he the unclean person proceed in slaughtering he fetches a long knife and slaughters Therewith so as to avoid touching the flesh of the beast but in the case of consecrated beasts he should not slaughter lest he touch the flesh nevertheless if he did slaughter and declared I am certain that I did not touch the flesh his slaughtering is valid except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor who slaughtering even in the case of common beasts and even after the act is invalid lest they pause press or thrust now on this interpretation when the mission continues and if any of these slaughter to which persons does the statement refer if we were to say it refers to a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor in that case having just now dealt with these the should have said and if they slaughtered and if it refers to an unclean person slaughtering a common beast surely you have said that he may slaughter even in the first instance or again if it refers to an unclean person slaughtering a consecrated beast surely you have said that in his case it is sufficient if he Said I am certain that I did not touch the flesh it refers to the latter case when he is not present to be questioned but is the law concerning an unclean person slaughtering a consecrated beast derived from our mission here is it not derived from that other mission there which reads if any of those who are unfit for service in the temple slaughtered a consecrated beast the slaughtering is valid for slaughtering is valid even if performed by them that are not priests or by women or by slaves or by unclean persons and even if the beast was intended for a sacrifice of the highest grade provided that the unclean person does not touch the flesh here our mission is the source of the law the other mission there mentions the unclean person slaughtering consecrated animals only because it mentions all others who are unfit if you wish however I can say there is the source of the law seeing that it is in the tractate which deals with consecrated things our mission here Mentions the unclean person slaughtering consecrated beast only because it mentions the unclean person slaughtering common beast. This unclean person of whom we speak, how did he become unclean? If we were to say that he became unclean by touching a corpse, there is this difficulty. The divine law says one slain with the sword Talmud, Mastul and A, signifying that the sword has the same degree of uncleanness as the slain person, the slaughterer, therefore being a primary source of uncleanness, would defile the knife, and the knife in turn would defile the flesh. It must be that he became unclean through contact with a dead reptile. If you wish, however, I can even say that he became unclean by touching a corpse, but he prepared a reed and slaughtered therewith, for it has been taught one may slaughter with any instrument with a flint, with glass, or with a reed They said this is the interpretation of the mission. All may slaughter even a kuti, and this applies only where an Israelite is standing over him but if an Israelite is merely going in and out he may not slaughter if however he did slaughter one cuts off an olive's bulk of the flesh and gives it to him if he ate it others may also eat of his slaughtering if he did not eat it others may not eat of his slaughtering except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor who slaughtering even after the act is invalid lest they pause press or thrust now on this interpretation when the mission continues and if any of these slaughter to which persons does the statement refer if we were to say it refers to a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor in that case having just now dealt with these the tana should have said and if they slaughtered and if it refers to a kuti and surely you have said that if an Israelite is standing over him he may slaughter in the first instance this is a difficulty said Rabba but is it correct to state that if an Israelite is going in and out the kuti and has not the right to Slaughter in the first instance have we not learned if one left a heathen in one's wine shop and an Israelite was going in and out of the shop the wine is permitted does it teach there one may leave it says if one left which is only a sanction after the act you can however derive it from this mission there is no need for the supervisor to sit and watch the whole time even if he keeps going in and out the wine is permitted rather said Rabbah this is the interpretation of the mission all may slaughter even a kuti and this applies only where an Israelite is going in and out at the time but if an Israelite came and found that the kuti and had slaughtered one must cut off an olive's bulk of the flesh and give it to him if he ate it others may also eat of his slaughtering if he did not eat it others may not eat of his slaughtering except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor who slaughtering even after the act is invalid lest he pause press or thrust now on this interpretation when the mission continues and if any of these slaughter to which persons does the statement refer if we were to say it refers to a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor in that case having just now dealt with these the tana should have said and if they slaughtered and if it refers then to a kuti and surely you have said that though an Israelite is merely going in and out he may slaughter in the first instance this is a difficulty or as she said this is the interpretation of the mission all may slaughter even an Israelite apostate in what respect is he an apostate in that he eats carrion in order to satisfy his appetite this holds good provided the requirement of Rabbah is fulfilled for Rabbah said in the case of an Israelite apostate who eats carrion in order that he may satisfy his appetite Talmud Mastul and B1 prepares the knife and gives it to him and then we may eat of his slaughtering but if the knife was not prepared and given to him he may not slaughter if however he did Slaughter the knife should be examined now if it is found to be satisfactory we may eat of his slaughtering otherwise we may not eat of his slaughtering except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor who slaughtering even after the act is invalid lest they pause press or thrust now on this interpretation when the mission continues and if any of these slaughter to which persons does the statement refer if we were to say it refers to a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor in that case having just now dealt with these the tana should have said and if they slaughtered and if it refers to an Israelite apostate surely you have said that if a knife was prepared and given to him he has the right to slaughter in the first instance and if on the other hand a knife was not prepared for him well then if the knife is here it can be examined now and if it is not here what is the advantage if others were standing over him at the time perhaps he slaughtered with a notched knife this is a Difficulty Rabbanah
Overcome by faintness, but if they have not slaughtered two or three times in our presence, they may not slaughter lest they are overcome by faintness. If however one of these did slaughter and said, I am certain I was not overcome by faintness, his slaughtering is valid except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor who slaughtering even after the act is invalid lest they pause press or thrust now on this interpretation when the mission continues and if any of these slaughter to which persons does. This statement refer if we were to say it refers to a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor in that case having just now dealt with these the tana should have said and if they slaughtered and if it refers to those who are not experienced surely you have said that in such cases it is sufficient if they said I am certain I was not overcome by faintness it must be that they are not present to be questioned Rabbana and Rabbiola do not interpret the mission in the way suggested by Abayor. By Rabba or by Arashi because the latter find a difficulty in interpreting the expression and if any of these slaughtered all do not agree with Rabbiola's interpretation because according to the one version which suggested that our mission here is the source of the rule on the contrary they say that other mission is the source of the rule since it is in the tractate which deals with consecrated things and according to the other version which suggested that the other mission is the source of the rule but that our mission here refers to the case of an unclean person slaughtering consecrated beasts merely incidentally because it deals with the case of an unclean person slaughtering a common beast they say the case of an unclean man slaughtering a common beast was unnecessary to be taught because the correct view is that common things kept in the cleanness proper to hallowed things are not considered hallowed all do not agree with Rabba's interpretation because According to the one version which ruled that only those qualified may slaughter but not those unqualified they hold the principle that the majority of those who slaughter are qualified and according to the other version which ruled that only those who are known to be experienced may slaughter but not those who are not so known they say the danger of being overcome by faintness in slaughtering is too remote to be apprehended Rabbi does not agree with Abbe's interpretation because of it. Objection which he raised Abbe does not agree with Rabbi's interpretation because in that other case the heathen is not handling the wine while in our case the Kutian is handling the beast Arashi does not agree with either of these interpretations because he holds the view that the Kutians were lying proselytes Abbe does not agree with Arashi's interpretation because he does not accept Rabbi's statement the question however remains why does not Rabbi interpret the Mishnah in accordance with his own statement Rabba's interpretation merely follows up the argument of Abbe but he himself does not accept it. Our rabbis taught the slaughtering by a Kutian is valid. This applies only where an Israelite was standing over him at the time. But if he the Israelite came and found that the Kutian had already slaughtered, he cuts off an olive's bulk of the flesh and gives it to him. If he ate it, then we may eat of his slaughtering. If he did not, then we may not eat of his slaughtering. And so, too, if the Israelite found in the possession of a Kutian Talmud, Mosul and the baskets of slaughtered birds, he cuts off the head of one of the birds and gives to him. If he ate it, then we may eat of his slaughtering. If he did not, then we may not eat of his slaughtering. Now Abbe emphasizes the first part of the statement, whereas Rabba emphasizes the second part of the statement. Abbe emphasizes the first part of the statement is the reason why the slaughtering of a Kutian is valid is. That an Israelite was standing over him at the time, which implies that if the Israelite was merely going in and out, it is not sufficient. Rabbah, on the other hand, emphasizes the second part of the statement is the reason why the prescribed test is necessary is because he came and found that the Kutian had slaughtered, which implies that if the Israelite was going in and out at the time, it is in order. Now, according to Abay, is not the second clause difficult to explain. Abay will tell you a person going in and out can also be described as one who came and found that he had slaughtered, and according to Rabbah, is not the first clause difficult to explain. Rabbah will say a person going in and out is regarded as one who is standing over him, and so too, if the Israelite found in the possession of a Kutian baskets of slaughtered birds, he cuts off the head of one of the birds, etc. Is this a sufficient test? Perhaps it was only this one bird that he slaughtered properly, Arman said. Mnemonic putting a knife on rams this is a case where the Israelite put the basket under the lap of his garments and took out a bird at random but perhaps the Kutian had made a sign on the bird by which he recognized it or Mirhashia said it is a case where the Israelite has crushed the bird but may it not be that the Kutians maintain that birds do not require Sheshit according to the law of the Torah if you use this argument you might ask are the rules against pausing pressing thrusting deflecting and tearing specifically written in the Torah what you must therefore admit is that since they have adopted these rules they certainly observe them so in our case too since they have adopted Sheshit for birds they certainly observe it now as to the observance or non-observance by the Kutians of adopted unwritten customs there are differences of opinion among Tanaim for it has been taught the unleavened bread of a Kutian may be eaten on Passover and an Israelite Fulfills his obligation by eating of it on the first night of Passover. Our Eliezer says it may not be eaten because they are not versed in the details of the precepts. Like an Israelite, our Simeon B. Gamaliel says whatever precept the Kutians have adopted, they are very strict in the observance thereof. More so than Israelites, the Master said the unleavened bread of a Kutian may be eaten, and an Israelite fulfills his obligation by eating of it on the first night of Passover. Is not this obvious? No. You might say that they are not versed in the regulation of careful supervision. He therefore teaches you that an Israelite fulfills his obligation by eating of it. Our Eliezer says it may not be eaten because they are not versed in the details of the precepts. Like an Israelite, for he is of the opinion that they are not versed in the regulation of supervision. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says whatever law the Kutians have adopted, they are very strict in the observance thereof. More so than Israelites is. Not this view the same as that of the first Tana there is this difference between them namely a law which is written in the Torah but it is not known whether the Kutians have adopted it the first Tana is of the opinion that since it is a written law even though we do not know whether they have adopted it we can rely upon them our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds a view that only if they have adopted it can they be relied upon but not otherwise if this is so why does our Simeon B. Gamaliel say whatever precept the Kutians have adopted he should say if they have adopted it this rather is the real difference between them namely an unwritten law which has been adopted by them the first Tana is of the opinion that since it is an unwritten law even though they have adopted it they do not observe it our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds a view that since they have adopted it they observe it the above text stated Rabbah said in the case of an Israelite apostate who eats carrion in order to Satisfy his appetite one prepares the knife and gives it to him and then we may eat of his slaughtering what is the reason for this because since there is a possibility of permissible and forbidden food he would not leave what is permitted and eat what is forbidden if so should we not argue in like manner even where a knife is not prepared for him no for he would not go to any trouble said the rabbis to rabbis these is a very good talk that supports your view is eleven bread of transgressors is immediately after the Passover Talmud must and be permitted to be eaten because they exchange it for non-Jewish bread now it was thought that the author of this berry was our Judah who holds that leaven bread which has remained over Passover is forbidden by biblical law and yet the berry says it is permitted because they exchange it thus one can prove the principle that a person would not leave what is permitted and eat what is forbidden is this really so perhaps the author of the Beretha is our Simeon who holds that leavened bread which has remained over Passover is forbidden only by rabbinic law and therefore ST is only in connection with rabbinic laws that a lenient view is taken but not in connection with biblical laws be it so that the author is our Simeon but does the Beretha say because I assume that they exchange it it says because they exchange it he they certainly exchange it it follows therefore that if in connection with rabbinic laws we say a person would not leave what is permitted and eat what is forbidden how much more so in connection with biblical laws can we say that the following Beretha supports Rabbah's view for it was taught all may slaughter even a Kutian even an uncircumcised Israelite even an Israelite apostate now what is meant by an uncircumcised Israelite shall I say it is one whose brothers have died as a result of circumcision surely such a one is a good Israelite clearly then it can only mean one who is Opposed to the law of circumcision and the Tanah is of the opinion that one who is opposed to one law is not regarded as one opposed to the whole Torah. Let us now read the last statement. Even an Israelite apostate, what is meant by an Israelite apostate? If it means one who is opposed to one particular law, then it is identical with our interpretation of an uncircumcised Isra
Persuaded him, perhaps he persuaded him with words. Persuasion in scripture never means with words is this so is it not written if thy brother persuade thee this verse also means by eating and drinking but is it not written and thou didst persuade me to destroy him without cause with reference to the most high it is different but is it not possible that he drank wine and did not eat meat but why distinguish and say that drinking the wine is permitted because you hold the view that one who is an apostate in respect of idolatry is not regarded as opposed to the whole Torah the same then holds good with regard to eating meat for one that is an apostate in respect of idolatry is not regarded as opposed to the whole Torah how can you compare the two with regard to drinking the only ground for its prohibition is a law concerning the ordinary wine of Gentiles and at that period the ordinary wine of Gentiles was not prohibited but with regard to eating I maintain that one that is an apostate in respect of idolatry is regarded as opposed to the whole Torah if you wish I can answer it is not the custom of kings to drink without eating and if you wish I can answer it reads and he slaughtered and persuaded him which suggests how did he persuade him by giving him to eat of what he had slaughtered but perhaps it was Obadiah who slaughtered the animals it reads in abundance Obadiah could not have managed it all by himself perhaps the seven thousand righteous men slaughtered for it is written yet will I leave seven thousand in Israel all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal these were in hiding because of Jezebel but perhaps the servants of Ahab were righteous you cannot assume such a thing for it is written if a ruler hearkeneth to falsehood all his servants are wicked but perhaps the servants of Jehoshaphat too were not righteous therefore that which was slaughtered by Ahab's men was eaten by Jehoshaphat's men but that which was slaughtered by Obadiah was eaten by Jehoshaphat. You cannot assume such a thing, for if a ruler hearkeneth to falsehood, all his servants are wicked. It follows that if a ruler hearkeneth to the truth, all his servants are righteous. But perhaps that which was slaughtered by Ahab's servants was eaten by Ahab and his men. But that which was slaughtered by Jehoshaphat's servants was eaten by Jehoshaphat and his men. Talmud, Mosul and Jehoshaphat would not have kept himself aloof. How do you know this? Shall I say? Because it is written, I am as thou art, my people as thy people. If so, can the following words, my horses as thy horses, bear such a meaning? You must therefore say that the meaning of the last phrase is whatever burden shall be on thy horses shall be on my horses. Then the first phrase too might mean whatever burden shall be upon thyself and upon thy men shall be upon myself and upon my men. Rather, it is derived from this verse. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat each on. Is thrown arrayed in their robes in the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. Now, what is meant by threshing floor shall I say it is to be taken literally, but surely the entrance of the gate of Samaria was not a threshing floor. It can only mean that they sat together as in the threshing floor of the courtroom, for we learned the Sanhedrin sat in the form of a semicircular threshing floor so that they might see one another. Can we say that the following supports his Aranans? View it is written, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And Rab Judah explained this in the name of Rab that the ravens brought the flesh from Ahab's slaughter as being a divine command. It is different. What is meant by the ravens? Arab and Rabbin said it means actually ravens are a Abimanyam. I, however, suggested to him, may it not mean two men whose names were Oreb as we find it written, and they slew Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb. Reply could it have happened that both were named Oreb but perhaps they were so named after the town in which they lived just as it is written and the Arameans had gone out in bands and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid now the difficulty was pointed out first the verse refers to this girl as a maid Nar and then as little Ken and Arpedath explained this to mean a little girl from the town of Nar and if so the verse should read Arabim can we say that the following supports his Aranans view for it was taught all may slaughter even a Kuti and even an uncircumcised Israelite even an Israelite apostate now what is meant by an uncircumcised Israelite shall I say it is one whose brothers have died as a result of circumcision surely such a one is a good Israelite clearly then it can only mean one who is opposed to the law of circumcision let us now read the last statement even an Israelite apostate what is meant by an Israelite apostate Shall I say it means one who is opposed to one particular law and is not this the same as the case of an uncircumcised Israelite hence it can only mean one who is an apostate in respect of idolatry and yet he may slaughter the supporting Aranans you know I might still maintain that an apostate in respect of idolatry may not slaughter for it has been said grave is idolatry and that he who denies it is as if he accepts the whole Torah and by Israelite apostate is meant one who is opposed to this particular practice of Sheshit and yet such a one may slaughter in accordance with Rabbah's view an objection was raised it is written of you but not all of you thus excluding an apostate of you that is among you Israelites does this distinction apply but not among other nations of the cattle includes persons who are devoid of merit like animals hence the rabbis have declared one should accept sacrifices from the transgressors in Israel so that they may be inclined to repent. But not from an Israelite apostate or from one who offers a wine libation to idols or from one who profanes the Sabbath publicly. Now this very is self-contradictory. It says of you, but not all of you, thus excluding an apostate. And then it says one may accept sacrifices from the transgressors in Israel. This is no difficulty. The former statement refers to one who is opposed to the whole Torah, while the latter statement refers to one who is opposed to one particular law. Consider now the last statement of the Beritha, but not from an Israelite apostate or from one who offers a wine libation to idols or from one who profanes the Sabbath publicly. What is meant by apostate in this statement? If it means one who is opposed to the whole Torah, then it is identical with the first statement. And if it means one who is opposed to one particular law, then it is inconsistent with the middle statement of necessity. This must be the meaning of the last statement, but not from an Israelite. Apostate for offering a wine libation to idols or for profaning the Sabbath publicly. This proves that one who is an apostate in respect of idolatry is regarded as opposed to the whole Torah. Consequently, Aranan's opinion is refuted. This is a conclusive refutation, but is this rule derived from the above? Surely it is derived from the following statement, which was taught Talmud. Mostul and B of the common people excludes an apostate. Our Simon B. Jose said in the name of our Simeon the verse end. Though through error any of the things which the Lord his God hath commanded not to be done and is guilty implies that only he who repents when he becomes conscious of his sin brings a sacrifice for his error, but he who does not repent on becoming conscious of his sin does not bring a sacrifice for his error. And it was asked what practical difference is there between them and Arham. Unreply the difference between them lies in the case of one who being an apostate in respect of the eating of. Forbidden fat brings a sacrifice for having eaten blood in error. The rule is derived from both passages, but one speaks of the sin offering while the other of the burnt offering, and both are required for if it were taught only in respect of a sin offering, it would have been argued that the reason why he the apostate is precluded is because a sin offering is brought for an atonement, but a burnt offering being in the nature of a gift to the Lord, we might say should be accepted from him. And on the other hand, if it were taught only in respect of a burnt offering, it would have been argued that the reason why he is precluded is because there is no obligation on his part to offer it, but a sin offering being obligatory, we might say should be accepted from him. Therefore, both statements are required, but is it a general rule that whenever scripture uses cattle, it implies contempt, but is it not written man and cattle thou preservest the Lord and Rab Judah said in the name of Rab this. Verse refers to those who are wise in understanding and conduct themselves humbly like cattle. There is this difference in the latter verse. It reads man and cattle, but in our text it says cattle by itself. But is it a general rule that whenever scripture uses man and cattle, it implies merit? But is it not written? And I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of male and with the seed of cattle. In this latter case, scripture clearly distinguishes between the two, referring to the seed of man separately and to the seed of cattle separately. Nehemiah Nicola P. R. Hanan reported in the name of our Jacob B. E. D. reported in the name of our Joshua B. Levi who reported in the name of Barkhaper as follows. Our Gamaliel and his court took a vote concerning the slaughtering by Akutian and declared it invalid. Thereupon our Zara suggested to our Jacob B. E. D. May it not be that my master heard this ruling only in the case where no Israelite was standing over him. He retorted this. Student is as one who has never studied the law where no Israelite was standing over him. Is it nec
Eliezer was sent by Armadir to fetch someone from among the Kutians. He was met by a certain old man who said to him, Put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Whereupon Arsimian B. Eliezer returned and reported the matter to Armadir, who thereupon proscribed them. Why Arnam and B. Isaac explained because they found a figure of a dove on the top of Mount Gerizim and they worshipped it. Armadir therefore consistent with his principle that the minority must be taken into consideration. Proscribed all Kutians because of this minority and Argamaliel and his court also held this principle. What is the plain meaning of the above quoted text? It refers to a people sitting before his master for our high taught when thou sittest to eat with the ruler, consider well him that is before thee and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to an appetite if the people knows that the master is capable of answering the question and he may ask it otherwise consider well him that is. Before thee and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite and leave him or Isaac the Joseph was sent by Arabab to fetch someone from among the Kutians. He was met by a certain old man who said to him, There are none here that observe the Torah. Our Isaac went and reported the matter to Arabab who reported it to RMI and RC the latter forthwith declared the Kutians to be absolute heathens in what respect were they declared absolute heathens if in respect of their Slaughtering that it is invalid and in respect of their wine that it is idolatrous had not the rabbis proscribed them in these matters from that former incident the rabbis had previously proscribed them but their decree was not accepted RMI and RC came now and proscribed them and their decree was accepted what was meant by declaring them absolute even said Arnam and B. Isaac it meant that they have no longer the power to renounce or to transfer ownership for it has been taught an Israelite apostate who publicly observes the Sabbath may renounce and transfer his ownership but if he does not observe the Sabbath publicly he may not renounce and transfer his ownership because the rabbi said an Israelite may transfer or renounce his ownership whereas with a heathen this can only be done by renting his property in what way is ownership renounced one Israelite can say to another Israelite my ownership is acquired by you or my ownership is renounced in your Favor and the latter has thereby acquired the property without the necessity of a formal acquisition. Arzara and Rc happened to come to the end of Yai. They were served with roasted eggs beaten up in wine. Arzara did not eat it. Rc did. Arzara asked Rc Master, Are you not concerned about the admixture of Dimei? He replied, I did not think of it. Can it be thought, Arzara, that the rabbis have prohibited Dimei in a mixed state and that it should come about that Rc should eat prohibited? Food surely if the Holy One blessed be, he would not permit the beast of the righteous to sin in error. How much less the righteous themselves? Arzara thereupon went out, looked into the matter, and found the law for it was taught if one buys wine in order to pour it into muris or into alanti or beans to make into grist or lentils to make into groats, he must tithe them. If they are Dimei, it is needless to say so if they were certainly untithe the mixtures themselves, however, may be eaten. Without tithing because they are in a mixed state but did the rabbis then not prohibit Dimei in a mixed state has it not been taught if a man gives to his neighbor's wife dough to be baked or a dish to be cooked and also provides her with leaven and spices he need have no fear that the leaven and the spices used are seventh year produce or are untithed if however he said to her make it with your own ingredients he must suspect that the leaven and spices used are seventh year produce or untithed this last case is different for this reason since he said to her make it with your own ingredients it is as though he actually mixed it himself Raphram said it is different with leaven and spices since they are used primarily for seasoning and seasoning never loses its distinctiveness but do we not suspect an exchange have we not learned if a man gives to his mother-in-law dough to be baked he must tithe what he gives to her and what he takes from her because she is suspected of Changing it if it is spoiled in this case the reason for her changing it is added Bizar Judah says because she desires the welfare of her daughter and feels shame for her son-in-law Talmud, Mostul and B in all other cases then do we not suspect an exchange have we not learned if a man gives to his landlady dough to be baked he must tithe what he gives to her and what he takes from her because she is suspected of changing it in this case too she justifies herself by saying let the young student rather eat the fresh and I will eat the stale but otherwise do we not suspect an exchange surely it has been taught the wife of a Haber may assist the wife of an Amhires in grinding corn only when she is in a state of uncleanness but not when she is in a clean state Arsimian B. Eliezer says even when she is in a state of uncleanness she may not assist in grinding because the other would offer her some corn to eat now if it is said that the wife of an Amhires is ready to Steal from her husband, surely she is to be suspected of making an exchange in this case too. She justifies herself by saying the ox has a right to eat of what he threshes. Our Joshua Bezir is the son of Armadir's father-in-law testified before Rabbi that Armadir ate a leaf of a vegetable in Bethshin without tithing it on this testimony. Therefore Rabbi permitted the entire territory of Bethshin thereupon his brothers and other members of his father's family combined to protest saying the place which was regarded as subject to tithes by your parents and ancestors will you regard as free. Rabbi thereupon expounded to them the following verse and he Hezekiah broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did offer to it and it was called Nehushtan. Now is it at all likely that Asa did not destroy it or that Jehoshaphat did not destroy it? Surely Asa and Jehoshaphat destroyed every form of idolatry in the world Talmud, Mastulane. Talmud, Mastulin, it must therefore be that his ancestors left something undone whereby he has might distinguish himself. So in my case, my ancestors left room for me to distinguish myself from this is to be learned that whenever a scholar reports a decision, however strange it may sound, he should not be made to move Mazayin from his tradition. Others say he should not be rejected Majahin, and others say he should not be regarded as arrogant Majahin. Those who say he should not be made to move from his tradition, base it on the verse, and the breastplate be not moved. Yazah from the Ephod. Those who say he should not be rejected, base it on the verse, for the Lord will not reject Yazah forever. And those who say he should not be regarded as arrogant, base it on the following, for we learned when the arrogant increased disputes increased in Israel to the Judah son of Arsimian, because he demurred. Is there anyone who holds of you that Bethshin was not part of Palestine? Is it not written and Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Bethshin and its towns nor of Tanish and its towns when he raised his objection there must have escaped his attention the statement of Arsimian Beliakim who reported R. Eliezer B. Petat in the name of R. Eliezer B. Shamuay as follows many cities which were conquered by the Israelites who came up from Egypt were not reconquered by those who came up from Babylon for he held the view that the consecration of the Holy Land on the first occasion by Joshua consecrated it for the time being but not for the future they therefore did not annex these cities in order that the poor might have sustenance therefom in the seventh year our Jeremiah said to our Zerah but our Meir ate a mere leaf of a vegetable he replied he ate it from a bundle and we have learned vegetables which are usually tied in bundles become due for tithing on being tied up but perhaps our Meir forgot to tie that this cannot be surely if the Holy One. Lest be he would not permit the beast of the righteous to sin in error how much less the righteous themselves but perhaps he set aside from other produce the tithe due for this vegetable one would not suspect a haber of setting aside the dues for the produce that is before us out of produce that is not before us but perhaps he had in mind to set aside the tithe from one end of the bundle whilst he ate from the other end he replied see how great a man testified concerning this what was the incident about the beast of the righteous once Arfinah Asbi Jahir was on his way to redeem captives and came to the river Janao Janae said he divide thy waters for me that I may pass through thee it replied thou art about to do the will of thy maker I too am doing the will of my maker thou mayest or mayest not accomplish that purpose I am sure of accomplishing mine he said if thou wilt not divide thyself I will decree that no waters ever pass through thee it thereupon divided itself for him there was also present a certain man who was carrying wheat for the Passover and so Arphinehas once again addressed the river divide thyself for this man too for he is engaged in a religious duty it thereupon divided itself for him too there was also an Arab who had joined them on the journey and so Arphinehas once again addressed the river divide thyself for this one too that he may not say is this the treatment of a fellow traveler it thereupon divided itself for him too our Joseph exclaimed how great is this man greater than Moses and the sixty myriads of Israel for the
Meet him, will you please dine with me? Asked Rabbi. Certainly he answered Rabbi's face at once brightened with joy, whereupon Arphinehah said, You imagine that I am forbidden by bow from deriving any benefit from an Israelite. Oh no, the people of Israel are holy, yet there are some who desire to benefit others but have not the means, whilst others have the means but have not the desire, and it is written, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainties for as one. That hath reckoned within himself, so is he, and drinks at he to thee, but his heart is not with thee, but you have the desire and also the means at present. However, I am in a hurry, for I am engaged on a religious duty, but on my return I will come and visit you when he arrived. He happened to enter by a gate near which were some white mules at this. He exclaimed, The angel of death is in this house, shall I then dine here? When Rabbi heard of this, he went out to meet him, I shall sell the mule, said. Rabbi Arfinehaz replied, Thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind, I shall abandon them, you would be spreading danger, I shall hamstring them, you would be causing suffering to the animals, I shall kill them, there is the prohibition against wanton destruction. Rabbi was thus pressing him persistently when there rose up a mountain between them, then Rabbi wept and said, If this is the power of the righteous in their lifetime, how great must it be after their death for our hand of the behemoth? Asserted the righteous are more powerful after death than in life, for it is written, and it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold they spied a band and they cast a man into the sepulchre of Elisha, and as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet, said, Our Papa, do have a perhaps the restoration to life was to fulfill Elijah's blessing as it is written, Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me, he replied, If so, why has it been taught? He stood. Upon his feet, but walked not to his home, wherein then was Elijah's blessing fulfilled. As our Yohanan has said, he healed the leprosy of Naaman, leprosy being the equivalent of death. As it is written, let her not I pray be as one dead. Our Joshua believe I said, why are they mules called him? Because they cast fear upon men. For our Hannah has said, no one has ever consulted me for a case of a wound from a white mule and has recovered. But do we not see people recovering from it? I mean, never has the wound healed. But do we not see cases where the wound has healed? I am referring to a wound inflicted by a white-legged mule. There is none else beside him. Our Hannah has said, even sorcery. A woman once attempted to cast a spell over our Hannah. He said to her, try as you will, you will not succeed in your attempts. For it is written, there is none else beside him. Has not, however, our Yohanan declared why is sorcery called Keshavim because it overrules the decree of the heavenly council. Our Hannah was in a. Different category owing to his abundant merit, our Hannah further said, No man bruises his finger here on earth unless it was so decreed against him in heaven, for it is written, It is of the Lord that a man's goings are established. How then can man look to his way? Our Eliezer said, The blood of a bruise atones like the blood of a burnt offering. Rabbah added, It is only the blood of a second bruising of the thumb of the right hand that atones, and then only if it happened to one who was about to do it. Religious act, it is related of our Phinehas Bijahir that never in his life did he say grace over a piece of bread which was not his own, and furthermore, that from the day he reached years of discretion, he derived no benefit from his father's table Talmud. Mastulin Arzara said, In the name of Samuel, if one made a knife red hot and slaughtered with it, the slaughtering is valid because the effect of the sharp edge precedes the effect of the heat, but what about the size of the knife? Cut opens why the following question was raised if one made a spit red hot and struck with it is the resulting wound to be regarded as a boil or as a burning but what is the difference between the two even as it has been taught a boil and a burning each is declared unclean within seven days by one of two symptoms by white hair or spreading why then did the Torah deal with them separately to teach you that they cannot unite one with the other and we have learned what is a boil and what is a burning a wound caused by wood or stone or olive heat or the hot springs of Tiberius or any wound that is not caused by fire including a wound caused by lead just taken from the mind is a boil and what is a burning a burn caused by a live coal or hot ashes or boiling lime or boiling gypsum or any burn that is caused by fire including a burn caused by water heated by fire is a burning and it was further taught in the case of a wound which is both a boil and a burning if the boil came first. Then the subsequent burning annuls the boil and it is considered a burn but if the burning came first then the subsequent boil annuls the burn and it is considered a boil. Now the circumstances of our case are as follows a man had a boil of the size of half a bean and was struck close to it with a red hot spit another wound of the size of half a bean resulting making a whole wound the size of a whole bean in such a case how are we to consider the resulting wound did the force of it blow take effect first and the burn caused by the glowing heat that followed and all the effect of the blow so that the whole wound is composed of a boil and a burning each to the extent of half a bean which do not unite to make him unclean or did the glowing heat take effect first and the force of the blow that followed and all the effect of the glowing heat and consequently the whole wound is composed of two boils each to the extent of half a bean which unite to make him unclean come and here Arzara said in the name of Samuel if one made a knife red hot and slaughtered with it the slaughtering is valid because the effect of the sharp edge precedes the effect of the heat it thus proves that the force of the blow precedes the glowing heat no in the case of a sharp edge it is different come and here if one was struck with a red hot spit the resulting wound is regarded as a burning by fire it thus proves that the force of the blow precedes the glowing heat no here to the wound was made by a thrust with the point which is a sharp edge Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abu a knife which has been used in connection with idolatry services may be used for slaughtering but it may not be used for cutting up meat it may be used for slaughtering for thereby one impairs the value but it may not be used for cutting up meat for thereby one enhances the value Rabbi remarked there are times when one may not slaughter with it to wit if the animal is at the point of death and there are times when one may cut up meat with it to wit if the meat was in large pieces intended for a present but should not the prohibition thereof be considered on account of the forbidden fat Talmud, Mastul and B it was a new knife if knew it should not be prohibited at all since it is merely an appurtenance for the worship of idols and appurtenances of idols both according to our Ishmael and our Akiva are not forbidden till actually used in idol worship if you wish I can. Answer it was used for cutting up wood for the idol or if you wish I can answer it was an old knife which was cleansed in the fire it was stated if a man slaughtered with the knife of a Gentile rap says he must bear the flesh Rabbi Barhana says he need only rinse it shall we say that their difference lies in this one holds of you that the throat is cold while the other holds of you that it is hot no all hold of you that the throat is hot therefore he who says he must bear it is. Clearly understood, but he who says that he need only rinse it argues thus while the organs of the throat keep on spurting out blood, they will not absorb any fat from the knife. Some there are who state as follows all hold the view that the throat is cold, therefore he who says he need only rinse it is clearly understood, but he who says that he must bear it argues thus by reason of the pressure of the knife, the flesh must absorb to some extent a knife which was used for slaughtering an animal found to be trifa is the subject of a dispute between Araha and Rabbana. One says it must be cleansed with hot water, the other says it may be cleansed even with cold water, the law is even with cold water, and if there is a hand a piece of cloth wherewith to wipe the knife, nothing more is required. Now what is the reason of the one who says that it must be cleansed with hot water? It is, is it not because it absorbed forbidden fat? If so, even after slaughtering an animal which is Permitted to be eaten, it should also require cleansing with hot water because it absorbed the fat of the limbs of a living animal. It is not so for the knife absorbs the fat only when the throat is hot and it becomes hot only at the end of the slaughtering when the animal is ritually permitted. Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbi Butcher requires three separate knives, one for slaughtering, one for cutting meat, and one for cutting away the forbidden fat. But why should he not use the same knife first for cutting meat and then for cutting fat? It is forbidden to do so lest he cut with it the fat first and then the meat. Well, even now he might get the mix. No sense he must have two separate knives, he will make a distinguishing mark on each again. Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbi Butcher requires two separate pails of water, one in which he washes the meat and one in which he washes the fat. But why should he not use the same pail for washing in it first the meat and then? The fat it is forbidden to do so lest he wash in it the fat first and then the meat well even now he might get the mix no since he must have two separate pails he will make a distinguishing mark on each Amimar said
must examine the organs of the throat after slaughtering our Joseph remarked we have learned the same in a mission our Simeon says if one paused for the time taken to examine now does it not mean the time taken to examine the organs of the throat Abbe replied no thus did our Yohanan say it means the time taken for the sage to examine the knife if this is the meaning then the rule would vary according to circumstances rather the meaning is the time taken for a butcher who is himself a sage to examine the knife if one did not examine the organs of the throat after slaughtering what is the law our Eliezer B. Antigonus ruled in the name of our Eliezer son of Arjana the animal is trifa and may not be eaten in a very it was taught the animal is nibble and defiles one who carries it on what principle do they differ on the principle laid down by Arhuna who said an animal while alive is presumed to be forbidden and therefore remains forbidden when dead until it becomes Known to you that it was ritually slaughtered once ritually slaughtered it is presumed to be permitted until it becomes known to you how it became true for the one reasons thus it is presumed to be forbidden and now that it is dead it is nibble and therefore defile the other reasons thus the presumption holds good only in respect of the prohibition to be eaten but there is no presumption in respect of defilement the text above stated Arhuna said an animal while alive is presumed to be forbidden and therefore remains forbidden when dead until it becomes known to you that it was ritually slaughtered once ritually slaughtered it is presumed to be permitted until it becomes known to you how it became true should he not simply have said once ritually slaughtered it is permitted he teaches you this that even if something happened to the animal to impair its status it is nevertheless permitted for example the question which was put to Arhuna by our Abba if a wolf came and Carried away the intestines of a slaughtered animal. What is the law you ask? Carried away, then they are not your rather say and perforated the intestines, perforated the intestines, then it is evident that the wolf did it rather say carried away the intestines and brought them back perforated. Now what is the law? Are we to apprehend that the wolf inserted its teeth in a perforation that was there previously or not? Arhuna replied, We do not apprehend that it inserted its teeth in a perforation. Our Abba thereupon raised an objection from the following Beretha. If one saw a bird nibbling at a fig or a mouse nibbling at a melon talmud, Mosul and B1 must apprehend that it was nibbling in a pre-existing hole. He replied, How can you compare what is forbidden ritually with what is forbidden on account of possible danger to life? In the latter case, we are certainly more apprehensive, said Rabba. What difference is there whenever there arises a doubt concerning a prohibition? Based on danger to life, the stricter view is preferred, and the same is the case with regard to a doubt in connection with the ritual prohibition set up to him. Is there then no difference between laws concerning danger to life and laws concerning ritual prohibitions? But let us see whenever there is a doubt regarding any object, whether it is clean or unclean. If such doubt arose in a public place, it is deemed clean, but whenever there is a doubt regarding water that was left uncovered, it is deemed to be forbidden. He answered, In the case of uncleanness, the rule is derived by analogy from the case of a woman suspected of adultery, because as a doubt in connection with the suspected woman can only occur in a private place, so every doubt in connection with uncleanness must have occurred in a private place. Arshaim, I raised an objection. We have learned if a weasel has a dead reptile in its mouth and walks over loaves of terramah, and it is doubtful whether the reptile came into contact. With the loaves were not there deemed clean yet in the case of water left uncovered if there is any doubt about it it is forbidden here again the rule in the case of uncleanness is derived by analogy from the case of a woman suspected of adultery because as a doubt in connection with the suspected woman relates to a person that has understanding to be questioned about it so every doubt in connection with uncleanness must relate to such as have understanding to be questioned about it come and here if a man left uncovered a bowl containing purification water and came and found it covered it is regarded as unclean for i can say that an unclean person entered and covered it if he left it covered and came and found it uncovered and a weasel or even a snake according to our Gamaliel could have drunk from it or if dew fell on it during the night the water is invalid and our joshua believe i said what is the reason for this talmud mostly because it is the habit of reptiles to Uncover a vessel but not to cover one or you might argue thus the above decisions only apply to the cases mentioned is where he left the bowl uncovered and came and found it covered and where he left it covered and came and found it uncovered but if he found it as he left it the water is neither unclean nor invalid whereas in the case of water left uncovered if there is any doubt about it it is forbidden this therefore proves that regulations concerning danger to life are more stringent than ritual prohibitions it stands proved we have learned elsewhere three liquids are prohibited if left uncovered water wine and milk how long must they have remained uncovered to become forbidden such time as it would take a reptile to come forth from a place nearby and drink what distance is meant by a place nearby our Isaac the son of Rab Judah explained such time as it would take a reptile to come forth from under the handle of the vessel and drink therefrom and drink therefrom and you See it rather and drink therefrom and return to its hole. It was stated if a man slaughtered with a knife which was found afterwards to have a notch in it, Arhuna says even if he broke bones with it the whole day long after the slaughtering, the Sheshita is invalid because we apprehend that it became notched while cutting the skin before actually cutting the throat. Arhista, however, says that the Sheshita is valid because we assume that it became notched by a bone. Now Arhuna's opinion is clear, it being in accordance with the principle he laid down above. But what is the reason of Arhista's opinion? He reasons thus a bone certainly notches the knife, whereas the skin may or may not notch the knife. There is thus a doubt against a certainty, and a doubt cannot set aside a certainty. Robber raised an objection against Arhista, thereby supporting the opinion of Arhuna. It was taught if a man immersed himself and came up and then there was found something adhering to his body even. Though he was using that particular substance all day long after his immersion, it is not regarded as a proper immersion unless he can declare, I am certain it was not upon me before my immersion. Now, in this case, he certainly immersed himself, and there is a doubt whether the substance was or was not upon him before his immersion. Yet the doubt sets aside the certainty. This case is different, for one can say, let the unclean person remain in his unclean status and assume that there has been no immersion. Well, then, in our case, too, one can say, let the animal remain in its forbidden status and assume that there has been no slaughtering. Surely the animal is slaughtered before us, but here, too, surely this man has immersed himself before us. In the latter case, something has happened to impair his immersion, but in the former case, too, something has happened to impair the slaughtering. No, the defect is in the knife, but not in the animal. An objection was raised if one cut through the Gullet and then the windpipe was torn away from its position. The slaughtering is valid if the windpipe was first torn away and then one cut through the gullet. The slaughtering is invalid if one cut through the gullet and then the windpipe was found to be torn away and it is not known whether it was torn away before or after the slaughtering. This was an actual case brought before the rabbis and they ruled any doubt whatsoever arising about the slaughtering makes it invalid. Now, what is the scope of this rule? Does it not include the case mentioned above? No, it includes those cases where there is a doubt as to whether or not one paused or pressed in the act of slaughtering Talmud, Mosul, and B. But what is the difference in the latter cases? The defect has arisen in the animal, whereas in the above mentioned case, the defect has arisen in the knife but not in the animal. The law is as Arhuna ruled where he did not break up bones with the knife after slaughtering and the law is as our Hista ruled where he did break up bones it follows that our Hista maintains his view even where no bones were broken up then the question is how did the knife become notched you can say it became notched through striking the bone of the neck there happened such a case and our Joseph declared as many as 13 animals to be trifa now whose view did he follow did he follow Arhuna's view and so declared them all trifa including the first animal no he may have followed our Hista's view and so declared an all trifa accepting the first animal if you wish however I can say that he followed Arhuna's view because if he followed our Hista's view then since our Hista adopts a lenient view why is it suggested that the knife became notched through striking the neck bone of the first animal should we not say that it became notched through striking the neck bone of the last animal Araha the son of Rabba told Arashi that Arkahan required the knife to be examined after each animal that was Slaughtered now whose view did he adopt was it Arhuna's view with the result that if the knife were not examined between each animal that was slaughtered even the first animal would be trifano it was Arhista's view that he adopted and he therefore required the knife to be examined after each animal so that even those slaughtered after the first should be permitted if this is
that in a dark house one may not open up windows to inspect the leprous spot. This rule only applies when the leprosy has not yet been ascertained. But once the leprosy has been ascertained, the matter is determined. A very though was taught, which is not in agreement with the view of our Ahabi Jacob, since it is written, and the priest shall go out of the house. You might think that he may go to his own house and shut up the affected house from there. The verse therefore reads to the door of it. House, but if we had only the door of the house to go by, you might think that he may stand under the doorpost of the affected house and shut it up. The verse therefore reads out of the house, that is to say, he must go right out of the house. How is this done? He stands outside the doorpost and shuts it up. Moreover, whence do we know that if he went to his own home and shut it up from there, or if he remained within the affected house and shut it up, the shutting up is valid. The verse therefore says, and he shall shut it the house, implying that the shutting up in whatever way affected is valid. And R. A. Jacob Talmud, Mosul and A. The Barith refers to a case where there was a row of men who reported that the leprous spot remained unaltered. Whence is derived the principle which the rabbis have adopted. This follow the majority. Whence you ask, is it not expressly written? Follow the majority in regard to those cases where the majority is defined, as in the case of the nine shops. Or the Sanhedrin, we do not ask the question. Our question relates to cases where the majority is undefined, as in the case of the boy and girl. Whence then is the principle derived? Nimon Exim and Eshev Omikanish R. Eliezer said it is derived from the head of a burnt offering. The verse reads, and he shall cut it into its pieces, which means he shall cut it up into its pieces, but not its pieces into smaller pieces. Now, why do we not fear that the membrane which encloses the brain is perforated? Is it not because we follow the majority, but is this really so? Perhaps he splits open the head and examines the membrane, and as for the rule, he shall cut it into its pieces, but not its pieces into smaller pieces. This only prohibits the cutting up of a limb into pieces, but does not prohibit the mere splitting open of a limb so long as the parts remain joined. Mar the son of Robin has said it is derived from the rule concerning breaking the bones of the Paschal lamb. The verse reads, and ye shall not. Break a bone thereof. Now, why do we not fear that the membrane which encloses the brain is perforated? Is it not because we follow the majority? But is this really so? Perhaps he places a burning coal upon the head, burns away the bone, and examines the membrane, for it has been taught he who cuts the sinews or burns away the bones of the paschal lamb has not transgressed the law of breaking the bones. Our nom and B. Isaac said it is derived from the law concerning the tail of sheep. The verse reads it. Fat thereof and the fat tail entire. Now, why do we not fear that the spinal cord is severed? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say he can cut off the fat tail lower down? Surely the divine law says which he shall take away hard by the rump bone, that is to say hard by the place where the counseling kidneys are seated. But perhaps he cuts open the fat tail and examines it. And as for the law that the fat tail be entire, this only prohibits the complete severing of it, but does. Not prohibit cutting it open so long as it is still one piece. Arshis hate the son of Aridi said it is derived from the case of the heifer whose neck was to be broken. The divine law says whose neck was broken, which has been interpreted to mean that after the neck has been broken, the heifer must remain whole. Now, why do we not fear that it has some defect which makes it trif? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say what does it matter even if it is trif? Surely it was taught in the school of Arjana. Forgiveness is mentioned in connection therewith as with sacrifices. Rabbi Sheila said it is derived from the case of the red cow. The divine law says and he shall slaughter it and he shall burn it, which signifies just as for the slaughtering the animal must be whole, so for the burning it must be whole. Now, why do we not fear that it is trif? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say what does it matter even if it is trif? Surely it Divine law calls it a sin offering. Our Ahabi Jacob said it is derived from the case of the scapegoat. The divine law says, and he shall take the two goats, which implies that the two shall be alike in all respects. Now, why do we not fear Talmud, Mosul, and be that one of them is trif? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say what does it matter even if it is trif? Surely it has been taught the law cannot determine the goat for Azazel unless it is fit to be for the Lord. And should you say it can be examined? Surely we have learned before it reached halfway down the mountain and was already broken into pieces. Armari said it is derived from the case of one that smites his father or his mother for which offense the divine law prescribes death. Now, why do we not fear that the person struck may not have been his father? Is it not because we follow the majority and a woman cohabits with her husband more often than with a stranger? But perhaps the law applies only to the Case where the father and mother were locked up in prison, even so there is no guardian against unchastity. Our Kahana said it is derived from the case of a murderer for whom the divine law prescribes death. Now, why do we not fear that the victim may have been trifled? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say we can examine the body? This is not allowed because it would thereby be mutilated. And should you say since a man's life is at stake, we should mutilate the body? Surely there is always the possibility that there was a hole in the victim in the place where he was stuck by the sword. Robin has said it is derived from the law concerning witnesses who are found to be Zomemim in connection with whom the divine law says, and shall ye do unto him as he had purpose to do unto his brother? Now, why do we not fear that the person against whom they gave false evidence that he committed a capital offense is trifled? Is it not because we follow the majority? And should you say? We can examine him now. Sure, why it has been taught. The rabbi said, if the person against whom their evidence was directed has not been executed, they are put to death. If he has been executed, they are not put to death. Arashi said, it is derived from the law of Shechet itself. For the divine law says, in effect, slaughter and eat. Now, why do we not fear that there is a hole in the gullet in the place where it was cut through? Is it not because we follow the majority? Arashi added, I put forward this argument to Arkahana. Others say, Arkahana put forward this argument to Arshimai, and he replied, perhaps the law is that where it is possible to ascertain the facts, we must do so. It is only where it is impossible to ascertain the facts that we follow the majority. For if you do not accept this argument, then the question will be asked, did Armadir, who is of the opinion that the minority must be taken into consideration, always abstain from eating meat? And if you reply that this indeed was the case. Then it will be asked Talmud, Mosul, and what about the meat of the Paschal Lamb and of other sacrifices? You are therefore obliged to say that Armadir's view is where it is possible to ascertain the facts, one must do so, and only where it is impossible to ascertain the facts does one follow the majority. Our view then is the same where it is possible to ascertain the facts, we must do so, and only where it is impossible to do so do we follow the majority. Our said in the name of Rabbi Man saw another slaughtering and he watched him from beginning to end. He may eat of the slaughtering, otherwise he may not eat of the slaughtering. What are the circumstances of the case if he knows that the slaughterer is conversant with the rules of Shechita? Then why is it necessary to watch over him if he knows that the slaughterer is not conversant with the rules at all? Then the case is obvious again if he does not know whether the slaughterer is conversant with the rules or not then. Should not the principle that the majority of those who slaughter are qualified to apply for has it not been taught if a man found a slaughtered chicken in the market or if he said to his agent go and slaughter an animal and subsequently found it slaughtered it is presumed to have been ritually slaughtered this proves that we apply the principle that the majority of those who slaughter are qualified in our case too should we not apply this principle the actual facts of our case are that he knows that the slaughterer is not conversant with the rules at all and that the latter has cut one of the organs of the throat in his presence properly according to ritual now it might be said since he has cut the one organ properly he will cut the other just as well Rab therefore teaches us that we may not assume such to be the case because it might just as well be that it happened merely by chance that he cut the one organ properly but in the cutting of the other he might pause or Press Ardimi B. Joseph put to Arnam in the following questions If a man said to his agent go and slaughter an animal and he subsequently found it slaughtered what is the law he replied it is presumed to have been ritually slaughtered if a man said to his agent go and set aside the terimah and he subsequently found it set aside what is the law he replied it is not presumed to have been validly set aside as terimah he thereupon contended what is your opinion if you hold that there is a presumption that an agent carries out his instructions then apply it also to the case of terimah and if you hold that there is no presumption that an agent carries out his instructions then even in the case of Shechita it should not be presumed
be eaten and furthermore if they were found on a public rubbish heap both agree that they are forbidden the issue between them is only in the case where they were found on the rubbish heap of a private house one are Judah is of the opinion that a man is wont to cast a nibla onto the rubbish heap in his house while the other are Hannah is of the opinion that a man is not wont to cast a nibla onto the rubbish heap in his house the master stated said rabbi our Judah's view is acceptable to me in the case where the kids or chickens were found on a rubbish heap now what kind of rubbish heap is meant shall I say a public rubbish heap but you have said above that both agree that in such a case they are forbidden to be eaten it must then be a rubbish heap of a private house now consider the next statement of rabbi and our Hannah's view is acceptable to me in the case where they were found in a house what is meant by in a house shall I say in the house itself but you have said above that in such a case both agree that they are permitted to be eaten it must then be on the rubbish heap of a private house is there not then a contradiction between these two statements of Rabbi Talmud, Mosul and B this is what you Rabbi meant to say the view of Arjuda is acceptable to Arhana the son of Arhose the Galilean in the case where they were found on a public rubbish heap for the latter differs from Arjuda only in the case where they were found on the rubbish heap of a private house but agrees with him if they were found on a public rubbish heap and the view of Arhana is acceptable etc except a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor lest they invalidate their slaughtering it does not say lest they have invalidated it says lest they invalidate the said Rabbi proves that one may not give them even common beasts to slaughter in the first instance and if any of these slaughtered while others were standing over them their slaughtering is valid who is the author of the statement which suggests that one does not require to have the intention to slaughter according to ritual Rabbi answered it is our Nathan for Ashai Jr. of the collegiates learned if one threw a knife intending to thrust it into a wall and in its flight it slaughtered an animal in the usual way our Nathan declares the slaughtering valid but the sages declare it invalid and Ashai having learned this very added that the halacha was in accordance with our Nathan's view. But do we not require a forward and backward motion in slaughtering there was here a forward and backward motion in the usual way our high Ab reported that our Yohanan raised the following question does the law recognize the expression of the intention of a minor or not said our Ami to our high he might as well have put the question in regard to the act of a minor why did he not put the question in regard to the act of a minor presumably because we have learned that the law recognizes. The act of a minor is sufficient evidence of his intention for the same reason he need not have put the question in regard to the expression of the intention of a minor because we have learned that the law does not recognize the expression of the intention of a minor as sufficient evidence of his intention for we have learned acorns or pomegranates or nuts which children hollowed out in order to measure sand therewith or which they fashioned into scales are susceptible to uncleanness. Because the law reckons as the act of a minor is sufficient evidence of his intention Talmud, Mastral and Ahad not the mere expression of his intention he replied he certainly did not put the question in regard to the mere expression of the intention of a minor what he asked was whether his intention could be inferred from his act for example there stood an animal intended for a burnt offering on the south side of the altar and the minor brought it to the north side and Slaughtered it there should we say that since he brought it to the north side and slaughtered it there it is clear that he had the proper intention or should we rather say that he did not find a convenient place in the south but has not our Yohanan already expressed his view in such a case for we have learned if a man took his fruit up to the roof in order to keep it free from maggots and dew fell upon it it does not come within the rule of if water be put if however he had the intention that the dew should fall upon it it comes within the rule of if water be put if it was taken up by a deaf mute and imbecile or a minor it does not come within the rule of if water be put even though they had the intention that the dew should fall upon it because the law recognizes the act of a minor but not mere intention and our Yohanan explained that this rule only applies where they did not turn the fruit over but if they did turn the fruit over it comes within the rule of if water be put the question our Yohanan put was this was this rule laid down by the Torah or only by the rabbis Arnam and B. Isaac gives this version of the foregoing argument Arhai B. Abba said that our Yohanan put this question does the law recognize the act of a minor as sufficient evidence of his expressed intention or not said Rmi to Arhai he might as well have put the question in regard to the expression of the intention of a minor why did he not put the question in regard to the expression of the intention of a minor because we have learned that the law does not recognize the expression of the intention of a minor as sufficient evidence of his intention for the same reason he need not have put the question in regard to the act of a minor because we have learned that the law recognizes the act of a minor as sufficient evidence of his expressed intention the question our Yohanan put was this is this rule laid down by the Torah or only by the rabbis and our Yohanan himself Solved that the act of a minor as sufficient evidence of his unexpressed intention is recognized even by the Torah. The mere expression of his intention is not recognized even by the rabbis. The unexpressed intention of the minor evidence from his act is not recognized by the Torah, but only by the rabbi Samuel. Put the following question to our Hunawans. Do we know that an act performed incidentally in connection with sacrifices is invalid? He replied, Because it is written and he shall slaughter the bullet, thus teaching that the slaughtering should be intended for a bullet. Thereupon Samuel said, This we already know, but once do we know that this rule is indispensable? He replied, It is written, Ye shall slaughter it at your will, that is to say, slaughter it intentionally. Mishnah, that which is slaughtered by G E N T L L E I S nibble and defiled by carrying Gemara, it is nibble only, but it is not prohibited for all other purposes. Who is the authority for this view? Are high be in the name of our Yohanan replied it cannot be our Eliezer for were it our Eliezer it should also be prohibited for all other purposes since he maintains that the thoughts of a Gentile are usually directed towards idolatry our M.I. said that the mission is to be interpreted thus that which is slaughtered by a Gentile is nibble but that which is slaughtered by a minute is presumed to be intended for idolatry we thus learned here what our rabbis have taught that which is slaughtered by a minute is regarded as intended for idolatry his bread as the bread of Kutians his wine as wine used for idolatry's purposes his scrolls of the law his books of soothsayers his fruit as Tebal Samad even Talmud Mosul and be his children as bastards and the first tana he holds that he would not allow his wife to prostitute herself the master stated above that which is slaughtered by a Gentile is nibble but perhaps he is a minute our in the name of Rabbi Abu answered there are no minim. Among the Gentiles, but we see that there are say the majority of Gentiles are not minim for he accepts the opinion expressed by our high Abba in the name of our Yohan and the Gentiles outside the land of Israel are not idolaters, they only continue the customs of their ancestors. Our Joseph Beman, you might state in the name of Arnaman, there are no minimum among the idolatrous nations. Now to what would this rule apply? Do you say to Sheshita, but surely if what is slaughtered by a minute who is an Israelite is prohibited, it goes without saying that what is slaughtered by a Gentile men is prohibited. Do you then say it applies to the law of casting down into a pit? But surely if a minute who is an Israelite may be cast down, it goes without saying that a Gentile man may be cast down. Our Abba said the rule applies to the matter of accepting sacrifices from them, for it has been taught of you, but not all of you, thus excluding an apostate of you, that is to say, among you Israelites is a distinction drawn. But not among the Gentiles, but are you correct in this? Perhaps this is the meaning of the very that as regards Israelites, you may accept sacrifices from the righteous, but not from the wicked. But as regards Gentiles, you may not accept sacrifices from them at all. You cannot entertain such a view, for it has been taught it would have sufficed had scripture stated a man. Why does it state a man a man to include Gentiles that they may bring either votive or free will offerings like an Israelite and defiled by carrying is not this obvious since it is nibble, it follows that it defiles by carrying. Rob answered, This is the interpretation this animal defiled by carrying, but there is another similar case where the animal even defiles men and utensils that are in the same tent, which is that it is the case of an animal slaughtered as a sacrifice to idols. This then is in accordance with the view held by our Judah B. But there is some report this statement as follows Rob answered, This is the Interpretation this animal defiled by carrying and there is another case which is similar to this one in that the animal thereto only defiled by carrying but does not defile men and utensils that are in the same tent which is that it is the case of an animal slaughtered as a sacrifice to idols this then is not in agreement with our Judah B but therefore it has
He is guilty against his own life. The slaughtering is valid. Gamara Aruna said that Hibi Rabbin in exposition on this Mishnah said in the name of Rab that the animal was nevertheless forbidden to be eaten. That same day, the colleagues thereupon suggested that the reason for this decision was that the view expressed in the Mishnah was that of Arjuna. Now, where does Arjuna express such a view? Our Abba said in the matter of readiness, for we have learned one may cut up on the Sabbath. Pumpkins for beasts or a carcass for dogs. Arjuna says it is forbidden to do so if the animal was not dead on the eve of the Sabbath, for then it would not belong to that class of things set in readiness for the Sabbath. This therefore shows that since it was not set in readiness on the eve of the Sabbath for that particular use, it is forbidden to be so used on the Sabbath. So too in the case of our Mishnah, since the animal was not set in readiness on the eve of the Sabbath for food, it is forbidden to be so used on the Sabbath. Thereupon Abbe said to him, "What a comparison!" In the case quoted, the animal was originally set in readiness to serve for human food, but now it merely serves for dogs' food. Whereas in the case of our Mishnah, the animal was originally set in readiness to serve for human food, and now too it serves for human food. He replied, "You are assuming that a living animal is intended for food. In reality, it is intended for breeding purposes. If so, why is it permitted?" On this view of Arjuna to slaughter an animal on a festival, Arabah then replied, The truth of the matter is that a living animal is intended both for breeding purposes and for food. If it is slaughtered, this act proves that it was intended originally to serve for food. If it is not slaughtered, it proves that it was intended originally for breeding purposes. But surely Arjuna does not hold bearer. Whence do we know this? Shall we say from the following barith wherein it is taught if a man bought wine from the Kutians, he may say, Let two logs which I intend later to set aside be terima ten first tithe, nine second tithe, and then after redeeming this latter tithe with money, he may drink it. This is the opinion of our Mayor Arjuna, our Jose, and our Simeon do not allow this Talmud. Mosul and B. This case is quite different for there the reasoning is expressly stated as they said to our Mayor, Do you not agree that if the cask were to break, the result would be that this person has from the outset been drinking untithed wine to this Armeyer replied when it breaks rather we can derive it from the teaching of Io for Io taught Arjuna says that a person cannot conditionally reserve for himself two contingencies simultaneously he may declare that if a sage comes to the east his Arab at the east should serve him and if to the west his Arab at the west should serve him but on no account may he make such conditions in the event of two sages coming one to the side and the other to that side now it was argued why is it that in the event of two sages coming one to the side and the other to that side that he may not make conditions it is is it not because Bararah is not held and even in the event of the sage coming to one side only either to the east or to the west he should not be allowed to make conditions for the very same reason that Bararah is not held and Aryohanan had explained that in the latter case the sage had already arrived rather said R. Joseph, it is the view of Arjuna expressed in the matter of vessels, for we have learned whatsoever vessels which may be moved on the Sabbath, fragments thereof may likewise be moved on the Sabbath, provided they can perform aught in the nature of work, e.g., fragments of a kneading trough that can be used for stopping the bunghole of a cask, or fragments of a glass for covering the mouth of a flask. Arjuna says, provided they can perform aught in the nature of their former work, e.g., fragments of a kneading trough that can have porridge poured into them, or fragments of a glass that can have oil poured into them. Now, according to Arjuna, they are permitted to be moved only if they can perform aught in the nature of their former work, but not if they can perform aught in the nature of some other work. This therefore shows that since they were not set in readiness on the eve of the Sabbath for that particular work, it is forbidden to use them for such purpose on the Sabbath, so too in the Case of our mission, since the animal was not set in readiness on the eve of the Sabbath for food, it is forbidden to be so used on the Sabbath. Thereupon, Abbe said to him, What a comparison there we are dealing with something that was originally a vessel and is now a fragment of a vessel, which is a case of Nolid and consequently forbidden. Whereas here in our mission, we are dealing with something that was originally intended for food and now too is intended for food, it is therefore the same food stuff merely more defined. And we have already ascertained that according to our Judah, where the food stuff is the same but more defined, it is permitted, for we have learned one must not press fruit on the Sabbath in order to extract the juice, and even if the juice used out by itself, it is forbidden. Our Judah says if the fruits were intended to be eaten, the juice which used out is permitted, but if they were kept only for their juice that was used out by itself, is forbidden. Our Joseph. Replied, but has it not been stated in connection there with Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel that Arjuna accepts the opinion of the rabbis in the case of baskets of olives and grapes. Now the reason for this is clear, namely since these fruits are usually kept for pressing, one would always be inclined to do so at all times. Similarly, it must be said here in the case of our Mishnah, since an animal is usually kept for slaughtering, one would always be inclined to do so. Abe replied, indeed. The whole argument is based upon Rab's original statement, is it not? And Rab has stated that Arjuna was in conflict with the rabbis, even in the case of baskets of olives and grapes. Rather said Arshis hate be it is a view of Arjuna expressed in the matter of lamps, for it has been taught a new lamp may be moved on the Sabbath from place to place, but not an old one. So according to Arjuna, but perhaps we are to understand Arjuna's view only in case of Muksa on account of nauseousness, but are we to understand that it applies also to cases of muksa in consequence of a ritual prohibition? Yes, indeed, for it has been taught. Arjuna says Talmud, Mostul, and all metal lamps may be moved on the Sabbath, excepting a lamp that has been alight on the Sabbath. But perhaps it might be suggested that in the latter case the law is exceptional, since the lamp has been put away by the hand of man. Rather said Arashi, it is a view of Arjuna expressed in the matter of cooking, for it has been taught if a man cooked food on the Sabbath inadvertently, even he himself may eat of it. But if deliberately he may not eat of it, so our Mayor Arjuna says if inadvertently he may eat of it only after the termination of the Sabbath. But if deliberately he may never eat of it, or Yohanan Hasandler says if inadvertently it may be eaten after the termination of the Sabbath by others only, but not by himself. But if deliberately it may never be eaten neither by him nor by others. But may we not explain? The mission to be the case of a deliberate act, and so in accord with our mayor's view, this cannot be for in our mission. Sabbath and the day of atonement are stated in juxtaposition, suggesting that as on the day of atonement, the one who slaughtered may on no account eat of it, whether he acted inadvertently or deliberately. So on the Sabbath, he may not eat of it, whether he acted inadvertently or deliberately. But how can you explain the mission to be a case of inadvertence? And in accord with our Judas view, does it not read notwithstanding he is guilty against his own life? This is the interpretation. Notwithstanding he is guilty against his own life, had he acted deliberately, since in our case he has acted inadvertently, the slaughtering is valid. But may we not explain the mission in accordance with our Yohanan Hasandler, who holds the view that whether he acted inadvertently or deliberately, he may never eat of it. Nay, for our Yohanan Hasandler discriminates between him and others after. The termination of the Sabbath, whereas the Tana of our Mishnah states the slaughtering is valid without discriminating between him and others. A Tana recited before Rab if a man cooked food on the Sabbath inadvertently, even he himself may eat of it, but if deliberately he may not eat of it, Rab thereupon bade him to keep silent. Now, why did Rab silence him? Was it because Rab accepts the view of Arjuna and the Tana was reciting the teaching in accordance with our Mayor's view? Is he then justified? Because he himself accepts Arjuna's view in bidding one who recites according to our Mayor's view to keep silent. Moreover, is it true to say that Rab accepts Arjuna's view as not Arhain and BM? I reported that whenever Rab laid down the rule to his disciples, he would rule according to our Mayor's view, but whenever he lectured at the public session, he would expound the law according to Arjuna's view because of the ignorant masses present. And if you will say that this Tana was reciting the teaching. In the presence of Rab at the public session, would then the public pay attention to the Tana? They would pay attention to the Amor Arnam and B. Isaac answered that the Tana recited before Rab the case of slaughtering. Thus, if a man slaughtered on the Sabbath inadvertently, he himself may eat of it, but if deliberately he may not eat of it. Whereupon Rab said to him, You are inclined, no doubt, to accept our Mayor's view, but even so, our Mayor adopts a lenient view only in the case
Ill on the Sabbath it may not be eaten by a healthy person e.g. where a pumpkin was plucked out of the ground on the Sabbath and cooked Ardemi Ogni Hartia said the law is that where a man slaughtered on the Sabbath for an invalid the meat may be eaten raw by a healthy person what is the reason inasmuch as one cannot have even an olive's bulk of meat without slaughtering the animal it is clear that the slaughtering was done for the sake of the invalid but where a man cooked on the Sabbath for an invalid the food may not be eaten by a healthy person for otherwise it is to be feared lest a greater amount will be cooked on account of the healthy person mission if one slaughtered with the smooth edge of a hand sickle with a flint or with a reed the slaughtering is valid all may slaughter at all times one may slaughter with any implement one may slaughter excepting a side a saw teeth or a fingernail since these strangle gamara the expression if one slaughtered implies that the slaughtering is valid only after the act but it does not imply right in the first instance now this view is reasonable in the case of a hand sickle for it is always to be feared lest one will slaughter with the other edge but is it right to say that one may not slaughter with a flint or reed in the first instance is there not an obvious contradiction from the following very with any implement one may slaughter with a flint with glass or with a reed home it is no Contradiction for the latter statement refers to a reed or flint that is detached from the ground whereas our mission refers to a reed or flint that is attached to the ground for our Kahana reported if one slaughtered with an implement that was attached to the ground Rabbi declares the slaughtering invalid but our high declares it valid and even our high declares it valid only after the act but there is no right to do so in the first instance now what is the position our mission is in agreement with our high and the slaughtering is valid only after the act and what of the following which was taught with any implement one may slaughter whether it be detached or attached whether the knife be on top and the throat below or the knife below and the throat on top who can be the author of this very thing it can be neither Rabbi nor our high if our high the slaughtering is valid only after the act but not in the first instance if Rabbi such slaughtering is invalid even after the act in truth the author is our high and he is indeed of the opinion that such slaughtering is permitted even in the first instance and as to the reason why the dispute is reported with regard to the validity of such slaughtering after the act it is in order to demonstrate the strong view of rabbis if this be so what of our mission which reads if one slaughtered implying that it is valid only after the act but not a right in the first instance who can be the author thereof it can be neither rabbi nor our high if our high the slaughtering should be permitted even in the first instance if rabbi it is always invalid even after the act in truth the author of the beritha is our high who holds that such slaughtering is permitted even in the first instance and as to our mission which reads if one slaughtered the author of it is rabbi but is not rabbi then contradicting himself there is no contradiction for in the one case the implement had always been so attached by nature whereas in the other case the implement was first loose and subsequently attached once do you know that a distinction is to be drawn between that which was always attached and that which was first loose and subsequently attached from the following barrier which was taught if one slaughtered with a will the slaughtering is valid with an implement that was attached to the ground the slaughtering is valid if one inserted a knife into a wall and slaughtered moving the throat of the animal to and fro across the knife the slaughtering is valid if there was a sharp flint jutting from the wall or a regrowing of itself and one slaughtered there with the slaughtering is invalid talmud masculine and now is there not a contradiction here this proves that there is a distinction between that which was always attached and that which was first loose and subsequently attached this is proved the master said if one slaughtered with a will the slaughtering is valid but was it not taught in another Barry that the slaughtering is invalid it is no contradiction for the former Barry that deals with the potter's will whereas the latter with the will turned by water if you wish however I can say that in both Barry the will was turned by water and yet there is no contradiction for in the former case it was turned by the first onrush of the water whereas in the latter case it was turned by the subsequent onrush of the water and this distinction is in agreement with our purpose. Statement who said that if a man bound his neighbor and turned onto him a jet of water so that the victim died he is culpable what is the reason that the water jet is as it were his arrow wherewith the victim has been attacked but this is the law only in the case where the victim was killed by the first onrush of the water but not where he was killed by the subsequent onrush of the water for then the act was but the indirect cause of the death rab was once sitting behind Arhaya. Whilst Arhai was before Rabbi when Rabbi in session expounded the following once is it derived that the slaughtering must be performed with a detached implement from this verse and he took the knife to slay Rab then asked Arhai what can he mean he replied it is just idle talk but does he not a disperse the verse merely serves to show the enthusiasm of Abraham Rabbi stated I have no doubt at all that in the law concerning idolatry an object which was first loose and subsequently attached to the ground is regarded as detached for Rab has ruled that if a man worshipped his own house it thereby becomes forbidden to be used for any purpose now if you were to hold that such an object is to be regarded as attached wherefore is the house forbidden is it not written ye shall surely destroy their gods upon the mountains but not the mountains which are themselves their gods in the law concerning the susceptibility of plants to become unclean it is the subject of dispute. Between Tanaim for we have learned if one inverted a dish and placed it upon a wall in order that the dish might be washed by the rainwater and the rainwater subsequently ran off the dish onto footstuffs the rule of if water be put applies if however it was placed in order that the wall might not be damaged and the rainwater ran off the dish onto the footstuffs the rule of if water be put does not apply now is there not an inconsistency here the first clause reads if in order that the dish might be washed the rule of if water be put applies it follows however that if one placed it in order that the wall might be washed and the rainwater subsequently fell on the footstuffs the rule of if water be put does not apply yet the second clause reads if it was placed in order that the wall might not be damaged the rule of if water be put does not apply it follows however that if it was placed in order that the wall might be washed and the rainwater subsequently fell on it Footstuffs the rule of if water be put applies our Eliezer replied you must break up this mission for he who taught the first clause could not have taught the second our papa however answered indeed the whole was taught by one tana but the first clause deals with the wall of a cave whereas the second clause deals with the built-up wall accordingly the mission is to be read thus if one inverted a dish and placed it upon a wall in order that the dish might be washed the rule of if water be put applies from which it follows that if one placed it in order that the wall might be washed the rule of if water be put does not apply now this is stated only in the case of a cave wall but in the case of a built-up wall the law is if one placed it in order that the wall might not be damaged the rule of if water be put does not apply from which it follows that if one placed it in order that the wall might be washed the rule of if water be put applies Robin now raised the question Talmud Moss Chulin be in the law concerning slaughtering how are we to regard an implement which was first loose and subsequently attached come and here if there was a sharp stone jutting from the wall or a regrowing of itself and one slaughtered there with the slaughtering is invalid it is dealing here with the wall of a cave indeed the context proves this for it puts wall in juxtaposition with the regrowing of itself this is proved come and here if one inserted a knife into a wall and slaughtered it slaughtering is valid this case is different because one would not allow the knife to remain fixed to the wall come and here if one slaughtered with an implement that was attached to the ground the slaughtering is valid perhaps this clause is defined by the subsequent clause of this very thus what is meant by an implement that was attached a knife which clearly would not remain fixed permanently the master said if one inserted a knife into a wall and slaughtered the slaughtering is Valid said Arain in the name of Samuel this is a law provided the knife was on top and the throat of the animal below if however the knife was below and the throat of the animal on top the slaughtering is invalid for it is to be feared that the head might press down heavily upon the knife but does not the aforementioned bury the read whether the knife be below and the throat on top or the knife on top and the throat below are but answered the cases are to be interpreted each in its own way thus whether the knife be below and the throat on top where the knife is loose or the knife on top and the throat below where the knife is attached our papa answered the bury that deals with the slaughtering of a bird which is of lightweight our histah stated in the name of our Isaac others report that it was taught in the bury that his five rules have been laid down in connection with the read home I one must not slaughter with it two one must not perform circumcision with it three one must not Cut flesh with it for one must not pick the teeth with it be one must not cleanse oneself with it one must not slaughter with it but has it not been taught one may slaughter with
Former restriction the Mishnah therefore teaches us at all times one may slaughter to the Sar Joseph the Mert in the first place why does the Mishnah read at all times one may slaughter it should read at all times one may slaughter and eat the flesh and in the second place why were they forbidden in the beginning surely because they were near to the sanctuary and why were they permitted subsequently similarly because they were far away from the sanctuary Talmud, Mosul and the Venice. They are not all the more reason for them to be permitted now that they are even further away from the sanctuary rather said our Joseph the Tana of our Mishnah is our Akiba for it has been taught it is written if the place which the Lord thy God will choose to put his name there be too far from thee then thou shalt slaughter of thy herd and of thy flock this verse says our Akiba is stated specially in order to prohibit the flesh of a stabbed animal for in the beginning the Israelites were permitted to eat the flesh of a stabbed animal but on entering the land of Israel they were forbidden but now that they are in exile it might be said that they should revert to their former license the Mishnah therefore teaches us at all times one may slaughter wherein do they differ our Akiba maintains that at no time was it ever forbidden to eat flesh and will our Ishmael maintains that at no time was it ever permitted to eat the flesh of a stabbed animal now according to our Ishmael the verse and he shall Slaughter the bullock is of significance, but according to our Akiba, what is the purpose of and he shall slaughter in the case of consecrated animals? The law is different again. According to our Ishmael, the verse shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them is of significance, but according to our Akiba, why does the verse read be slaughtered for them? It should rather read be stabbed for them. The stabbing of animals constituted their slaughtering again. According to our Ishmael, we can understand what we learned if a man slaughtered a wild animal or a bird and it became nibbled under his hand, or if he stabbed it or he tore away the organs of the throat, there is no obligation to cover the blood. But according to our Akiba, wherefore is there no obligation to cover the blood since stabbing became prohibited? It is regarded as an unlawful slaughtering now. According to our Akiba, who maintains that at no time was it ever forbidden to eat flesh, and will the significance of the verse how be it is it? Gazelle and as the heart is eaten so shalt thou eat thereof the unclean and the clean may eat thereof alike is evident but according to our Ishmael the verse is incomprehensible for was the gazelle or the heart ever permitted to be eaten at all when the divine law prohibited the eating of flesh and will it was only the flesh of an animal that was fit for a sacrifice but not the flesh of a wild animal that was not fit for a sacrifice our Jeremiah raised the following question what was the law regarding portions of meat of stabbed animals that were brought into the land of Israel by the Israelites but then at what period could this question have arisen should you say during the seven years of conquest behold they were permitted to eat unclean things for it is written and houses full of all good things and our Jeremiah be abstated till the name of Rab that even bacon was permitted can there then be any question regarding the flesh of a stabbed animal the question could have arisen only after this period if you wish however I can say that the question refers to the seven years period of conquest and it would have arisen since it might be argued that when permission was granted it was only with regard to the spoil taken from the idolaters but not their own stabbed meat the question remains unanswered Robert remarked you have interpreted the clause all may slaughter and so too the clause at all times one may slaughter but how do you interpret the final clause with any implement one may slaughter should you say it means whether with a flint or a glass or a reed there is this difficulty behold it is in juxtaposition with the other clauses in our mission if there are the other clauses deal with the subjects that may slaughter this also must deal with the subjects that may slaughter and if the others deal with the subjects that are to be slaughtered this also must deal with the subjects that are to be slaughtered rather said Rob interpret the mission Thus all may slaughter is stated twice one to include a kutian and the other to include an Israelite apostate at all times one may slaughter whether by day or by night whether on the rooftop or on the top of a ship with any implement one may slaughter with a flint or a glass or a reed home excepting a scythe and a saw the father of Samuel made a notch in a knife and sent it up to Palestine and also on another occasion he made a notch and sent it up whereupon the authority sent back. Word to him we have been taught in the Mishnah a saw or rabbis taught Talmud, Mosul and be a knife with many notches must be regarded as a saw with but one notch if it is ogreth it may not be used if it is mesoxed it may be used what is meant by ogreth and what is meant by mesoxed ogreth said our Eliezer is a notch with two edges mesoxed the notch with but one edge why is it that if the notch has two edges the knife is invalid presumably because the first edge will cut it. Skin and flesh and the second edge will tear the organs and even if the notch has but one edge it should likewise be said the sharp edge of the knife will cut the skin and flesh and the notch will tear the organs the reference is to a notch that is at the top of the knife but even so when the knife is moved forward the edge of the notch cuts the skin and flesh and when it is drawn back it tears the organs the reference is where the slaughter removed the knife forward but did not draw it back Robbis stated there are three rules with regard to the knife I, if it has an ogre one may not slaughter with it and if one did the slaughtering is invalid two if it has a mesox one may not slaughter with it in the first instance but if one did the slaughtering is valid three if its edges uneven one may slaughter with it even in the first instance are who not the son of Arnim I ask Arashi did you teach us in the name of Robbis that a knife with a mesox is unfit for Use is it not well known that Rabbah said a knife with a mesox is fit for use it is no contradiction for in the one case the slaughter removed the knife forward and backward but in the other case he moved the knife forward but not backward Araha the son of Ara we asked Arashi what if the edge of the knife resembles an on he replied with that we were given such meat to eat Ar Hisda said once do we learn from scripture that it is necessary to examine the slaughtering knife from it verse and slaughter with this and eat but is it not obviously necessary so to do seeing that if the gullet is perforated the animal is true we mean once do we learn from scripture that it is essential that the knife be examined by a sage but surely has not Ar Yohanan said that the ruling that one must present the knife to a sage for examination was laid down only out of respect to the sage the rule is actually rabbinic and the verse is merely a support in the west the knife is Usually examined by the light of the sun in Nihardia, it is usually examined with water. Arshi's head used to examine it with the tip of his tongue. Our Ahabi Jacob used to examine it with a hair in Surah. It was said, seeing that it is to cut flesh, it must be examined with flesh. Our Papa ruled it must be examined with the flesh of the finger and with the fingernail, and the examination must be of the three edges of the knife. Rabbin has said to Arashi, Arsama, the son of Armeshir, she had told us in your name that you said to him in the name of Rabbin that it must be examined with the flesh and the nail on the three edges. Arashi replied, I said with the flesh and the nail, but not on the three edges. Another version reads, Arashi replied, I said with the flesh and the nail on the three edges, but not in the name of Rabbin. And Araha, the son of Rabbin, were sitting before Arashi when a knife was brought to Arashi for examination. He thereupon asked Araha to examine it, who did so with the flesh of his finger and with his fingernail on the three edges of the knife well done said our Ashi Arkahana held a similar view our Yamar said it must be examined with the nail and the flesh but not on the three edges for did not our Zara say in the name of Samuel that if one made a knife red hot and slaughtered with it the slaughtering is valid because the effect of the sharp edge precedes the effect of the heat and the question was raised as to the size of the knife and the answer was given that the cut opens wide then. In this case too we should also say that the cut opens wide our Huna son of Arkatna said in the name of our Simeon be in three matters the Lord regards a notch as of consequence I a notch in the bone of the paschal lamb to a notch in the ear of a male firstling three a notch in any organ which it blemished invalidates a sacrifice our histiads for also a notch in the slaughtering knife and why does not the other teacher include this last because he does not deal with unconsecrated matters. In all these cases a notch is measured by the standard of a notch which renders the altar unfit Talmud, Mastulin A and what is the size of a notch which renders the altar unfit such a notch as would catch the fingernail when passed over it an objection was raised it was taught what size of notch renders the altar unfit our Simeon B. He says the size of a handbreadth our Eliezer B. Jacob says the size of an olive this is no objection for the opinions in this very the refer to an altar of cement whereas here we are dealing with an altar of stones are who not said a slaughterer who does not present his knife to a sage for examination is to be placed under the ban Rabbah said he is to be removed from his
is no contradiction for Rabba's statement deals with a single tooth whereas our Mishnah deals with two teeth and as regards a fingernail there is no contradiction for Rabba's statement deals with a nail that is detached from the finger whereas our Mishnah deals with a nail that is attached to the finger Mishnah if one slaughtered with a scythe moving it forward only Beth Shammai declare the slaughtering invalid and Beth Hillel declare it valid if the teeth of the scythe were filed away. It is regarded as an ordinary knife Imar Arhai B. Abba said in the name of our Yohan and even when Beth Hillel declared the slaughtering valid they intended thereby to teach that the animal was to be regarded as clean and not a nibble of but as for eating it they certainly held that it was forbidden Our Ashi said this is supported by the context for it reads in the Mishnah Beth Shammai declare the slaughtering invalid and Beth Hillel declare it valid but it does not read Beth Shammai forbid it and Beth Hillel permit it but according to your argument should not the Mishnah read Beth Shammai declare it unclean and Beth Hillel declare it clean the fact is that the expressions declare valid and invalid and permit and forbid are synonymous Mishnah if one slaughtered by cutting at the top ring of the windpipe and left a hair's breadth of its entire circumference towards the head the slaughtering is valid our Jose son of Arjuda says if only there was left towards the head a hair's Breadth of the greater part of its circumference, the slaughtering is valid. Gemara Rab and Samuel both agree that the law is in accordance with the view of our Jose son of Arjuda. Howbeit, our Jose son of Arjuda said this only with regard to the top ring, since the cartilage surrounds the windpipe entirely. But he did not say this with regard to the other rings. But does he not hold such a view with regard to the other rings? Surely it has been taught. Our Jose son of Arjuda says Talmud, Mastulin. B. If one slaughtered by cutting in the other rings, although they do not surround the whole of it, yet since they surround the greater part of the windpipe, the slaughtering is valid. Any deflection of the knife outside the top ring invalidates the slaughtering. Our Hanna B. Antigonos testified that a deflection is permitted. Our Joseph answered that our Jose son of Arjuda gave both rulings, but Rab and Samuel agreed with one and not with the other. But do they not say he did not say this, etc.? They mean. To imply the Halachah is in accordance with the view of our Jose son of Arjuda with regard to the top ring but the Halachah is not in accordance with his view with regard to the other rings when Arzara went up to Palestine he ate there of an animal which was slaughtered in that part of the throat which was regarded as a deflection by Rab and Samuel he was asked are you not from the place of Rab and Samuel he replied who taught it in the name of Rab and Samuel was it not Joseph Bihai? Well Joseph Bihai took traditions from everyone when our Joseph Bihai heard of this he was annoyed and said when I take my traditions from everyone indeed I received my traditions from Rab Judah who recited in his statements of tradition even the doubt as to his authority says in the following statement Rab Judah said in the name of our Jeremiah Bihai and I am in doubt whether he reported it in the name of Rab or in the name of Samuel three ordinary persons may declare a firstling. Permitted for use where there is no specialist available but does not Arzara accept the rule when a person arrives in a town he must adopt the restrictions of the place which he has left and also the restrictions of the place he has entered this rule applies only when one travels from town to town in Babylon or from town to town in the land of Israel or from the land of Israel to Babylon but when one travels from Babylon to the land of Israel inasmuch as we are subject to their authority we must adopt their customs Arashi said you may even hold that the rule applies when one travels from Babylon to the land of Israel but only when such a person intends to return Arzara however had no intention to return to Babylon Abbe remarked to our Joseph the rabbis who came from Mahuza report in the name of Arnaman that this deflection is permitted he replied every river has its own course our Simeon Belakish held that if the windpipe was cut at the top of the thyroid cartilage Slaughtering was valid. Our Yohan and thereupon exclaimed, "Too bold indeed! Too bold!" Our Poppy reported in the name of Rabba, "If the knife reached the arytenoid cartilages, the slaughtering is invalid." The question was raised: Does reach mean that it actually touched the cartilages, as in the verse, and he fell upon him and slew him, or does it mean that it came close to but did not touch the cartilages, as in the verse, and the angels of God met him? It was stated, "Our Papa said in the name of Rabba, if it knife cut through the arytenoid cartilages, leaving part of them on the side of the head, the slaughtering is valid." Amimar Bimar said, "I was once standing in the presence of Arhai, the son of Arwia, and he told me that if the knife cut through the arytenoid cartilages, leaving part of them on the side of the head, the slaughtering is valid." Rabba said to our Ashi, our Shaman of Sakara told me that Marzitra once happened to come to our town and ruled that if the knife cut through the Arytenoid cartilages leaving part of them on the side of the head the slaughtering is valid Mar son of Arashi said if the knife reached the arytenoid cartilages the slaughtering is valid if however the knife cut through the arytenoid cartilages leaving part of them on the side of the head the slaughtering is invalid Talmud, Mastulin but the law is if the windpipe was cut at or below the point where the thyroid cartilage narrows the slaughtering is valid this then corresponds with the aforementioned view that if the knife cut through the arytenoid cartilages leaving part of them on the side of the head the slaughtering is valid Arnaman held that the slaughtering was valid if the windpipe was cut at or below the point where the thyroid cartilage narrows Arhan and son of Arkatan asked Arnaman but whose view do you adopt it is neither the view of the rabbis nor that of our Jose son of Arjuda of our Mishnah he replied I know no hillock and no bilik, I only know it. Tradition for our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan, some read our Abba B's Abba said in the name of our Hannah, and others read our Jacob B. E. D. said in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, or below the point where the thyroid cartilage narrows the slaughtering is valid. Our Joshua B. Levi also said that which is regarded as a deflection by the rabbis is permitted by our Jose B. Judah, and that which is regarded as a deflection by our Jose B. Judah is permitted by our Hannah B. Antigonos is not this obvious. You might have thought that the statement of our Hannah B. Antigonos refers to that of the rabbis. We are therefore taught that it does not, but perhaps it does. If so, it should read he testified concerning it that it was permitted. The law is in accordance with the view of our Hannah B. Antigonos, since our agrees with him. Our said in the name of our C. They differ only where the slaughterer cut two thirds of the windpipe in the top ring, and then the last third above it for the rabbis hold it. View that all the slaughtering must be within the top ring and our Jose son of Arjuda holds a view that the greater portion is equal to the whole but in the case where the slaughterer first cut a third above the top ring and then the other two thirds in it all are of the opinion that the slaughtering is invalid because at the moment when the life escapes the greater portion should have been cut in the ritual manner and this was not the case here said Arhis to him on the contrary the master might just as well say the opposite thus they differ only where the slaughterer first cut a third above the top ring and then the other two thirds in it according to our Jose son of Arjuda it is analogous with the case where half the windpipe was mutilated before the slaughtering and according to the rabbis it is to be distinguished thus in the latter case the mutilation was in the prescribed area for slaughtering whereas in our case the cutting of the first third was outside the Prescribed area for slaughtering, but where the slaughterer first cut two thirds in the top ring and then the last third above it, all are of the opinion that the slaughtering is valid. For we have learned in a mission the greater part of an organ is equivalent to the whole of it. Our Joseph said to him, Who can tell us that the rule there concerning the greater portion is not the view of our Jose son of Arjuda? It might indeed be the individual opinion of our Jose son of Arjuda. Abbe interposed, Are you suggesting that wherever it is held that a majority is sufficient, it is the individual opinion of our Jose son of Arjuda? He replied, I mean that the view that a majority is sufficient in matters concerning Sheshita is the individual opinion of our Jose son of Arjuda. For we know that the rabbis hold a different view. Another version of the above reads as follows Arhuna said in the name of RC, they differ only where the slaughterer first cut a third above the top ring and then it. Other two thirds in it, according to our Jose son of Arjuda, it is analogous with the case where half the windpipe was mutilated before the slaughtering, and according to the rabbis, it is to be distinguished. Thus, in the latter case, the mutilation was within the prescribed area for slaughtering, whereas in our case, the cutting of the first third was outside the prescribed area for slaughtering. But in the case where the slaughterer first cut two thirds in the top ring, and then the last third above
Slaughtering was invalid. Rav Judah heard of this and became annoyed, saying, "What I say invalid, he says valid, and what I say valid, he says invalid." Arhu not and said, "He is rightly annoyed." In the first place, he heard the decision from Rav himself, and I did not. And in the second place, in this case, the greater portion of the cutting was in the ritual manner. Thereupon Arhis said to him, "Do not withdraw your decision, Talmud. Mastulin be Talmud. Mastulin be, because if you do, you defeat your decision. In the first case, for there your reason for declaring it valid was that the life escaped at the time that he was cutting within the prescribed area. It follows then that in this case it should be invalid because here the life escaped at the time that he was cutting outside the prescribed area. When Arnaman once happened to come to Surah, he was asked, "What is the law of the slaughter? First cut a third of the windpipe within the prescribed area, another third outside it, and the last third." Within it he replied, Is not this the case that was taught by our Eliezer Bimanyamai? For our Eliezer Bimanyamai said, Where the cutting of the organ is like a zigzag, the slaughtering is valid, but perhaps this decision applies only to a slaughtering entirely within the prescribed area within the prescribed area. But this goes without saying that the slaughtering is valid. Indeed, no, for you might have thought that there must be an open cut, and here it is not so. We are therefore taught that it is not. Essential Nemonic Bakit Arava was once sitting behind Arkahana whilst Arkahana was before Rabjuda when Arkahana asked, What is the law of the slaughterer? First cut a third of the windpipe within the prescribed area, another third outside it, and the last third within it. Rabjuda answered, The slaughtering is valid, and what is the law of the slaughterer? First cut a third of the windpipe outside the prescribed area, another third within it, and the last third outside it. He replied, Slaughtering is invalid, and what is the law of the slaughterer? Cut the windpipe in an existing gash. He replied, The slaughtering is valid, and what is the law of the slaughterer? Cut the windpipe terminating in an existing gash in the windpipe. He replied, The slaughtering is invalid. Our Abba then went and reported these decisions to our Eliezer, and the latter went and reported them to our Yohanan. Our Yohanan asked, Wherein lies the difference? He, our Eliezer, replied, The case where one cut the windpipe in an existing gash is the same as when a Gentile began the slaughtering, and an Israelite finished it, and the case where one cut the windpipe terminating in an existing gash is the same as when an Israelite began the slaughtering, and a Gentile finished it. Whereupon our Yohanan exclaimed, Gentile, Gentile, Rabba said he was right in exclaiming, Gentile, Gentile, for in that case where the Gentile finished the slaughtering, the decision is reasonable because the Israelite should have cut at least it. Greater portion and this he did not do with the result that life escaped at the hand of the Gentile in this case however where there is a gash in the windpipe he has indeed cut as much as he could what difference therefore can there be whether he cuts in a gash or cuts terminating in a gash mission if one cut at the side of the neck the slaughtering is valid if one nipped off the head from the side of the neck the nipping is invalid if one cut at the back of the neck the slaughtering is invalid if one nipped off the head from the back of the neck the nipping is valid if one cut at the front of the neck the slaughtering is valid if one nipped off the head from the front of the neck the nipping is invalid for the whole of the back of the neck is the appropriate place for nipping and the whole of the front of the neck is the appropriate place for slaughtering it follows therefore that the place which is appropriate for slaughtering is inappropriate for nipping and the place which is appropriate for nipping is inappropriate for slaughtering tomorrow. What is meant by the back of the neck? Does it mean the actual back of the neck? If so, why is it that only if one slaughtered there it is invalid? If one nipped there it would also be invalid. For in the divine law it is stated close to the back of its neck, but not the actual back of the head. The back of the neck really means the region close to the back of the neck, and this is indicated in the subsequent clause, which reads for the whole of the back of the neck is the appropriate place for nipping. Once do we know this from the following statement? Our rabbis taught close to the back of its neck, that is to say, the region which overlooks the back of the neck, as it is written, and they dwell close to me, and it is also written, for they have turned unto me the back of the neck, and not the face. Why another verse? Because you might argue that so long as we do not know the true meaning of the back of the neck, we cannot know what is meant by the region which is close to it therefore come and here it is written for they have turned unto me the back of the neck and not the face thus clearly showing that the back of the neck is directly opposite the face the sons of our high said this is the proper method for nipping the priest twists the organs of the throat around to the back of the neck and then nips off the head some red may twist others must twist it is more reasonable however to adopt it reading may twist why for the mission reads if one cut at the back of the neck the slaughtering is invalid if one nipped off the head from the back of the neck the nipping is valid talmud mastulin and now if you adopt the reading must twist then why is it that only if one nipped off the head there it is valid even if one slaughtered there it would also be valid you can therefore prove from this that the correct reading is may twist and as for our mission of the cases that the organs we're not twisted around and therefore the slaughtering is invalid. Arjan A said let these young men receive the refutation of their view for our mission reads IT follows therefore that the place which is appropriate for slaughtering is inappropriate for nipping and the place which is appropriate for nipping is inappropriate for slaughtering. Now what does this rule exclude? Presumably the case where one twisted the organs around to the back of the neck. Rabbi Barhana said it is not so but it excludes the use of a tooth or a fingernail but is not a tooth or a fingernail expressly stated to be invalid for slaughtering. Rather said our Jeremiah it excludes the act of moving to and fro. This is well however according to the one who holds that to move the fingernail to and fro whilst nipping is not allowed but according to the one who holds that it is allowed how is it to be explained the sons of our high agree with him who holds that to move the fingernail to and fro whilst Nipping is not allowed. Arkahana said the precept of nipping requires pressing with the fingernail downward, and this is the proper method. Now Arabin thought this to mean that if he pressed with his fingernail downward, it is valid, but if he moved it to and fro, it is not valid. Whereupon our Jeremiah said to him, But surely to move the fingernail to and fro whilst nipping is most certainly allowed. And as for the words, this is the proper method. Read instead, this also is a proper method. R. Jeremiah said in the name of Samuel, whatsoever part of the front of the neck is valid for slaughtering, the corresponding part on the back of the neck is valid for nipping. It follows no doubt that what is invalid for slaughtering is invalid for nipping. Now what does this exclude? Can it exclude the case where the organs of the throat had been torn loose? Surely not for Rami B. Ezekiel has taught the fact that the organs of the throat have been torn loose is not a defect in the bird. Our Papa said it. Excludes the head the head, but this is obvious for the divine long joints close to the back of its neck, but not on the head by head. He meant the slope of the head, and the cases as follows. He commenced to nip at the slope of the head, and moving his fingernail gradually downwards ended the nipping below. This view is in agreement with that stated by Arhuna in the name of RC for Arhuna said in the name of RC if one cut a third of the windpipe outside the prescribed area for slaughtering and then cut two thirds within it, the slaughtering is invalid. Araha the son of Rabba said to Arashi the stick of Rami B. Ezekiel, namely the fact that the organs have been torn loose is not a defect in the bird can be maintained only by him who holds that according to the law of the Torah birds do not require Sheshita Talmud, Mastulin B, but according to the one who holds that birds do require Sheshita by the law of the Torah, then it must also be held that the tearing loose of the organs is a defect. Arashi retorted on the contrary. The reverse argument is the more reasonable. Thus, according to him who holds that birds do require Sheshita by the law of the Torah, it can well be argued that he was expressly informed that the tearing loose of the organs in the case of birds was not a defect. Furthermore, even according to him who obtains this result by analogy with cattle, it can nevertheless be argued that as regards the tearing loose of the organs, he was informed that birds are to be different from cattle. But according to the one who holds that birds do not require Sheshita by the law of the Torah, but only by rabbinic enactment, and the rabbis obviously derived this rule only by a comparison with cattle. Surely, then birds should be compared with cattle in all respects. Rabbin answered Rabin because he told me that the dictum of Rami B. Ezekiel, namely the fact that the organs have been torn loose, is not a defect in a bird, is to be applied only to the case of. Nipping, but in the case of slaughtering, it is certainly a defect. But did not our Jeremiah report in the name of Samuel whatsoever part of the neck is valid for slaughtering? The corresponding part on the back of the neck is valid for nipping, and from which followed the
This latter case he does so merely to carry out the precept of severance if so the skin too should be severed the rule is whatever is indispensable in the slaughtering is indispensable in the precept of severance and whatever is not indispensable in the slaughtering is not indispensable in the precept of severance but what of the lesser portion of each organ which is not indispensable in the slaughtering nevertheless according to the ruling of the rabbis is indispensable in the precept of severance read therefore whatever comes within the purview of slaughtering comes within the precept of severance and whatever does not come within the purview of slaughtering does not come within the precept of severance Talmud, Mastulin but after all does not the original objection stand Rabbah answered read in the text this is what he does he the priest cuts with his fingernail the spinal cord and the neck bone without cutting through the major portion of the surrounding flesh. When Arzera went up to Palestine he found RMI sitting and reciting the above statement of Zeiri and at once put to him the question why proceed with the nipping if it is already dead he was astounded for a moment but then replied read in the text this is what he does he cuts with his fingernail the spinal cord and the neck bone without cutting through the major portion of the surrounding flesh the same is taught in the following Barita how must he the priest nip off the head of the sin offering of a bird he cuts with his fingernail the spinal cord and the neck bone without cutting through the major portion of the surrounding flesh until he reaches the gullet or the windpipe on reaching the gullet or the windpipe he cuts through one of them or the major portion of one of them and then cuts through the major portion of the surrounding flesh in the case of a burnt offering he cuts through both or the major portion of both of these organs who is the author of this Beretha is it the rabbis surely they hold that both organs must be severed is it our Eliezer son of our Simeon surely he holds that the major portion only of both organs shall be cut through interpret it thus both organs that is according to the view of the rabbis or the major portion of both organs that is according to the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon if you wish however I can say that the whole Beretha is in accordance with the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon and as to the term both organs it means that both organs appear to be severed Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel if in a human being the neck bone and the major portion of the surrounding flesh was broken the body immediately defiles men and vessels that are in the tent and if you will contend but was not the incident of Eli a case where the neck bone was broken without the major portion of the surrounding flesh having been cut I reply that in the case of old age it is different for it is written at it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell off his seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck broke and he died for he was an old man and heavy our Samuel B. Naman he said in the name of our Yohan and if one ripped up a human being as one does a fish the body immediately defiles men and vessels that are in the tent our Samuel B. Isaac added provided he was ripped up along the back Samuel said if one split an animal into two it is immediately nibbler our Eliezer said if it thigh was removed and the cavity was noticeable the animal is immediately nibbler what is the meaning of and the cavity was noticeable Robert replied it means that when the animal is crouching there appears to be something missing we have learned elsewhere if their heads have been cut off even though their limbs move convulsively they are unclean the convulsions being but similar to the convulsive movements of the lizard's tail after it has been cut off what is meant by have been cut off Resh Lakish said it means actually cut off R.C. said in the name of Armani it means severed in the sense as the head of the burnt offering of a bird is severed whereupon our Jeremiah asked R.C. do you mean as the head of the burnt offering of a bird is severed according to the view of the rabbis and so you do not disagree at all or do you mean as the head of the burnt offering of a bird is severed according to the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon and so you do disagree he replied I mean as the head of the burnt offering of a bird is severed according to the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon and so we disagree some there are who read the above passage thus Resh Lakish said it means actually cut off R.C. said in the name of Armani it means severed in the sense as the head of the burnt offering of a bird is severed according to the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon and that is cut off to the extent of the greater portion of both organs what is this dispute between the Rabbis and our Eliezer son of our Simeon it was taught it is written and he shall prepare the second for a burnt offering according to the ordinance this means according to the ordinance prescribed for the sin offering of an animal you say it means according to the ordinance prescribed for the sin offering of an animal but perhaps it is not so but rather according to the ordinance prescribed for the sin offering of a bird this cannot be for when it says and he shall bring it near the verse thereby draws a distinction between the sin offering of a bird and the burnt offering of a bird how then must I interpret the verse according to the ordinance it must mean according to the ordinance of the sin offering of an animal thus as the sin offering of an animal must be brought Talmud must and be only from unconsecrated animals must be sacrificed by day and all the services in connection therewith must be performed with the priest's right hand so to the burnt offering of a Bird must be brought only from unconsecrated birds must be sacrificed by day and all the services in connection therewith must be performed with the priest's right hand but then it should follow that just as in the former case one has only to cut the greater portion of both organs so in the latter case one has only to nip off the greater portion of both organs there is therefore another text which reads and he shall nip off and he shall burn it from which one can draw the following conclusion as for the purposes of burning the head must be separate from the body so too in nipping the head shall be made separate from the body our Ishmael says according to the ordinance means according to the ordinance prescribed for the sin offering of a bird thus as the nipping of the head of the sin offering of a bird must be done close to the back of the neck so too the nipping of the head of the burnt offering of a bird must be done close to the back of the neck but then it should follow should it not that as in the former case one must nip through only one organ without severing the other so in the latter case one must nip through only one organ without severing the other it is therefore written and he shall bring it near our Eliezer son of our Simeon says according to the ordinance means according to the ordinance of the sin offering of a bird thus as in the latter case Talmud, Mastul and the priest sprinkles the blood whilst holding the head and the body in his hand so in this case too he sprinkles the blood whilst holding the head and the body in his hand what can this mean it means this just as in the latter case he sprinkles the blood whilst the head is still attached to the body so too in the case of the burnt offering of a bird he sprinkles the blood whilst the head is still attached to the body but then it should follow should it not that just as in the former case only one organ shall be severed so here too only one organ shall be severed it is therefore Written and he shall bring it near now it may be asked against the first tannis since he derives the rule from the verse and he shall nip off and he shall burn it what need is there for the verse and he shall bring it near without the verse and he shall bring it near he would have interpreted according to the ordinance to mean according to the ordinance of the sin offering of a bird and as to the verse and he shall nip off and he shall burn it he would have explained it thus is it. Burning of the sacrifice is performed upon the top of the altar so shall the draining of the blood following the nipping be performed upon the upper part of the altar wall but now that the divine law states and he shall bring it near this verse therefore serves to distinguish in every respect the burnt offering of a bird from the sin offering of a bird and from the verse and he shall nip off and he shall burn it he can derive this too once do we know that the sin offering of an animal must be brought only from unconsecrated animals are his die answered from the verse and Aaron shall offer the bullock of the sin offering which is his that is to say it must come from his own means and not from the money of the community nor from second tithe is not the rule that sacrifices may only be offered by day inferred from the verse in the day that he commanded it is indeed stated above to no purpose is not the rule that all the services in connection therewith must be performed with the right hand derived from the following dictum of Rabbi Barhanna for Rabbi Barhanna declared in the name of our Simeon Belakish wherever the word finger or priest is employed it signifies that the right hand only shall be used and the other he is of the opinion that the word priest requires with it the word finger in order that the above rule may apply though the word finger does not require with it the word priest once do the first tana and our Eliezer. Son of Arsimian derived the jaw that the nipping in the case of the burnt offering of a bird shall be close to the back of the neck they derive it from the fact that nipping is prescribed in both cases mission of the age which qualifies turtle doves for sacrifice disqualifies pigeons and the age which qualifies pigeons for sacrifice disqualifies turtle doves at the period when the neck feathers begin to glisten in either kind they are disqualified tomorrow our rabbis taught turtle doves are qualified for sacrifice when fully grown but not when small pigeons are qualified for sacrifice when small but not when fully grown it follows therefore
Pigeons, inasmuch as in the divine law they are always preceded by the epithet young, are qualified for sacrifice only when small and not when fully grown, whereas turtle doves I submit may be offered either when fully grown or even when small turtle doves must be placed under conditions similar to pigeons, thus just as pigeons are qualified for sacrifice only when small and not when fully grown, so turtle doves are qualified for sacrifice only when fully grown and not when small are rabbis. Taught one might conclude that all turtle doves that are not small and all pigeons that are not fully grown are qualified for sacrifice. It is therefore written of the turtle doves implying that some, but not all turtle doves are qualified. Similarly, it is written of the young pigeons implying that some, but not all pigeons are qualified. Hence, there is excluded from either kind those whose neck feathers begin to glisten when do turtle doves first become qualified for sacrifice when their wing plumage becomes golden and when do pigeons become disqualified when their neck feathers begin to glisten. Jacob Carhaller and when do pigeons first become qualified as soon as the limbs have absorbed Yalu the blood he reported this passage and also explained the word Yalu by reference to the verse her young ones also suck up Yalu blood when is this have a answered if when a feather is plucked out there flows blood it is an indication that the limbs have absorbed the blood. Arzera put the following question What is the law of a man said behold I undertake to offer for a burnt offering either a pair of turtle doves or a pair of pigeons and he brought a pair of each kind both pairs however being at the stage when the neck feathers were beginning to glisten if the stage is a period of doubt then in this case he at all events fulfills his obligation but if it is a distinct intermediate stage then he does not fulfill his obligation Rabbi said come and hear hence. There is excluded from either kind those whose neck feathers begin to glisten now if you say that it is an intermediate stage it is well but if you say that it is a period of doubt it will be asked surely a verse cannot serve to exclude a condition of doubt Talmud, Mostulin of the verse is required to exclude birds that have suffered an unnatural crime or that have been worshipped for since it is written for their corruption is in them there is a blemish in them and a tana of the school. Of our Ishmael taught wherever corruption is mentioned it means either sexual perversion or idolatry sexual perversion for it is written for all flesh had corrupted his way upon earth idolatry for it is written lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image it might well be argued that whatever is rendered unfit for sacrifice by reason of a blemish will similarly be rendered unfit by reason of sexual perversion or idolatry and on the other hand whatever is not rendered unfit for Sacrifice by reason of a blemish will not be rendered unfit by reason of sexual perversion or idolatry with the result that birds inasmuch as they are not rendered unfit for sacrifice by reason of a blemish for a master said the unblemished state and the male sex are prerequisites only to sacrifices of cattle but not of birds will likewise not be rendered unfit by reason of sexual perversion or idolatry the verse therefore teaches us that they are excluded Arzera put the following question. What is the law of a man said behold I undertake to offer for a burnt offering either a ram or a lamb and he brought a plax of course according to our Yohan and the question does not arise since he holds that it is a distinct species for we have learned if a man under an obligation to bring a lamb or a ram as a sacrifice offered to plax he must bring for it libations as for a ram but he does not thereby discharge the obligation of his sacrifice and our Yohan and said that the verse or a ram. Included a plaque. The question, however, does arise according to the view of Bar Pata Talmud, Mostul and B, who holds that he must bring for it libations as for a ram and account for the possibilities. The question, therefore, is must he account only for the possibility of it being either a ram or a lamb, but not of it being a distinct species, or must he also account for the possibility of it being a distinct species and declare that if it is a distinct species, all the libations shall be regarded as a free will offering? The question remains undecided. Arzera put the following question: What is the law of a man said? Behold, I undertake to bring ten cakes of a thank offering, either leavened or unleavened, and he brought to according to whose definition of sur does the question arise? If he brought that sur as defined by our Meir, and the question is asked according to our Judah's ruling about it, then it is undoubtedly unleavened, and if he brought that sur as defined by our Judah and the Question is asked according to our Meir's ruling about it, then it is clearly leavened again if he brought that sur as defined by our Meir, and the question is asked according to our Meir's ruling about it, then it is evidently leavened since one is liable to stripes for eating it on the Passover. Indeed, the question arises on our Judah's definition of sur, and according to our Judah's ruling about it, thus is it a condition of doubt, then in our case he at all events fulfills his obligation, or is it a distinct state, then he does not fulfill his obligation, but has not Arhuna said that if a man said, Behold, I undertake to offer the cakes of a thank offering, he must bring a thank offering as well as the cakes. Now, in our case, since there is imposed upon this person the duty of bringing a thank offering as well as the cakes, he does not know whether he must regard these cakes of sur as leavened, and so bring for the rest unleavened cakes, or as unleavened, and so bring leavened cakes among it. Others the question could only arise where a man said behold I undertake to bring ten cakes either leavened or unleavened in order to release so and so from this obligation in his thank offering even so that other person does not know whether to regard these cakes of sur as leavened and bring the unleavened himself or to regard these as unleavened and bring the leavened himself the question only arises in the case where he did not say in order to release and the point is this has this person fulfilled his obligation or not the question remains undecided mission of the method of killing which renders the red cow valid renders the heifer invalid and the method which renders the heifer valid renders the red cow invalid Gemara our rabbis taught the red cow is rendered valid by slaughtering and invalid by breaking its neck the heifer is rendered valid by breaking its neck and invalid by slaughtering it follows therefore that the method of killing which renders the red cow valid renders the heifer invalid and the method which renders the heifer valid renders the red cow invalid but should not the red cow be rendered valid by breaking its neck by the following a fortiori argument thus if the heifer which is not rendered valid by slaughtering is nevertheless rendered valid by breaking its neck the red cow which is rendered valid by slaughtering should surely be rendered valid by breaking its neck Talmud, Mostul and the verse therefore says and he shall slaughter it. And in addition the law is stated to be a statute in order to indicate that it is rendered valid only by slaughtering and not by breaking its neck but is it established that whenever statute is written in connection with the law one may not apply to it in a fortiori argument but what of the day of atonement L in connection wherewith statute is written nevertheless it was taught upon which the law fell for the Lord and it shall determine it for the sin offering implies that only the law can. Determine it for the sin offering, but designation cannot determine it for the sin offering. For without this biblical direction, I would have argued by an fortiori argument. Thus, if offerings which are not consecrated by lot are nevertheless consecrated by designation, an offering which is consecrated by lot should surely be consecrated by designation. It is therefore written, and it shall determine it for the sin offering to indicate that the lot only can determine it for a sin offering, but designation will not determine it for a sin offering. Now, this is so only because it is written in the divine law, and it shall determine it for the sin offering. But without this verse, one would have applied the fortiori argument. The divine law excluded all others when it stated in connection with the heifer whose neck was broken, indicating that only this shall have its neck broken, but no other, and should not the heifer be rendered valid by slaughtering by the following fortiori argument. Thus, if the red cow which is not rendered valid by breaking its neck is nevertheless rendered valid by slaughtering the heifer which is rendered valid by breaking its neck should surely be rendered valid by slaughtering the verse states and they shall break the neck and also whose neck was broken thus emphasizing that the heifer is rendered valid only by breaking its neck and not by slaughtering mission of the disability which does not disqualify priests disqualifies Levites and the disability which does not disqualify Levites disqualifies priests tomorrow our rabbis taught priests are disqualified by reason of bodily blemish and not by reason of age Levites are disqualified by age and not by bodily blemish it follows therefore that the disability which does not disqualify priests disqualifies Levites and the disability which does not disqualify Levites disqualifies priests whence do we know this from the following barrier our rabbis taught it is written this is that which Pertaineth unto the Levites now what does this teach us from the verse and from the age of fifty years they shall return from the service of the work we know that Levites are disqualified by age now I might have argued by an fortiori argument that they are disqualified by bodily
and one cannot accept the age of 25 because of the verse which mentions 30. How are these verses to be reconciled? Thus, at the age of 25, the Levite enters the service for training, and at the age of 30, he performs service. Hence, the dictum: If a student does not see a sign of blessing progress in his studies after five years, he never will. Our Jose says, after three years, for it is written that they be trained three years and that they be taught the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the other: How does he explain these latter verses? He would say that the Chaldean language is an exception, for it is easy to master. And the other: Our Jose, he would say that the temple service is an exception, for its rules are difficult. Our rabbis taught a priest from the time that he has grown two years until he grows old is qualified for service. A bodily blemish, however, disqualifies him. A Levite from 30 years old until 50 years old is qualified for. Service and becomes disqualified by age. This law of the Levite, however, applied only at the tent of meeting in the wilderness, but at Shiloh or at the permanent house, they were only disqualified because of their voices. Said Ar Jose, where is this indicated in any verse? Talmud, Mosul, and be it is written, and it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one loud sound until he grows old, until when is this Ar said in the name of Ar Hanan, until he begins to tremble. We have learned elsewhere if a man who was unclean by reason of a seminal emission immersed himself in a but did not first urinate when he does urinate, he again becomes unclean. Ar Jose says if he was ill or elderly, he again becomes unclean, but if he was young and healthy, he is clean. How long is one regarded as young and healthy? Ar said in the name of Ar as long as one is able to stand on one foot and put on and take off one shoe, it was said of Ar that at the age. Of eighty years he was able to stand on one foot and put on and take off his shoe. Our Hannah said the warm baths and the oil with which my mother anointed me in my youth have stood me in good stead in my old age. Our rabbis taught he whose beard is fully grown is qualified to act as the representative of the community to descend before the ark and to pronounce the priestly benediction. When does he the priest become qualified for temple service when he produces two hairs? Rabbi says I say only when. He is twenty years old. Our Hista asked what is rabbi's reason because it is written and they appointed the levites from twenty years old and upward to have oversight of the work of the house of the Lord and the other Tana he maintains that to have oversight is quite a different matter but is not this verse stated in connection with the levites. One must accept the statement of our Joshua B. Levi for our Joshua B. Levi said in twenty four passages the priests are referred to as levites and it Following is an example and the priests the levites the sons of Zadok are rabbis taught it is written any man of thy seed throughout their generations let him not approach to offer hence our Eliezer derived the rule that a minor is not qualified for service even though he is without bodily blemish when does he become qualified for service when he has grown two hairs his brother priest however would not permit him to take part in the service until he was twenty years old some say that this Beretha agrees with the view of rabbi for he maintains that under the age of twenty years there is no legal disqualification whatsoever not even by rabbinic enactment others say that rabbi's view is that under the age of twenty years one is disqualified by rabbinic enactment and that this Beretha however agrees with the view of the sages for they maintain that under the age of twenty years there is a restriction only in the first instance but if he did serve the service would be Valid mission of that which cannot be rendered unclean in earth and where vessels can be rendered unclean in all other vessels and that which cannot be rendered unclean in all other vessels can be rendered unclean in earth and where vessels Gemara our rabbis taught the airspace of an earth and where vessel can be rendered unclean but the outside of it cannot the airspace of all other vessels cannot be rendered unclean but the outside of them can it follows therefore that that which cannot be rendered unclean in earth and where vessels can be rendered unclean in all other vessels and that which cannot be rendered unclean in all other vessels can be rendered unclean in earth and where vessels whence do we know this from the following very which our rabbis taught it is written and every earthen vessel into which toko any of them falleth that is to say even though it does not actually touch the vessel you say even though it does not actually touch but perhaps it is not so but only if it Actually touches the vessel our Jonathan B. Abdulma said there is used the word toko in connection with the vessel conveying uncleanness and also the word toko in connection with the vessel receiving uncleanness therefore just as toko used in connection with the vessel conveying uncleanness means even though it does not actually touch so too toko used in connection with the vessel receiving uncleanness means even though it does not actually touch but once do we know this in the former case are Jonathan said the Torah has declared the contents of an earthenware vessel to be unclean Talmud, Mosulan even though it is filled with mustard seed R.A. to be of asked rubbish should not an earthenware vessel be rendered unclean by contact from the outside by the following a fortiori argument if all other vessels which are not rendered unclean through their airspace are nevertheless rendered unclean from the outside an earthenware vessel which is rendered unclean through its airspace. Should surely be rendered unclean from the outside, he replied. The verse reads, and every open vessel which has no covering close bound upon it is unclean. Now, what kind of vessel is it to which uncleanness comes first through its opening? You must say it is an earthenware vessel, and the verse teaches that if it has no covering close bound upon it is unclean, but if it has a covering close bound upon it, it is clean, and should not all other vessels be rendered unclean through their airspace by the following a fortiori argument. If an earthenware vessel which is not rendered unclean from the outside is nevertheless rendered unclean through its airspace, all other vessels which are rendered unclean from the outside should surely be rendered unclean through their airspace. The verse says in it, toko, meaning the airspace of this can suffer uncleanness, but the airspace of no other can suffer uncleanness. But have we not already interpreted these terms toko for other purposes? Indeed, four expositions may be derived from Toko by reason of Toko Talk. Toko Talk one is required for the rule of the text itself, another for the analogy, and again another for the rule that the airspace of this vessel can suffer uncleanness and not the airspace of any other vessel, and again another for the rule that the airspace of this vessel can suffer uncleanness and not the airspace of another vessel which is within the airspace of this vessel, hence even a rinsable vessel is a protection against uncleanness. One might argue that all other vessels should not be rendered unclean by contact from the outside, but only by contact from the inside. By the following a fortiori argument, if an earthenware vessel which is rendered unclean through its airspace is nevertheless not rendered unclean from the outside, all other vessels which are not rendered unclean through their airspace should surely not be rendered unclean from the outside. The verse therefore. Reads and every open vessel which has no covering close bound upon it is unclean. That is to say, only with regard to this is a distinction made, namely, if it has no covering close bound upon it, it is unclean, and if it has a covering close bound upon it, it is clean. Whereas all other vessels, whether they have or have not a covering close bound upon them, are unclean. Mission of that which cannot be rendered unclean in wooden articles can be rendered unclean in metal articles, and that which cannot be rendered unclean in metal articles can be rendered unclean in wooden articles. Gemara, our rabbis taught unfinished wooden articles can be rendered unclean, but flat wooden articles cannot. Unfinished metal articles cannot be rendered unclean, but flat metal articles can. It follows therefore that that which cannot be rendered unclean in wooden articles can be rendered unclean in metal articles, and that which cannot be rendered unclean in metal articles can be rendered unclean in wooden articles. It Following wooden articles are regarded as unfinished whatever still requires to be smoothed or adorned with designs or planed or trimmed round or polished with the skin of a tiny fish whatever still lacks the base or the rim or the handle can be rendered unclean but whatever still requires to be hollowed out cannot be rendered unclean whatever still requires to be hollowed out but this is obvious it is necessary to be mentioned for the following case where one hollowed out of a block which was intended to hold a cap only as much as would hold a cup as the following metal articles are regarded as unfinished whatever still requires Talmud, Mosul and B to be smoothed or adorned with designs or planed or trimmed round or hammered out whatever still lacks the base or the rim or the handle cannot be rendered unclean but whatever only requires a lid can be rendered unclean why is there a difference between the one and the other are said because these metal vessels are Made for occasions of honor, Arnaman said, because they are expensive. What practical difference is there between them? Bone vessels and indeed Arnaman is consistent in his view. For Arnaman said, bone vessels are regarded on the same footing as metal vessels. It appears
Sweetened by roasting in the fire Mishnah Tamed before it has fermented may not be bought with second tithe money and renders a mikwe invalid after it has fermented it may be bought with second tithe money and does not render a mikwe invalid brothers who are partners in their inheritance when they are liable to pay the agio are exempt from the cattle tithe and when they are liable to the cattle tithe they are exempt from the agio gemara who is the author of our Mishnah it is neither are. Judah nor the rabbis for we have learned if a man made tamed putting in a certain measure of water and he subsequently found the same measure of liquid he is exempt from tithing it our Judah however makes him liable now who is the author of our Mishnah if the rabbis then even though it has fermented it should not be purchasable with second tithe money and if our Judah then even though it has not fermented at all it should be purchasable with second tithe money our said in the name of Rabbi Biyavu Talmud, Mosul and their dispute referred only to the case where it had fermented and our Mishnah therefore is in accordance with our Judas Buar Hosei Bihuma also reported that their dispute referred only to the case where it had fermented our Naman further said in the name of Rabbi Biyavu if a man bought to man with second tithe money and it subsequently fermented that which he has purchased is second tithe why is this because it now appears that from the outset it was fruit juice but cannot the same argument be applied to our Mishnah which teaches that only if it had fermented is it purchasable with second tithe money but that if it had not fermented it is not purchasable with second tithe money for it might be argued that had he let it stand it would have fermented Rabbi answered that our Mishnah deals with the case where he let some of it stand in a glass and it did not ferment Rabbi however said that the author of our Mishnah was our Yohan Anbi. Nuri for we have learned if a quart of wine fell into three logs less a quart of water the mixture having the color of wine and the whole of this mixture fell into a deficient mikwe it does not render the mikwe invalid if a quart of milk fell into three logs less a quart of water the mixture having the color of water and the whole of this mixture fell into a deficient mikwe it does not render it invalid but our Yohan Anbi Nuri says it all depends upon the color now did not our Yohan Anbi Nuri lay down the rule that we must determine every mixture by its color then in the case of our Mishnah 2 one ought to determine the mixture by its color and the taste and color of the mixture is that of water the above view differs from that of our Eliezer for our Eliezer said all agree that one may not set aside other tomat as tied for this tomat unless this had already fermented it is clear then that he our Eliezer is of the opinion that the dispute between our Judah and the rabbis refers only to the case where it has not fermented and when our Judah said that he was liable to tithe it he only meant that he must set aside some of it as tithe for the whole but not that he may set aside other tomat as tithe for this for then he might be setting aside that which is subject to tithing as tithe for that which is exempt or that which is exempt as tithe for that which is subject to tithing our rabbis taught tomat before it has fermented Talmud, Mosul and B can be rendered clean by bringing it into contact with the water of Amikwe after it has fermented it cannot be rendered clean by bringing it into contact with the water of Amikwe Rabba remarked this rule applies only if the tomat was made with water that was clean and it subsequently became unclean but not if the water was unclean from the outset our Gabi Hav went and reported this statement to our Ashi and raised this question why does not the rule apply if the water was unclean from the outset is not the reason because we say that the water being heavy will sink to the bottom of the vessel whilst the fruit skins being light will float on the surface of the water and consequently the contact made with the waters of the mikwe will be of no effect if so is not the same reasoning to be applied to the case where the water was first clean and subsequently became unclean you must therefore say that in this case they mix well together then in the former case too we should say that they mix well together mission when there is a power to sell the fine is not payable and when the fine is payable there is no power to sell Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab this is our Meir's opinion but the rabbis say that the fine is payable even when there is a power to sell for it has been taught the power to sell applies to a minor from the age of one day until the time she has grown two hairs but the fine is not payable from the time that she has grown two hairs until maturity. The fine is payable but there is no power to sell thus our mayor for our mayor used to say when there is a power to sell the fine is not payable and when the fine is payable there is no power to sell but the rabbis say in the case of a minor from the age of three years and one day until maturity the fine is payable the fine is payable you say but is there not also a power to sell render the fine is payable and there is also a power to sell mission when there is the right of refusal there can be no Eliza and when there can be Eliza there is no longer the right of refusal Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab this is our mayor's opinion but the rabbis say that there is a right of refusal even when there can be Eliza for it has been taught until what age can a daughter refuse until she has grown two hairs thus our mayor but our Judah says until the dark hairs appear in abundance over the white skin mission when the shofar is blown there is no Havdalah service and when there is a Havdalah service the shofar is not blown thus if a festival falls on the day before the Sabbath the shofar is blown but there is no Havdalah service if it falls on the day following the Sabbath there is Havdalah service but the shofar is not blown what is the form of the Havdalah benediction who makes a distinction between holy and holy Ardosa says who makes a distinction between the more holy and less holy day Gemara how was the shofar blown and Rab Judah said a tekiah was blown which in the end was converted into a teruah RC said a tekiah was blown and then a teruah all in one breath RC instituted the custom in Husel in accordance with his view an objection was raised from the following very if a festival fell on the day before the Sabbath the tekiah was blown but no teruah now does not this mean that no teruah was blown at all it is not so but Rab Judah interprets this very in accordance with his view and RC interprets it in accordance with his view. Rab Judah interprets it in accordance with his view thus but no teruah that is to say not separately but the tekiah was converted into a teruah RC interprets it in accordance with his view thus but no teruah that is to say not with a second breath but all in one breath if it falls on the day following the Sabbath who makes the distinction between holy and holy at what part of the Havdalah service is this formula said Rab Judah said at the conclusion Arnam and also said at the conclusion Arshis hate the son of Aridi said even at the beginning the law however is not in accordance with his view Ardosa says who makes a distinction between the more holy and the less holy day the law however is not in accordance with his view Arzara said if a festival falls in the middle of the week one must say in the Havdalah service who makes a distinction between holy and profane between light and darkness between Israel and other nations between the seventh day and the sixth working Days wise this he is merely enumerating the distinction C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I Talmud, Mosul and Amishnah if a man cut one of the organs of the throat in the case of a bird or both organs in the case of cattle the slaughtering is valid the greater part of an organ is equivalent to the whole of I-T-R Judah says he must cut through the jugular veins if one cut half of one organ in the case of a bird or one and a half organs in the case of cattle the slaughtering is invalid if a man cut the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird or the greater part of each organ in the case of cattle the slaughtering is valid Gemara if a man cut implies that the slaughtering is valid only after the act but that one is not permitted to do so in the first instance this would mean that to cut both organs in the case of cattle is not sufficient in the first instance indeed how much further can one go on cutting if you wish I can say that the expression if one cut refers to the clause. One organ in the case of a bird alternatively it refers to the clause the greater part of an organ is equivalent to the whole of it Kamash Arkahana said once do we know that slaughtering must be performed at the neck from the verse and he shall slaughter we shall have the bullet that is to say he shall cleanse had it from blood in the place where it bends down shy and once do we know that had means to cleanse from the verse and he shall cleanse we hit the house or if you wish. From the verse cleanse me tehati and I with hyssop and I shall be clean perhaps it should be performed at the tail the word shall we say implies bent down of something that is usually erect but that see the tail is always bent down perhaps it should be performed at the ear it is necessary to obtain the life blood perhaps one should keep on cutting the ear until one reaches the life blood moreover once would we know the rules against pausing pressing thrusting deflecting and tearing. We must therefore say that we know them by tradition then the rule that slaughtering must be performed at the neck is also derived from tradition what then does this verse teach us that one may not cut the animal into two or said we can derive it from the verse and thou shalt slaughter we that is to say
head and the fat are not the head and the fat included in the pieces why are they mentioned separately for this reason since it is written and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces I would have thought that only such limbs as must be flayed are included in the pieces whence would I learn to include also the head which is already severed it is therefore written explicitly and he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat and he shall lay them in order. Now since the tanda speaks of the head as severed it is evident that slaughtering must be performed at the neck why does the tanda open his argument with and the head and the fat and conclude with its head and its fat this is what he means whence would I learn to include the head which is already severed from the verse and the head and the fat then for what purpose do I require the verse its head and its fat for the purpose shown in the following bury the whence do I know that the head and the fat precede all limbs on the altar from the verse its head and its fat and he shall lay them in order Talmud, Mosul and B and why did the Divine Law mention the fat in the first verse for the purpose shown in the following Beritha how does he offer it he covers the throat with the fat and thus offers it upon the altar and in this way there is glory given to the Most High another Tana derives it from the following Beritha it is written this is the law of cattle and of birds now in which law of the laws of uncleanness are birds and cattle treated alike on the one hand the carcass of cattle conveys uncleanness by contact or by carrying whereas the carcass of a bird does not on the other hand the carcass of a bird whilst in the gullet renders clothes unclean whereas the carcass of cattle does not in which respect then are birds and cattle alike in this respect as cattle are rendered clean by slaughtering so birds are rendered clean by slaughtering but it should follow. Should it not that as in the case of cattle the greater part of both organs must be cut so in the case of birds the greater part of both organs must be cut the verse therefore reads this is the law Elizer says in which respect are birds and cattle alike in this as birds are rendered fit at the neck so cattle are rendered fit at the neck but then it should follow should it not that as in the case of birds the nipping is done close to the back of the neck so in the case of cattle the slaughtering should be done close to the back of the neck the verse therefore reads and he shall nip off its head close to the back of its neck but shall not divide it asunder that is to say its head shall be nipped off close to the back of its neck but the head of no other shall be cut close to the back of its neck and how does our Elizer interpret the word this without this I would have argued that as in the case of birds only one organ is severed so in the case of cattle only one Organ shall be cut the divine law therefore states this is the law of Archibald taught it is written this is the law of cattle and of birds and of every living creature that moveth in the waters this verse has interposed birds between cattle and fishes now one cannot say that in the case of birds both organs of the throat must be cut for they are on the one hand grouped with fishes and one cannot say that none of the organs are to be cut for they are on the other hand grouped with cattle. How is this to be explained they are rendered fit by the cutting of one organ once do we know that fish do not require to be ritually slaughtered shall I say from the verse if flocks and birds be slain for them will they suffice them or if all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them will it suffice them which implies that the mere gathering of fishes is sufficient but if so with regard to quails of which it is written and they gathered the quails can it similarly be said that the mere gathering is sufficient and that no slaughtering is necessary have you not said above and one cannot say that none of the organs are to be cut for they are grouped with cattle in the latter verse gathering is not written in the same verse which mentions slaughtering for others but in the former verse gathering in the case of fishes is written in the same verse which mentions slaughtering for others a Galilean traveling lecturer expounded cattle were created out of the dry earth and are rendered fit by the cutting of both organs fish were created out of the water and are rendered fit without any ritual slaughtering birds were created out of the alluvial mud and are therefore rendered fit by the cutting of one organ our Samuel of Cappadocia said you can prove this from the fact that birds have scales on their legs like the scales of fishes he put to him this further question one verse says and God said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath Life and let birds fly above the earth from which it would appear that birds were created out of the water but another verse says and the Lord God formed out of the ground every beast of the field and every bird of the air from which it would appear that they were created out of the earth he replied they were created out of the alluvial mud he thereupon noticed his disciples looking at each other with surprise you are no doubt displeased said he because I brushed aside my opponent with a straw. The truth is that they were created out of the water but they were brought before Adam only in order that he might name them others say that he replied to the Roman general in accordance with the latter view but to his disciples he gave the first explanation since the birds are mentioned in connection with the expression and he formed Rab Judah said in the name of our Isaac be Phinehas birds do not require to be slaughtered ritually by the law of the Torah for it is written and he shall pour. Out the blood thereof that is to say the mere pouring out of the blood is sufficient to render the bird fit but if so should not the same be said of wild beasts to know for wild beasts have been compared by biblical analogy with consecrated animals that have become unfit for sacrifice well then birds have also been compared with cattle in the following verse this is the law of cattle and of birds surely there is also the verse he shall pour out the blood thereof but why do you choose to apply the latter verse to birds rather than to wild animals it is more reasonable to do so since birds are mentioned last mnemonic it became nibble a blood nipping an objection was raised if a man slaughtered a wild animal or a bird and it became nibble under his hand or if he stabbed or if he tore away the organs of the throat of a wild animal or a bird he is exempt from covering the blood now if you were right in holding that birds do not require to be ritually slaughtered by the law of the Torah then stabbing is all the slaughtering that is required for them consequently there is surely an obligation to cover the blood you are assuming that the above mission deals with the bird in fact it deals with the case of a wild animal only come and here if a man slaughtered even though he requires the blood for use he must nevertheless cover it but what should he do so that he may use the blood he should either stab it or tear away the organs Talmud, Mostulin and now presumably. This statement refers to the slaughtering of a bird whose blood he would require for destroying the flax worm no it refers to the slaughtering of a wild animal whose blood he would require for dying purposes come and here if one nipped off the head of a consecrated bird with a knife the carcass whilst in the gullet renders clothes unclean now if you were right in holding that birds do not require to be ritually slaughtered by the law of the Torah then granting that as soon as it's Neck bone and spinal cord have been sundered. The bird is true for the subsequent cutting of the organs with the knife should at least have the effect of rendering the carcass free from the uncleanness of nibble. Here Isaac B. Phinehas accepts the view of the Tana in the following Barith R. Eliezer Hakapur Gurubai says, What does the verse how be it as a gazelle and as the heart is eaten, so shalt thou eat thereof? Teach us what do we learn from the gazelle and the heart? Indeed, it comes as a teacher, but turns out to be a pupil. We must put the gazelle and the heart on the same footing as consecrated animals which have been rendered unfit for sacrifice. Thus, as the latter must be ritually slaughtered, so the gazelle and the heart must also be ritually slaughtered. Birds, however, need not be ritually slaughtered by the law of the Torah, but only by rabbinic enactment, who is the Tana who disagrees with this view of R. Eliezer Hakapur. It is rabbi, for it has been taught. Rabbi says the verse. And thou shalt slaughter as I have commanded thee teaches us that Moses was instructed concerning the gullet and the windpipe concerning the greater part of one of these organs that must be cut in the case of a bird and the greater part of each in the case of cattle one organ in the case of a bird it was stated our says either the gullet or the windpipe whilst our Adabiyahabah says only the gullet and not the windpipe our says either the gullet or the windpipe for the mission says one organ that is any one our Adabiyahabah says only the gullet and not the windpipe for one organ means the vital one mnemonic he cut half of each the windpipe mutilated the sin offering of a bird an objection was raised if a man cut the gullet of a bird and afterwards the windpipe was torn away the slaughtering is valid if the windpipe was torn away and he then cut the gullet the slaughtering is invalid if he cut the gullet and the windpipe was found to be torn away and it is not known. Whether it was torn away before or after the slaughtering this was an actual case which came before the rabbis and they ruled any doubt whatsoever arising about the slaughtering makes it invalid now there is no mention here at all of the cutting of the windpipe it is because the windpipe is more liable to be torn away come and here if a man cut half of each organ in the case of a bird the slaughtering is invalid needless to say this is so in the case of cattle our Judah says in a bird he must cut through the gullet and the j
is the breaking of the spinal cord and neck bone what then is the law come and your duck belonging to Rabba's house was found with its neck smeared with blood said Rabba how shall we deal with it Talmud, must and be if we first slaughter it and then examine the organs it is of no avail for it might have been slaughtered in the very place where there was a perforation in the gullet if we first examine it and then slaughter it it is also of no avail for has not Rabba taught that the gullet cannot be examined from the outside but only from the inside his son our Joseph said to him we could first examine the windpipe and then cut it and thereafter the gullet can be turned inside out and examined Rabba exclaimed my son Joseph is as versed in the laws concerning what is true as our Yohanan this proves that the Mishnah when it says one organ means either the one or the other our Judah says he must cut through the jugular veins our Hisda said that our Judah deals with the case of a Bird only and his reason is because it is often roasted whole but in the case of cattle since the animal is usually cut up into limbs it is not necessary to cut the jugular veins shall we say that the reason for our Judah's ruling is on account of the blood surely we have learned our Judah says he must cut through the jugular veins say he must pierce the jugular veins why then does it say he must cut because he must pierce them at the time of the ritual cutting come and hear the jugular veins must be ritually cut so our Judah say the jugular veins must be pierced at the time of the ritual cutting so our Judah come and hear they said to our Judah since the jugular veins were referred to only for the purpose of drawing out the blood what does it matter whether they are cut ritually or not it is evident is it not that our Judah is of the opinion that they must be cut ritually this is what they said to him what does it matter whether one pierces them at the time of the ritual cutting or not he However, is of the opinion that if the jugular veins are pierced at the time of the ritual cutting, the blood being warm will flow freely, but after the ritual cutting, the blood will not flow so freely, for it is already cold. Our Jeremiah raised the question according to our Judah, what would be the law if one paused or pressed downwards whilst cutting the jugular veins? A certain old man answered him, This is what our Eliezer has said. Others read, A certain old man said to our Eliezer, This is what our Yohanan has said, They may be pierced with a thorn and are thus rendered valid. A very was taught in accordance with our Histah's view, as if a man cut ritually half of each organ in a bird, the slaughtering is invalid. It is needless to say so. In the case of cattle, our Judah says, In a bird, he must cut through ritually the gullet and the jugular veins half of one organ. In the case of a bird, etc., it was stated, Rab said, An exact half is equivalent to the greater portion. Our Kahana said, An exact half is. Not equivalent to the greater portion, Rab said an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion because what the divine law instructed Moses was thou shalt not leave the greater portion uncut. Our Kahana said an exact half is not equivalent to the greater portion because what the divine law instructed Moses was thou shalt cut the greater portion. Nimad gay half cat the windpipe mutilated. We have learned if a man cut half of one organ in the case of a bird or one and a half organs in the case of cattle, the slaughtering is invalid. Now, if you say that an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion, why is the slaughtering invalid? Has he not cut here the greater portion? It is invalid only by rabbinic ruling as a precaution, lest he should cut less than an exact half. Our Katna said, Come and here if he divided it into two equal parts, both parts are unclean because it is impossible to make an exactly equal division. It follows, however, that if it were possible to make an exactly Equal division both parts would be clean now if you say that an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion why would both parts be clean when you turn to one part you must regard it as the greater portion and therefore unclean and when you turn to the other part you must regard it as the greater portion and therefore also unclean our papa answered there cannot be two greater portions in one vessel come and here if a man cut half of the windpipe and pause Talmud, Mastulina for the length of time required for another slaughtering and then finished it the slaughtering is valid now if you say that an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion and here the animal is already trifle you are assuming are you not that the berita is dealing with cattle indeed it deals with a bird and whichever view you take the result is the same for if an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion then he has cut here the greater portion and if an exact half is not equivalent to the greater portion then he has done nothing at all which would render the slaughtering invalid come and here if half of the windpipe of a bird was mutilated and a man cut a fraction more and finished it the slaughtering is valid now if you say that an exact half is equivalent to the greater portion then was it not already trifle before the slaughtering Rob answered with regard to the law of trifle it is different for there all agree that we require such a greater portion as is perceptible to the eye thereupon Abbe said to him but is there not here in a fortiori argument if in the law concerning trifle notwithstanding that in certain cases the slightest defect will render an animal trifle nevertheless whenever we do require a greater portion we insist upon a greater portion that is perceptible to the eye how much more in the law concerning Sheshita where no slaughtering is valid without the greater portion having been cut should we insist upon a greater portion which is perceptible to the eye rather say thus all are of the opinion that an exact half is not equivalent to the greater portion and when the dispute between Rab and Arkahana was reported it was only in connection with the Passover sacrifice thus if the community of Israel was exactly equally divided half being clean and half unclean Rab said that an exact half was equivalent to the greater portion Arkahana said that an exact half was not equivalent to the greater portion and what is the reason for Rab's view in that case for it is written if any man of you shall be unclean by reason of a dead body signifying that only an individual is obliged to postpone his Passover sacrifice on account of uncleanness but not a community the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird has not the ten already taught this the greater part of an organ is equivalent to the whole of Itini Monikach Pasha or Hashai answered one clause refers to unconsecrated animals the other clause to consecrated animals and they are both necessary for had he taught the rule only in connection with unconsecrated animals I should have said that only there is a greater portion of the organ sufficient since the blood is not required for any purpose but in the case of consecrated animals since the blood is required for a special purpose I should have said that the greater portion of the organ was not sufficient but that the whole organ must be cut hence the rule had to be stated in connection with consecrated animals and if he taught the rule only in connection with consecrated animals I should have said that only there is a greater portion of the organ necessary since the blood is required for a special purpose but in the case of unconsecrated animals since the blood is not required for any purpose I should have said that half of the organ was sufficient hence both are necessary which clause refers to unconsecrated animals and which to consecrated animals are kahana Said it is reasonable to say that the first clause refers to unconsecrated animals and the second to consecrated animals. Why? Because the mission opens with if a man cut one organ in the case of a bird. Now, if you were to say that the first clause refers to consecrated animals, it should open with if one nip. You say therefore that the second clause refers to consecrated animals. But then why does it state the slaughtering is valid? It should state the nipping is valid. This is no real difficulty for one can say that because the Tana mentioned cattle last. He therefore stated the slaughtering is valid. But this argument is conclusive for since it the first clause clearly refers to the case of a bird. If you were to say that it refers to consecrated birds, the Tana ought to have stated if one nip. Our Shai Mibi Ashi said it can be proved that the first portion of the mission deals with unconsecrated animals. From this clause is one organ in the case of a bird. For if you were to say that the first portion deals with consecrated animals the question would be raised what about the burnt offering of a bird which requires both organs to be cut you therefore say that the second portion of the mission deals with consecrated animals but then the same question will be raised upon the clause which reads the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird is what about the burnt offering of a bird which requires both organs to be cut the greater part of one organ really means the greater part of each organ and strictly the mission should have stated the greater part of both since however there is a case of the sin offering of a bird for which one organ is sufficient the tana stated the clause ambiguously our papa said it can be proved that the first portion of our mission deals with unconsecrated animals from this clause our Judah says he must cut through the jugular veins the rabbis however disagree now if you say that the first portion deals with Unconsecrated animals it is well but if you were to say that it deals with consecrated animals why do the rabbis disagree with the view of our Judah is not the whole purpose of the slaughtering of consecrated animals for the sake of obtaining the blood our Ashi said it can be proved that the latter portion of the mission deals with consecrated animals from the following statement if one slaughtered two
teaches us the greater part of an organ is equivalent to the whole of IT. What need is there for the further statement the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird or the greater part of each organ in the case of cattle it is necessary because we have learned elsewhere when they brought unto him SC the high priest on the day of atonement the daily sacrifice he made an incision but another priest completed the slaughtering for him now from this mission I might have thought that if another had not completed the slaughtering it would have been invalid our mission therefore teaches us if a man cut the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird or the greater part of each organ in the case of cattle the slaughtering is valid the master said I might have thought that if another had not completed the slaughtering it would have been invalid Talmud, Mastulan B but if this were so then a vital service would have been performed by another and it has been taught it. Entire service of the Day of Atonement must be performed by the High Priest alone. This is rather what he meant. I might have thought that if another had not completed the slaughtering, it would have been invalid by decree of the rabbis, for it might have been argued that the rabbis declared the slaughtering invalid. Our mission therefore teaches us if a man cut the greater part of one organ in the case of a bird or the greater part of each organ in the case of cattle, the slaughtering is valid. But now that it is established that there is not even a rabbinic decree against it, wherefore is it necessary for another to complete the slaughtering? It is meritorious to complete it. Rush said in the name of Levi the Elder, the term Sheshit applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering. Our Yohanan said the term Sheshit applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end. Robert remarked, all agree that where a Gentile cut the first organ of the throat and Israelite the second the slaughtering is invalid for the animal has already been rendered trifa by the hand of the Gentile furthermore all agree that in the case of a burnt offering of a bird where the priest nipped the first organ below the red line and the second organ above it the nipping is invalid for by nipping the first organ below he has already done to this offering all that is prescribed for a sin offering of a bird the dispute arises only where a person cut the first organ outside the sanctuary and the second inside the sanctuary according to the one who says that the term Sheshit applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end he would in this case be liable but according to the one who says that the term Sheshit applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering he would not be liable Rabbi Bishai said to him but the master that is our Joseph did not say so for he said that even where a person cut the first organ outside the sanctuary and the second inside he would also be liable because he has done to this offering outside the sanctuary such an extent of service as would render the sin offering of a bird valid if performed inside the sanctuary rather the dispute arises only where a person cut the lesser portion of the organ outside the sanctuary and completed it inside according to the one who says that the term Sheshit applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end he would in this case be liable. But according to the one who says that the term Sheshit applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering he would not be liable our zero raised this objection all who take part in the service of the red cow either at the beginning or at the end render their garments unclean and if they do any other work at the same time they render it the red cow invalid if any invalidating defect befell it during the slaughtering it does not render unclean the garments worn by those who either before or after the occurrence of the defect took part in any service in connection with it if the defect occurred during the sprinkling of the blood the red cow renders unclean the clothes worn by those who took part in any service before the defect but it does not render unclean the clothes worn by those who took part in any service after the defect now if you say that the term Sheshit applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end then the Tana should have drawn a distinction even in the slaughtering thus if any invalidating defect befell it during the slaughtering it renders unclean the clothes worn by those who took part in any service before the defect but not the clothes worn by those who took part in any service after the defect robber replied you are alluding are you not to a defect which invalidated the slaughtering but that is quite a different matter for it is now apparent that there never was a valid slaughtering but said robber if I have any Difficulty about this mission it is this according to the one who says that the term Sheshit applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering the Tana might have drawn a distinction even where the slaughtering of the red cow was entirely according to ritual as in the case where two persons slaughtered it in which case the first does not render his clothes unclean but the second does our Joseph thereupon interposed you are suggesting are you not the case of two persons slaughtering one sacrifice away with the suggestion for I have learned it is written thou shalt slaughter to teach that two persons shall not slaughter one sacrifice also thou shalt slaughter it to teach that one person shall not slaughter two sacrifices simultaneously and Arkahana had said that this exposition was based upon the Kethib which is thou shalt slaughter it whereupon Abbe said to him was there not reported in conjunction with this exposition the dictum of Rabbi Barhana in the name of R. Yohanan namely that the opinion expressed was that of our Eliezer son of our Simeon Talmud, Mastul and A who was often quoted anonymously whereas the rabbis are of the opinion that two persons may slaughter one sacrifice moreover even adopting the view of our Eliezer son of our Simeon the Tana might have drawn a distinction in the case where only one person slaughtered it but he wore two different garments while slaughtering in which case the first garment is clean and the second unclean the truth of the matter is that the Tana dealt only with those circumstances where the red cow was in fact rendered invalid but not where everything was done entirely according to ritual R E D B Aben raised this objection we have learned if a man slaughtered the paschal lamb whilst having leaven in his possession during the festival under its own name he has not incurred guilt under the name of another he has incurred guilt and we argued upon it as follows this is so only because it was slaughtered under the name of another but if it were slaughtered under no specific name it follows that no guilt would have been incurred but why is no guilt incurred is not the paschal lamb at any time of the year save on the eve of Passover regarded as a peace offering will not then this mission approve the rule that for a paschal lamb to become valid as a peace offering at any other time of the year its name must first be repealed our high begamita said it was suggested by the whole assembly that the circumstances of the case were these the owners of this paschal lamb were rendered unclean by a corpse so that they had to postpone the offering of the paschal lamb until the second Passover hence if this lamb was slaughtered during the first Passover under no specific name it would certainly be regarded as slaughtered under its own name now only in this particular case must the name of the paschal lamb be repealed before it is valid as a peace offering but in no other cases Repeal necessary this is right if you were to say that the term Sheshit applies to the entire process of the slaughtering from beginning to end for then the paschal lamb is rendered invalid at the beginning of the slaughtering and therefore no guilt is incurred but if you say that the term Sheshit applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering then as soon as the person commenced to slaughter it it can no longer be intended to serve as the paschal lamb and as he continues to slaughter he is really slaughtering a peace offering consequently he should incur guilt thereupon Abbe answered him granted that this lamb can no longer serve as a paschal lamb but its price can serve this purpose and should you say that in order to sell a consecrated animal it must be placed before the priest and appraised I reply that we have learned if one cut both or the greater portion of both organs and the animal still moves convulsively it is regarded as alive for all purposes Rab Judah Said in the name of Rab, if one cut the throat in two or three places, the slaughtering is valid. But when I reported this statement to Samuel, he said to me, We must have a wide open cut, and it is not so here. Reshlakish is also of the opinion that there must be a wide open cut for Reshlakish taught once. Do we know that Shechita implies a wide open cut from the verse, Their tongue is a sharpened arrow, it speaks to see our Eliezer raised an objection. We have learned if two persons held a knife and slaughtered, even if one cut higher up and the other cut lower down in the neck, the slaughtering is valid. Now, why is this so? There is not here a wide open cut. Our Jeremiah answered, Our mission deals with the case of two persons holding one knife thereupon. Our Abba said to him, If so, let us consider the comment upon this mission of his, and there is no fear that one will render the animal on account of the other. Now, if you say that it deals with the case of two knives and two persons each. Holding a knife, then the comment is most proper for you might have said that we must apprehend lest they come to rely one upon the other, and neither the one nor the other will cut the required greater portion of the organs. We are therefore informed that there is no fear of this, but if you say that it deals with the case of two persons holding one knife, then why the comment and there is no fear that one will render the animal trifle on account of the other, it should rather read, and there is no fear that one will cause
Slaughtering was property therefore teaches us that it is not valid underneath the skin that slaughtering is valid in the school of rabbit was said that underneath the skin it was doubtful whether the slaughtering was valid or not the question was raised according to the view of the school of rabbit that underneath the skin was a doubtful case what would be the law if a man thrust the knife underneath the rag or underneath the entangled wool the question is undecided our papa put the question what is the law if he placed the knife under cover on cutting the lesser portions of the organs this question too is undecided mission if a man slaughtered two animals simultaneously the slaughtering is valid if two persons held the knife and slaughtered even if one cut higher up and the other cut lower down in the neck the slaughtering is valid if he chopped off the head with one stroke the slaughtering is invalid if whilst cutting he cut through the neck with one stroke the slaughtering is Valid provided the knife extended the width of a neck if whilst cutting he cut through two necks with one stroke the slaughtering is valid provided the knife extended the width of a neck these provisions apply only to the case where the slaughterer moved the knife forward and not backward or backward and not forward but if he moved the knife to and fro however small it was even if it was a lancet the slaughtering is valid Gamara if he chopped off the head with one stroke the slaughtering is invalid once do we know the said Samuel from the verse their tongue is a sharpened arrow it speak the seed a ten of the school of our Ishmael taught it is written and he shall slaughter we shaha and we shaha means nothing else than and he shall draw as in the verse beaten shaha gold and as it is also written their tongue is a sharpened shaha arrow it speak the seed why the second verse you might have said that gold shaha really means gold woven in threads therefore come and here it is written their tongue is a sharpened shaha arrow rob examined the head of an arrow for Arjuna B. Talifa and the latter slaughtered with it a bird in its flight perhaps there was a thrust we saw Talmud, Moss told that the feathers on the front of the neck were also cut but what about covering the blood and should you say that he covered the blood where it fell on the ground this is not sufficient for our Zerah taught in the name of Rabbi who slaughters a bird or a wild beast must place dust underneath the blood and dust above it for it is written and he shall cover it with dust before it does not say afar but before in order to teach that he who slaughters a bird or a wild beast must place dust underneath the blood and dust above it he prepared the soil of the entire valley for this purpose if whilst cutting he cut through the neck with one stroke provided the knife extended the width of a neck our Zerah said the width of a neck and also Beyond the neck the question was raised does he mean the width of a neck and another width of a neck beyond the neck so that the knife is two necks long or does he mean to say the width of a neck and also a little beyond the neck come and here if whilst cutting he cut through two necks with one stroke the slaughtering is valid provided the knife extended the width of a neck now what is the meaning of the width of a neck can it mean the width of a neck and no more but if when slaughtering one animal we require the knife to be the width of a neck and also beyond the neck can it possibly be said that when slaughtering two animals the width of a neck by itself is sufficient obviously it must mean the width of a neck beyond the two necks which are being slaughtered this therefore proves that our zero means there must be the width of a neck beyond the neck these provisions apply only to the case where he moved the knife forward and not backward however small it was even if it was a lancet the slaughtering is valid Armanasa said the mission refers to a lancet which has no projections Araha the son of Arawiya asked Armanasa what is the law if one used a needle for slaughtering he replied a needle rends the flesh what if one used a shoemakers all he replied we have learned it in our mission however small it was surely this includes the shoemakers all know it refers to a lancet but a lancet is expressly mentioned later no it is merely explanatory thus however small it was namely a lancet and this is logical too for if you say that it includes a shoemakers all then it will be asked if a shoemakers all is allowed what need is there to mention a lancet but this indeed would be no difficulty because it is necessary to mention a lancet for you might have thought that the rabbis would prohibit the use of a lancet even without projections as a precaution lest one use a lancet with projections the mission therefore teaches us that this is not Prohibited mission if a knife fell down and slaughtered an animal even though it slaughtered it in the proper way the slaughtering is invalid for it is written and thou shalt slaughter and thou shalt eat that is to say that which thou dost slaughter mayst thou eat Gemara now this is so only because it fell down of itself but if one threw it and it slaughtered an animal the slaughtering would be valid notwithstanding there was no intention to slaughter according to ritual who is it? Tanda that holds that the intention to slaughter according to ritual is not essential Rabbi said it is our Nathan Farashai Jr. of the collegiate school learned if one threw a knife intending to thrust it into a wall and in its flight it slaughtered an animal in the proper way our Nathan declares the slaughtering valid the sages declare it invalid having reported this he added that the Halacha was in accordance with our Nathan's view but has not Rabbi stated this before in connection with it. Following mission for we have learned and if any of these slaughtered while others were standing over them their slaughtering is valid and it was asked who was the tenor that held that the intention to slaughter according to ritual was not essential and Rob answered it was our Nathan both statements are necessary for if he only stated it there I should have said that only there the slaughtering was valid because they at least intended to cut but here since there was no intention to cut at all I should have said that it was not valid and if he only stated it here I should have said that only here the slaughtering was valid because it the act emanated from a person of sound mind but there since it emanated from a person of unsound mind I should have said that it was not valid both statements are therefore necessary it was stated if a menstruous woman accidentally immersed herself Rab Judah says in the name of Rab she is permitted to have intimate relations with her Husband, but is forbidden to eat. Terima Ar Yohanan says she is not even permitted to have intimate relations with her husband. Rabbi said to Arnaman against Rab's view that she is allowed intimacy with her husband, but is forbidden to eat. Terima, I would put the question if you have permitted her that which entails the penalty of Kara, surely you will permit her that which entails only the penalty of death at the hands of heaven. He replied, Intimacy with her husband is a common thing, and in the case of common things, the intention is not essential. Whence do you know this from the following mission which we learned if a wave containing 40 sei of water was detached from the sea and fell upon a man or upon vessels that were unclean, they are not clean. Presumably a man is on the same footing as vessels, and as vessels have no intention, so a man need have no intention, but is this so perhaps we are dealing with the case of a man who was sitting and waiting for the wave to become. Detached Talmud, Mastul and B and on the contrary vessels are to be on the same footing as a man and as a man is capable of forming an intention so in the case of vessels a man must form an intention for them but should you ask if we are dealing with the case of a man who was sitting and waiting why is it at all necessary to be taught I reply that you might have disallowed this immersion as a precautionary measure lest he immerse himself in a torrent of rainwater or you might have disallowed immersion at the edge of the wave as a precaution lest it be thought that immersion is also allowed in the arch of the wave we are therefore taught that no precautionary measures are necessary and whence do we know that immersion is not allowed in the arch of the wave from the following very which was taught immersion is allowed at the edge of the wave but not in the arch of the wave for immersion is not allowed in midair whence then do we derive the rule that in the case of common things the intention is not essential from the following mission which we learned if fruits had fallen into a channel of water and the person whose hands were unclean stretched out his hands and took them his hands have become clean and the rule of if water be put does not apply to the fruits but if his purpose was to wash his hands his hands have become clean and the rule of if water be put applies to the fruits Rob raised an objection against Arnaman we have learned if a man immersed himself to render himself fit to partake of common food and had this purpose in view he is forbidden to partake of the second tithe now this is so only because he had this purpose in view but if he did not have this purpose in view he may not partake even of common food he replied this is what it means even though he had the purpose in view to render himself fit to partake of common food he is forbidden to eat second tithe he raised this further objection if he immersed himself but did not have any purpose in view it is as if he had not immersed himself presumably it means it is as if he had not immersed himself at all no it means it is as if he had not immersed himself for second tithe but he has certainly immersed himself for common food now he rather thought that Arnaman merely intended to point out a possible refutation he accordingly went and searched and found the following beritha if he immersed himself and had no purpose in view he is fit to eat common food but not second tithe Abbe said to our Joseph shall we say that this last beritha is a refutation of our
We can see that the intention is not essential for inasmuch as the divine law has expressly laid down that an act performed incidentally in connection with consecrated animals is invalid. It follows that with regard to common things the intention is not essential and the rabbis they will say granted that with regard to common animals it is not essential to have the intention to slaughter according to ritual but it is essential to have an intention to cut in this matter said Rabbi R. Nathan triumphed over the rabbis for is there ever written and thou shalt cut it is written and thou shalt slaughter therefore if it is essential to have the intention to cut it is also essential to have the intention to slaughter according to ritual and if it is not essential to have the intention to slaughter according to ritual then it is not even essential to have the intention to cut how did it happen that the menstruous woman accidentally immersed herself shall we say that another woman pushed her into a and she thus immersed herself but surely the intention of the other woman is a perfect intention moreover in such a case she would even be allowed to eat terimah for we have learned if a woman was a deaf mute or an imbecile or blind or not conscious and she immersed herself provided there were present women of sound mind to prepare everything for her she may eat terimah or papa said according to our nathan it happened thus she fell from a bridge according to the rabbis it happened thus she went down into the sea to cool herself. Rabbis said if a person while slaughtering the red cow slaughtered at the same time another animal according to all views the red cow is invalid Talmud. Mosulan if another animal was accidentally slaughtered with it according to our Nathan the red cow is invalid and the other animal valid according to the rabbis the red cow is valid and the other animal invalid this is surely obvious it was necessary to state it. Clause if another animal was accidentally slaughtered with it in order to set forth our Nathan's view for I might have said that the divine law when it said and he shall slaughter it implying it but not it and another referred to the slaughtering of two red cows simultaneously but to slaughter a common animal with it I might have said would not render it invalid we are therefore taught otherwise if while slaughtering the red cow he cut at the same time a pumpkin according to all views it. Red cow is invalid if a pumpkin was accidentally cut whilst the red cow was being slaughtered according to all views the red cow is valid Mishnah if the knife fell and he paused in the slaughtering in order to lift it up if his coat fell down and he paused to lift it up if he sharpened the knife and grew tired and another came and slaughtered in each case if the pause was for the length of time required for slaughtering the slaughtering is invalid our Simeon said it is invalid if it pause was for the length of time required for examining the knife tomorrow what is meant by the length of time required for slaughtering it means said Rabbi of time required for slaughtering another animal Arkahana and RC asked Rabbi is the test in the case of a beast to be the length of time required for slaughtering another beast and in the case of a bird the length of time required for slaughtering another bird or is the test always the length of time required for slaughtering a beast even in the case of a bird, Rab answered, I was not on such intimate terms with my uncle as to ask him this. It was stated, Rab said, in the case of a beast, the test is the length of time required for slaughtering a beast, and in the case of a bird, the length of time required for slaughtering a bird. Samuel said, the test, even in the case of a bird, is the length of time required for slaughtering a beast. So too, when Arabin came from Palestine, he reported our Yohanan's opinion that the test, even in the case of a bird, is the length of time required for slaughtering a beast. Arhanada said, the Mishnah means the length of time required for fetching another animal and slaughtering it. Fetching why he might fetch an animal from anywhere, then you have made the test to vary with the circumstances of each case. Our Papa explained the difference between them is as regards an animal that is ready for casting in the West. It was reported in the name of our Jose, son of Arhanada. The Mishnah means the length. Of time required to lift up lay on the ground and slaughter in the case of small animals a small animal and in the case of large animals a large animal Rabbi said if one spent the whole day slaughtering one animal with a blunt knife the slaughtering is valid Rabbi raised the question are several short pauses to be combined but surely this can be solved from his preceding statement no for there he did not pause at all Arhuna the son of our Nathan raised this question what if he paused whilst cutting the lesser portion of the organs this remains undecided our Simeon said it is invalid if the pause was for the length of time required for examining the knife what is the meaning of the length of time required for examining our Yohanan said it means the length of time required for a sage to examine the knife but this test would vary with the circumstances of each case it means the length of time required for the slaughterer himself a sage to examine the knife mission of a man First cut the gullet and then tore away the windpipe or first tore away the windpipe and then cut the gullet or if he cut one of these organs and paused until the animal died or if he thrust the knife underneath the second organ and cut it in all these cases Archibald says the animal is nibble or Akiva says it is truth Archibald laid down this rule in the name of our Joshua whenever an animal is rendered invalid by a fault in the slaughtering it is nibble whenever an animal has been duly slaughtered but is rendered invalid by some other defect it is truth our Akiva ultimately agreed with him Gamar if a man first cut the gullet etc and our Akiva agreed with him a contradiction was pointed out we have learned the following defects render cattle truth Talmud Mostul and B if the gullet was pierced or the windpipe severed Rob answered there is no contradiction in the one case he first cut the gullet and then tore away the windpipe in the other case he first tore away the Windpipe and then cut the gullet where he first cut the gullet and then tore away the windpipe we regarded as a fault in the slaughtering but where he first tore away the windpipe and then cut the gullet we regarded as invalidated by some other defect our Ahabi who raised the following objection against Rabbah it was taught if he first cut the gullet and then tore away the windpipe or first tore away the windpipe and then cut the gullet the animal is nibble render the second clause. Thus or if he tore away the windpipe having already cut the gullet he retorted there are two arguments against this first it is now identical with the first clause and secondly it expressly says and he then cut rather said Rabbah it must be interpreted thus the following defects render the animal prohibited some as nibble and some as trifa then why does it not include also the case of Hezekiah for Hezekiah taught if one cut an animal into two it is nibble forthwith and also the case of R. Eliezer for our Eliezer taught if the thigh of an animal was removed and the cavity was noticeable it is nibble forthwith it includes such nibble only as does not convey uncleanness whilst alive but not such nibble as conveys uncleanness whilst alive our Simeon Belakish suggested in the one case he cut the windpipe in the place where it was already lacerated in the other case he did not cut the windpipe in the place where it was already lacerated where he cut it in the place where it was already lacerated we regard the animal as invalidated by a defect in the slaughtering but where he did not cut it in the place where it was already lacerated we regard the animal as invalidated by some other defect but did our Simeon Belakish really say this surely our Simeon Belakish has said that if the lung was pierced after he had cut the windpipe but before he had cut the gullet the slaughtering was valid this proves does it not that once the windpipe has been cut the lung is regarded as Though placed in the basket here also we should say should we not that once the windpipe has been lacerated it is regarded as though placed in the basket rather said our high Abba in the name of our Yohan and there is no contradiction there the mission represents the view of our Akiva before he retracted here after he retracted that mission however was allowed to stand the text above stated our Simeon Belakish said if the lung was pierced after he had cut the windpipe but before he had cut it. Gullet the slaughtering is valid Rabba said this decision of Rush Lakish applies only to the lung because the vitality of the lung is entirely dependent upon the windpipe but it does not apply to the intestines Arzara demurred saying since you declare the animal permissible wherever a defect occurred after cutting one organ what difference does it make whether the defect was in the lung or in the intestines Arzara however must have withdrawn his objection for Arzara had put the following. Question what is the law if the intestines were perforated after the first organ but before the second organ was cut is the first organ to be reckoned together with the second in order to render the animal clean and not nibble or not and we replied was not this question similar to that put by Ilfav is what is the law if a foe is put forth its foreleg out of the womb of its dam after the first organ but before the second organ was cut Talmud, Mostulan is the first organ to be reckoned together with the second in order to render the foreleg clean and not nibble or not now the question put by Arzara was only as to whether or not the animal was to be regarded as clean and not nibble but admittedly it is forbidden to be eaten our Ahabi Rab said to Rabbin it may very well be that Arzara did not
and all its bulk of flesh from around the throat salted well rinsed and well weighed until the animal expires and then eat it. Both Israelite and Gentile may eat it in this way. This very on the other hand supports the view of REDB Avin for REDB Avin said in the name of our Isaac B. Ashi and if a person wishes to be in good health he should cut off an olive's bulk of flesh from around the throat salted well rinsed and well weighed until the animal expires and then eat it. Both Israelite and Gentile may eat it in this way. Mishnah if a man slaughtered cattle or a wild beast or a bird and no blood came forth the slaughtering is valid and it may be eaten by him whose hands have not been washed for it has not been rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes by blood. Our Simeon says it has been rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes by the slaughtering Gemara. Now this is so only because no blood came forth but if blood did come forth it follows that it may not be eaten by one with unwashed hands but why? Are not unwashed hands unclean in the second degree, and that which is unclean in the second degree cannot render common food unclean in the third degree. But whence do you gather that we are dealing with common food? For it reads in the Mishnah or a wild beast, and if it is dealing with consecrated animals, it is unintelligible. For is there such a thing as a consecrated wild beast? Furthermore, if it is dealing with consecrated animals, can it be said that the slaughtering is valid where no blood came forth? The whole purpose of the slaughtering is to obtain the blood. Furthermore, if it is dealing with consecrated animals, can it be said that in the case where blood did come forth, it would render the animals susceptible to uncleanness? Surely our high Abba has said in the name of our Yohanan, whence do we know that the blood of consecrated animals cannot render anything susceptible to uncleanness from the verse, Thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water, which implies that blood. Which is poured out as water can render susceptible to uncleanness, but blood which is not poured out as water cannot. Furthermore, if it is dealing with consecrated animals, can it be said that where no blood came forth, the animal would not be rendered susceptible to uncleanness? Surely it would be susceptible to uncleanness because of its sacred esteem, for it is established that sacred esteem will render consecrated matter susceptible to uncleanness. Our said in the name of Rabbi Abba. Here in our mission, we are dealing with unconsecrated animals that were bought in Jerusalem with second tithe money, and the ruling is not in accordance with our measures. Before we have learned Talmud, Mosul, and be whatsoever requires immersion in the waters of Amikwe by decree of the scribes will through contact render consecrated food unclean and terima invalid, but will leave common food or second tithe unaffected. So our measure, the sages, however, regard second tithe to be affected. Our shima. Be ashy demurred, is it really so? Perhaps the sages differ with our mayor only on the question of eating the second tithe, but there is no dispute between them on the question of coming into contact with the second tithe or of eating common food. And here in our mission, it is a question of coming into contact for it reads and may be eaten by him whose hands have not been washed. And this might very well mean that we are dealing with the case of one person feeding another, rather said our papa here in the mission. We are dealing with hands that were unclean in the first degree, and the ruling is in accordance with the view of our Simeon B. Eliezer, for it was taught hands which are unclean in the first degree can in no wise affect common food. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says in the name of our mayor, hands which are unclean in the first degree can affect common food, and hands which are unclean in the second degree can affect terima. Does this mean to say that hands which are unclean in the first degree can? Affect common food only and not terima. Indeed, no, it means hands which are unclean in the first degree can affect even common food, but hands which are unclean in the second degree can affect terima only, but not common food. But is it possible for hands to be unclean in the first degree? Yes, for we have learned if a person put his hands into a house stricken with leprosy, his hands become unclean in the first degree. So our the sages, however, say his hands become unclean in the second degree. Now all accept the principle that an entry by part of the person only is no entry, and the dispute between them is the extent of uncleanness imposed by the rabbis upon the hands as a precaution against the entry of the whole person. One our says that the rabbis imposed upon the hands the same degree of uncleanness as upon the person himself, but the sages say that they imposed upon the hands the usual degree of uncleanness attached to hands. But why do we not say that the ruling in our Mission accords with our Akiba who also holds that hands can be unclean in the first degree because it may be that our Akiba says so only with regard to terima or consecrated food since these are to be treated with strictness but with regard to common food he would agree that they are unclean only in the second degree but even so be they unclean only in the second degree have we not learned that according to our Akiba whatever is unclean in the second degree can render common food unclean in the third degree for we have learned on that same day our Akiba expounded it is written and every earthen vessel wherein to any of them falleth whatsoever is in it shall be unclean yet but now there is not written tame but yidma which signifies that it will make others unclean this teaches that a loaf which is unclean in the second degree will by contact render common food unclean in the third degree perhaps this is a law only with regard to such uncleanness as declared by the Torah but not with Regard to such uncleanness as decreed by the rabbis, our Eliezer said in the name of our Hashai here in our mission, we are dealing with unconsecrated animals that were kept in the cleanness proper to consecrated things, and the ruling is not in accordance with our Joshua's view. For we have learned, our Eliezer says, He who eats food unclean in the first degree becomes unclean in the first degree. If it was unclean in the second degree, he becomes unclean in the second degree, and if it was unclean in the third degree, he becomes unclean in the third degree. Our Joshua says, He who eats food unclean in the first or second degree becomes unclean in the second degree. If it was unclean in the third degree, he becomes unclean in the second degree with regard to consecrated things only, but not with regard to terima. This applies only to common food kept in the cleanness proper to terima, and so only in the case of common food kept in the cleanness proper to terima is there a third. Degree of uncleanness, but not in the case of common food kept in the cleanness proper to consecrated things. For here, Joshua is of the opinion that in that latter case there cannot be a third degree of uncleanness. Why should we not say that our mission deals Talmud, Mosul, and A with unconsecrated animals kept in the cleanness proper to terima, and so it will be in accord with our Joshua? This cannot be for our mission speaks of the meat of the animal, and if you say that it deals with an animal kept in the cleanness proper to terima, it is unintelligible. For is there such a thing as meat of terima? You therefore say it deals with an animal kept in the cleanness proper to consecrated animals, but it is likewise difficult. For is there such a thing as a consecrated wild beast? One might mistake meat for meat, but one could not mistake meat for produce. Ola said, My colleagues say that the mission deals with unconsecrated animals kept in the cleanness proper to consecrated. Animals and the ruling is not in accordance with our Joshua's view, but I say that it is in accordance with our Joshua's view, for he merely states the stronger case not only in the case of common food kept in the cleanness proper to consecrated food, which is of greater sanctity, is there a third degree of uncleanness, but even in the case of common food kept in the cleanness proper to terima, there is also a third degree of uncleanness who is meant by my colleagues, it is Rabbi B. Barhana for Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan, on what lines did the discussion between our Eliezer and our Joshua run? Thus our Eliezer said to our Joshua, we find in one instance that the eater is more unclean than the unclean food he has eaten, for the carcass of a clean bird does not defile by ordinary contact, and yet whilst in the gullet it renders the clothes unclean, should we not then generally regard the eater at least in the same degree of uncleanness as the unclean food that he has eaten and are? Joshua, what would he reply to this? We must not draw any conclusions from the case of the carcass of a clean bird, for it is an anomaly. But argue thus: we find that the unclean food is more unclean than the eater thereof. For foodstuffs can become unclean from an egg's bulk of unclean food, whereas the eater of unclean food does not become unclean unless he has eaten the size of two eggs thereof. Surely, then we cannot generally regard the eater as unclean as the food and our Eliezer. We must not draw any conclusions as to the degree of uncleanness from the specific quantities required in each case. Furthermore, according to your own argument, you are consistent when you say that he who eats food unclean in the first degree becomes unclean in the second degree. But why should he who eats that which is unclean in the second degree become likewise unclean in the second degree? Said our Joshua to him: Do we not find that foodstuffs unclean in the second degree can render other foodstuffs? Unclean in the second degree through the medium of a
He replied he merely stated the stronger case but has it not been stated above in the name of Aryul Hanan I too only said so in the case of common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima Amram disagree as to Aryul Hanan's view Allah said he who eats common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima which was unclean in the third degree becomes unfit to eat Terima what does he teach us we have already been taught above if it was unclean in the third degree he becomes unclean in the second degree with regard to consecrated things only but does not become unclean in the second degree with regard to Terima this applies only to common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima now it says that with regard to Terima he does not become unclean in the second degree but presumably he becomes unclean in the third degree from this passage I might have thought that he neither becomes unclean in the second degree nor in the third degree but merely on account of the fact that with regard to consecrated things he becomes unclean in the second degree does it also say with regard to Terima he does not become unclean in the second degree Allah therefore teaches us that he does become unclean in the third degree Arham raised this objection against Allah we have learned common food unclean in the first degree is itself unclean and renders unclean that which is unclean in the second degree renders invalid but not unclean and that which is unclean in the third degree may be eaten even if it is a potage containing ingredients of Terima now if you are right in saying that he who eats common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima which was unclean in the third degree becomes unfit to eat Terima would we then allow a priest to eat that which renders him unfit for eating Terima he replied drop the question of the potage containing ingredients of Terima Talmud Mastulana because in the time it takes to eat half a loaf there is not Consumed in olive's bulk of Terima, Arjanathan said in the name of Rabbi he who eats Terima which is unclean in the third degree is forbidden to eat Terima but is permitted to touch it. It is truly necessary to have the statement of Arjanathan as well as Allah's for from Allah's statement above. I should have thought that the ruling applied only to the case of common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima but in the case of real Terima I might have said that he is even forbidden to touch it. It is therefore necessary to have Arjanathan's statement and from Arjanathan's statement alone I should have thought that the ruling applied only to the case of real Terima but in the case of common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima I might have said that he is even permitted to eat it. Therefore both statements are necessary. Our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha was sitting before our and said he who eats common food kept in the cleanest proper to consecrated things which was Unclean in the third degree is clean and he may eat consecrated food for the only thing which will render consecrated food unclean in the fourth degree is real consecrated food which was unclean in the third degree Rami B. Hammer raised an objection it has been taught above if it was unclean in the third degree he becomes unclean in the second degree with regard to consecrated things only but does not become unclean in the second degree with regard to Terima this applies only to common food kept in the cleanest proper to Terima now why should this be so this food which is unclean in the third degree is not real consecrated food he replied drop the question of Terima since what is considered clean for Terima may yet be considered unclean for consecrated things whence do you gather this from the following mission which we learned the clothes of an Amharas are regarded as Midras for the Pharisees the clothes of the Pharisees are regarded as Midras for those who eat Terima the clothes of those who eat Terima are regarded as Midras for those who partake of consecrated food thereupon Rabba raised this point you are dealing are you not with Midras uncleanness but the law as to Midras uncleanness is quite exceptional Talmud, Mastul and before it is feared that his wife when in a menstruous condition sat upon these clothes with regard to produce however the rule does not apply or Isaac on the other hand says that the rule applies to the case of produce too R. Jeremiah of Diffie raised this objection do you say that the rule applies to the case of produce too surely we have learned if an Amhara said I have set aside in this barrel of Terima W any one quarter log for a consecrated purpose he is believed and the Terima does not render the consecrated one unclean now if you are right in saying that the rule that what is considered clean for Terima may yet be considered unclean for consecrated things applies to the case of produce too should. Not the Terima in this barrel render the consecrated one unclean he replied you are dealing are you not where the unclean is together with the clean but in such cases the law is exceptional for since he is believed with regard to the consecrated portion he is to be believed also with regard to the Terima portion Arhunabi Nathan raised this objection we have learned common food which is unclean in the second degree renders by contact common liquids unclean in the first degree and renders those who eat Terima unfit if it is unclean in the third degree it renders consecrated liquids unclean in the first degree and renders those who eat consecrated food unfit this applies only to common food kept in the cleanest proper to consecrated things this is a subject of dispute between Tanaim for it was taught common food kept in the cleanest proper to consecrated food is treated as common food our Eliezer son of Arzadik says it is treated as Terima that is two stages are Unclean and one stage invalid Arsimian says it has been rendered susceptible to uncleanness by the slaughtering RC said that Arsimian was of the opinion that only the slaughtering renders an animal susceptible to uncleanness but not the blood shall we say that the following interpretation supports his view we have learned Arsimian says it has been rendered susceptible to uncleanness by the slaughtering it means does it not by the slaughtering and not by the blood no it means even by the slaughtering come and here Arsimian said to the rabbis is it the blood that renders the animal susceptible to uncleanness surely it is the slaughtering this is what he said to them is it only the blood which renders the animal susceptible to uncleanness surely the slaughtering also renders it susceptible to uncleanness come and here we have learned Arsimian says the blood of a dead animal does not render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness now it is to be inferred from this is it not that the blood of a slaughtered animal will render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness. No, the inference to be drawn is that the blood of a slain animal will render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness. Then, what is the law with regard to the blood of a slaughtered animal? Will you say that it does not render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness? If so, he or Simeon should rather have stated his view with regard to the blood of a slaughtered animal, and it would have been self evident with regard to the blood of a dead animal. It was necessary for him to state his view with regard to the blood of a dead animal, for I might have argued what is the difference whether a human being or the angel of death slays it. It was therefore necessary to state it. Come and here it was taught. Our Simeon says the blood from a wound in an animal does not render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness. Is not the inference from this that the blood of a slaughtered animal renders susceptible? No, the inference. To be drawn is that the blood of a slain animal renders susceptible then what is the law with regard to the blood of a slaughtered animal will you say that it will not render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness if so he should rather have stated his view with regard to the blood of a slaughtered animal and it would have been self-evident with regard to the blood from a wound it was necessary for him to state his view with regard to the blood from a wound for I might have argued what difference can there be with regard to the blood whether the animal was slain completely or partially why is it that the blood of a slain animal will render foodstuff susceptible to uncleanness because it is written and drink the blood of a slain then the same should be the case with the blood of a slaughtered animal for it is written thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water the latter verse is stated in order to permit for general use the blood of consecrated animals which were Rendered unfit for sacrifice Talmud, Mastulina for I might have argued that since it is forbidden to shear the wool of these consecrated animals or to put them to any work the blood would have to be buried and not be used for any purpose we are therefore taught that it is not so a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught the verse and drink the blood of the slain excludes blood which comes out in a gush from rendering seeds susceptible to uncleanness our rabbis taught if a man while slaughtering splashed blood onto a pumpkin rabbi says it becomes thereby susceptible to uncleanness our high says it is a matter of doubt our Ashai remarked since rabbi says that it is susceptible to uncleanness and our high says that it is a matter of doubt on whose view should we rely let us then rely upon the view of our Simeon who has stated that only slaughtering will render an animal susceptible to uncleanness but not the blood our papa said it is agreed by all that where the blood remained. On the pumpkin from the beginning of the slaughtering unto the end there is no dispute for all hold it is rendered thereby susceptible to uncleanness the dispute arises only where the blood was wiped off between the cutting of the first and second organs rabbi holds that the term sheshet applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end so that here the blood upon the pumpkin is considered
The great opinion of two Arashi said the expression it is a matter of doubt means that it will never be settled for Arhai was in doubt in the case where the blood was wiped off during the slaughtering whether the term Shechita applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end or only to the last act of slaughtering so that by saying it is a matter of doubt he meant that it must not be eaten and yet it must not be burnt but then what is meant by the suggestion let us then rely. Upon the view of Arsimian are they not at variance for Arsimian holds that blood does not render foodstuffs susceptible to uncleanness whereas Arhai is in doubt about it they are nevertheless in agreement in their views regarding burning for they are both of the opinion that it is not to be burnt the opinion of Rabbi therefore on this point stands alone and the opinion of one Rabbi will not prevail over the great opinion of two Arsimian Vilakish raised the following question if it dry portion of a meal offering were to become unclean would it transmit uncleanness up to the first and second degrees or not is the conception of sacred esteem effectual only to the extent of rendering it invalid but not of enabling it to transmit uncleanness up to the first and second degrees or is there no such distinction our Eliezer said come and here it is written all food therein which may be eaten that on which water cometh shall be unclean that is to say food which has been Moistened by water is susceptible to uncleanness, but food which has not been moistened by water is not. Are you suggesting then that Arsimian Belakish does not accept the rule that food must first be moistened by water? Indeed, the question that Arsimian Belakish raised was as follows: Is food rendered susceptible to uncleanness by sacred esteem on the same footing as food moistened by water or not? And our Eliezer suggested an answer on the basis of the superfluous verses, arguing thus: Since it is written, but if water be put upon the seed, what need is there for the verse? All food therein which may be eaten, that on which water cometh Talmud, Mastul and be Talmud, Mastul and be it serves. Does it not to exclude sacred esteem? Not at all. One verse states the rule with reference to uncleanness emanating from a corpse; the other verse with reference to uncleanness emanating from a dead reptile. And it is necessary to have both verses for if the rule were stated only with reference to. Uncleanness emanating from a corpse I should have said that in that case only was it necessary for the food to be first moistened by water for the law regarding corpse uncleanness is not so rigorous inasmuch as a lentil's bulk of a corpse will not convey uncleanness but with regard to reptile uncleanness inasmuch as a lentil's bulk of a dead reptile will convey uncleanness might have said that it was not necessary for the food to be first moistened by water and on the other hand if the rule were stated only with reference to uncleanness emanating from a reptile I should have said that in that case only was it necessary for the food to be first moistened by water for the law regarding reptile uncleanness is not so rigorous inasmuch as a reptile does not render a person unclean for seven days but with regard to corpse uncleanness inasmuch as a corpse will render a person unclean for seven days I might have said it was not necessary for the food to be moistened by water both Verses are therefore necessary. Our Joseph raised the subjection. Our Simeon says it has been rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes by the slaughtering. Presumably susceptible to Uncle Anes means that when unclean it would transmit uncleanness up to the first and second degrees. But why it is not food moistened by water? Abbe replied it was ordained by the rabbis that if the slaughtering shall have the same effect upon the animal as though it had been moistened by water. Our Zara said come and hear. It was taught if a man gathered grapes for the one press Shammai says they are susceptible to uncleanness but Hillel says they are not eventually Hillel acquiesced in the view of Shammai but why it is not food emo stand by water Abbe replied it was ordained by the rabbis that if the grape juice shall have the same effect upon the grapes as though they had been moistened by water. Our Joseph thereupon said to Abbe when I cited our mission IT has been rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes by the slaughtering you replied that it was ordained that if the slaughtering shall have the same effect as though there was a moistening by water and when Arzara cited another case you also replied that it was ordained that if the grape juice shall have the same effect as though there was a moistening by water you might then just as well answer the question raised by Arsimian Belakish and say that it was ordained that its sacred esteem shall have the same effect as though there was a moistening by water you replied do you think that Arsimian Belakish raised the question as to whether it was to be held in a state of doubt or not he raised the question as to whether it was to be committed to the flames or not it follows that the conception of sacred esteem is indicated in the Torah where shall I say in the verse and the flesh that touch it any unclean thing shall not be eaten now what rendered this flesh susceptible to uncleanness shall I say it was the blood but this cannot before our high be ever reported in the name of our Yohan and whence do we know that the blood of a consecrated animal does not render food susceptible to uncleanness from the verse thou shalt not eat it thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water which teaches that blood which is poured out as water renders food susceptible to uncleanness but blood which is not poured out as water does not was it then the other liquid found in the slaughterhouse that rendered the flesh susceptible to uncleanness but this also cannot be the case for our Jose B. Hanan, it taught that the liquids in the slaughterhouse of the temple court are not only clean but will not even render any food susceptible to uncleanness moreover you cannot suggest that this passage refers to the blood only for it speaks of liquids you must therefore say that this verse proves that the flesh was rendered susceptible to uncleanness by sacred esteem but perhaps the verse is to be explained as suggested by Rab Judah. In the name of Samuel for Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel it might refer to the case where a cow consecrated for a peace offering was passed through a stream and slaughtered immediately after so that the water was still dripping from it rather it is to be proved from the latter part of the verse and as for the flesh which serves to include wood and frankincense now are wood and frankincense edible so as to be in the same category as foodstuffs it must therefore be that sacred esteem puts them in the same category as foodstuffs and renders them susceptible to uncleanness so in all cases sacred esteem will render foodstuffs susceptible to uncleanness Talmud, Mastul and now the question to our Simeon Belakish is this is the conception of sacred esteem effectual to the extent only of rendering the matter invalid but not of enabling it to transmit uncleanness up to the first and second degrees or is there no such distinction the question remains undecided mission of a man. Slaughtered a dying animal Arsimian B. Gamaliel says the slaughtering is invalid unless it jerked its foreleg and its hind leg. Arlizer says it is sufficient if it spurted the blood. Arsimian said if a man slaughtered a dying animal by night and early the following morning found the sides of the throat full of blood the slaughtering is valid for this proves that it spurted the blood which is sufficient according to Arlizer's view the sages say the slaughtering is invalid unless it jerked either its foreleg or its hind leg or it moved its tail to and fro and this is a test both with regard to large and small animals if a small animal stretched out its foreleg at the end of the slaughtering but did not withdraw it the slaughtering is invalid for this was but an indication of the expiration of its life these rules apply only to the case of an animal which was believed to be dying but if it was believed to be sound even though it did not show any of these signs it Slaughtering is valid Gamara how do you know that a dying animal which was slaughtered is permitted to be eaten but why should you assume that it is forbidden because it is written these are the living things which you may eat that is to say that which can live you may eat but that which cannot live you may not eat and a dying animal cannot live we know it from here since the divine law ordains that nibbleh is forbidden to be eaten it follows that a dying animal is permitted for if you were to say that a dying animal is forbidden then it will be asked if it is already forbidden whilst still alive is there any doubt after death but perhaps the term nibbleh includes a dying animal this cannot be for it is written and if any beast of which you may eat die he that touches the carcass nibbleh thereof shall be unclean until the even that is to say when it is dead the divine law terms it nibbleh but whilst still alive it is not termed nibbleh but perhaps the term of nibbleh I still Maintain includes the dying animal but whereas the animal is still alive one who partakes of it transgresses a positive law after death one who partakes of it transgresses a prohibition as well rather we must derive it from here since the divine law ordains that trifa is forbidden to be eaten it follows that a dying animal is permitted for if you were to say that a dying animal is forbidden then it will be asked if a dying animal which is not physically deficient is forbidden is there any doubt about it trifa but perhaps the term trifa includes a dying animal yet trifa was expressly prohibited to teach that one who partakes thereof transgresses a positive law as well as a prohibition if so wherefore does the divine law
and likewise let the prohibition of trifa come and be superimposed upon the prohibition of fat Talmud, Mastulan be now if you were to say that the term trifa includes a dying animal the divine law then should have ordained and the fat of Nebula may be used for any other service and the fat of trifa you shall in no wise eat and I should have argued that if while the animal is yet alive the prohibition of trifa is superimposed upon the prohibition of the fate is there any question of this? After death, but since the divine law expressly stated Nibla in the verse, it follows that the term Trifa does not include a dying animal. Marsan of Arashi demurred, perhaps in truth the term Trifa does include a dying animal. And if you ask why, then does the divine law expressly state Nibla? I reply, it refers only to a case of Nibla which was not preceded by the animal being in a dying state, as in the case where the animal was suddenly cut into two, even in that case it is impossible. For the animal to have died without first being in a dying state for the short while before the greater portion of the animal had been cut through. Alternatively, I can argue thus if it is so, the verse should have stated and the fat of Nibla and of Trifa. Wherefore is the word fat repeated to teach you that in this case SC Trifa there is no distinction between the fat and the flesh, but there is another in which there is a distinction between the fat and the flesh, and that is the case of A. Dying animal alternatively we can derive it from the following it is written and said I Lord God behold my soul hath not been polluted for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself nibla or is torn of beasts trifa neither came there abhorred flesh into my mouth and it has been interpreted as follows behold my soul hath not been polluted for I did not allow impure thoughts to enter my mind during the day so as to lead to pollution at night for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of nibla or trifa for I have never eaten of the flesh of an animal concerning which it had been exclaimed slaughter it slaughter it neither came there abhorred flesh into my mouth for I did not eat the flesh of an animal which a sage pronounced to be permitted in the name of our Nathan it was reported that this means I did not eat of an animal from which the priestly dues had not been set apart now if you say that the flesh of a dying animal which was slaughtered is permitted to be eaten then in this lay the preeminence of Ezekiel but if you say that it is forbidden to be eaten wherein lay the preeminence of Ezekiel what do you call a dying animal Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if when it is made to stand it does not remain upstanding it is a sign that it is dying Arhan Abishalimia said in the name of Rab and this is so even if it can buy logs of wood Rami B Ezekiel said even if it can buy tree trunks this was the version taught in Surah in Pamadida however it was taught as follows what do you call a dying animal Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if when it is made to stand it does not remain upstanding it is a sign that it is dying even though it can buy logs of wood Rami B Ezekiel said even though it can buy tree trunks Samuel once met Rab's disciples and asked them what did Rab teach you with regard to the signs of a dying animal they replied this is what Rab said Talmud Mastulan it is an adequate sign of vitality if it lows or excretes or moves its ear he thereupon remarked does Abba really require the moving of the ear I am of the opinion that whatever movement the animal makes provided it is not a movement brought about by the expiration of its life is a sufficient sign of vitality and what are the movements brought about by the expiration of life said Arain and Mar Samuel explained it to me thus if its foreleg was bent and it stretched it out this is a movement brought about by the expiration of life if its foreleg was outstretched and it bent it this is a movement not brought about by the expiration of life but what does he teach us we have learned it already if a small animal stretched out its foreleg at the end of the slaughtering but did not withdraw it, it is invalid for this was but an indication of the expiration of its life now it follows from this does it not that if it did withdraw it, it is valid no from our mission I might have concluded that only if its foreleg was bent and it stretched it out and then bent it again it is valid but not if it was first outstretched and it merely bent it he therefore teaches us that this latter is a sufficient sign of vitality an objection was raised and was taught our Jose said our mayor used to say that the lowing of an animal while it was being slaughtered was not a sign of vitality our Eliezer son of our Jose reported in the name of our Jose even if it excreted or moved its tail to and fro it is not a sign of vitality is there not here a contradiction in regard to lowing and also in regard to excreting in regard to lowing there is no contradiction because in the one case the noise was loud and in the other case the noise was faint and also in regard to excreting there is no contradiction for in the one case the animal discharged excrement feebly and in the other case it discharged vigorously our Hista said it has been reported that the indications of vitality which the rabbis require must occur at the end of the slaughtering but at the end of the slaughtering I say really means the middle of the slaughtering and it excludes only the case where the indications occur at the beginning of the slaughtering are his diet once do I know this from our mission which we learned if a small animal stretched out its foreleg but did not withdraw it, it is invalid now when did it do so shall I say at the end of the slaughtering how long then must it continue to live we must therefore say that it did so in the middle of the slaughtering Rabbi thereupon said to him indeed I maintain that it must do so at the end of the slaughtering for I am of the opinion that if the animal did not do so at the end of the slaughtering one may be certain that life had expired some time previously our and B Isaac said the indications of vitality which the rabbis require may occur at the beginning of the slaughtering our and B Isaac added once do I know this from our mission which we have Learned our Simeon said if a man slaughtered a dying animal by night and early the following morning found the sides of the throat full of blood the slaughtering is valid for this proves that it spurted the blood which is sufficient according to our Eliezer's view and Samuel explained that the mission referred to the sides of the throat now if you say that the indication of vitality may occur at the beginning of the slaughtering it is well but if you say that it must occur at the end of it slaughtering then why is the slaughtering valid it might have spurted the blood only at the beginning of the slaughtering but perhaps the spurting of blood indicates a greater measure of vitality but is it greater have we not learned our Eliezer says it is sufficient if it spurted the blood it is a measure of vitality less than that required by Rabbi Gamaliel but greater than that required by the rabbis Rabbi said Samabi Hilkiah told me that the father of Barabah Ramothers read the brother of Barab Abram raised this question, but is it the spurting of blood greater than that required by the rabbis? Does it not read in the mission of the sages say the slaughtering is invalid unless it jerked either its foreleg or its hind leg? Now, with whom do the sages argue with our Simeon be Gamaliel? Then they should have said if only it jerked clearly, therefore they are arguing with our Eliezer. Now, if you say that it, the spurting of blood is a greater measure of vitality than that required by the sages, why do they say unless Rabbah said the indications of vitality which the rabbis require must occur at the end of the slaughtering? Rabbah added, Whence do I know this from the following Beritha which was taught? It is written when a bullet Talmud, Mastulan B, or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, then it shall be seven days under the dam, or a sheep. This excludes a crossbreed, or a goat. This excludes a goat looking like a lamb is brought forth. This excludes that which was. Extracted from the side, it shall be seven days. This excludes an animal which is too young under the dam. This excludes an orphan. Now, what is meant by an orphan? Does it mean that the mother beast brought forth its young and died immediately after? Must it then continue to live on forever? Or again, does it mean that the mother beast died and immediately after the young was brought forth? But this would be excluded from the words is brought forth. It can only mean that the one expired at the same moment that the other came into life. Now, if you say that the mother beast must show signs of life after bringing forth, it is therefore necessary to employ a verse in order to exclude this case of an orphan. But if you say that it need not show signs of life after bringing forth, why then is a verse employed to exclude this case? It surely is excluded from the words is brought forth. Rabbi said the law is as stated in the following: Barita, if a small animal stretched out its foreleg and did not. Withdraw it, the slaughtering is invalid, but if it did withdraw it, it is valid. These rules apply only to the foreleg, but with regard to the hind leg, the rule is that whether it stretched it out but did not bend it or bent it but did not stretch it out, it is valid. Moreover, all this applies to a small animal, but with regard to a large animal, the rule is that whether it was the foreleg or the hind leg, whether it stretched it out but did not bend it or bent it but did not stretch it out, it is valid with regard to a bird, even if it merely twitched its wing or flapped its tail, it is a sufficient sign of vitality. What does he rob teach us? Surely these rules are all implied in our mission. If a small animal stretched out its foreleg but
however is of the opinion that only if we heard him a heathen express an idolatrous intention with regard to the animal does it become invalid but not otherwise for we do not say that the thoughts of a heathen are usually directed towards idolatry whereas our Eliza is of the opinion that even if we did not hear him express an idolatrous intention it is invalid for we say that the thoughts of a heathen are usually directed towards idolatry and our Jose comes to say that even if we heard him express an idolatrous intention it does not become invalid for we do not hold that one man's wrongful intention should affect another's acts according to another version they differ even in the case where we heard him a heathen express an idolatrous intention with regard to the animal the first tana is of the opinion that the view that one man's wrongful intention may affect another's acts applies only as regards acts performed inside the temple but not outside and we cannot draw any inference as to acts performed outside from acts performed inside Talmud, Mosulin, whereas our Eliezer holds that we may draw this inference outside services from inside services and our Jose comes to say that even as regards acts performed inside we do not hold that one man's wrongful intention should affect another's acts it was reported if one slaughtered a beast with the intention expressed during the slaughtering of sprinkling the blood or burning the fat unto idols. Ar Yohanan says a beast is forbidden for all purposes Reshlakish says it is permitted Ar Yohanan says it is forbidden because he accepts the principle a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service is of consequence even in connection with idolatry for one must draw an analogy between acts performed inside and acts performed outside Reshlakish says it is permitted because he does not accept the principle a wrongful intention expressed during one service with Regard to another service is of consequence in the case of idolatry for one must not draw any analogy between acts performed inside and acts performed outside now they are consistent in their views for it was also reported if one slaughtered a sin offering under its own name with the intention expressed at the time of slaughtering of sprinkling the blood under the name of another sacrifice Ar Yohanan says it is invalid Rush Lakish says it is valid Ar Yohanan says it is invalid because he accepts the principle a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service is of consequence even in this case for we derive it from the case of Pickle Rush Lakish says it is valid because he does not accept in this case the principle a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service is of consequence for we may not derive it from the case of Pickle and it was necessary for both disputes to be reported for if this dispute only was Reported I should have said that only here does Rush Lakish maintain his view because we must not draw an inference as to acts performed outside from acts performed inside but where each is a service performed inside he would no doubt concur with Aryohanan that we derive one from the other and if the other dispute only was reported I should have said that only there does Aryohanan maintain his view but in this case he would no doubt concur with Rush Lakish it was therefore necessary that both disputes be reported Arshis hate raised an objection we have learned our Jose exclaimed is there not here in the fortiori argument for if in the case of consecrated animals where a wrongful intention can render invalid it is established that everything depends solely upon the intention of him who performs the service how much more in the case of unconsecrated animals where a wrongful intention cannot render invalid does everything depend solely upon the intention of him who slaughters now what is meant by the assertion that in the case of unconsecrated animals a wrongful intention will not render invalid shall I say it means that in no wise will it render invalid then how is it possible for the prohibition of that which has been slaughtered to idols ever to take effect obviously it means a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service and the mission is to be interpreted thus if in the case of consecrated animals where a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service renders them invalid it is established that everything depends solely upon the intention of him who performs the service how much more in the case of unconsecrated animals where a wrongful intention expressed during one service with regard to another service does not render them invalid does everything depend solely upon the intention of him who slaughters now the assertion with regard to services performed inside namely consecrated animals Contradicts Resh Lakish and the assertion with regard to services performed outside, namely unconsecrated animals, contradicts Ar Yohanan. I grant, however, that as far as Resh Lakish is concerned, the assertion with regard to services performed inside presents no real difficulty for one view he expressed before he learned the interpretation of the mission from his master Ar Yohanan and the other after he learned it from Ar Yohanan, but the assertion with regard to services performed outside clearly contradicts Ar Yohanan. After raising this objection, he or she's hate answered it. Thus, the mission refers to the four principal services, and the passage must be read as follows If in the case of consecrated animals where a wrongful intention expressed in the course of any one of the four principal services renders them invalid, it is established that everything depends solely upon the intention of him who performs the service Talmud, Mosul, and be how much more in the case of Unconsecrated animals where a wrongful intention renders them invalid only if expressed in the course of any one of two services does everything depend solely upon the intention of him who slaughters the following Barry who was taught in support of the view of Ar Yohanan if a person in Israelite slaughtered an animal with the intention expressed during the slaughtering of sprinkling the blood or burning the fat unto idols it is regarded as a sacrifice unto the dead if he slaughtered it and afterwards expressed his intention this was an actual case which occurred in Caesarea and the rabbis expressed no opinion with regard to it neither forbidding nor permitting it or his dot explained they did not forbid it in deference to the view of the rabbis and they did not permit it in deference to the view of our Eliezer but how do you know this perhaps the rabbis maintain their view only there in our mission because we did not hear him as see the idolater express any intention at all but here since we heard him express an intention after the slaughtering even the rabbis will admit that it is invalid for his last act proves what he had in mind at the beginning or you might argue thus perhaps our Eliezer maintains his view only there in our mission because it deals with a heathen and he is of the opinion that the thoughts of a heathen are usually directed towards idolatry but here since we are dealing with an Israelite it would not be right to say that his last act proves what he had in mind at the beginning rather said our Shizbai explained thus they did not permit it in deference to the view of our Simeon Begamaliel which statement of our Simeon Begamaliel is meant shall I say it is his statement on the subject of divorce for we have learned if a person in good health said write a bill of divorce to my wife it is held that he merely intended to tease her and there actually happened a case where a person of good health said write a bill of divorce to my wife and he Immediately went up to the roof and fell down from it and was killed and Arsimian Begamaliel ruled if he threw himself down the divorce is valid but if the wind pushed him over the divorce is not valid and the following argument ensued does not the case stated contradict the given ruling and the reply was there is an omission in the text and it should read thus if his last act proves what he had in mind at the beginning the divorce will be valid and there actually happened a case where a person in good health said write a bill of divorce to my wife and he immediately went up to the roof and fell down from it and was killed and Arsimian Begamaliel ruled if he threw himself down the divorce is valid but if the wind pushed him over the divorce is not valid perhaps this case is different for he actually said write the bill of divorce rather said Rubin it was in deference to the view of Arsimian Begamaliel in the following case for it was taught if a person assigned in writing his estate which included slaves to another and the latter said I do not want them the SC the slaves may nevertheless eat terimog if their second master was a priest our Simeon Begamaliel says as soon as that person has said I do not want them the ears at once become the legal owners of them and the following argument ensued with the first tanner regard the assignee as a legal owner even if he stands and objects whereupon rabbi others say are Yohanan explained if he objected from the outset all agree that he has not acquired them likewise if he remained silent at first but subsequently objected all agree that he has acquired them the dispute arises only where the assignor transferred the estate through a third party to the assignee and the latter was silent at first but subsequently objected to it the first tanner is of the opinion that by his silence he has acquired them and his subsequent objection merely signifies that he has changed his mind our Simeon Begamaliel is of it opinion that his last act proves what he had in mind at the beginning and the reason he did not object at the outset was because he no doubt said to himself why should I object before they came into my possession Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel that the Halachah is in accordance with the view of our Jose certain Arabs once came to Zikania and gave the Jewish butchers some rams to slaughter saying the blood and the fat shall be for us while the hide and the flesh shall
Regarded as a sacrifice of the dead, I will point out a contradiction. It was taught if a man slaughtered an animal as a sacrifice to mountains, hills, seas, rivers, deserts, the sun, the moon, the stars, and planets, Michael the archangel, or a small worm, it is regarded as a sacrifice of the dead. Abay explained it is no difficulty here in our mission. He declared it to be a sacrifice to the mountain itself, but there he declared it to be a sacrifice to the deity of the mountain. There is indeed support for this view. For in the Barith quoted, they are all stated together with Michael the archangel. This is conclusive. Arhuna stated if his neighbor's beast was lying in front of an idol, then as soon as he has cut one of the organs of the throat, he has thereby rendered it prohibited. He is evidently in agreement with the dictum of all reported in the name of Arhuna and his, although the rabbis have declared that he who bowed down to his neighbor's beast has not rendered it prohibited. Nevertheless, if he performed on it an act of idolatrous worship, he has thereby rendered it prohibited. Arnaman raised this objection against Arhuna. It was taught if a person inadvertently slaughtered on the Sabbath a sin offering outside the temple court as a sacrifice to an idol, he is liable to three sin offerings. Now, if you say that as soon as he has cut one organ only, he has rendered it prohibited, then he should not be liable on account of slaughtering outside Talmud, Mos Chulin B. For it is as though he were cutting earth. Our Papa answered, We are dealing here with a sin offering of a bird, so that all the prohibitions arrive simultaneously. But let us consider Arhuna based his statement. Did he not upon Ola's view, but Ola refers to any act, however slight, rather assume that he expressly declared that he intended to worship the idol only at the completion of the slaughtering. If this is the case, why only a sin offering it could have dealt with any offering, rather said. Marzutra in the name of our Papa we are dealing here with the case where half of the windpipe of the sin offering of a bird was mutilated and this person merely added to it the smallest cut thereby completing the slaughtering and now all the prohibitions arrive simultaneously our Papa remarked had not Arhuna specifically mentioned one organ the above barita of the sin offering would never have presented any difficulty for the expression and act used by Ola could mean a complete act of idolatrous worship our Papa further remarked had not Arhuna expressly said his neighbor's animal the above barita of the sin offering would not have presented any difficulty why because a man can only render prohibited even by his slightest act that which belongs to him but not that which belongs to others is not this obvious it is not for I might have said that since he received atonement through it it is regarded as his own he therefore must state it our Isaac stated a person cannot render prohibited that which does not belong to him an objection was raised it was taught if a person inadvertently slaughtered on the Sabbath a sin offering outside the temple court as a sacrifice to an idol he is liable to three sin offerings and we interpreted this barita as referring to a sin offering of a bird half of whose windpipe was mutilated now the reason for the ruling is because it is a sin offering of a bird in which case all the prohibitions arrive simultaneously Talmud, Mosulim but with regard to other sacrifices it would not be so if then you say that a person cannot render prohibited that which does not belong to him why must the barita be interpreted referring to the sin offering of a bird it can just as well refer to the sin offering of an animal since he receives atonement through it it is regarded as his own come and here if two persons held one knife and slaughtered an animal one intending it as a sacrifice to one of these things and the other for a legitimate purpose the slaughtering is invalid we must suppose that he had a share in it come and here if a person rendered unclean another's food or if he mixed terima with another's common food or if he offered unto an idol another's wine then if he did so inadvertently he is not liable for the damage but if deliberately he is liable we must suppose also here that he had a share in it this is disputed by Tanaim it was taught if a gentile offered the wine of an Israelite as a libation even though not in the presence of an idol he has rendered it prohibited our Judah be there and our Judah be Baba declare it permitted for two reasons first because a wine libation is offered only in the presence of the idol and secondly because he the owner can say to the gentile you have no right to render my wine prohibited against my will our and our and our Isaac however will say that even the Tana who holds that a Person can render prohibited that which does not belong to him maintains this view only in the case of a Gentile but not in the case of an Israelite for the Israelite merely intended to vex his fellow come and here if two persons held one knife and slaughtered an animal one intending it as a sacrifice to one of these things and the other for a legitimate purpose the slaughtering is invalid we must suppose that he was an Israelite apostate come and here if a person rendered unclean another's food or if he mixed terima with another's common food or if he offered unto an idol another's wine then if he did so inadvertently he is not liable for the damage but if deliberately he is liable we must suppose also here that he was an Israelite apostate Araha the son of Rabba asked Arashi what is the law of an Israelite about to slaughter another's beast as a sacrifice to idols was warned against it and he accepted the warning he replied you speak to you not of one who has surrendered himself to death surely no one is more of an apostate than he mission one may not slaughter in such manner that the blood runs into the sea or into rivers or into vessels but one may slaughter into a pool of water or when on board ship onto the backs of vessels one may not slaughter at all into a pit yet a person may dig a pit in his own house for the blood to run into in the street however he should not do so lest he appear Talmud, Mosul and be to follow the ways of it. Heretics tomorrow one may not slaughter into the sea why is it that a person may not slaughter into the sea it is, is it not because it might be said that he is slaughtering to the deity of the sea then is it not the same when a person slaughters into a pool of water for it might be said that he is slaughtering to the image reflected in the water Rob answered this was taught only regarding turbid water one may not slaughter at all into a pit yet a person may dig a pit etc have you not just Said that one may not slaughter into a pit at all. Abay answered the first clause refers to a pit in the street. Said to him, Rabbah, since the final clause reads in the street, however, he should not do so. It follows that the first clause does not refer to a pit in the street. Rabbah therefore answered, This is the interpretation. One may not slaughter at all into a pit, but if a person desires to keep his yard clean, what should he do? He should prepare a place close to the pit and slaughter there. And the blood may be allowed to trickle down into the pit in the street, however, he should not do so, lest he appear to follow the ways of the heretics. A very though was taught which supports Rabbah's view. If a person was traveling on a ship and there was no place on the ship where he might slaughter, he may stretch out his hand over the side of the ship and slaughter there, and the blood is allowed to trickle down the sides of the ship into the sea. A person may not slaughter at all into a pit, but if he Desires to keep his yard clean, what should he do? He should prepare a place close to the pit and slaughter there, and the blood is allowed to trickle down into the pit in the street. However, he should not do so, for it is written, Neither shall ye walk in their statutes. If he did so, there must be an inquiry concerning him. Mishnah, if a man slaughtered an unconsecrated animal outside the temple court, declaring it to be a burnt offering, or a peace offering, or a guilt offering, for a doubtful SLN, or the Passover offering, or a thank offering, the slaughtering is invalid. Our Simeon, however, declares it valid. If two persons held one knife and slaughtered an unconsecrated animal outside the temple court, one declaring it to be one of the above, and the other intending it for a legitimate purpose, the slaughtering is invalid. If a man slaughtered an unconsecrated animal outside the temple court, declaring it to be a sin offering, or a guilt offering, or a firstling, or the tithe of cattle, or a Substitute offering the slaughtering is valid. This is the rule if one slaughtered an animal declaring it to be a sacrifice which can be brought either as a votive or a free will offering IT is invalid, but if he declares it to be a sacrifice which cannot be brought either as a votive or a free will offering IT is valid. Gemara if one slaughtered declaring it to be a burnt offering, etc. Can a guilt offering for a doubtful sin be brought as a votive or as a free will offering? Are Yohanan answered it. Author of this view is Arlizer who maintains that a person can offer a guilt offering for a doubtful sin daily. Can the Passover offering be brought as a votive or as a free will offering at any time is not its time fixed. Arashai answered it is different with the Passover offering for it may be set aside for this purpose at any time during the year. Arjane said the mission refers only to unblemished animals, but in the case of blemished animals, everybody knows that it cannot be an offering. Our Yohanan, however, says that it refers even to blemished animals, for he might sometimes cover up the blemish and it would not be noticeable if one slaughtered, declaring it to be a sin offering. Our Yohanan
Offering of a woman after childbirth are Eliezer said this is so only when he has no wife but if he has a wife it might be said that he is slaughtering it for a burnt offering on her behalf but he did not say I declare it to be the burnt offering of my wife Arabau answered we must suppose that he said I declare it to be the burnt offering of my wife is not this obvious Talmud, Mastulin and Ofer you might say that if his wife had given birth to a child it would be known to all he. Therefore teaches us that the slaughtering in this case is invalid for it is possible that she had a miscarriage C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I I mission the following defects render cattle trophy if the gullet was pierced two or the windpipe severed three if the membrane of the brain was pierced four if the heart was pierced as far as the cavity thereof be if the spine was broken and the cord severed six if the liver was gone and not remained seven if the lung was pierced eight or was deficient our Simeon says provided it was pierced as far as the main bronchi nine if the abomasum x or the gallbladder eleven or the intestines were pierced twelve if the inner rumen was pierced thirteen or the greater part of the outer covering torn our Judah says in a large animal if it was torn to the extent of a handbreadth and in a small animal if the greater part of it was torn nineteen if the omasum fifteen or reticulum was pierced on the outside sixteen if the animal fell from the roof seventeen if most of its ribs were fractured eighteen or if it was clawed by wolf our Judah says small cattle are trophy if clawed by wolf large cattle if clawed by a lion small fowl if clawed by a hog large fowl if clawed by a falcon this is the rule if an animal with a similar defect could not continue to live it is trophy our Simeon Belakish said where do we find in the Torah an allusion to trophy where you ask is it not written ye shall not eat flesh that is torn of beasts trophy in the field the question was where do we find in the Torah the view that a trophy animal cannot continue to live for from the last clause of the Mishnah this is the rule if an animal with a similar defect could not continue to live it is trophy it follows that a trophy animal cannot continue to live where then do we find it in the Torah it is written these are the living things which you may eat that is that which can continue to live you may eat but that which cannot continue to live you may not eat hence a trophy animal cannot continue to live and as to the one who holds the view that a trophy animal can continue to live it will be asked where do we find this view indicated in the Torah it is indicated in the verse these are the living things which you may eat for it means these living things you may eat but other living things you may not eat hence a trophy animal can continue to live and for what purpose does the first teacher use the word these he requires it for the following Exposition of the Tana of the School of R. Ishmael for a Tana of the School of R. Ishmael expounded the verse These are the living things which you may eat indicates that the Holy One blessed be he took hold of one of each species of animal showed it to Moses and said to him this you may eat and this you may not eat but does not the second teacher also require this word for the exposition of the Tana of the School of R. Ishmael indeed he does where then is it indicated in the Torah that a trip animal can continue to live it is indicated in the exposition of another verse also by a Tana of the School of R. Ishmael for a Tana of the School of R. Ishmael expounded it is written between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten here are indicated the eighteen defects which render an animal trip and which were communicated to Moses on Mount Sinai but are there no more but what about Basker and the seven statements reported by the Amram. Talmud, Mastulin B. Of course, to the Tana of our Mishnah, this is no difficulty, for he merely mentioned some defects, whilst those which he omitted to mention he intended to include under the general head. This is the rule, but against the Tana of the school of Arishmael, who expressly mentions the number 18, it will be asked, Are there no more? Is there not also an animal whose hind leg was cut off above the knee joint? Is trophy the Tana of the school of Arishmael concurs with the view expressed by our Simeon B. Eliezer that the wound could be cauterized and the animal could recover, granted, however, that it could be cauterized and the animal could recover, but are we not arguing upon the view of the Tana of the school of Arishmael? And he is of the view that a trophy animal can continue to live, rather say he concurs with our Simeon B. Eliezer, who indeed declares that in such a case the animal is permitted, but is there not the case of a deficiency of the spine for we? Have learned what is considered a deficiency of the spine. Bet Shammai say if two vertebrae were missing, Beth Hillel say if only one was missing. And Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel that their views are the same with regard to trophy, the piercing of the omasum and the reticulum, which you reckon as two cases you ought to reckon as one, so that you may exclude one and add this in its place. But is there not the case of an animal which was stripped of its height? He concurs with the view of R. Mayor that it is permitted, but is there not the case of an animal whose lungs were shriveled up? Who is it that includes the piercing of the gallbladder in the list of defects? It is R. Jose B. R. Judah. You should therefore exclude the case of the gallbladder and insert the case of the shriveled lungs in its place. But are there not the following seven statements which should be included? I R. Matina said if the top of the femur slipped out of its socket, the animal is trophy to rakish B. Papa. Said in the name of Rab, if one kidney was diseased, it is trifa. Further, we have learned if the spleen was gone, the animal is permitted. But R.R. said in the name of Rab, this was taught only in the case where the spleen was gone. But three, if the spleen was pierced, it is trifa. Four, Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Samuel, if the greater part of the organs of the throat was torn away, it is trifa. And further, Rabbi son of Arshila said in the name of Armatina, who reported in the name of Samuel. B. If a rib was dislodged from its socket, or six, if the greater part of the skull was shattered, or seven, if the greater part of the membrane which covers the greater portion of the rumen was torn, it is trifa. The eight cases of piercing enumerated in the Mishnah, you ought to reckon under one head, so that by eliminating seven cases, you can insert these seven statements in their stead. If so, you ought also to reckon under one head the two cases of severing. Consequently, there is one short of it. Number moreover, our R's case is also a case of piercing, is it not Talmud? Mastulin, you have no other alternative but to say that the two cases which were excluded above must now be added. Ola said eight types of defects as trifa were communicated to Moses on Mount Sinai if an organ was pierced or severed or gone or deficient or torn or if the animal was clawed or fell from a height or if a limb was fractured. This clearly excludes disease of the kidneys mentioned by Rakish. B. Papa Hai B. Rab said there are eight cases of trifa included under the head of piercing. If you say there are nine enumerated in the Mishnah, you must remember that the piercing of the gallbladder is the ruling of our Jose son of our Judah only for it was taught if the abomasum or the intestines were pierced, it is trifa. Our Jose son of our Judah says even if the gallbladder was pierced, Nemonic, the Halacha, the Kaligan, Olives, both the gallbladder, the gizzard, our Isaac son of our Joseph said. In the name of our Yohanan, the Halacha follows the view of our Jose son of our Judah, our Isaac son of our Joseph further said in the name of our Yohanan, what was the reply of the colleagues of our Jose son of our Judah? They said it is written, he poured out my gall upon the ground, nevertheless Job continued to live, he retorted, you may not quote miraculous deeds in support of an argument, otherwise you might as well ask it is written, he cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare, could he then continue to live on you must therefore admit that a miracle is an exceptional case and the whole treatment of Job was miraculous for it is written only spare his life and so here a miracle is an exceptional case, our Isaac son of our Joseph further said in the name of our Yohanan, the Halacha follows the view of him who says in Olive's fault, but did our Yohanan really say this, did not our Yohanan say that the Halacha was in accordance with the ruling of an anonymous mission and we have learned if the liver was gone. And not remained now it follows that if it remained even less than an olive's bulk it is permitted Amram differ as to our Yohanan's view our Isaac son of our Joseph further said in the name of our Yohanan if the gallbladder was pierced but the liver completely closed up the hole it is permitted our Isaac son of our Joseph further said in the name of our Yohanan if the muscular covering of the gizzard was pierced but the inner lining was intact it is permitted the question was raised what is it? Log the inner lining was pierced but the muscular covering was intact come and here our nomin taught if one coat of the gizzard was pierced but not the other it is permitted Rabbi said the gullet has two coats the outer red and the inner white if one was perforated but not the other it is permitted why was it necessary to state that the outer coat was red and the inner white to teach that if these coats interchanged it is true the question was raised what is the law if both coats were? Pierce one hole, however, not coinciding with the other. Marzitra said in the name
pierced it through mnemonic clawed pieces in the knife uncleanness but why according to Allah is this case different from that of an animal about which there arose a doubt whether it had been clawed or not Allah is of the opinion that we are not apprehensive for an animal about which there arose a doubt whether it had been clawed or not and why is it different from the case of two pieces of fat one being forbidden fat and the other permitted fat in that case the forbidden piece of fat is clearly established but here the prohibition is not clearly established and why is it different from the case of the man who slaughtered with a knife which was found afterwards to have a notch in it in that case there had arisen a flaw in the knife and why is it different from the case of a doubt concerning uncleanness which occurred in the private domain which is regarded as unclean but according to your own argument it is analogous is it not with the case of a doubt concerning uncleanness which occurred in the public domain which is regarded as clean in truth the law concerning uncleanness is exceptional for it is derived by analogy from the case of a woman suspected of adultery a certain rabbi was once sitting before Arkahana and recited as follows the ruling of Allah applies only to the case where the thorn was found in the cavity of the gullet but where it was impacted in the wall of the gullet it is to be feared that it actually pierced the gullet and it is Therefore Trifa Arkahana thereupon said to his disciples do not pay any attention to this rabbi the ruling of Ola was stated concerning a thorn that was impacted in the gullet for if it were merely found in the cavity of the gullet it would not be necessary for Ola to state it since all beasts that pasture in the open field eat thorns it was reported as regards the pharynx rab says the slightest perforation therein will render the animal Trifa Samuel says it is Trifa only if it greater portion of its circumference was severed rab said the slightest perforation because he regards it as being within the area prescribed for slaughtering Samuel said the greater portion because he does not regard it as being within the area prescribed for slaughtering what is considered to be the pharynx Mari Bimar Akba said in the name of Samuel that part of the gullet which when cut opens wide is the pharynx but that part which when cut remains as it was is the gullet proper are Remarked, but the master that is RBBB Abbe did not say sob, but thus that part of the gullet which went out remains as it was is the pharynx, but that part which when cut closes up is the gullet proper. Jonah said in the name of Zerah, it is that part where deglutition takes place, and what is its extent? Are we answered? It is less than the length of a grain of barley, but more than a grain of wheat and ox belonging to the family of Arakba was slaughtered. The slaughtering having been commenced at the pharynx and completed in the gullet proper, said Rabbi, I will impose the restriction implied in Rab's view as well as the restriction implied in Samuel's view, and will declare it true for the restriction of Rab's view. For Rab said that the slightest perforation therein would render the animal true, but if you will ask, does not Rab hold that it is within the area prescribed for slaughtering in that respect? I rule in accordance with Samuel's view that it is not within it. Area prescribed for slaughtering, and if you will further argue, does not Samuel hold that it is trifle only if the greater portion of its circumference was severed in that respect? I am in accordance with Rab's view that the slightest perforation therein will render the animal trifle. Meanwhile, the case was circulated till at last it was laid before our Abba. He said to his disciples, The ox should have been permitted whether one accepted the view of Rab or of Samuel. Go tell the son of Joseph. Hamma to pay the owner the value of the ox. Mar the son of Robin said, I can deduce a passage which would confute the stigma of Rab's foes, for it has been taught the Halachah is always in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel. Nevertheless, one who desires to adopt the view of Beth Shammai may do so, and one who desires to adopt the view of Beth Hillel may do so. One who adopts the view of Beth Shammai only when they incline to leniency, and likewise the view of Beth Hillel only when they Inclined to leniency is a wicked person Talmud, Mosul and a one who adopts the view of Beth Shammai only when they incline to strictness and likewise the view of Beth Hillel only when they incline to strictness is a fool and to such an one applies the verse but the fool walketh in darkness but one must either adopt the view of Beth Shammai in all cases whether they incline to leniency or strictness or the view of Beth Hillel in all cases whether they incline to leniency or strictness now is not this statement self-contradictory at first it says the Halashah is always in accordance with the ruling of Beth Hillel and immediately after it says nevertheless one who desires to adopt the view of Beth Shammai may do so this is no difficulty the latter statement relates to the practice before the heavenly voice was heard whilst the former states the law as it is after the heavenly voice was heard or you may even say that the latter statement too was made after the heavenly voice was Heard and yet there is no contradiction for that statement is the view of our Joshua who exclaimed we pay no attention to a heavenly voice nevertheless the question remains our Tabuf said he Rabbah acted entirely in accordance with Rab's view for when Rami B. Ezekiel arrived from Palestine he stated don't pay any heed to the laws transmitted to you by my brother Judah in the name of Rab for thus said Rab the sages prescribed the limits in the gullet now since he said that the sages prescribed the limits in the gullet it follows that the pharynx is not within the region prescribed for slaughtering nevertheless Rab ruled that the slightest perforation therein will render the animal trifa how far on top said Arnaman as far as the last hand grip and how far below Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abba as far as that part where it is villas but this cannot be for Rabbah said in the name of Jenabah on the authority of Rab that the last hand breadth of the gullet close to the rumen was the inner rumen. Now, if you say as far as that part where it is villus, one would then actually be cutting the rumen. Render thus the first hand breadth in the rumen close to the gullet is the inner rumen. Alternatively, you may say that Rab was referring to an ox in which the villus portion is found higher up. Arnaman said in the name of Samuel, if the pharynx was entirely detached from the jaw, the animal is valid. And Artana confirms this, for we have learned if the lower jaw was removed, the animal is valid. Our Papa demurred, saying, but is this not a case of throat organs being torn away? And does not the statement of the Mishnah, if the lower jaw was removed, the animal is valid, present the same difficulty to our Papa? No, the Mishnah does not present any difficulty to our Papa, because in the one case the organ was torn away forcibly, whilst in the case of the Mishnah the jawbone was merely carved away against Samuel. However, the difficulty remains. Do not read. Entirely, but rather the greater portion. But has not Samuel himself said that if the greater portion of the circumference of the pharynx was severed, it is true, there it was lacerated. But here it merely came away. But has not Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Samuel that if the greater part of the circumference of the organs of the throat was torn loose, the animal is true. Our Shisha, the son of Aridi, answered in that case the organs were forcibly torn loose, or the windpipe severed it. Was taught how much of the windpipe must be severed, the greater part of it, and what is meant by the greater part of it. Rab says Talmud, Mosul, and be the greater part of the outer circumference of the windpipe. Others say in the name of Rab, the greater part of the inner circumference, an animal with its windpipe severed was brought before Rab. He said about to examine it on the basis of the greater part of the outer circumference, whereupon Arkahana and R.C. said, But you have taught us. Master to examine it on the basis of the greater part of the inner circumference Rab therefore sent the case to Rabbi Barhana and he examined it on the basis of the greater part of the inner circumference he permitted it and actually bought from the meat of the animal to the value of thirteen common history but was he right in doing so has it not been taught if a sage has declared ought unclean his colleague may not declare it clean or if he has declared ought forbidden his colleague may not permit it this case is different for Rab did not declare it forbidden and why did he eat of it seeing that a sage had to make a decision with regard to it behold it is written then said I all Lord God behold my soul hath not been polluted for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself or is torn of beast neither came there a poured flesh into my mouth and it has been interpreted as follows behold my soul hath not been polluted for I did not allow him pure. Thoughts to enter my mind during the day so as to lead to pollution at night for from my youth up even till now have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself or is torn of beasts for I have never eaten of the flesh of an animal of which it had been exclaimed slaughter it slaughter it neither came there abhorred flesh into my mouth for I did not eat the flesh of an animal which a sage declared to be permitted it was reported in the name of our Nathan that this means I did not eat of an animal from which the priestly dues had not been set apart this applies only to a matter which was declared to be permitted as the result of a logical argument Rabbi Barhana however relied upon his tradition but in any case there is a
Eliezer was sent a gift from the house of Anasai he would not accept it and whenever he was invited out to dine he would not go for he used to say it seems that you don't want me to live for it is written he that hate gifts shall live whenever Arzero was sent a gift he would not accept it but whenever he was invited out to dine he would go for he used to say Talmud, Mosulan they are honored by inviting me Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if the windpipe was perforated with many holes like a sieve they are reckoned together in order to make up the greater part our Jeremiah raised an objection and was taught if there was one long hole in the skull or even if there were many small holes in it in either case the hole or holes are computed to make up the measure of a hole the size of a surgeon's drill we therefore see that if the measure is that of a hole the size of a drill several small holes are reckoned together so as to make up this measure similarly we ought to Say here, inasmuch as the measure is that of a hole the size of an isar, that several small holes shall be reckoned together to make up a hole the size of an isar. Here, Jeremiah obviously overlooked the dictum of our helbo, which he reported in the name of our hamabigiri on the authority of rab holes with loss of substance are reckoned together to make up the measure of a hole the size of an isar, but holes without any loss of substance are reckoned together to make up the greater part of it. Circumference rabbi Barhan said in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, if a strip of the windpipe was removed, its space is computed to make up a hole the size of an isar. Our Isaac B. Namani inquired of our Joshua B. Levi, what is the law if the windpipe was perforated like a sieve? He replied, they have said holes with loss of substance are reckoned together to make up the measure of a hole the size of an isar, but holes without any loss of substance are reckoned together to make up the greater part. Of the circumference, what is the test in the case of a bird? Our Isaac B. Namani said it was explained to me by our Eliezer, thus it must be cut out and placed over the opening of the windpipe. If it covers the greater part of the windpipe, the bird is truth, but if not, it is permitted. Our Papa said, and in order to remember this test, think of a sea bar. Naman said, if the windpipe was lacerated in the shape of a door, it is truth. If an isar can pass through it horizontally, Rab said, if the windpipe was slit lengthwise, it is permitted, provided there remained intact at least one ring at the top and one ring at the lower end. When this was reported to our Yohanan, he explained why a ring, why does Rab insist upon a ring? I would rather say it is permitted, provided there remained the portions, no matter how little intact at the top and at the lower end. When the same ruling was reported to our Yohanan in the name of the Babylonian, our Jonathan, he explained, our Babylonian friends know full well how to. Interpret the law or high be Joseph recited in the presence of our Yohanan the whole of the neck is the appropriate place for slaughtering that is from the large ring to the nethermost lobe of the lung Rabbah said the nethermost lobe really means the uppermost lobe for I hold that the appropriate place for slaughtering is the entire extent of the neck observed at the time when the animal is grazing but on no account may the organs of the throat be stretched by force our Hanan others say our Hanania inquired what is the law if the animal of its own accord stretched its neck it is undecided our Yohanan and our Simeon be were once sitting together and the following was established if one stretched the organs of the throat of an animal by force and slaughtered in the extended part the slaughtering is invalid if the windpipe was pierced below the breast it is considered as if the lungs were pierced our rabbis taught what counts as the breast it is that portion which looks down upon the ground on top it extends as far as the neck and below as far as the room and two ribs from the two sides on the side and on that are cut away with it this is the breast which is to be given to the priest if the membrane of the brain was pierced Rab and Samuel both said if the outer membrane only was pierced even though the inner was not it is true others say that Rab and Samuel both said it is not true unless the inner membrane was also pierced our Samuel be Namani said and in order to remember this think of the bag in which the brain lies Rab will be Barhanna said in the name of our Joshua be Levi the same is to be observed with the stones our Simeon Bipas he said in the name of our Joshua be Levi on the authority of Barkhapra all the marrow that is within the cranium is regarded as the brain from the point at which it begins to elongate it is counted as the spinal cord at what point does it begin to elongate said our Isaac be Namani it was explained to me by our Joshua be Levi there are two Talmud, Mosul and Bibin shaped protuberances that lie at the entrance of the cranium. Whatsoever lies on the inside of these protuberances is regarded as within the cranium, and whatsoever lies on the outside of these protuberances is regarded as outside the cranium. As to that which lies directly opposite these protuberances, I know not how to regard it. It is a more reasonable view, however, to regard it as within the cranium. Our Jeremiah once examined the skull of a bird and found these two bean shaped protuberances at the entrance of the cranium. If the heart was pierced as far as the cavity thereof, our Zara raised the question, does it mean as far as the small cavity or as far as the large cavity thereupon? Abbe said to him, Why are you in doubt? Have we not learned? Our Simeon says, provided it was pierced as far as the main bronchi, and this was explained by Rabbi Talafa in the name of our Jeremiah B. Abba on the authority of Rab to mean that it alone must be pierced as far as the large bronchus he replied there is no comparison at all there it says as far as the main bronchi that is the center into which the bronchial tubes converge but here it says as far as the cavity thereof what does it matter whether it is a large or small cavity as to the aorta rab says the slightest perforation therein will render the animal trophy samuel says it is true only if the greater portion of its circumference was severed what is the aorta said rabbi isaac in the name of rabbit is the artery which runs along the chest walls the walls but that is absurd rather it is the artery which runs in the group between the lungs of imar said in the name of arnaman there are three main vessels one leads to the heart the other to the lungs and the third to the liver the one that leads to the lungs is counted as the lungs the one that leads to the liver is counted as the liver but with regard to the one that leads to the heart there is the above mentioned dispute between Rab and Samuel Marbi High reports a different version the one that leads to the lungs is counted as the liver the one that leads to the liver is counted as the lungs but with regard to the one that leads to the heart there is the above mentioned dispute between Rab and Samuel our high be Joseph went and reported Rab's view to Samuel said Samuel if this is what Abba said then he knows nothing about defects in animals if the spine was broken our rabbis taught Rabbi says the greater part of the circumference of the spinal cord must be severed our Jacob says even if it was only pierced the animal is true for Rabbi however decided cases according to the view of our Jacob Arhuna said the halachah is not in accordance with our Jacob's view what is meant by the greater part Rab said it means the greater part of the circumference of the membrane which envelopes the cord others say in the name of Rab it means the greater part of the circumference of the middle and now those who say that Greater part of the circumference of the medulla will certainly hold that the severance of the greater part of the circumference of the membrane renders the animal trophy. But as for those who say the greater part of the circumference of the membrane, what would be their view if the greater part of the circumference of the medulla was severed? Come and hear Nilai said in the name of Arhuna, the greater part of which the rabbi spoke means the greater part of the circumference of the membrane. For the actual medulla is of no consequence. Our Nathan B. Avin was once sitting before Rab and was examining the spinal cord for any severance of the greater part of the circumference of the membrane and also for any severance of the greater part of the circumference of the medulla. Whereupon Rab said to him, If the greater part of the circumference of the membrane is intact, no further examination is necessary for the actual medulla is of no consequence. Rabbi Barhana said in the name of R. Joshua B. Levi, if the middle liquefied, the animal is unfit. Likewise, if softened, it is unfit. What is meant by liquefied and by softened, liquefied means that it flows out as from a jug. Softened means that it cannot stand upright. Our Jeremiah asked, What is the law if it cannot stand upright because of its abnormal heaviness? It is undecided in the school of Rabbit was taught if it softened, the animal is unfit, but if part wasted away, the animal is still fit. The following objection was raised. R. Simeon B. Eliezer said, If part of the spinal substance of an animal wasted away, it is true for that was a case where the substance had softened, but surely this is not right. For Levi was once sitting in the public baths when he saw a man shaking his head incessantly and exclaimed, Ah, oh, this man's brain has wasted away. Now he meant to imply, Did he not that he could not continue to live? No, said Abbe, he meant to imply that he could not procreate. How far does the spinal cord extend? Rab Judah said in. The name of Samuel up to the interval between the branch nerves as our DMB Isaac was intending
Once standing before Banfazi when the bird was brought to him for examination he had examined the spinal cord as far as the point opposite the beginning of the wings when he was sent for by the Nasi whereupon he arose and went away now I did not know whether his leaving at this point was because he did not consider it necessary to examine it any further or only out of respect for the Nasi if the liver was gone and not remained it follows however that if it remained even though less then an olive's bulk it is permitted but we have learned if the liver was gone provided there remained an olive's bulk thereof it is permitted our Joseph said there is no contradiction the one mission represents the view of our high and the other the view of our Simeon B. Rabbi for our high used to throw it away whilst our Simeon B. Rabbi would eat it and in order to remember this think of the saying the rich our parsimonious and army once was stationed at Pamadai the Rabbi and our Joseph fled the town and were met on the way by Arzera who said to them fugitives remember the olive's bulk of which the Rabbi spoke must be found in the region of the gallbladder our Adabi Ahabah said it must be found in the most vital place therefore said our Papa there must be one olive's bulk in the region of the gallbladder and another in the most vital place our Jeremiah inquired what is the law if the olive's bulk was not found in one place but was obtained by collecting it or if there only remained of it Liver along thin strip our Ashi asked what is the law if that which remained of the liver was flattened these questions remained undecided our Zerika inquired of our MI what is the law if the liver was for the most part torn away from its connections though in parts it was still attached to the diaphragm he replied in this case of the liver being torn loose I see no difficulty at all for as to the one who says there must be an olive's bulk in the region of the gallbladder it is so here and as to the one who says there must be an olive's bulk in the most vital part that too is here if the lung was pierced Rab Samuel and RC say the outer membrane must be pierced others say that they said the inner membrane are Joseph Beman I said in the name of our in order to remember this think of the rose colored coat in which the lungs lie it is clear that if the outer membrane was pierced but not the inner one the animal is permitted for the inner membrane is a sufficient Protection this being in accordance with Rabba's decision for Rabba ruled that if the outer membrane of the lung was peeled off Talmud, must and be so that now the lung resembles a red date it is permitted the only question is if the inner membrane was pierced but not the outer one will the latter afford sufficient protection or not Araha and Rabba disagree one maintains that it does not afford sufficient protection the other that it does the law is that it does afford sufficient protection and this is in agreement with the decision of our Joseph for our Joseph said if the lung produces a sound when inflated and the source of the sound can be located we must place over that spot a feather or a straw or spittle if it stirs the animal is true otherwise it is permitted if the source cannot be located we must take a basin of lukewarm water and put the lung there in the water must not be too hot for then the lungs would shrivel up nor too cold for then they would harden but it must be lukewarm we then inflate the lung if it bubbles it is true otherwise it is permitted for then it is certain that the inner membrane only has been perforated but not the outer one and the sound is caused merely by the air vibrating between the two membranes Nimadake date red dry scabs the text stated above Rabba said if the outer membrane of the lung was peeled off so that now the lung resembles a red date the animal is permitted Rabba further said if a portion of the lungs turned red the animal is permitted but if the whole turned red it is true for Rabba said to Rabba why is it that where a portion only turned red it is permitted it is, is it not because it will eventually recover its normal color then surely where the whole turned red it should also be permitted because it will eventually recover its normal color for it was taught with regard to other creeping and crawling things one would not be liable for causing them an injury on the Sabbath unless the Wound blood should you argue and say that we ought to compare our case with the case of the eight species of creeping things about which it has been taught one is liable for desecrating the Sabbath by injuring these creatures if only the blood collected in one spot though there was no bleeding at all then I would contend that even if only a portion of the lungs had turned red the animal should be true there is therefore no difference Rabba further said if a portion of the lungs became dry. The animal is true to what extent our poppy said in the name of Rabba it is so dry that it crumbles with the nail is this view only in accord with the opinion of our Jose B. Hamishalam for we have learned what is meant by dry that is does not bleed when pierced our Jose B. Hamishalam says it is so dry that it crumbles with the nail you can even say that our view is in accord with the opinion of the rabbis but there is however this distinction to be drawn in the case of the Uruguay. Firstling, inasmuch as it is constantly exposed to wind, it will not recover. Whilst in the case of the lungs, since they are not exposed to wind, they will recover. Rabba further said, if the lungs were covered with scabs or with black patches or with patches of various colors, it is permitted. Amimar said, in the name of Rabba, we may not compare cysts with each other. Rabba further said, if two lobes of the lungs adhere to each other by fibrous tissue, no examination thereof can avail to render the animal permitted. This is so, however, only if the lobes were not adjacent, but if they were adjacent, it is permitted. For this is their natural position. Talmud, Mastul, and Rabba further said, if two cysts are contiguous, no examination thereof can avail. If one cyst appears like two, we must take a thorn and burst it. If the mucus runs from one into the other, it is clear that there is here only one cyst, and it is permitted. But if not, there are here two distinct cysts which are contiguous and. It is true for Rabba further said the lungs have five lobes three on the right side and two on the left that is when held up with the front facing the examiner if there was one lobe missing or one too many or if the number of lobes was transposed the animal is true for there once was brought before Mirmar a pair of lungs with an additional lobe Araha who was sitting at the entrance of Mirmar's house asked the butcher as he was leaving what did he say about it he replied he declared it to be permitted then take it into him again said Araha whereupon Mirmar said go tell him that sits at the door that the law is not in accordance with Rabba in the case of an additional lobe this is the rule however only if the additional lobe was in line with the other lobes but if it was interjacent between the lungs it is true for there once was brought before Arashi a pair of lungs that had an interjacent lobe he was about to declare it true for when Arhum said to him but all beasts that pasture in the open field have this interjacent lobe and it is called by butchers the little rose lobe this is the rule however only if it is found in front Talmud, Mastul and B but if it is found on the back of the lungs even though it is as small as a myrtle leaf it is true for Raphram said if the lung was like wood it is true for some explain like wood in color others like wood in touch the former say in color meaning thereby that when distended it is pale like wood but the others say in touch meaning thereby that it is hard like wood or as some say that it is quite smooth and has no fissures marking the lobes Rabba said if the lung was blue it is permitted if black like ink it is true for Arhanna said black blood is in reality red blood which has turned black by disease if green it is permitted in accordance with our Nathan if red it is also permitted in accordance with our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said I once came to a coastal town and was Approached there by a woman who having circumcised her first son and he died and her second son and he also died brought her third son to me I saw that the child was red so I said to her my daughter wait until the blood will become absorbed in him she accordingly waited and thereafter circumcised her child and he lived and was named Nathan the Babylonian after me on another occasion when I went to Cappadocia I was approached by a woman who having circumcised her first son and he died and her second son and he also died brought her third son to me I saw that the child had a greenish color I examined him and found that he was animate without blood for circumcision I said to her my daughter wait until the blood will circulate more freely in the child she accordingly waited and thereafter circumcised her child and he lived and was named Nathan the Babylonian after me Arkahana said if the lung resembles liver it is permitted if it resembles meat it is true and in order to Remember this think of the verse flesh that is torn of beasts trifa in the field our Sama son of Rabba said if the lung resembles cuscuta or the crocus or the yolk of an egg it is trifa but what is meant by the statement above if green it is permitted that it resembles a leak in color Rabba said if there is an obstruction in the lung we must fetch a knife and cut open the obstruction if there is found there an accumulation of pus then it is clear that the obstruction was caused by the pus and it is therefore permitted if there is no pus we must then place over the obstruction a feather or spittle if it stirs it is permitted otherwise it is trifa our Joseph said a membrane which had formed on the lungs in consequence of a wound is not a proper membrane our Joseph further said if the lung produces a sound when inflated and the source of the sound can be located we must place over that spot
the great men of that age came to visit him there was then brought into him Arhananiah along whose substance had the cate and was tossing about within his water in a jug and he declared it to be permitted Rabbah said provided however the bronchial tubes within were intact Ara Hassan of Rabbah asked Arashi how would we know it he replied we take a glazed earthen basin pierce the lung and pour it out into the basin if there are seen any white streaks it is true but if not it is permitted R. Naaman said if the substance of the lung decayed within but the entire external covering was intact it is permitted it was taught likewise if the substance of the lung decayed within but the entire external covering was intact it is permitted even though the cavity within would hold a quarter log if the womb of an animal was gone Talmud, Mosulan it is permitted if the liver of an animal was wormy this was an actual case about which the people of Isha made inquired when they came up to Jabna on each of the three festivals on the third time the rabbis declared it to be permitted our Joseph Bimanyam I said in the name of our Naaman if the lung adheres to the chest wall there is nothing to be feared if however there is an eruption of ulcers on the lung close to the adhesion there is grave fear with regard to it Marjuda said in the name of Abami in either case there is grave fear with regard to it what must we do about it said Rabba Rabin Bishaba explained it to me that we must Take a knife with a fine edge and separate the lung from the chest wall. If there is a taint upon the wall, then we assume that the adhesion was caused by the wall and the animal is permitted. But if not, we assume that it was caused by the lung and it is true. Our Nehemiah B.R. Joseph applied the test of putting it in lukewarm water. Marzitra, son of Arhuna, the son of our poppy, said to Rabbi, Do you report the test of our Nehemiah, the son of our Joseph, in connection with the above case we reported in? Connection with Rabbi's case for Rabbi said, If two lobes of the lungs adhere to each other by fibrous tissue, no examination thereof can avail to render the animal permitted. Our Nehemiah, the son of our Joseph, however, used to apply the test of putting the lungs in lukewarm water. Our Ashi demurred, But what is the point of it? In our case, the test is reasonable, for we could thereby assume that the disorder was caused by the wall, in which case the animal would be permitted. But in that case of Rabbi, what? Is the point of the test if this lobe is found to be perforated, the animal is trifid, and if the other lobe is found to be perforated, it is also trifid. But did Arnaman really say this? Our Joseph B. Menyamai surely said in the name of Arnaman, if the lung was pierced but the perforation was covered up by the chest wall, it is permitted. There is no contradiction in the latter case. The adhesion was formed in that part where by natural development they see the lung and the chest wall are in contact with each other, whereas in the former case the adhesion was not formed in that part where they are in contact by nature. And at what point is it that by natural development they are in contact with each other at the point where the lung is divided into lobes? The text above stated, Our Joseph B. Menyamai said in the name of Arnaman, if the lung was pierced but the perforation was covered up by the chest wall, it is permitted. Rubin added, provided it had grown into the flesh, our Joseph asked Rubin. And what would be the law if they had not intergrown it would presumably be trifid and obviously because we assume that the lung is perforated but if this be so even where they had intergrown it should also be trifid for it has been taught a man whose privy member is pierced is unfit because the flow of semen is sluggish and it does not fertilize if the whole had closed up he is fit for he can procreate this is an instance where the unfit can in the course of time return to fitness now. What is excluded by this presumably such a case as the above no it only excludes the case of a membrane which had formed on the lungs in consequence of a wound for it is not a sound membrane or a bobby habit had the wall above the perforation of the lung also been pierced it would be trifid would it not why then does not the tana of our mission include in the list of defects the perforation of the wall but even as you will have it you are also faced with this type of question. For our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohanan that if the gallbladder had been pierced and the liver had completely closed up the hole it was permitted now you should ask had the liver above the hole and the gallbladder also been pierced it would be trifid would it not why then does not the tana of our mission include also the perforation of the liver it is obvious however that the tana does not include the perforation of an organ which is not trifid per here to the tana does not include that which is not trifid per Rabbi B. Barhana inquired of Samuel what is the law if there was an eruption of ulcers on the lungs he replied it is permitted I also said so said the other but the students were hesitant about it for our Martina stated if the boils are full of pus it is trifid if full of clear water it is permitted that statement replied Samuel was made with regard to the kidneys our Isaac B. Joseph was walking behind our Jeremiah in the butcher's market and they Noticed certain lungs with ulcers thereupon he or Isaac said to our Jeremiah master would you care to buy of this meat he replied I have no money I can get it on credit for you he said the other answered why should I put you off whenever such a case as this came before our Yohanan he would always send it to our Judah son of our Simeon and the letter on the authority of our Eliezer son of our Simeon always ruled that it was permitted though he or Yohanan himself did not hold that view robber related when we were walking behind our Naman in the letter dealer's market Talmud, Mosul and B others say in the public place of the scholars we noticed lungs covered with large tumors and he or Naman said nothing about it our MI and RC were once passing through the marketplace of Tiberias when they saw lungs covered with large and hard lumps and they said nothing to them the butchers about it it was stated if a needle was found in the lungs our Yohanan our Eliezer and our Hannah declared the animal Permitted our Simeon Belakish, our Mani B. Patish, and our Simeon Belakim declare it trifid. Shall we say that they disagree upon the following law? Is the latter hold that a deficiency within the lung is considered to be a defect, whereas the former hold that it is not a defect? No, all hold that a deficiency within is not a defect, but they disagree in this. The former assume that it entered the lung via the bronchus, whereas the latter assume that it pierced some organ before it entered a needle. Was once found in a portion of the lung and it was brought before our MI. He was about to declare it permitted when our Jeremiah other say our Zerika raised the following objection against him. We have learned if the lung was pierced or was deficient. Now, what does deficient mean? Should you say it means a deficiency from the outside, but that would be identical with pierced? It must mean therefore a deficiency within, thus proving that a deficiency within is considered a defect. The case was then sent. To our Isaac Napaha, who was also about to declare it permitted when our Jeremiah others say our Zerika raised the following objection against him, we have learned if the lung was pierced or was deficient. Now, what does deficient mean? Should you say it means a deficiency from the outside, but that would be identical with pierced? It must therefore mean a deficiency within, thus proving that a deficiency within is considered a defect. The case was then sent back to our MI and he now declared it trifid. Whereupon his students said to him, But the rabbis have declared it permitted. He replied, They permitted it because they saw good grounds for permitting it. But what grounds have we for permitting it? Perhaps if the entire lung was before us, we should have found it perforated. Now, the reason for declaring it trifid was that the entire lung was not before us, but if it were before us and was without perforation, it would be permitted. But has not our Naman stated that if one of the bronchial tubes was Perforated it is trifid that is so only where the perforation in the bronchial tube lies next to another bronchial tube but has not our nomin taught that if in the colon and intestine was perforated in that part where it lies next to another intestine it is permitted for the latter affords a covering or as she replied are you comparing defects with each other amongst the various defects we cannot say that this resembles that for an animal may be cut in one place and die in another place. And live a needle was once found in the large branch as the case was brought before those rabbis who in the previous case ruled that it was trifid but they neither forbade nor permitted it they did not permit it by reason of their aforementioned view yet they did not forbid it because since it was found in the large branch as it most probably entered it by the windpipe a needle was once found in a portion of the liver Marsan of our Joseph was about to declare the animal trifid when our ashi. Said to him, Sir, and if it were found in the flesh of the animal, would you also declare it true? Rather, said Arashi, we must see if the head of the needle is outside the liver, it is true, for it must have pierced the internal organs and entered, but if the head is inside, it is permitted, for it must have entered by the vein. This is the rule, however, only in the case of a large needle, but in the case of a fine needle, there is no difference whether the head was outside the liver or inside. For it is always to be assumed that it pierced the internal organs before it entered, and why is this case different from that of a needle which was found Talmud, Mosulin, in the thick wall of the reticulum where it is
Was one Zeus but a goose's lung was for Zeus and now should you say that when one eats it as it is it makes the eyes bright white and should not one buy the goose for a Zeus and eat also the lungs thereof it obviously means that when used medicinally it has this effect if the lung was found perforated in the part which is usually handled by the butcher do we attribute it to the handling or not our Ahabi Nathan says we do Marzitra the son of Armari says we do not the laws that we do attribute. It our Samuel the son of Arabab said my father one of the heads of the assemblies under Raphram said that we do attribute it to the handling this was reported to Marzitra the son of Armari but he would not accept it whereupon our Meshachia said it is reasonable to accept the view of my grandfather since we also attribute a perforation to a wolf with regard to a worm found on the lung there is a difference of opinion between our Joseph P. Dosai and the rabbis one holds that it wormed its way. Through the lung before the slaughtering, the other that it wormed its way through after the slaughtering, the law is that it wormed its way through after the slaughtering, and so it is permitted. Our Simeon says, provided it was pierced as far as the main bronchi, Rabbi B. Talafa explained in the name of our Jeremiah B. Abba, provided it was pierced as far as the large bronchus, our Ahabi Abba was sitting before our Huna and recited our Malach said in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, the Halacha is in accordance with our Simeon, whereupon he our Huna said to him, You are quoting Malach of Arabia, are you not? But he said that the Halacha was not in accordance with our Simeon. When our Zerah went up to Palestine, he found our BB sitting and reciting as follows, our Malach said in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, the Halacha is in accordance with our Simeon, whereupon he our Zerah said to him, By your life, I our Habi Abba and our C happened to be in the town where our Malach lived, and we asked him, Did the master say that the Halacha was in accordance with our Simeon, and he replied, I said that the Halacha was not in accordance with our Simeon. He or Bibi then said to him, Arzera, and what tradition have you got in the matter? He replied, I said, Our Isaac BMI on the authority of our Joshua Bibi by the Halacha is in accordance with the view of our Simeon. The Halacha, however, is not in accordance with the view of our Simeon. If the Abba Mason was pierced, our Isaac Bina Mani said in the name of our Ashai, it was the practice of the priests to permit the fat which is on the Abba Mason to be eaten, thus agreeing with the view of our Ishmael, which he reported in the name of his ancestors. And in order to remember this, think of the saying, Ishmael, the priest favors the priests. Where do we see this? For it was taught, it is written on this wise, Ye shall bless the children of Israel. Our Ishmael said, We observe your blessing for Israel at the mouth of the priests, but we know of no blessing for the priests themselves when they Verse adds, and I will bless them. It means to say that the priest bless Israel and the Holy One bless be he blesses the priest. Our Akiva said, We observe your blessing for Israel at the mouth of the priest, but not from the Almighty. When the verse therefore adds, and I will bless them, it means to say that the priest bless Israel and the Holy One bless be he approves of it. But once does our Akiva derive that the priest also receive a blessing? Our Naman B. Isaac said from the verse, and I will bless them that bless thee in what respect, and does our Ishmael favor the priest in that he establishes in the one verse the blessing of the priest side by side with the blessing of Israel? What is this opinion of our Ishmael which he reported in the name of his ancestors? It was taught the fat that covereth the inwards Talmud, Mosul and B, etc. includes the fat upon the intestines. This is the view of our Ishmael. Our Akiva says it includes the fat upon the Abba Now this is in conflict with it. Following it is written and all the fat that is upon the inwards as says our Ishmael teaches as the fat upon the inwards is characteristic in that it is covered with a membrane which can be easily peeled off so all fat which is to be forbidden must be covered with a membrane which can be easily peeled off our Akiva says it teaches as the fat upon the inwards is characteristic in that it is an even layer and is covered with a membrane which can be easily peeled off so all fat which is to be forbidden must be an even layer and covered with a membrane which can be easily peeled off Rabin sent this answer in the name of our Yohan and that is indeed the proper construction of the latter Beritha but the authorities in the former Beritha must be reversed but why do you choose to reverse the authorities in the former rather than in the latter Beritha the position is different in the latter Beritha for it contains the argument as so it is clear precision was intended if so why does it say above thus agreeing with the view of our Ishmael it ought to be thus agreeing with the view of our Akiva Arnam and B. Isaac answered here Ishmael reported the decision in the name of his ancestors though he himself did not accept it Rab said clean fat can stop up the perforation unclean fat cannot Arshiz hate said either can stop up the perforation Arzera asked what of the fat of a wild beast did he Rab mean the expression clean fat can stop up to be taken strictly and as it fat of this is clean it can stop up the perforation or did either by merely imply the reason namely that it clings fast and as this does not cling fast it cannot stop up the perforation Abbe said to him what is your difficulty though it is permitted to be eaten it obviously does not cling fast there came before Rab the case of the perforation that was stopped up by unclean fat said Rab what have we to fear after all Arshiz hate has ruled that even unclean fat can also stop up and moreover the Torah doth spare the money of an Israelite whereupon our Papa said to Rabba but on the other hand there is Rab's view to the contrary and moreover it is a question involving a prohibition of the Torah and you say the Torah doth spare the money of an Israelite when you and a pottery dealer once left uncovered a pot of honey he came to Rabba to inquire about it and Rabba said what have we to fear in the first place we have learned three liquids are prohibited if left uncovered viz water wine and milk and all other liquids are permitted in the second place the Torah doth spare the money of an Israelite whereupon our and B Isaac said to Rabba but on the other hand there is a view of our Simeon to the contrary and moreover it is a question of possible danger to life and yet you say the Torah doth spare the money of an Israelite where have we learned the view of our Simeon in the following very these five liquids are not prohibited if left uncovered brine vinegar oil honey and are. Simeon says even these are prohibited if left uncovered indeed added our Simeon I once saw outside in a snake drinking brine to which the rabbis retorted that was a foolish snake and one cannot disapprove from fools he then said to him you must at least admit that I am right with regard to brine for whenever our papa or our Huna the son of our Joshua or any of the other rabbis had some liquid that had been left uncovered they would pour it into brine but replied the other you must at least admit that I am right with regard to honey that it is forbidden for our Simeon B. Eliezer is in agreement with him our Simeon as it has been taught similarly our Simeon B. Eliezer would prohibit honey that had been left uncovered our and said fat which lies helmet like upon the organ cannot stop up the perforation what is meant some say the nodules of fat of the rectum others say the pericardium Rabbis said I heard two decisions of our and one about the fat upon the abomasum called him and it other about the fat upon the Abba Mason called Barhimza one stops up the perforation and the other does not but I do not know which does and which does not Arhuna behind it and Arhuna the son of Arnaman said Barhimza stops up the perforation while Himza does not Arhuna said in order to remember this think of the saying the position of the son is better than that of the father what is Himza and what is Barhimza come and here for Arnaman remarked they in Palestine eat a Talmud, Mastulin. As surely for us Babylonians it should at least be effective to stop up the perforation now concerning the fat that is upon the greater curvature of the Abba Mason, there is no dispute at all that it is forbidden the dispute is only concerning the fat that is upon the lesser curvature others report concerning the fat that is upon the lesser curvature there is no dispute at all that it is permitted the dispute is only concerning the fat that is upon the greater curvature this accords with it. Statement of Arawi in the name of RMI who said one must scrape away a little from the surface of the fat upon the lesser curvature Arjani likewise said in the name of an elder one must scrape away a little from the surface thereof Arawi said I was once present before RMI and I saw that they gave him this fat to eat after having scraped away a little from the surface thereof and he ate it the attendant of Arhanna was standing in attendance before him when Arhanna said to him scrape away a little from the surface thereof and give me the fat to eat as he saw his attendant hesitating he said to him you are evidently a Babylonian so you had better cut it off entirely and throw it away it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel says if there was a perforation in the intestines but it was stopped up by mucus it is permitted what is this mucus it is the viscous substance of the intestines which is removed by
Morning, you replied, there is a dispute about this, for it has been stated Arhista said the Halachah is in accordance with Arsimian's view, Aryohan and also said that that was the Halachah Arnavan. However, said the Halachah is not in accordance with Arsimian's view, the Halachah is not in accordance with the view of Arsimian B. Gamaliel in the matter of Trifa, but the Halachah is in accordance with the view of Arsimian in the matter of mourning, for Samuel has taught in matters of mourning the law. Is always in accordance with him who states the more lenient view. Arshimai Bihai said we may compare defects in the intestines. The intestines of an animal were brought before Rabba containing perforations. He compared them with other perforations that he now made, but they did not appear alike. Whereupon his son Armeshir she came and handled them, and they now appeared like the others. He Rabba said to him, Once did you know to do this? He replied, Think of the number of hands that had handled the original perforations before they were brought to my master. He exclaimed, My son is versed in the laws concerning triple like Aryohanan, Aryohanan, and Aryohanan. Both said we may compare defects in the lungs. Rabba said this is allowed only in the same lung, but we may not compare the defect in one lung with the defect in the other lung. The law, however, is that the defect in one lung may be compared with the defect in the other lung. The small with the small and the large with the large, but not. The large with the small nor the small with the large Abe and Rabba both said we may compare defects in the windpipe. Our Papa said this is allowed only in the same group of cartilaginous rings, but we may not compare the defect in one group with the defect in another group of rings in the same windpipe. The law, however, is that the defect in the cartilaginous portion of one group may be compared with the defect in the cartilaginous portion of another group. Likewise, the defect in the membranous portion of one group with the defect in the membranous portion of another group, but we may not compare the defect in the cartilaginous portion with the defect in the membranous portion, nor the defect in the membranous portion with the defect in the cartilaginous portion. Zeiri said if the rectum was perforated, it is permitted for the hips supported and close up the perforation. How much must be mutilated? Rili said in the name of our Yohanan, where it is joined to the hips only the destruction. Of the greater part thereof will render trifle where it is not so joined, even the slightest perforation will render trifle. When the rabbis reported the statement to Rabbah in the name of Arnaman, he exclaimed, Have I not told you not to hang on him, Arnaman Talmud? Mosul and be empty vessels, thus said Arnaman, where it is joined to the hips, even if the hole was gone, provided there remained a portion thereof which can be covered by a hand grasp, it is permitted. How much is this abitra? In an occiput in a room and was pierced, Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab that Nathan B. Sheila Chief Slaughter and Sephoris testified before Rabbi in the name of our Nathan as follows, What is the inner room? And it is the Sanya to be our Joshua B. Karha also said that it is the Sanya to be our Ishmael said it is the entrance of the room. And R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan, it is a narrow part in the room, but I don't know which it is said, Arnaman B. Isaac, the room has fallen into the well, our Ahabi Ewa. Said in the name of R.C. at the above mentioned narrow part is that portion of the room where it begins to taper down to join with the gullet. R. Jacob B. Namani said in the name of Samuel it is that part of the room which has no downy lining. R. Abin is said in the name of Jenna on the authority of Rab. The last hand breadth of the gullet adjoining the room is the inner room in the West Palestine. It was said on the authority of R. Jose B. Hanna the entire room is the inner room and what is the outer room it is the membrane which covers the greater part of the room and Rab. The son of R. Huna said it is the mafrata. What is the mafrata? R. We have said it is that part of the room which is exposed when the butcher tears open the abdomen in the heart. They acted on the view of Rab. The son of R. Huna. R. Ashi asked Amimar, but what about all the other views? He answered they are all included in the view of Rab. The son of R. Huna. But what about the view of R. C. in the name of R. Yohanan? He Answered it has already been explained by Araha son of Aruya and what about the view of Arab and of those in the West? He answered these are obviously at variance with the view of Rabbi son of Arhuna Ar Judah says in a large animal, etc. Our Benjamin B. Jaffe reported in the name of our Eliezer large does not mean a large animal nor small a small one, but the meaning is if it was torn to the extent of a handbreadth, but this was not the greater portion of the room and it is true, and this is what the Mishnah teaches us by stating in a large animal to the extent of a handbreadth, and if the greater portion was torn, but it was not the extent of a handbreadth, it is true, and this is what the Mishnah teaches us by stating in a small animal the greater portion of IT, but it is obvious, is it not that where the greater portion was torn, though it was not the extent of a handbreadth, it is true, it was only necessary to be stated with regard to such a case as where the laceration extended. Over the greater portion, but it would have made up a handbreadth had it only been torn a little more. For then you might have said that it was not trifle until the extent of a handbreadth was torn. He therefore teaches that it is not so. Jenna said in the name of R.C. If a circular hole was cut out in the room and having a diameter of a cell, it is trifle. For then if you were to stretch out the circumference thereof, it would amount to a handbreadth. Our high B. Abbas said Jenna explained it to me on the bridge of Nihardia. Thus a hole having a diameter of a cell is permitted. If it is more than a cell, it is trifle. What, for example, is a hole larger than a cell? Said R. Joseph, a hole through which three date stones with some of the fruit attached could pass with pressure or easily without any fruit thereon. If the mason or reticulum was pierced, our rabbis taught where a needle was found impacted in the thick wall of the reticulum. If it had protruded only on one side, it is permitted. But if it had protruded on both sides, it is true. If there was found on it a spot of blood, Talmud, Mostul and Talmud, Mostul and it is certain that the perforation occurred before the slaughtering. But if there was not found on it a spot of blood, it is permitted. For it is certain that the perforation occurred after slaughtering. If the top of the wound was covered with a crust, it is certain that the wound occurred at least three days before the slaughtering. If it was not covered with a crust, then the burden of proof lies upon the claimant. Why is this case different from all other cases of perforation of an organ where the master declares it to be true? Even though there was not a drop of blood around the perforation in those cases, there was no object to which the blood could cling here. However, since a needle is impacted in the reticulum, had it pierced it before the slaughtering, some blood would surely have clung to it. Our Safra said to Abbe, has my master seen that? Scholar who came from the West and who goes by the name of Arara for he relates that once there came before Rabbi the case of a needle found impacted in the thick wall of the reticulum and which protruded only on one side and he declared it Trif Abbe thereupon sent for the scholar but he would not come so Abbe went to him he found him on the roof and he called out would you come down sir he would not come down Abbe then went up to him and said would you tell me the actual facts of that case he replied I am in charge of the assemblies to his excellency the great Rabbi and as Arhuna of Sephoris and Arhose the Mede were sitting with him there came before Rabbi the case of a needle found impacted in the thick wall of the reticulum it protruded only on one side but when Rabbi turned it over he found on the outside directly above the needle a spot of blood so he declared it to be Trif saying if there was no wound there once came the spot of blood Abbe exclaimed you caused me a great deal of trouble all for nothing it is expressly stated in our mission if the omasum or reticulum was pierced on the outside if the animal fell from the roof Arhuna said if a person left an animal on the roof and when he returned he found it on the ground below we do not apprehend any lesion of the internal organs a goat belonging to Rabbana was on the roof and through the skylight saw some peeled barley below it jumped and fell down from the roof to the ground he Rabbana came before Arashi and inquired was the reason for Arhuna's statement if a person left an animal on the roof and returned and found it on the ground we do not apprehend a lesion of the internal organs that it had something to hold on but in this case it had nothing to hold on or was it that it estimated the distance so that here too it estimated the distance he replied the reason was that it estimated the distance so that here too it estimated the distance and it is therefore permitted to you Belonging to our Habibah was seen dragging along its hind leg said our Yamar it is suffering from a hip disease Rabbana demurred perhaps its spinal cord is severed it was thereupon examined and was found to be as Rabbana had thought nevertheless the law is in accordance with the view of our Yamar for a hip disease is a common disorder whereas the severance of the spinal cord is not common Arhuna said in the case of rams that attack each other we do not apprehend any lesion of the internal organs for although they groan with pain the whole time we say it is
One day old Talmud, Mastulim became convey uncleanness by reason of an issue. Now if there was any ground to fear that the passage through the womb might cause a lesion of the internal organs, then surely he should not convey such uncleanness for the rule of the birth should be applied here out of his flesh, but not by reason of an accident. It may be dealing there with the case of a child that was extracted from the side of his mother come and here a calf that was born on a festival maybe. Slaughtered the same day on the festival here too, we must suppose that it was extracted from the side come and here, but they agree that if the firstling was born on the festival with a blemish, it is of the class of things designated for food. Now should you say that this too was extracted from the side? This cannot be since a firstling extracted from the side has no sanctity for our Yohan and has stated our Simeon admits that with regard to consecrated animals, it is an animal extracted from the Side has no sanctity whatsoever. We must suppose in this case that it planted its hooves on the ground. Our and further said in the slaughterhouse, we do not apprehend any lesion of the internal organs. An ox once fell, and the noise of its groaning was heard when it was slaughtered. Our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha came and bought of the choicest portions of its meat. Thereupon the rabbis asked him, Whence do you know this? He replied, Thus said, Rab, the animal whilst falling plants its hooves firmly on the ground until it actually reaches the ground. Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, If the animal after a fall stood up, it need not be kept alive for twenty four hours, but it certainly must be examined against an internal injury. If it actually walked, there is no need for any examination. Our high B. Ashi said, In either case, it must be examined. Our Jeremiah B. Abba said in the name of Rab, If it stretched out its foreleg to stand, even though it did not stand, it is as though it had stood, or if it Moved its hind leg to walk even though it did not walk it is as though it had walked. Aristotle said if it made an effort to stand even though it did not stand it is as though it had stood. The law is if it accidentally fell from the roof and stood up but did not walk it must be examined against an internal injury but it need not be kept alive for 24 hours if it walked it needs no examination. Amimar said in the name of Ardemi of Nihardia the examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of a fall must be carried out in the region of the intestines. Marzitra said to him we rule on the authority of our papa that an examination must be carried out on all the internal organs. Hunamar the grandson of Arniamai inquired of Arashi what about the organs of the throat he replied these organs are unaffected by a fall. Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel where a bird was thrown with force upon water it is sufficient if it swam the length of its body this is so however. Only if it swam upstream, but if it swam downstream, clearly the current of the water carried it along. If the waters were still, then it matters not. And if twigs were strewn upon the water, and the bird overtook them, then it has obviously overtaken them by moving of its own accord. If a sheet was stretched taut, and the bird fell down upon it, we must apprehend an injury to the internal organs. If it was not stretched taut, we do not apprehend an injury. Likewise, if the sheet was folded double even, though it was stretched taut, we do not apprehend any injury. If a bird was caught in its flight by a closely knotted net, we must apprehend an injury to the internal organs. If it was not closely knotted, we do not apprehend any injury. If a bird fell on flax tied up in bundles, we must apprehend an injury on the sides of the bundles. We do not apprehend any injury on bundles of reeds. We must apprehend an injury on flax which was pounded and cord. We do not apprehend any injury on flax which was. Founded but not cord, we must apprehend an injury on flax stalks which contain seed vessels. We must apprehend an injury because of the knots on coarse toe. We must apprehend an injury on fine toe. We do not apprehend any injury on dry bark. We must apprehend an injury but on crushed bark. We do not apprehend any injury on sifted ashes. We must apprehend an injury but on unsifted ashes. We do not apprehend any injury. Talmud, Mosul, and on fine sand. We do not apprehend any injury but on coarse sand. We must apprehend an injury. Likewise, on dust of the wayside, we apprehend an injury on straw tied in bundles. We must apprehend an injury but if loose, we do not apprehend any injury on wheat or on similar grain. We must apprehend an injury on barley or on similar grain. We must apprehend an injury on all kinds of pulse except fenugreek. We must apprehend a lesion of the internal organs on chickpeas. We do not apprehend any lesion of the internal organs but on lentils. We must apprehend such. An injury this is the rule on such things as slip away from each other we do not apprehend any lesion of the internal organs but on things which do not slip away from each other we must apprehend a lesion of the internal organs if a bird was glued or ashi permits it and amimar forbids it if it was glued by one wing only all agree that it is permitted they disagree only where it was glued by both wings he that forbids it gives as his reason how can it keep aloft but he that permits it says it can keep aloft in the air by the movement of its wings at the joints others report as follows if it was glued by both wings all agree that it is forbidden they disagree only where it was glued by one wing only he that permits it gives as his reason it can very well fly with one wing but he that forbids it says since it cannot fly with the one wing which is glued it cannot fly with the other which is free the laws if both wings were glued to the board it is forbidden if one wing only was glued it is permitted if most of its ribs were fractured our rabbis taught this is meant by most of its ribs either six on each side were fractured or eleven on one side and one on the other side ziri added provided in each case the fracture was in that half of the rib nearest the spine rabbi barhana said in the name of our yohan and we are dealing only with the large ribs which are filled with marrow reported that banzakai taught if most of the ribs on one side were dislocated or if most of the ribs on both sides were fractured the animal is true our yohan said whether the ribs were dislocated or fractured the animal is true only if most of the ribs on both sides were dislocated or fractured rab said if a rib together with its vertebra was dislocated the animal is true arkahana and rc asked rab what if the rib on each side of the vertebra was dislocated but the vertebra remained firm in its place he replied then you are speaking of it Animal cut asunder but is not Rab's case to the case of an animal cut asunder Rab was speaking of the dislocation of a rib only without the vertebra but did he not expressly say a rib together with its vertebra he meant a rib with half of its vertebra it follows then that Arkahana and RC were speaking of the case where the ribs on each side of the vertebra were dislocated but the vertebra remained firm would Rab then have replied to them then you are speaking of an animal cut asunder. Has not Ola reported that Banzakai taught if most of the ribs on one side were dislocated or if most of the ribs on both sides were fractured the animal is true he will say in that case of Ola the ribs were not opposite each other but in this case the ribs were opposite each other but did not Aryohan and say that most of the ribs on both sides must either be fractured or dislocated and in speaking of most of the ribs on both sides it cannot be otherwise but that at least one rib was. Dislocated opposite the other there in the case of our Yohanan only the rib but not the facet was dislocated but here in the case put by Arkahana and RC the rib together with its facet was dislocated but if so is not this case identical with Rab's own statement they had not heard of Rab's statement then why did they not ask him about the dislocation of one rib together with its facet as in the statement of Rab they thought let us rather ask him one question which would give us the answer to two for if we were to ask him about the dislocation of one rib with its facet we would have had satisfaction only if he had answered that it was true since the same ruling would apply with even greater force to the case of the dislocation of two ribs but had he answered that it was permitted we would still have been in doubt as to two ribs but even now when they ask him about the dislocation of two ribs with their facets the same difficulty presents itself does it not for only if he had answered that it was permitted would they have had satisfaction since the same ruling would apply with even greater force to the case of the dislocation of one rib but had he answered that it was true they would still have been in doubt as to one rib they thought in that case he would have been annoyed and would have replied seeing that the dislocation of one rib with its facet renders the animal trivial can there be any question about two but did they not actually ask him about the dislocation of two ribs nevertheless he was not annoyed his answer then you are speaking of an animal cut asunder is the expression of his annoyance rabbi son of Arshila said in the name of Armatine on the authority of Samuel if a rib was dislodged from its socket or if the greater portion of the skull was shattered or if the greater portion of the membrane which covers the greater part of the room was torn in each case the animal is true if a rib was dislodged from its Socket, I can point out a contradiction to this for we have learned Talmud, Mastul and B what is considered a deficiency of the spine
was torn and this was interpreted by the scholars in the West Palestine on the authority of our Jose B. Hanna, thus the entire rumen is the inner rumen and what is the outer rumen it is the membrane which covers the greater part of the rumen was not this question raised on the statement of Samuel but our Jacob B. Namani has reported in the name of Samuel that at SC the inner rumen is that part of the rumen which has no downy lining if it was clawed by wolf Rab Judah said in the name of Rabin. The case of cattle from the wolf and upwards and in the case of birds from the hawk and upwards what does this exclude should you say it excludes the cat surely we have expressly learned if it was clawed by wolf and should you further say that the Mishnah merely wishes to teach that a wolf can claw even large cattle surely this is not so for our Mishnah adds our Judah says small cattle if clawed by wolf and large cattle if clawed by lion and should you further say that our Judah differs. From the view of the first Tana surely it is not so for our Benjamin B. Jaffe has stated in the name of our Ilay that the sole purpose of our Judah statement was merely to explain the words of the first Tana but not to dissent therefrom do you point out a contradiction between one authority and another if you wish however I can say that if the Mishnah indeed excludes the cat and yet our Judah statement was necessary for you might have said the reason why the Mishnah mentions the wolf. Was because it was the more common occurrence. He therefore teaches us that it is not so. Aram Rome said in the name of our hista goats and lambs are trifle claw either by a cat or a martin birds if clawed by a weasel. An objection was raised to clawing by a cat or a hawk or a martin does not render trifle unless the claw actually penetrated into the abdominal cavity. Now it follows from this that the clawing itself is of no consequence. But how do you explain this? Is the clawing by a hawk of no consequence? Surely we have learned if clawed by a hawk. This is no difficulty for the statement of our mission refers to birds being clawed, whereas the statement of the berita refers to goats and lambs. But against our hista, this berita is indeed an objection. Here hista concurs with the view of the following tana. For it was taught the rabbi said only in that case when no one was present to save the attacked animal did the rabbi say that the clawing by a cat was of no. Consequence, but when someone was present to save the attacked animal, the clawing by a cat is of consequence. Do you then hold that when no one is present to save the animal, the clawing by a cat is of no consequence? But it once happened that a hand belonging to our Kahana was being pursued by a cat and it ran into a room. The door shut in the face of the cat so that in its fury it struck the door with its paw. There were then found on it five spots of blood when the attacked animal tries to save itself. It is the same as when others are present to save it, but does not this incident contradict the view of the rabbis? They maintain that it has venom, but the venom does not burn. Others report the passage, thus the author of that very is the rabbi, for it was taught the rabbi said only in that case when there was someone present to save the attacked animal, did the rabbi say that the clawing by a cat was of consequence, but when no one was present to save the attacked animal. The clawing by a cat is of no consequence. Do you then hold that when no one is present to save the animal, the clawing by a cat is of no consequence? But it once happened that a hand belonging to our Kahana was being pursued by a cat and it ran into a room. The door shut in the face of the cat so that in its fury it struck the door with its paw. There were then found on it five spots of blood. When the attacked animal tries to save itself, it is the same as when others are present to save it. Our Kahana inquired of Rab Talmud, Mastulin is the clawing by a cat of consequence or not? He replied, Even the clawing by a weasel is of consequence and is the clawing by a weasel of consequence or not? He replied, Even the clawing by a cat is of no consequence and is the clawing by a cat or by a weasel of consequence or not? He replied, The clawing by a cat is of consequence, but the clawing by a weasel is not. Now there is really no contradiction between these replies for when he said even the Clawing by a weasel is of consequence he meant with reference to birds and when he said even the clawing by a cat is of no consequence he meant with reference to large sheep and when he said the clawing by a cat is of consequence but the clawing by a weasel is not he meant with reference to kids and lambs our ashi asked is the clawing by the other unclean birds of consequence or not our hillel said to our ashi when we were at the school of our kahana he taught us that the clawing by the other unclean birds was of consequence but have we not learned small fowl if clawed by a hawk it means the clawing by a hawk is of consequence upon other birds even as large as itself while the clawing by other birds is of consequence only upon others smaller than themselves others say that it means the clawing by a hawk is of consequence upon others even larger than itself while the clawing by other birds is of consequence only upon others as large as themselves our kahana said in the name of our shimai be ashi the clawing by a fox is of no consequence, but this is not so. For when Ardimi came from Palestine, he related that there once happened a case where a ulam was clawed by a fox at the baths of Beth Hanai, and when the case was brought to the sages, they ruled that the clawing was of consequence. Our Safra answered in that case it must have been a cat and not a fox. Others reported thus. Our Kahana said in the name of our Shimai B. Ashi, the clawing by a fox is of consequence, but this is not so. For when Ardimi came from Palestine, he related that there once happened a case where a ulam was clawed by a fox, and when the case was brought to the sages, they ruled that the clawing was of no consequence. Our Safra answered it must have been a dog and not a fox. Our Joseph said we have it on tradition that the clawing by a dog is of no consequence. Abe said we have it on tradition that clawing is only with the foreleg, thus excluding the hind leg. That clawing is only with the claws, thus excluding. The teeth that the clawing must be intentional, thus excluding an unintentional act, and that the clawing must be by a living animal, thus excluding the clawing by a dead animal. But since you have already said it must not be unintentional, is it then at all necessary to say that it must not be by a dead animal? It is indeed necessary for the case where the animal struck with its claw and it was immediately amputated. Now you might have thought that it discharges the poison at once when it strikes. With the claw, we therefore learned that it discharges the poison only when it withdraws the claw. Rabbi son of Arhuna said in the name of Rabbi, the lion had entered amidst oxen, and later there was found a nail from a lion's claw lodged in the back of one of them. There is no fear that the lion had clawed it. Why? Because although most lions attack with their claws, there are a few that do not. Moreover, all that do claw do not usually lose a nail. Therefore, the fact that this ox has a nail lodged in. Its back suggests that it had rubbed itself against the wall. On the contrary, we should argue thus: although most oxen rub themselves against the wall, there are a few that do not. Moreover, all that do rub themselves against the wall do not usually find a nail lodged in their backs. Therefore, the fact that this ox has a nail lodged in its back suggests that it was clawed by a lion. One can argue this way, and one can argue that way. Therefore, as there is a doubt whether the ox had been clawed or not, it is permitted for Rav is consistent in his view that we are in no way apprehensive of an animal about which there is a doubt whether it has been clawed or not. Abay said this is the rule only when the nail was actually there protruding from the back of the ox. But if there was found the mark of the nail of a claw upon the back, we are certainly apprehensive about it. And even when the nail was actually there, this rule applies only if the nail was moist with blood. But if it was dry, it is. Quite usual for it to fall loose, and even when the nail was moist, the rule applies only to a single nail. But if there were two or three nails upon the back of the animal, we are apprehensive about it, provided, however, they were in the shape of a paw. It was stated, Rab says we are in no way apprehensive of an animal about which there is a doubt whether it has been clawed or not. Samuel says we are apprehensive about it. Now all agree as to the following if there was a doubt whether it the lion entered among the cattle or not, we may assume that it did not enter. If there was a doubt whether an animal had been clawed by a dog or by a cat, we may assume that it was a dog. If it the lion entered and quietly lay down among the cattle, we may assume that it became friendly with them. If it broke the head of one, we may assume that its fury has thereby been assuaged. If the lion was roaring and the cattle were lowing, we may assume that they are trying to frighten Talmud, Mastul and Beach. Other their dispute arises only where the lion was silent and they were lowing. One Samuel is of the opinion that this is an indication that it has already attacked them, whereas the other rabbi is of the opinion that they are lowing out of fear. Only Amimar said the laws that we must be apprehensive of an animal about which there was a doubt whether it had been clawed or not. Whereupon Arashi said to Amimar, But what about Rab's view? He replied, I have not heard of it, by which I mean to say I don't agree with it, or else I can say that Rab withdrew his opinion in favor of Samuel's, for it once
examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of calling must be carried out in the region of the intestines or Joseph said the statement of the sons of Arhai was made long ago by Samuel for Samuel said in the name of Arhan of B. Antigonos the examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of calling must be carried out in the region of the intestines Ilfa raised the question are the organs of the throat affected by calling or not Arzara said the question raised by Ilfa was answered long ago by Arhan and Birabah for Arhan and Birabah said in the name of Rab the examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of clawing must be carried out over all the internal organs including even the organs of the throat Ilfa raised the question how much of the organs of the throat must be torn loose in order to render the animal trifa Arzara said the question raised by Ilfa was answered long ago by Rabbi Barhana for Rabbi Barhana said in the name of Samuel if the greater part of the circumference of the organs of the throat was torn loose from its connection on top the animal is trifa Rmi asked what is the law of the case set in as a result of clawing Arzara said the question raised by Rmi was answered long ago by Rab Judah for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab in the case of clawing the animal is not trifa unless the flesh in the region of the intestines became red if the flesh decayed it is to be regarded as though it were gone. Entirely what is meant by decayed Arhuna the son of Arjashua said it is all such flesh as is scraped away by the surgeon in order to leave only healthy flesh Arashi said when we were at the school of Arkahana there was brought before us a lung which when laid down lay firm but when lifted up decomposed and fell to pieces and we declared it to be trifa in accordance with the view of Arhuna the son of Arjashua Arnaman said in the case of a thorn the animal is not trifa unless it penetrated into the abdominal cavity in the case of clawing unless the flesh in the region of the intestines became red Arzibid reported thus in the case of clawing the animal is not trifa unless the flesh in the region of the intestines became red and it clawed in the region of the organs of the throat unless the organs themselves became red our poppy reported that our BBB Abe raised this question Talmud Mosulane with regard to the gullet as the slightest preparation is sufficient to Render the animal trifa so too is the slightest indication of clawing but with regard to the windpipe since it is established that there must be a hole the size of an so what is the law as to the clawing thereof after raising this question he himself answered it thus in either organ the slightest indication of clawing will render the animal trifa why because the poison gradually burns away more and more our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha was sitting before Arnaman and recited the examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of clawing must be carried out in the region of the intestines thereupon Arnaman said to him by God Rab used to rule that an examination must be made of all the internal organs from the pen to the hips now what is the pen is it the pen of the forelimb but then this view would be identical with that mentioned above in the region of the intestines it must mean therefore from the pen of the brain to the hips when our high B. Joseph went up to Palestine he found our Yohanan and our Simeon Belakish stating their view namely that the examination of which the rabbis have spoken in the case of clawing must be carried out in the region of the intestines he thereupon said by God Rab used to rule that an examination must be made of all the internal organs from the pen to the hips Resh retorted who is this Rab who is this Rab I know him not said our Yohanan to him do you not remember that disciple who attended the lectures of the great Rabbi and of Arhai and by God all the years during which that disciple sat before his teachers are remained standing and in what do you think he excelled he excelled in everything immediately Resh Lakish explained verily that man is to be remembered for good for in his name has the following dictum been reported visive after slaughtering the windpipe was found to be torn loose the animal is permitted for it is impossible to have cut through an organ that had been torn loose our Yohanan. However said he should compare it or said the rule of Rab holds good only if the slaughterer did not grasp the organs when slaughtering but if he did grasp the organs the slaughtering is invalid for then it is possible to cut through an organ that had been torn loose this is the rule what cases does it include it includes the seven statements the members of the house of Joseph the fowler used to kill beasts by striking them on the sciatic nerve when they came to inquire of Arjuna. Be but there he said to them may we then add to the list of defects which render an animal trifle we accept only those enumerated by the rabbis the members of the house of our papa B. Abba the fowler used to kill beasts by striking them on the kidney when they came to inquire of our Abba he said to them may we then add to the list of defects we accept only those enumerated by the rabbis but do we not see that the beast dies from the blow it is established beyond doubt that if salts were applied. It would live mission and the following defects do not render cattle trifle if the windpipe was pierced or slit lengthwise to what extent may it be deficient our simian B. Gamaliel says up to an Italian sorry part of the skull broke off but the membrane of the brain was not pierced if the heart was pierced but not as far as the cavity thereof if the spine was broken but the cord was not severed if the liver was gone but an olive size thereof remained if the omasum and reticulum were pierced. On the inside if the spleen was gone or the kidneys or the lower jawbone or the womb if the lung was shriveled up by an act of God if an animal was stripped of its height our mayor declares it valid but the rabbis declare it invalid Gamar it was reported our Yohanan says the former mission of the following defects render cattle trifle is to be emphasized our simian B. Lakish says this mission and the following defects do not render cattle trifle is to be emphasized what is the real issue between them. It is Armatina's case for Armatina ruled if the top of the femur slipped out of its socket the animal is trifa now are Yohanan who said that the former mission namely the following defects render cattle trifa was to be emphasized argues thus the Tana stated various defects and finally added this is the rule Talmud. Mostral and B. he saw however that Armatina's case might be admitted as a trifa under the clause this is the rule for it is well nigh similar to a case where the entire organ was gone he therefore taught the following defects render cattle trifa emphasizing that only the following render cattle trifa but the defects stated by Armatina does not render the animal trifa our Simeon B. Lakish who said that this mission namely and the following defects do not render cattle trifa was to be emphasized on the other hand argues thus the Tana stated various defects and finally added this is the rule he saw however that Armatina's case might not be admitted as a Trifa under the clause this is the rule for it is not quite the same as when an organ is pierced or severed or gone entirely he therefore taught the following defects do not render cattle trifa emphasizing that only the following do not render an animal trifa but the defects stated by our Matina does the text stated above our Matina ruled if the top of the femur slipped out of its socket the animal is trifa Rabba however ruled that it was permitted though if the ligaments were severed it is trifa the laws even if the ligaments were severed it is permitted unless they had decayed to what extent may it be deficient etc zeir said you who have never seen the size of an Italian is or may take instead as a standard the size of a Gordian dinar which is equal in size to the small peshet current among the small coins of Pumadai the Arhana the money changer said once there stood before me Barnapaha who asked me for a Gordian dinar with which to measure a defect I wanted to rise before him but he would not allow me saying sit down my son sit down craftsmen are not allowed to rise before scholars whilst they are engaged in their work but are they not surely we have learned all craftsmen must rise before them inquire after their welfare and greet them our brethren from such and such a place here are welcome our Yohanan said before them they must rise but not before scholars thereupon our Jose B. Avin remarked come and see how precious is a precept when performed in its due season for the craftsmen must rise before these but not before scholars but once do you gather this perhaps they are shown respect so as not to put a stumbling block in their way for the future Arnaman said an exact seller is regarded as more than a seller likewise an exact is is regarded as more than an is this shows that Arnaman is of the opinion that up to is not inclusive robber raised an objection against Arnaman we have learned a string which hangs over from the texture of a bed that is of any length up to five handbreadths is clean presumably if it was exactly five handbreadths it would be regarded as less no exactly five would be regarded as more come and here if it was from five up to ten handbreadths in length it is unclean presumably if it was exactly ten handbreadths long it would be regarded as less no exactly ten would be regarded as more come and here small earthenware vessels or the bottoms or sides of broken earthenware vessels that can stand without support Talmud Mostral and A can contract uncleanness if they can now hold enough oil to anoint a limb of a child provided that when unbroken these vessels could hold any amount up to a log presumably
Upon that mission, if it was exactly five handbreadths long, it is regarded as more, but if it was exactly ten handbreadths long, it is regarded as less. If the spleen was gone, our Arah said in the name of Rabba, this was taught only if it was gone, but should it have been pierced, it would be true. Our Jose B. Abin others say, our Jose B. Zabit erased this objection. We have learned whatsoever is cut off from the embryo within the womb of the animal and left inside may be eaten, but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or kidneys of the animal itself and left inside may not be eaten. It follows, however, that the animal itself is permitted. No, the law is that the animal itself is also forbidden, but only because the Tanis stated in the first clause that it may be eaten, did he state in the second clause too that it may not be eaten. Alternatively, I can say pierced is one thing, but cut another if the kidneys were gone. Rakish B. Papa said in the name of Rabba, if one kidney was diseased, it is true. The West it was said provided the infection extended Talmud, Mastul and be up to the hilum of the kidney where is this at the white calices in the middle of the kidney which are immediately below the lungs are Nihunia said I inquired of all those who decide questions of Trifa in the West and they told me that the law was in accordance with the ruling of Rakish B. Papa but that the law was not in accordance with the ruling of Arara this is so however only if it the spleen was pierced in the flat part but if it was pierced in the thick part it is Trifa and if there remained of the spleen the thickness of the golden dinar that had not been pierced it is permitted it was said in the West whatsoever is considered a defect in the lung is not a defect in the kidney for a perforation is a defect in the lung and is not a defect in the kidney and of course whatsoever is not considered a defect in the lung is not a defect in the kidney are ten humidimer is this a fast rule but take the case of pus which if found in the lung is not considered a defect but in the kidney is considered a defect and indeed take the case of clear water which if found in either organ is not a defect rather said Arashi do you compare defects with each other amongst the various defects we cannot say that this resembles that for an animal may be cut in one place and die and in another place and live now this ruling that if filled with clear water it is permitted applies only if the water was pellucid but if it was turbid it is true and the ruling that if filled with pellucid water it is permitted applies only if the water was not fetid but if it was fetid it is true if the kidney diminished in size down to a bean in the case of small cattle or down to a medium sized grape in the case of large cattle it is true if the lower jawbone was gone Arzera said the mission teaches that it is permitted only where the animal can continue to live by the stuffing and the pushing of Food into its gullet, but if it cannot continue to live by the stuffing and the pushing of food into its gullet, it is true. If the womb was gone, attended taught em tarpahit and shalpahit are all one and the same thing. If the lung was shriveled up by an act of God, it is permitted. Our rabbis taught what is heresy. If its lung was shriveled up, if by an act of God, it is permitted. But if by the act of man, it is true. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says, even by other creatures, it was asked, does he are? Simeon B. Eliezer referred to the first clause, thus making the law more lenient, or does he refer to the second clause, thus making it more strict? Come and here it was taught, if it was shriveled up by an act of man, it is true. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says, even by other creatures, it is also true. Rabbi Barhano was once traveling through a desert when he came upon certain rams whose lungs were all shriveled up. He went and inquired about them at the college and was told the following in summer. One must take white glazed basins, fill them with cold water, and leave the lungs therein for a period of 24 hours. If they return to their normal state, it is a sign that it was caused by an act of God, and they are permitted. Otherwise, they are trifa. In winter, one must take dark glazed basins, fill them with warm water, and leave the lungs therein for a period of 24 hours. If they return to their normal state, they are permitted. Otherwise, they are trifa. If an animal was stripped of its hide, our rabbis taught if it was stripped of its hide, our Meir declares it valid, but the rabbis declare it invalid. Long ago, Eliezer the scribe and Yohanan B. Gajada had testified that an animal stripped of its hide was invalid. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said that our Meir had retracted his view and would follow. Therefore, that according to our Simeon B. Eliezer, our Meir did dispute the law of an animal stripped of its hide with the rabbis, but surely it has been taught. Our Simeon B. Eliezer said there was never. Any dispute between our Meir and the rabbis in the case of an animal stripped of its hide for it is certainly invalid. Moreover, our Ashai, the son of Arjuna, the spice dealer, had testified before our Akiva on the authority of Artarfan that an animal stripped of its hide was invalid, but if there remained there of the size of a cell, it was permitted. Our Naman B. Isaac answered that the words there was never any dispute meant that our Meir did not persist in the controversy. The master stated if there remained there of the size of a cell, it was permitted. Where must this be? Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel along the entire backbone. It was asked, does this mean a long thin strip along the entire backbone so that when rolled up it would be the size of a cell, or does it mean a strip the width of a cell along the entire backbone? Come and here for our Nira explained it on the authority of Samuel to mean a strip the width of a cell along the entire backbone. Rabbi Barhana said there. Must be the size of a cell at the top of every joint. Our Eliezer B. Antigono said in the name of our Eliezer B. Arjane at the navel. Arjane, son of Arishmael, raised this question: What if the skin along the entire backbone was gone, but all the rest of it remained? Or if the skin at the navel was gone, but all the rest of it remained? Or if the skin at the top of each joint was gone, but all the rest of it remained? This remains undecided. Rab said, Any remnant of skin anywhere the size of a cell saves the animal from being declared trifa, except the skin around the hoof. But our Yohanan said, Even the skin around the hoof saves the animal from being declared trifa. R.C. inquired of our Yohanan, Would the skin around the hoof save the animal from being declared trifa? He replied, It would, but retorted the other, You are teacher have taught us in the following cases the skin is accounted as flesh. The skin around the hoof. He replied, Do not weary me with your arguments for I Taught that as the opinion of an individual, for it was taught if a man slaughtered a burnt offering, purposing to burn an olive's bulk of the skin from under the fat tail at the improper place, the sacrifice is invalid, and he is not liable to the punishment of Kareth. But if he purposed to burn it at the improper time, it would be pickle, and he would be liable to the punishment of Kareth. Eliza B. Judah of Ibalame stated in the name of our Jacob. Similarly, our Simeon B. Judah of Farai, who stated in the name of our Simeon, if a man while slaughtering a burnt offering purposed to burn either the skin around the hoofs or the skin of the head of a young calf or the skin from under the fat tail or any of the skins which were enumerated by the sages in connection with the law of uncleanness, when they stated that in the following cases the skin is as the flesh Talmud, Mastulina, meaning to include the skin of the putenta at the improper place, the sacrifice would be invalid, and he would not be. Liable to the punishment of Kareth, but at the improper time it would be pickle and he would be liable to the punishment of Kareth. Mission of the following defects rendered birds trifa if the gullet was pierced or the windpipe severed if a weasel struck the bird on the head in such a place as would render it trifa if the gizzard or the intestines were pierced if it fell into the fire and its internal organs were scorched and they turned green it is invalid but if they remained red it is valid. If one trod upon it or knocked it against the wall or if an animal trampled upon it and it still jerks its limbs and it remained alive after this for 24 hours and it was thereafter slaughtered it is valid. Gamara Rab Samuel and Levi say one should insert the finger into the mouth of the bird and press upon the upper palate and apply this test if the brain substance oozes through the hole in the skull it is trifa but if not it is permitted this is well however only according to him. Who says that unless the lower membrane of the brain has also been pierced, it would not be trifa? But according to him, who says that it is trifa, even if only the upper membrane and not the lower had been pierced, we ought to be apprehensive of this test. For it might well be that the upper membrane has been pierced and the lower has not. If it were so that the upper membrane had been pierced, then the lower, on account of its tenderness, would most certainly break by reason of the pressure of the fingers. Zeiri said, no test is of any avail against the bite of a weasel because its teeth are fine. But what does it matter if its teeth are fine? Or Ashai corrected because its teeth are fine and curved. When Zeiri went up to Nihardia, he sent backward saying that statement which I made before you was wrong. Verily, it has been reported in the name of our Simeon Belakish that one may examine the membrane of the brain against the bite of a weasel with
membrane it has no membrane is this possible rather it means its membrane is so fine that the examination is of no avail our naman said to our and did you not tell us master that samuel used to make the test with the finger and would declare the bird permitted and our colleague Huna also reported that rab used to make the test with the finger and declare it permitted but surely levi has taught the defects enumerated by the sages in the case of cattle equally apply wherever possible to birds there is however this addition in the case of birds namely if the bone of the skull was broken even though the membrane of the brain has not been pierced he replied the latter defect refers only to a water bird for it has no membrane it has no membrane is this possible rather it means its membrane is very fine a hand belonging to our hannah was sent to our matina for the bone of its skull had been broken but the membrane of the brain had not been pierced and he declared it to be permitted er Hannah remarked, but Levi has taught the defects enumerated by the sages in the case of cattle equally applied to birds. There is, however, this addition in the case of birds, namely, if the bone of the skull was broken, even though the membrane of the brain has not been pierced, he replied that defect refers only to a water bird, for it has no membrane, it has no membrane. Is this possible? Rather, it means its membrane is very fine. Arshis by used to examine the membrane of the brain of the bird by the light of the sun. Our Yamar used to examine it with water. Our Ahabi Jacob used to examine it. Talmud, Mastul and be with a straw of wheat. Arshis by said, our geese are regarded as water birds. If it fell into the fire, our Yohan and said on the authority of our Jose B. Joshua, the size of a green patch on any of the internal organs required to render a bird trifa is the same as the size of the whole, just as a whole, however, small renders trifa, so does a green patch, however, small render trifa, our Joseph. Son of our Joshua B. Levi asked our Joshua B. Levi what is the law if that part of the liver which lies in front of the entrails turned green he replied it would be trifa but retorted the other it should not be worse than if the liver was gone. Rob answered since the part of the liver which lies in front of the entrails has turned green one can be certain that the bird had fallen into the fire and its internal organs had been scorched it is therefore trifa our Joshua B. Levi had a hand which he sent. To our Eliezer Hakapur Gurabai he replied they are still green and he declared it permitted but we have learned if they turn green it is invalid they said if they turn green it is invalid only with regard to the gizzard the heart or the liver there is also a very that supports this is with regard to which organs did they state the rule that if they turn green it was invalid only with regard to the gizzard the heart or the liver our Isaac B. Joseph had a hand which he sent to our Abba. He replied they have turned red and he declared it trifa but we have learned if they remained red it is valid he replied the rule is if organs which are normally red turned green or organs which are normally green turned red it is trifa for they said if they remained red it is valid only with regard to the heart the gizzard or the liver our Samuel Behai said in the name of Armani if organs which are normally red turned green on the hand falling into the fire but after being cooked turned again to red it is valid why for it was merely the smoke that had entered into them and had discolored them temporarily our and B. Isaac remarked then we too can say likewise if organs which are normally red did not turn green on the hand falling into the fire but after being cooked were found to have turned green it is invalid why their shame has only now been brought to light therefore said our ashi one should not eat a hand that had fallen into the fire without first cooking the internal Organs, but this is not right, for we do not assume any taint without cause. If one trod upon it or knocked it against the wall, it is valid. Our Eliezer B. Antigono said in the name of our Eliezer, son of our Janae, in each case the bird must be examined. Mission and the following defects do not render birds trifa if the windpipe was pierced or slit lengthwise. If a weasel struck it on the head in such a place as would not render it trifa if the crop was pierced, Rabbi says, even if it was gone, if it entrails protruded from the body but were not pierced, if its wings were broken or its legs or if its feathers were plucked out, our Judah says, if its down was gone, it is invalid. Gemara, our rabbis taught it is related of our Semai and our Zadok that when they were on their way to Lydia in order to enter Calat the year they spent the Sabbath at Ono and they ruled concerning the womb as Rabbi concerning the crop it was asked, does it mean they ruled that if the womb was gone it was forbidden and they also ruled like rabbi that if the crop was gone it was permitted or does it mean they ruled that if the womb was gone it was permitted just as rabbi rules concerning the crop but in the case of the crop they do not agree with rabbi's ruling it remains undecided rabbi others say our joshua b levi said the top of the crop is regarded as the gullet whereas this rbb of a said it is that part of the crop at which point it begins to elongate if the entrails protruded our samuel b r isaac said the mission refers only to the case where they were not twisted when put back but if they were twisted when put back it would be true for it is written hath he not made the end established be which implies that the holy one blessed be he created in man every organ on its foundation so that if any one organ is twisted man cannot live it was taught our mayor used to expound this verse as follows hath he not made the end established the israel is a community wherein all classes are due. Be found out of them come their priests out of them their prophets out of them their princes out of them their kings as it is written out of them shall come forth the cornerstone out of them the stake etc. A gentile once saw a man fall from the roof to the ground so that his belly burst open and his entrails protruded the gentile thereupon brought the son of the victim and by an optical illusion made out as if he slaughtered him in the presence of the father Talmud, Mosul and of it. Father became faint side deeply and drew in his entrails whereupon his belly was immediately stitched up if its legs were broken a basket full of birds each bird having its legs broken was brought before Rabbi he examined each at the juncture of the tendons and declared them to be permitted Rabbi Judah said in the name of Rabbi if the foreleg of an animal was dislodged it is permitted if the femur of an animal was dislodged it is trifa if the femur of a bird was dislodged it is trifa if it Wing of a bird was dislodged, it is true, for we apprehend that the lung has been pierced. Samuel said it should be examined. Our Yohanan also said it should be examined. Hezekiah stated a bird has no lungs. Our Yohanan said it has lungs, and they are like rose petals situated immediately beneath the wings. What is meant by a bird has no lungs? Does it mean that it has no lungs at all? But we see that it has, and should it mean that any defect therein would not render true? Surely Levi has taught it. Defects enumerated by the sages in the case of cattle apply also to birds with this addition in the case of birds, namely if the bone of the skull was broken, even though the membrane of the brain has not been pierced, we must therefore say that the statement it has no lungs means that they are in no wise affected whether the bird falls down from the roof or is scorched in the fire. Why is it so? Our Hannah answered because they are protected by most of the ribs, but surely since our Yohanan has. Said that it has lungs and they are like rose petals situated immediately beneath the wings. It follows that Hezekiah was of the opinion that it has no lungs at all. In truth, it has been said in the West in the name of our Jose, son of Arhana. It is evident from the statement of the rabbi that he knew nothing of fowls. Arhuna said in the name of Rabbi, the femur of a bird was dislodged. It is permitted. Rabbi, son of Arhuna said to Arhuna, but the rabbis who came from Hamadai reported it. Statement of Rab Judah in the name of Rab, thus if the femur of a bird was dislodged, it is true. He replied, My son, every river has its own course. Our Abba once went and found our Jeremiah B. Abba examining a bird at the juncture of the tendon. Said our Abba, Why does the master go to all this trouble? Has not Arhuna reported in the name of Rab, if the femur of a bird was dislodged, it is permitted. He replied, I know only of the following mission. If the hind legs of an animal were cut off below the knee. Joint it is permitted above the knee joint it is true. Similarly, if the juncture of the tendons was gone, it is true. And Rab has said the same is the law in the case of a bird. Then is there not here a contradiction between the two statements of Rab here? Jeremiah remained silent. The other thereupon suggested perhaps he Rab makes a distinction in law between a limb dislodged and a limb cut off here. Jeremiah then said, and you merely suggest this distinction in Rab. Rab has expressly said. So if the femur of a bird was dislodged, it is permitted, but if cut off, it is true. And be not amazed at this, for if the animal is cut in one place, it will die, and if cut in another place, it will live. When our Abba went up to Palestine, he found our Zara sitting and reciting as follows: Arhuna said in the name of Rab, if the femur of a bird was dislodged, it is true. Our Abba said to him, by your life since the day you left Babylon to go up here, Talmud, Mosul, and B, we had an opportunity of. Asking Arhuna about this, and he
Reported in the name of Rabbi, the femur of the bird was dislodged. It is permitted indeed. Our Hanana once had a hand, the femur of which had become dislodged, and he brought it to Rabbi, and the latter declared it to be permitted thereupon. Our Hanana preserved it in salt and used it to demonstrate the law to the pupils. This did Rabbi permit to me, this did Rabbi permit to me. The law, however, does not rest with any of the above views that declare it to be permitted, but it is as stated in the following. Incident Our Jose Binieri asked our Joshua B. Levi how large must a hole in the windpipe be in order to render the animal trifle. He replied, We have learned it as a clear statement in our mission of is up to an Italian. So the other retorted, But there was a lamb in our neighborhood in whose windpipe there was a large hole, and they inserted in it a tube of reed and it recovered. He rejoined, And can you rely upon this? Is not the law widespread in Israel that if the femur of a bird is dislodged, it is trifle. Nevertheless, it is related that our Simeon B. Halafta had a hand whose femur was dislodged, and they prepared for it a tube of reed as a support, and it recovered. You can only suggest an explanation that it recovered within twelve months of the injury. So in the former case, too, you must say that it recovered within twelve months of the injury. It was said of our Simeon B. Halafta that he was an experimenter in all things. Indeed, he once made an experiment to disprove our Judas before. We have learned our Judas says if its down was gone it is invalid now our Simeon B. Halafta once had a hand whose down was gone entirely he put it into the oven having first wrapped it in the warm leather apron used by bronze workers and it grew feathers even larger than the original ones but perhaps our Judah maintains that a trifle can improve surely not in that very physical blemish which rendered it trifle for here it grew feathers even larger than the original ones why was he called an experimenter our Meshachia said it is written go to the ant thou slug guard consider her ways and be wise which having no chief overseer or ruler provide her bread in the summer he our Simeon B. Halafta said I shall go and find out whether it is true that they have no king he went at the summer solstice and spread his coat over an anthill when one ant came out he marked it and it immediately entered and informed the others that shadows had fallen whereupon they all came forth he then removed his coat and the sun beat down upon them thereupon they set upon this ant and killed it he then said it is clear that they have no king for otherwise they would surely have required to obtain royal sanction our Aha son of Rabbah said to our Ashi but perhaps the king was with them or they had royal authority or it was during an interregnum when they were under no law as it is written in those days there was no king in Israel every man did that which was right in his own eyes rather must you take the word of Solomon for it Arhuna said the test for a is twelve months an objection was raised it was taught the test for a is that it cannot bring forth young our Simon B. Gamaliel says if it improves in health it is certainly fit if it wastes away it is certainly true Rabbi says the test for a is thirty days but they said to him is it not a fact that many continue to live for two or three years Tanaim differ in this for it was taught if in the skull there was one long hole or if there were many small holes in it, in either case the hole or holes are computed to make up the measure of a hole the size of a surgical drill. Our Jose B. Hameshalem said it happened at an IBL that a person had a hole in his skull and they put over it a plaster of a shell and he recovered. But our Simeon said to him, Do you mean to prove your case from that it happened in the summer months? But when winter set and he died, our Ahabi Jacob said the halachah is that a trifle animal can bring. Fourth young and can also improve a mimar set as to the eggs of a bird that was rendered trifle Talmud. Mosul and those of the first set are forbidden, but the subsequent ones are permitted for they are the product of two causes. Our Ashi raised this objection against a mimar we have learned, but they agree that the egg of a bird that was trifle is forbidden because it developed in what was forbidden. In that case the bird was fertilized through friction in the dust, but why did he not reply? That the egg was of the first set because if so it should have said it was finished and not it developed but then what of the following very it was taught our Eliezer says the calf of a cow which was trifa may not be offered as a sacrifice upon the altar our Joshua says it may now what are the circumstances of the case in which they differ it must be surely that the animal was first rendered trifa and then impregnated our Eliezer maintaining that the product of two causes is prohibited and our Joshua maintaining that it is permitted this being so why do they differ as to its validity for sacred purposes why do they not rather differ as to its validity for ordinary purposes in order to set forth the view of our Joshua that it is valid even for sacred purposes but why do they not differ as to its validity for ordinary purposes so as to set forth the view of our Eliezer that it is invalid even for ordinary purposes it is preferable to set forth the view which shows leniency nevertheless they agree that the egg of the bird which was trifle is forbidden if the bird was fertilized through friction in the dust for then the egg is the product of one cause our Aha accepts the view of our Ahabi Jacob and accordingly reports the statement of Amimar as we have stated it above Rabbana however does not accept the view of our Ahabi Jacob and therefore reports the statement of Amimar in this form Amimar said as to the eggs of the bird about which there arose a doubt whether it was rendered trifle or not those of the first set must be held over if the bird continues to lay eggs then these are permitted but if not these are forbidden our Ashi raised this objection against Amimar it was taught but they agree that the egg of the bird that was trifle is forbidden because it developed in what was forbidden he replied that refers to the egg of the first set if so it should have said it was finished and not it developed red then it was finished but what of the berry which was taught are Eliezer says the calf of a cow which was trifle may not be offered as a sacrifice upon the altar. Our Joshua says it may now. What are the circumstances of the case in which they differ? It must be surely that the animal was first impregnated and then became trifle. Our Eliezer maintaining that the embryo is part of its mother and our Joshua maintaining that the embryo is not part of its mother. This being so, why do they differ as to its validity for sacred purposes? Why do they not rather differ as to its validity for ordinary purposes in order to set forth the view of our Joshua? But why do they not differ as to its validity for ordinary purposes? So setting forth the view of our Eliezer, it is preferable to set forth the view which shows leniency. Nevertheless, they agree that the egg of the bird that was trifle beyond doubt is forbidden if it was one of the first set because it is part of the body of the bird. The law is in a male twelve months is a criterion and in a female if it cannot bring forth. Young Arhuna said all invertebrates cannot live for twelve months said our Papa we can infer from Arhuna's statement having regard to Samuel's statement namely that a cucumber which became wormy in its growth was forbidden Talmud, Mosul and be that dates which were kept in a vessel and which became wormy are permitted after twelve months Rab said no gnat lives a complete day and no fly lives a complete year our Papa said to Abe but there is a popular story for seven years the she gnat quarreled with the he gnat said she to him I was once watching a resident of Mosul bathing in the sea and when he came out and wrapped himself in a sheet you came and settled down on him and sucked his blood but you did not tell me of it he replied if as you suggest that it is to be taken literally behold that other popular saying a weight of sixty minus of iron is suspended on the gnat's proboscis is this possible how much does the whole gnat weigh obviously it speaks of their minus so. In the previous saying it speaks of their years we have learned elsewhere an animal that has five legs or only three is considered with blemish. Arhuna said this was stated only of a foreleg that is wanting or too many but if a hind leg is wanting or too many it is even trifle. Why? Because every addition of a limb is deemed equal to the loss of the limb. An animal having two sonia to be was brought before Rabbana and he declared it trifle because of Arhuna's principle if however they run into each other it would be permitted a tube running from the reticulum to the omasum was once found in an animal. Arashi was about to declare it trifle when Arhuna Marbihai said to him but all animals that feed in the open fields have this tube a tube running from the reticulum to the rumen was once found in an animal. Arashi was about to declare it permitted when Arashi said to him did you leave them all in one web where it has been expressly stated it has been stated but where it has not been. Expressly stated it has not been stated Nathan B. Sheila Chief Slaughter and Sephoris testified before Rabbi of two sets of intestines issue concurrently from the abomasum of the animal it is trifle in the bird however an abnormality such as this would be permitted this is the rule only if they emerge from two separate parts of the abomasum but if they emerge from the same place in the abomasum and coalesce within a finger breadth it is permitted RMI and RSC differ one says they must be fused into one the other says they need not be fused into one now it is well according to him who says that they must be
suffered from congestion of the blood or was overcome by fumes or if it ate oleander or hence dung or if it drank noxious water or if it swallowed crowfoot as aphitida or pepper or if it ate poison it is permitted if it was bitten by a snake or a mad dog it is not forbidden as trifa but is forbidden as a danger to life is there not here a contradiction in the matter of a and also in the matter of poison in the matter of a there is no contradiction because one speaks of it drops of a and the other of the leaves and in the matter of poison there is also no contradiction because sinus speaks of poison for animals and the other of poison for man but if it is only a poison for animals then it is the same as oleander it mentions two kinds of poison what is crowfoot rab judah said talmud mostulin it is the root of suckery our judah said he who eats three tickles of a on an empty stomach will shed his skin our about said it actually happened with me when I once ate one tickle of a saffitida and indeed had I not sat in water I should have lost my skin I thus applied to myself the verse wisdom preserveth the life of him that hath it or Joseph said he who eats sixteen eggs forty nuts and seven caper berries and drinks one quarter of a log of honey in one meal on an empty stomach in the summer months snaps his heart strings asunder there came before the rational of a young deer whose hind legs were broken rab examined it in the region of it juncture of attendance and declared it to be permitted he was about to eat a portion of it grilled when Samuel said to him master have you no fears lest it has been bitten by a snake then what is the remedy he asked let it be put into an oven and it will expose itself it was immediately put into an oven and it fell to pieces Samuel applied to rab the verse there shall no mischief befall the righteous and rab applied to Samuel the verse no secret trouble the mission of the characteristics of Cattle and of wild animals are stated in the Torah. The characteristics of birds are not stated, but the sages have said every bird that seizes its prey is unclean. Every bird that has an extra toe, a crop, and a gizzard that can be peeled is clean. Our Elizer, son of Arzadik, says every bird that parts its toes is unclean. Of locusts, all that have four legs, four wings, leaping legs, and wings covering the greater part of the body are clean. Our Jose says it must also bear the name locust of fishes. All that have fins and scales are clean. Our Judah says there must be at least two scales and one fin. The scales are those thin discs which are attached to the fish. The fins are those wings by which it swims. Gemara, our rabbis taught the following are the characteristics of cattle. Every beast that partakes its hoof, etc. If an animal chews the cud, one may be certain that it has no upper teeth and it is therefore clean. Is this a general rule? Behold, the camel chews the cud and has no upper teeth and yet is. Unclean the camel has canines but the young camel has not even canines furthermore the rock badger and the hare chew the cud nevertheless they have upper teeth and are unclean now are teeth mentioned at all in the Torah rather this is the meaning of the passage if an animal has no upper teeth one may be certain that it chews the cud and parts the hoof and it is therefore clean but one can examine its hoofs we must suppose that its hoofs were cut off and this accords with Arista's statement. For Arista said if a man was walking in the desert and found an animal with its hoofs cut off he should examine its mouth if it has no upper teeth he may be certain that it is clean otherwise he may be certain that it is unclean provided however he recognizes the camel but the camel has canines read provided he recognizes the young camel you admit then that there is a young camel which is the exception to the rule but there might well be other species similar to the young camel that should not enter your mind for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught it is written the camel because it shook the cut the ruler of the universe knows that there is no other beast that chews the cut and is unclean except the camel therefore the verse particularly stated it Arista further said if a man was walking in the desert and found an animal with its mouth mutilated he should examine its hoofs if they are parted he may be certain that it is clean but if not he may be certain that it is unclean provided however he recognizes the swine you admit then that there is a swine which is the exception to the rule but there might well be other species similar to the swine that should not enter your mind for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught it is written and the swine because it partake the hoof the ruler of the universe knows that there is no other beast that parts the hoof and is unclean except the swine therefore the verse particularly stated it Arista further said if a man was walking in the desert and found an animal with its hoofs cut off and its mouth mutilated, he should examine its flesh. If it runs crosswise, he may be certain that it is clean, but if not, he may be certain that it is unclean, provided however he recognizes the arod. You admit then that there is the arod, which is the exception to the rule, but there might well be other species similar to the arod. There is a tradition that there are not where should he examine the flesh of others say. Arista said under the rump the characteristics of wild animals. Our rabbis taught the following are the characteristics of wild animals, but surely the wild animal is included under cattle with regard to the characteristics of cleanness. Our Zara said Talmud, Mostul and B, it must be distinguished from cattle in order that its fat be permitted to be eaten, and it should read thus the following are the characteristics of wild animals whose fat is permitted, all that have horns and sharp. Pointed hoofs are doses says those that have horns need not be examined as to their hoofs but those that have sharp pointed hoofs must still be examined as to their horns and the gears so it has but one horn is permitted but is this a general rule behold the goat has horns and sharp pointed hoofs nevertheless its fat is forbidden we mean horns that are rounded but are not the horns of an ox rounded yet its fat is forbidden we mean horns that are notched but are not the horns of it goat notched nevertheless its fat is forbidden we mean horns that are forked but the horns of the deer are not forked nevertheless its fat is permitted we mean horns that are pointed therefore if its horns are forked there is no question at all about it but if they are not forked we then require them to be rounded and pointed and also notched and the notches must run one into the other this indeed is a doubt in connection with the carcass goat once there was taken out of the carcass goat Belonging to the rest of the basket full of fat, Araha forbade it, but our Samuel the son of Arabah ate of it and applied to himself the verse, A man's belly shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth. They sent word from there saying the law accords with our Samuel the son of Arabah. Nevertheless, give heed to the opinion of Araha, for he enlightens the eyes of the exile and the Kirsh, though it has but one horn is permitted. Rab Judah said the Kirsh is the deer of Bili, the Tigris is the lion. Of Bili, our Kahana said there is a distance of nine cubits from one ear to the other ear of the lion. Of Bili, our Joseph said the height of the deer of Bili is sixteen cubits long. The emperor once said to our Joshua, Behanani, your God is likened to a lion, for it is written, the lion hath roared, who will not fear the Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy, but what is the greatness of this a horseman can kill the lion? He replied, he has not been likened to the ordinary lion, but to the lion. A BLI I desire said the emperor that you show it to me he replied you cannot behold it indeed said the emperor I will see it here Joshua behind and I prayed and the lion set out from its place when it was 400 parasangs distant it roared once and all pregnant women miscarried and the walls of Rome fell when it was 300 parasangs distant it roared again and all the molars and incisors of man fell out even the emperor himself fell from his throne to the ground I beseech you he implored pray that it return to its place he prayed and it returned to its place another time the emperor said to our Joshua behind and I, I wish to see your God he replied you cannot see him indeed said the emperor Talmud Mostulin I will see him he went and placed the emperor facing the sun during the summer solstice and said to him look up at it he replied I cannot set our Joshua if at the sun which is but one of the ministers that attend the holy one blessed be he you cannot look how then can you presume to look upon the divine presence on another occasion? The emperor said to our Joshua Behan and I, I wish to prepare a banquet for your God. He replied, You could not undertake it. Why? Because his attendants are too numerous. Indeed, I will do it. Then go and prepare it on the spacious banks of Rebbe. The emperor spent the six months of summer in making preparations when a tempest arose and swept everything into the sea. He then spent the six months of winter in making preparations when rain fell and washed everything into the sea. What is the meaning of this? Asked the emperor there, but the sweepers and sprinklers that marched before him in that case said, The emperor, I cannot do it. The emperor's daughter once said to our Joshua Behan and I, Your God is a carpenter, for it is written, Who layeth the beams of his upper chambers in the waters? Ask him to make for me a spool. He replied, Very well. He prayed for her and she was smitten with leprosy. She was then removed. To the open square of Rome and was given a spool for so it was the custom in Rome whoever was smitten with leprosy was given a spool and removed
Nazi Bamba to Vinamar Hanabi Papa expounded May the glory of the Lord endure forever let the Lord rejoice in his works this verse was said by the angel of the universe for when the Holy One blessed be he enjoined after its kind upon the trees of plants applied unto themselves in a fortiori argument saying if the Holy One blessed be he desired a motley growth why did he enjoin after its kind upon the trees moreover is there not here in a fortiori argument if upon trees which by nature do not grow up in a motley growth the Holy One blessed be he enjoined after its kind how much more so does it apply to us immediately each plant came forth after its kind thereupon the angel of the universe declared may the glory of the Lord endure forever let the Lord rejoice in his works Rubina propounded the question if a man grafted one plant onto another Talmud must be what would be the law according to the view of our Hanabi Papa since after its kind is not expressly stated with regard to plants one should not be liable or seeing that the Lord approved of their action it is regarded as if after its kind were expressly stated and one would be liable the question remains undecided our Simeon because he pointed out a contradiction between verses one verse says and God made the two great lights and immediately the verse continues the greater light and the lesser light the moon said unto the Holy One blessed be he sovereign of the universe is it possible for two kings to wear one crown he answered go then and make thyself smaller sovereign of the universe cried the moon because I have suggested that which is proper must I then make myself smaller he replied go and thou wilt rule by day and by night but what is the value of this cried the moon of what use is a lamp in broad daylight he replied go Israel shall reckon by thee the days and the years but it is impossible said the moon to do without the sun for the reckoning of the seasons as it is written and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years go the righteous shall be named after thee as we find Jacob the small Samuel the small David the small on seeing that it would not be consoled the Holy One blessed be he said bring an atonement for me for making the moon smaller this is what was meant by our Simeon Belakish when he declared why is it that the he goat offered on the new moon is distinguished in that there is written concerning it unto the Lord because the Holy One blessed be he said let this he goat be an atonement for me for making the moon smaller R.C. pointed out a contradiction between verses one verse says and the earth brought forth grass referring to the third day whereas another verse when speaking of the sixth day says no shrub of the field was yet in the earth this teaches us that the plants commenced to grow but stopped just as they were about to break through the soil until Adam came and prayed for rain for them and when rain fell they Sprouted forth this teaches you that the Holy One blessed be he longs for the prayers of the righteous Arnam and B. Papa had a garden and he sowed in its seeds but they did not grow he prayed immediately rain came and they began to grow that he exclaimed is what R.C. had taught Arhan and B. Rabba said the Shesua is a specific creature that has two backs and two spinal columns was Moses a hunter or an archer this refutes those who maintain that the Torah was not divinely revealed Arhis said to R. Talapabi Abba to go write down the words for hunter and archer in your homiletic notebook and explain them so it is written the five lords of the Philistines the Gazite and the Ashdodite the Ashkelonite the Gittite and the Akronite also the Abba the verse says five but enumerate six R. Jonathan said their overlords were five in number Arhis said to R. Talapabi Abba to write down the word for overlord in your homiletic notebook and explain it so this interpretation differs from Rabs. View for Rab had declared that the Abim originally came from Taman. There is also a very in support of this. Viz. The Abim originally came from Taman and were named of him because they laid waste to their home. Another interpretation they were named of him because they longed for it. Well, many gods of further interpretation they were named of him because whosoever looked at them was seized with trembling. A with our Joseph said every one of them had sixteen rows of teeth. Our Simeon Belakish said there are many verses which to all appearances ought to be burnt but are really essential elements in the Torah. E.g. it is written and the Abim that dwelt in villages as far as Gaza. In what way does this concern us? Inasmuch as Abimelech adjured Abraham saying, Thou wilt not deal falsely with me nor with my son nor with my son's son. The Holy One blessed be. He said, Let the Kafirim come and take away the land from the Abim who are Philistines and then Israel may come and take it away from. The Kaftarim similarly you must explain the verse for Heshbon was the city of Sihon the king of the Amorites who had fought against the former king of Moab in what way does this concern us inasmuch as the Holy One blessed be he had commanded Israel be not at enmity with Moab he therefore said let Sihon come and take away the land from Moab and then Israel may come and take it from Sihon this indeed explains the saying of our Papa Ammon and Moab were rendered clean unto Israel through Sihon. Hermon the Sidonians call Syrian and the Amorites call it Sinir Tanit Tatsinir and Syrian are mountains in the land of Israel this verse however teaches us that every one of the nations of the world went and built for itself a large city naming it after a mountain of the land of Israel thus teaching you that even the mountains of the land of Israel are dear to the nations of the world in another instance it is written and as for the people he removed them city by city in what way does. This concern us in order that his brothers be not called strangers. The characteristics of birds are not stated, are they not? But it has been taught it is written the eagle Talmud, Mastulin, which implies as the eagle is peculiar in that it has neither an extra toe nor a crop. Its gizzard cannot be peeled, it seizes prey and eats it and is unclean. So all that have the like characteristics are unclean. It is also written turtle doves, which implies as the turtle dove has an extra toe and a crop. Its gizzard can be peeled, it does not seize prey and eat it and is clean. So all that have the like characteristics are clean. Have they answered they were not expressly stated in the Torah but were inferred by the scribes. Our Hayatata bird that has one characteristic of cleanness only is clean since it obviously is not of the same species as the eagle, for you may not eat the eagle as it has no characteristics of cleanness, but whatsoever has one characteristic you may eat, but let us. Rather infer the rule from turtle doves thus as turtle doves have the four characteristics of cleanness so all birds must have the four characteristics if so why does the divine law specify all the other unclean birds but let us infer it from these unclean birds specified in the Torah thus as these have three characteristics of cleanness and yet we may not eat them so we may not eat all birds that have three characteristics and a fortiori if it has but two characteristics or only one characteristic of cleanness if so why does the divine law specify the raven surely if we may not eat those that have three characteristics of cleanness it goes without saying that we may not eat those that have only two characteristics Talmud, Mastul and B but let us infer the rule from the raven thus as it has two characteristics of cleanness and yet may not be eaten so all that have two characteristics may not be eaten if so why does the divine law specify the paris and the Ajni is surely if we may not eat those that have two characteristics of cleanness it goes without saying that we may not eat those that have only one characteristic then let us infer the rule from the Paris and the Ajni if so why does the divine law specify the eagle for if we may not eat those that have one characteristic of cleanness it goes without saying that we may not eat those that have none of the characteristics of cleanness the inference must therefore be you may not eat the eagle because it has none of the characteristics of cleanness but whatsoever has one characteristic you may eat now this is the result only because the divine law specified the eagle but had it not done so we should have inferred it from the Paris and the Ajni but the, the Paris and the Ajni are two texts separately stated which teach the same thing and one may not draw any conclusions from two verses which teach the same thing there is a tradition that the characteristic of Cleanness of the one is not that of the other but consider there are 24 species of unclean birds mentioned in the Torah now it is inconceivable that the one characteristic of cleanness of each of these two species does not recur among the others so that it is a case of two verses which teach the same thing there is a tradition that there are 24 species of unclean birds and that there are four characteristics of cleanness the same three characteristics circulate among all. 20 species have each these three characteristics the raven has two of these characteristics and the paris and the ajnia have each one characteristic but the characteristic of one is not that of the other you might then have said let us infer the rule from that one the divine law therefore specified the eagle to teach you that you may not eat the eagle as it has none of the characteristics of cleanness but whatsoever has one characteristic you may eat why then does the divine law Specify turtle doves are Bobby Ham answered only with regard to sacrifices are and said Talmud, Mastul and to one who is familiar with these birds and their nomenclature any bird that has one characteristic of cleanness is clean but to one who is not familiar with these birds and their nomenclature any bird that has one characteristic of cleanness
Regent Rab Judas and a bird which scratches is permitted for use in the purification rite of a leper and this is the white tanunith about which our Elizer and the sages are due to me said as to the white-bellied tanunith there is no dispute that it is permitted they differ only about the green-bellied kind which our Elizer forbids and the rabbis permit and the lorest with our Elizer Marzitra reports this passage as follows as to the green-bellied tanunith there is no dispute that it is forbidden they differ only about the white-bellied kind which our Elizer forbids and the rabbis permit and the lorest with the rabbis now according to the version which reports the dispute between our Elizer and the rabbis about the white-bellied kind it is right that it says above the white tanunith but according to the other version which reports the dispute about the green-bellied kind why is the white tanunith mentioned in order to exclude the black kind which nests in eaves of houses Reuba said in the name of Rabbi Judah that the tzil is disqualified for sacrifice as a turtle dove but is not disqualified as a young pigeon Dazif and the turtle doves of Reuba are not disqualified as turtle doves but are disqualified as young pigeons are Daniel son of Arkatna raised an objection we have learned all birds Talmud, Mostul and be render invalid the waters of purification except the dove because it sucks up the water now if it were as you say it should read except the dove. And the tzil are Zerah answered the latter sucks up the water and spits it back whereas the former sucks up without spitting Rabbi Judah said Zuzani and doves are fit for the altar and they are identical with the doves of Reuba an objection was raised we have learned hyssop but not Greek hyssop nor Kohalath hyssop nor Roman hyssop nor wild hyssop nor any kind of hyssop which bears a special name Abbe said everything which prior to the giving of the Torah had various names and we find that the Torah is particular about it, then those kinds that bear a special name are invalid. These doves, however, did not have various names prior to the giving of the Torah. Rabbah said these Zuzanian doves are called simply doves in their locality. Rab Judah said cars which are found among the rushes are permitted, but those found among cabbages are forbidden. Rabbah added, and we scourge him that eats them for eating when creeping things. Rab Judah further said Zarda is permitted, but Barda is forbidden. And in order to remember this, think of the expression keep aloof far from it. As to Marta, there is a doubt. R.C. said there are eight birds regarding which there is a doubt. Bishop Hubba Yugashuka Harma Gatushlami Marta Kohalna and Barna Paka. What is the doubt about them? It is this one of the characteristics of clean birds is that the gizzard can be peeled, and one of the characteristics of unclean birds is that the gizzard cannot be peeled. But in the case of these eight, the gizzard can only be peeled with a knife but was there not a case of a duck belonging to Mar Samuel the gizzard of which could not be peeled so it was left in the sun and as soon as it became soft it peeled easily in that case as soon as it became soft it peeled easily with the hand but here even after it has been softened it can only be peeled with a knife Abbe said the murkak is one of the eight cases of doubt for it is a mardu our papa said the murkak is forbidden but the murhan is permitted and in order to remember this think of the rule an ammonite is depart but not an ammonite Mirmar stated in an exposition the murhan is forbidden because it was seen to seize prey and eat it and this is Jaru the rab said shiver androfata is permitted pirs androfata is forbidden and to remember this think of the wicked pirs are who not said bunya is permitted perway is forbidden and to remember this think of perway the magician our papa said the mardu which stands erect and eats is Permitted that which bends down and eats is forbidden and to remember this think of the verse thou shalt bow down to no other god Samuel said the wine drinker is forbidden and to remember this think of the law those that have drunk wine are unfit for service Samuel further said the wine mixer is forbidden Talmud, Mostul and the daughter of the wine mixer is permitted and to remember this think of the saying the position of the son is better than that of the father Rab Judah said the shake it no with the long legs and red body is permitted and to remember this think of Merzimah that with the short legs and red body is forbidden and to remember this think of the law the dwarf is unfit and that with the long legs and green body is forbidden and to remember this think of the rule if they turn green it is invalid Rab Judah said the shalak is the bird that catches fish out of the sea the tukafoth is so called because its crown appears double there is also a very tattoo. This effect the Tukafoth is so called because its crown appears double and it was this bird that brought the Shamir to the temple whenever our Yohanan used to see the Shalak he would exclaim thy judgments are like the great deep and whenever he used to see an ant he would exclaim thy righteousness is like the mighty mountains of Mimar said Lani and Batnei are permitted as for Shachnei and Batnei wherever it is a custom to eat them they are permitted and wherever it is not the custom to eat them. They are forbidden but is it a matter of custom indeed it is nevertheless there is no difficulty the former custom obtains in that place where the Paris and the Ajni are not found whereas the latter custom obtains in that place where the Paris and the Ajni are found Abbe said Kuai and Kakwe are forbidden but Kekuatha is permitted in the West Palestine however one would incur stripes for eating it and it is called by them Tawatha our rabbis taught the Tinchi is the Bawad among. The birds you say the Bawad among the birds but perhaps it is not so but rather the Bawad among the reptiles you can reply go and derive it by one of the thirteen exegetical principles by which the Torah is interpreted namely the meaning of a passage is to be deduced from its context now what does the passage deal with birds and this too is a bird it was likewise taught with regard to reptiles the Tinchi meth is the Bawad among reptiles you say the Bawad among reptiles but perhaps it is not so but rather the Bawad among the birds you can reply go and derive it by one of the thirteen exegetical principles by which the Torah is interpreted namely the meaning of a passage is to be deduced from its context now what does the passage deal with reptiles and this too is a reptile Abbe said the Bawad among the birds is a bat and the Bawad among the reptiles is the mole Rab Judah said Kaidish is a sea crow Raham the vulture are Yohanan said why is it called Raham? Because when the Raham comes, mercy Raham comes to the world. Rbdb Abbe said, provided it perches upon something and cries Sharak Rak. There is a tradition that if it settles upon the ground and hisses, the Messiah will come at once. For it is said, I will hiss for them and gather them. Rabbi Shimei said, Tamar the son of Rabbi did not Raham once settle upon a plowed field and commenced to hiss when a stone fell upon it and broke its head. That one was a liar. He replied, Our rabbis. Taught Raven signifies the Raven. Every Raven includes the Raven of the Valley. After its kind includes the Raven that moves ahead of the doves. The Master said, Raven signifies the Raven. But is it here before us? Render Raven signifies the Black Raven. As it is said, his locks are curled and black as a Raven. The Raven of the Valley is a white spotted Raven. As it is said, and the appearance thereof is deeper than the skin that is as the sunlight that appears deeper than the shadow. The Raven that. Moves ahead of the doves, our papa said, red not that moves ahead of the doves, but whose head resembles that of a dove. Our rabbis taught the nez is the hawk after its kind includes the bar hiria. What is the bar hiria? Abbe said it is the falcon. Our said the hasida is the white stork. And why is it called hasida? Because it shows kindness. Hasida to its companions. The anafa is the heron. And why is it called anafa? Because it quarrels mean effect with its companions. Arhinan son of Arhista. Stated in the name of Arhista, who reported in the name of Arhinan son of Rabbah on the authority of Rab, there are 24 unclean birds enumerated in the Torah, where in Leviticus there are only 20 enumerated, and in Deuteronomy there are but 21. And should you say that the da mentioned in Leviticus but not in Deuteronomy should be added to the list, even then there would only be 22. He replied, thus did your mother's father report in the name of Rab the words after its. Kind stated four times represent four more birds than there would be twenty six. Abe answered the da and the rar one and the same for should you say that they are two distinct birds Talmud, Mostul and be then consider the seeing that the purport of Deuteronomy is to add to the laws why is it that here in Leviticus it mentions the da but there in Deuteronomy only the rar and not the da you must therefore hold that the rar and the da are one and the same but for all that there are still twenty five Abe answered just as the rar and the da are one and the same so too are the da and the ayah for should you say that they are two distinct birds and consider the seeing that the purport of Deuteronomy is to add to the laws why is it that here in Leviticus the words after its kind are appended to the ayah but there in Deuteronomy these words are appended to the da you must therefore hold that the ayah and the da are one and the same. But since the ayah and the daya are one and the same, why are they both stated for the
One and the same it was taught Isibi Judah says in the east there are 100 unclean birds all of the species of Ayah the son of Arabah learned there are 700 species of unclean fishes 800 species of unclean locusts but the species of unclean birds are innumerable but there are only 24 species of unclean birds rather say the species of clean birds are innumerable it was taught Rabbi says it is well known to him who spake and the world came into being that the unclean animals are more numerous than the clean therefore did scripture enumerate the clean it is also well known to him who spake and the world came into being that the clean birds are more numerous than the unclean therefore did scripture enumerate the unclean what is the point of this teaching it sets forth the idea also expressed by Arhunad in the name of Rab others say Arhunad in the name of Rab on the authority of Armeir is a teacher should always teach his people Succinctly our eyes except for the eating of clean birds we rely upon tradition a hunter is believed when he says my master transmitted to me that this bird is clean are you had added provided he was familiar with birds and their nomenclature are there inquired does master mean a master in learning or in hunting come and here for are you had added provided he was familiar with birds and their nomenclature now if it means a master in hunting it is well but if it means a master in learning I grant you that he would have learned their nomenclature but would he actually know them so as to recognize them you must therefore say it means a master in hunting this is proof our rabbis taught one may buy eggs from gentiles in any place and need have no fear lest they are of birds that were nibble or trifle but perhaps they are of unclean birds Samuel's father answered we must suppose the case to be that he says it is of such and such a bird which is clean why is it not sufficient for the Gentile to say it is of a clean bird in that case he might be evasive and why not test the egg by the characteristics stated by the rabbis for it has been taught characteristics which distinguish the eggs of clean birds are the same as those which distinguish clean fish but how can you say as those which distinguish clean fish since the divine law states fins and scales say rather as those which distinguish Talmud, Mosul and a fish row and these are the characteristics which distinguish the eggs of clean birds all that are arched and rounded with one end broad and the other end narrow are clean those that are broad at both ends or narrow at both ends are unclean those with the white outside and the yolk in the center are clean those with the yolk outside and the white in the center are unclean if the white and the yolk are mixed up one may be certain that it is a reptile's egg this must be resorted to only where the eggs were broken but they can still be Examined by the position of the yolk and white, they were beaten up in a dish. But is it then permissible to purchase such from them, Gentiles? Surely it has been taught one may not sell to a Gentile the egg of a bird that was trifled unless it was beaten up in a dish. For this reason, one may not buy from them eggs beaten up in a dish. Rather, said Arzera, the distinguishing characteristics of the eggs of clean birds do not rest on biblical authority. For should you not hold this, then what are see? Stated there are eight birds about which there is a doubt. It could rightly be asked why not examine their eggs. You must therefore say that the characteristics do not rest on biblical authority. To what purpose then were they stated above to teach the following? If both ends of the egg were broad or both narrow, or if the yolk was outside and the white in the center, it is certainly unclean. If however one end was broad and the other narrow and the white outside and the yolk in the center, and if in Addition, the Gentile says it is of such and such a bird which is clean, he may be relied upon, but without this express statement, he may not be relied upon, for there is the raven's egg which resembles that of a dove. The master said, If the white and the yolk are mixed up, one may be certain that it is a reptile's egg. For what reason is this stated? So Arak Babiham answered to teach that if the embryo within was developed and the shell perforated, then a lentil's bulk thereof would convey. Uncleanness, Rabbin Adamard, saying, Perhaps it is a serpent's egg. Rather, said Rabbin, it is to teach that if the embryo within was developed, whosoever eats it would incur stripes for eating creeping things that crawl upon the earth. If so, why do we argue about the egg of an unclean bird? Even of a clean bird, there is also this prohibition, for it has been taught the verse, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, Talmud, Mosul, and B includes in its prohibition chicks that. Have not yet opened their eyes. This latter prohibition is only rabbinic, and the verse is merely a support. Our rabbis taught the exudation of eggs is permitted. Addled eggs may be eaten by those who are not squeamish. If there was found on it a spot of blood, the blood must be thrown away, and rest of the egg may be eaten. Our Jeremiah said this is so provided it was found upon the not dust. I, the father of Aftor, he taught this rule applies only if the spot of blood was found on it. White, but if found on the yolk, the whole egg is forbidden for the decay has spread over the entire egg. Our Rabbi Kathal said to our Ashi Atana once recited the statement before Abay in just the reverse form, but Abay corrected him so as to make it agree with the above. Hezekiah said, Once do we know that the egg of an unclean bird is prohibited by the Torah because it is written, and the Bath Hayana now has the Yana daughter, it can only mean the egg of an unclean bird, but Perhaps this is its actual name, this cannot be for it is written, the daughter of my people is become cruel like the Yanam ostriches in the wilderness, but on the other hand it is written, I will make a wailing like the jackals and the morning like the Benoth Yanam ostriches there, it means as the Yanam mourns for its young, but there is also written, and Benoth Yanam ostriches shall dwell there, it means as the Yanam dwells with its young, but there is also written, the beast of it. Field shall honor me the jackals and the Benoth Yanam ostriches, and if you were to say that it refers to the egg, it will be asked, can an egg sing hymns unto the Lord, indeed both Yanam and Bath Yanam are found written, but in this particular instance it is different since the scribe has divided the word into two, and since the scribe has divided it Talmud, Mosul, and into two words, it proves that it is two distinct terms, but according to this, will you also say that Chitarlaomer? Seeing that the scribe has divided it into two is two distinct names I reply in the latter case it is true that he has divided the word into two but he has not separated them on two lines but here he has even separated them on two lines but the sages have said every bird that seizes its prey is unclean it was taught Rabban Gamaliel says if a bird seizes prey and eats it one may be certain that it is unclean if it has an extra toe and a crop and its gizzard can be peeled one may be certain that it is clean our Eliezer son of Arzadik says a cord is stretched out for it and if one perched on it it divides its toes evenly two on each side it is a clean bird but if it places three toes on one side and one on the other it is an unclean bird our Simeon B Eliezer says every bird which catches food thrown to it in the air is unclean but does not the zipar to catch food in the air Abay answered it means catches food and eats it in the air others say those that dwell with unclean birds. Are unclean those that dwell with clean birds are clean according to whom is this rule is it only according to our Eliezer for it was taught our Eliezer said not for nothing did the Zarzer follow the raven but because it is of its kind it might even be according to the rabbis too for we speak here of those that dwell with and also resemble unclean birds of locusts all that have and wings covering the greater part of the body what is meant by the greater part Rab Judah said in the name of Rab it means the greater part of the length of the body others say in the name of Rab the greater part of the girth of the body our Papa said we therefore require the wings to cover the greater part of the length as well as the greater part of the girth of the body our rabbis taught if it has no leaping legs now but will grow them later on as in the case of the Zahal it is permitted our Eliezer son of our Jose says the verse which have leaping legs includes those that have none now but We'll grow them later on. What is this? Abay answered, It is the Isra. Our rabbis taught even those of them. You may eat the arba after its kind, etc. The arba is the gaba, the solam is the bash, and the hargal is the nipal, and the hagab is the gadai. And wherefore does the verse add after its kind to each to include the zikoreth karam of the Jerusalem, Yohanna, the arzubia, and the respondent respectively in the school of our Ishmael? It was taught in this verse. We have a number of general propositions. And a number of particular instances. Thus the arba is the gaba after its kind includes Talmud, Mosul, and be the zikoreth karam. Now from this I know to include all types that are not bald, but once would I learn to include even those that are bald. The verse therefore states the solam, which is the nipal, the bald locust, and after its kind stated with it includes the ashkaf. I would now include all types whether they are bald or not, provided they are tailless, but once would I learn. To include even those that have a tail, the verse therefore adds the hargal, which is the rashon, and after its kind stated with it includes the karsefet and the shalanith. I would now include all types, whether bald or not, and whether tailless or not, provided
Then here also you must object on the ground that none of them are long-headed rather sent Arahat argue thus the Divan law need not have stated Solam for it could be derived from the Arba and the Hargal indeed what objection could you raise that the Arba is not bald and the Solam is but the Hargal is also bald or that the Hargal has a tail and the Solam is not but the Arba is also tailless why then did the Divan law state Solam since it is of no purpose unto itself it can serve to include all those that are long-headed Talmud, Mastral and Talmud, Mastral and Warren is there a difference between the Tana of the school of Rab and the Tana of the school of Arishmael in the long-headed species the Tana of the school of Rab maintains the verse which have leading legs Yamaid is a general proposition Arba Solam Hargal and Hadjab are specifications we thus have a general proposition followed by several specifications in which case the scope of the general proposition is limited to the particulars specified accordingly those of the same kind as those specified are included but those not of the same kind are not included that is we include all those that resemble those specified in every respect the tana of the school of our Ishmael on the other hand maintains which have leading legs Yamaid is a general proposition Arba Solam Hargal and Hayab are specifications after its kind is a further general proposition we thus have two general propositions separated from each other by several specifications which include such things as are similar to the particular specified accordingly we include all that are similar to those specified even in one respect only but the first general proposition is not analogous in scope with the other general proposition for the first general proposition which have leading legs implies if it has leading legs one may eat it but otherwise one may not eat it whereas the second General proposition after its kind implies that only those that have the four characteristics are permitted the tana of the school of Arishmael nevertheless interprets texts of this kind by the principle of general propositions and specifications indeed the dictum which is expressed frequently that the tana of the school of Arishmael interprets texts of this kind by the principle of general propositions and specifications emanates from here the master said will you say that if it goes by the name of Hayab it is permitted even though it has none of the above mentioned characteristics the verse therefore states after its kind to teach that everyone must have all the above mentioned characteristics but if it has not all the characteristics whence could it have been inferred that it is permitted does not the divine law specify Arba and Hargal it would indeed be as you say had not so been stated but now that so is actually stated and serves to include all that are long Headed it might also be suggested that it shall include every variety even those that have but the slightest resemblance to those specified he therefore teaches us that this is not so why is it that there in the first barith of the Solam is identified with the Rashan and the Hargal with the Nepal and here in the barith of the Tana of the school of Arishmael the Solam is identified with the Nepal and the Hargal with the Rashan each Tana states the appellation by which each is recognized in his locality of fishes all that have fins and scales are rabbis taught if it has no fins and scales now but grows them later on as the Sultanate and the Affiant it is permitted if it has them now but sheds them when drawn out of the water as Talmud, Mastul and be the coleus converse or fish and three and it is permitted we have learned elsewhere all fishes that have scales have also fins but there are some that have fins but no scales those that have fins and scales are Clean, but those that have fins and no scales are unclean. But consider, we rely upon scales. The divine law then should have stated scales only as a distinguishing mark, and not fins. Had the divine law only stated scales and not fins, I might have said that the word for scales, cascasim, meant fins, and even unclean fishes would have been permitted. The divine law therefore stated fins as well as scales. But even now that the divine law states fins as well as scales, whence do we know that the term cascasim means the scales that cover the fish like a garment? Because it is written, and he was clad with cascasim, a coat of mail. This being so, the divine law need not have stated fins at all, but only scales, cascasim, are about said, and so it was taught in the school of our Ishmael. It is stated in order to make the teaching great and glorious. Our rabbis taught since the verse stated that you may eat that which has fins and scales. I would have inferred that you may not eat that which. Has not, and since the verse stated that you may not eat that which has not fins and scales, I would have inferred that you may eat that which has why then are both verses stated to teach that he infringes a positive as well as a negative command. Why does scripture state these you may eat of all that are in the waters? Because without this verse I should have argued thus since scripture has permitted to eat the creeping things of the water in two verses in one verse expressly and in the other. Impliedly then just as when it expressly permitted them it referred only to those that were in the water of vessels, so too when it impliedly permitted them it permitted only those that were in vessels, whence should I have known that one may bend down and swallow without any hesitation even those found in cisterns, ditches, or caverns, it is therefore written these you may eat of all that are in the waters, where does scripture permit those creeping things found in the water of vessels in the Verse these you may eat of all that are in the waters in the seas and in the rivers which signifies that those creeping things found in the seas and in the rivers if they have fins and scales you may eat and if they have not fins and scales you may not eat whereas all those found in the water of vessels you may eat even though they have not fins and scales but perhaps I ought to say that those found in vessels you may not eat at all even though they have fins and scales you cannot say so for it is written and all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers of all that swarm in the waters they are a detestable thing unto you which signifies that those found in the seas and in the rivers if they have not fins and scales you may not eat whereas those found in vessels even though they have not fins and scales you may eat perhaps I ought to argue thus in the waters is a general proposition in the seas and in the rivers is a specification. We thus have a general proposition followed by a specification in which case the scope of the general proposition is limited to the particular specified hence only with regard to those found in the seas and in the rivers are the distinguishing marks of fins and scales essential but not with regard to those found in gutters and trenches in the waters is repeated thus stating another general proposition but here these two general propositions follow one another Robin has said it is to be interpreted as said in the Westbiz wherever you find two general propositions that follow one another Talmud, Mastul and you insert the subsequent specification between them and treat the whole as if it were two general propositions separated by the specification now the argument here will run as follows in the waters is a general proposition in the seas and in the rivers is a specification in the waters is another general proposition we thus have two general propositions separated by the specification in which case they include such things as are similar to the particular specified therefore as the particular specified clearly indicate running water so everything to be included must be found in running water what does it include it includes gutters and trenches namely that all creeping things found therein are subject to the restriction and what does it exclude it excludes cisterns ditches and caverns namely that whatsoever found therein is free from all restriction but perhaps i ought to say as the particular specified clearly refer to water contained in the ground so everything to be included must be found in water contained in the ground what does it include it includes cisterns ditches and caverns namely that whatsoever found therein is subject to the restriction and what does it exclude it excludes vessels namely that whatsoever found therein is free from all restriction if this were right then what does the previous exposition of the verse these you may eat of all that are in the waters teach us a tana of the school of Arishmael taught since there is written in this verse in the waters in the waters without any specification of particulars between them it must not be interpreted by the principle of general proposition and specification but rather by the principle of amplification and limitation thus in the waters is an amplifying proposition in the seas and in the rivers is a limitation in the waters is another amplifying proposition we thus have two amplifying propositions separated by a limitation in which case well nigh everything is to be included what does it include it includes gutters and trenches namely that whatsoever found therein is subject to the restriction and what does it exclude it excludes cisterns ditches and caverns namely that whatsoever found therein is free from all restriction but perhaps I ought to say what does it include it includes cisterns ditches and caverns namely that Whatsoever found therein is subject to the restriction and what does it exclude it excludes vessels namely that whatsoever found therein is free from all restriction if this were right then what does the previous exposition of the verse these Yamadi of all that are in the waters teach us and why should I not accept the reverse argument because of the view expressed by our Madithai for our Madithai Bijuda taught why do you prefer to conclude that creeping things found in cisterns ditches and caverns are free from all restriction but those found in gutters and trenches are under the restriction I say that those found in cisterns ditches and caverns are free from all restriction because the water therein is as it were enclosed as in vessels whereas those
indicates the express permission he would say it is from this verse that we derive the permission for the creeping things found in vessels and what is the reason of him who holds that the verse which treats of those that have not fins and scales indicates the express permission he would say it is this verse which suggests the true interpretation of the other for from the other verse alone I might have argued that those found in vessels even though they have fins and scales you must not eat Arhuna said a man should not pour beer into a vessel at night and strain it through twigs for fear that a worm from the beer might drop onto the twigs and thence fall into the vessel and he would if he swallowed the worm with the beer infringe the law of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth if so even when he pours it directly into the vessel we should apprehend lest the worm drop onto the side of the vessel and then fall into the vessel that would be the natural Way of things whence do you know to make such a distinction from the following very though which was taught whence should I have known that one may bend down and swallow without any hesitation even those found in cisterns, ditches and caverns it is therefore written these you may eat of all that are in the waters now perhaps these creeping things had at some time previously crawled to the edge of the cistern and had fallen back into the cistern you must therefore say that that would be the natural way of things then here too we say that that is the natural way of things are his da said to Arhuna there is a very the top that supports your contention the verse and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth is a detestable thing it shall not be eaten includes insects found in liquids that have been passed through a strainer the reason then that they are forbidden is because they had passed through a strainer but had they not passed through a strainer they would be Permitted Samuel said a cucumber which became wormy Talmud, mostral and be during its growth is forbidden because of the prohibition of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth shall we say that there is a berry that supports his view for one berry that teaches the verse every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth excludes mites found in lentils bugs in pea pods and insects in dates and dry figs another berry that however teaches the verse every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth includes insects found in the roots of the olive and of the vine now presumably each berry that speaks of insects found in the fruit and yet there is no contradiction between them for the latter berry refers to fruit during growth whereas the former to fruit no longer growing no in either case the fruit was in the course of growth nevertheless there is no contradiction for the former berry refers to insects found in the actual fruit whereas the latter do. Insects found in the stock of the tree indeed there is proof for this distinction for it reads in the latter berry the insects found in the roots of the olive and of the vine this is conclusive our Joseph raised the following questions what is the law if the insect left the fruit and immediately died or if part of the insect left the fruit or if it was in midair these questions remain undecided our Ashi raised these questions what if the insect moved from the inside of a date to the outside or to the top of a date stone or if it moved from one date to another that was sticking to it these questions also remain undecided Arshis hate the son of Aridi said parasites are forbidden because they come from outside our Ashi demurred saying if they come from the outside then they should surely be found in the excretory passages others report this passage thus Arshish the son of Aridi said parasites are permitted because they are generated within our Ashi said of course this is so for if they come from the outside they should surely be found in the excretory passages the laws parasites are forbidden because they might enter through the nostril whilst the animal is asleep maggots found under the skin of animals are forbidden of fish are permitted Rubina once said to his mother let me swallow these maggots with the fish and I shall eat them or measure she a son of Araha asked Rubina why is this case different from what was taught in the following very the verse end. Their carcasses ye shall have in detestation includes maggots of cattle he replied there is no comparison between the two cattle are in a forbidden state until rendered permitted by slaughtering and since these maggots had not been rendered fit by slaughtering they always remain in the forbidden state fish on the other hand are always in a permitted state for they are permitted by the mere taking up the maggots therefore generated in a permitted state our rabbis talk oath upon the belly. Means the snake whatsoever includes the earthworm and all that are like unto it upon all fours means the scorpion whatsoever includes the beetle and all that are like unto it have many feet means the centipede whatsoever includes all that are like unto it and all that resemble the latter it was taught our Jose son of the Damascene says the Leviathan is a clean fish for it is written his scales are his pride and it is also written sharpest pots herds are under him scales these are the scales that cover him sharpest pots herds are under him these are the fins wherewith he propels himself chapterv Talmud, Mostul and Talmud, Mostul and Mishnah if an animal was in difficult labor and the foetus put forth its forelimb and withdrew it within it may be eaten if it put forth its head though it withdrew it within it is considered as born whatsoever is cut off from the foetus within the womb and left inside may be eaten but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or kidneys of the animal and left inside may not be eaten. This is the rule that which is from the body of the animal is forbidden, but that which is not from the body of the animal is permitted. Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab, the actual limb that was put forth is forbidden. Why? Because the verse says, Ye shall not eat any flesh in the field torn of beasts, trifle, which implies that any flesh that had got beyond its bound is forbidden. An objection was raised. We have learned if an animal was in difficult labor and the foetus put forth its forelimb and withdrew it within it may be eaten. Presumably, it may be eaten refers to the actual limb. No, it refers to the foetus that is within. If it refers to the foetus, why does the Tana say and withdrew it? Even if it did not withdraw it, the foetus would be permitted. Indeed, the law is the same even though it did not withdraw it within, but because he stated in the second clause, if it put forth its head, though it withdrew it within it is. Considered as born, he says also in the first clause and with Ru'it, but what does the second clause teach us that as soon as the head emerged, it is considered as born, but we have learned it elsewhere who is considered a firstborn for the right of inheritance and not for the priest he that was born after a premature child, the head of which had even emerged alive, or after a nine month child, the head of which had emerged dead. Now this is so because the head of the nine month child had emerged dead, but had it emerged alive, then the child that was born after this would not be considered a firstborn even for the right of inheritance. Should you, however, say that there it was taught with regard to man, and here it is taught with regard to beast, because we could not apply the principle as established in the case of beast to man, inasmuch as there is no antechamber in beast, neither could we apply the principle as established in the case of man to beast, inasmuch as the face of a human. Being is a principal feature surely we have expressly learned it even with regard to beast visit part of the afterbirth emerged before slaughtering the dam it may not be eaten for it is a token of birth in the case of woman and also a token of birth in the case of beast now if you were to say that the withdrawal of the limb within which is stated in the first clause of our mission is to be particularly stressed it is well for then we could say that the second clause was stated on account of the first clause but if you say that neither the first nor the second clause is to be particularly stressed for any special teaching then why are they stated at all it is not so for in point of fact it may be eaten refers to the actual photos and not to the limb but as our nom and b isaac had said elsewhere it would not have been necessary to mention the withdrawal of the limb within except in so far as it affects the part where it is cut off likewise we may say here it was only stated in so far as it affects the part where it is cut off come and here if an animal was in difficult labor and the foe has put forth its forelimb and withdrew it within and then the dam was slaughtered it may be eaten if the dam was slaughtered and then it withdrew it within it may not be eaten if it put forth its forelimb and it was immediately cut off and then the dam was slaughtered that which is outside is unclean and also forbidden to be eaten but that which is inside is clean and permitted if the dam was slaughtered and then the limb was cut off Talmud, Mostul and be the flesh is unclean like that which had touched Nibbala so are but the sages say it is unclean like that which had touched the slaughtered truff animal now it says in the first clause if the foe has put forth its forelimb and withdrew it within and then the dam was slaughtered it may be eaten presumably it may be eaten refers to the actual limb no it refers to the foe but if it refers to the photos how can we explain the next clause which reads if the dam was slaughtered and then it withdrew it within it may not be eaten if it refers to the photos why is it forbidden as our and B Isaac had said elsewhere it would not have been necessary to mention it except in so far as it affects the part where it is cut off we may say the same here it was only stated in so far as it affects the part where it is cut off but surely this is not so for when Abami came from Bihuzay he brought with him the following teaching if the photos withdrew the hoof within you may eat and
Everything was included in the general rule of the verse Ye shall not eat any flesh in the field torn of beasts strip of but since scripture expressly mentioned the case of the sin offering namely that if it was taken out of its bounds and also brought in again it is forbidden it is clear that only in the case of a sin offering is this so but in all other cases if they got back within their bounds they would be permitted an objection was raised it is written Ye shall not eat any flesh in the field torn of beasts strip of why does the verse add trip for this reason since we find that second tithe or first fruits if they were taken out of their bounds and were brought in again they are permitted now we might have thought that in this case too that is also the law the verse therefore adds trip how is this derived from the verse rabbi said it is like trip just as a trip animal once it has been rendered trip can never be permitted so also flesh which had got out of its Bounds can never be permitted again. This is indeed a refutation of Allah's view. The master said, since we find that second tithe or first fruits, if they were taken out of their bounds, etc., where do we find this from the following verse? Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, etc. That is to say, only within thy gates thou mayest not eat them. But if they were taken out of Jerusalem and brought in again, they are permitted. Those in the West reported in this version rap says that emergence of a limb is regarded as the birth of that limb. Yohanan says the emergence of a limb is not regarded as the birth of that limb. What is the actual difference between them? Whether to render forbidden the lesser portion of the limb that was within or not, the question was raised according to him who says that the emergence of a limb is not regarded as the birth of that limb. What would be the law if the foe is first put forth one for limb and withdrew it within and then the other four? Limb and withdrew it within and then other parts of its body and withdrew them within and so on until all in all the greater portion of the photos had emerged. Are we to say that here it is obvious that the greater portion of the photos has emerged and it is deemed fully born or since each part had been withdrawn within it remains withdrawn and if you were to accept the view that since each part had been withdrawn within it remains withdrawn it will further be asked what would be the position if the photos put forth a forelimb and it was cut off and another forelimb and it was cut off and so with the other limbs until the greater portion of the photos had been cut off. Are we to say that it is obvious that the greater portion has emerged and it is deemed fully born or perhaps we should say it is deemed born only when the greater portion of the photos emerged at one time come and here we have learned Talmud, Mastrullin that this is the rule what is from the body of the animal is forbidden, but what is not from the body of the animal is permitted. Now, what does the term not from the body include? Surely it includes such a case as the above. No, it includes a photos with uncloven hoofs which is in the womb of the cow, and it is permitted even according to our Simeon, for although our Simeon ruled that an animal with uncloven hoofs which was brought forth by a cow is forbidden, that is so only where it came forth into the world, but where it was still in the womb of the dam, it is permitted. Our Hanani propounded the question, what if the photos in the womb of an animal consecrated as a peace offering put forth its forelimb into the temple court? For it might be argued, since the temple court is the bounce for consecrated animals, it would also be the bounce for this. See the photos, or it is not the bounce for this photos, for the bounce of the photos are the womb of its dam, whereupon Abbe said to him, but you might have raised this question with regard to. Consecrated animals which are holy in a minor degree in Jerusalem, nevertheless, you did not raise the question with regard to consecrated animals which are holy in a minor degree because it is clear that the bounds of the photos are the womb of its dam. And in the previous question, too, we must say that the bounds of the photos are the womb of the dam. If raise this question, what is the law of the photos put forth its forelimb out of the womb of its dam after the first throat organ? But before the second organ was cut, is the first organ to be reckoned together with the second in order to render it the forelimb clean so that it be not nibbler or not rob? Answered certainly, it must be so reckoned for if the cutting of the first organ followed by the cutting of the second organ has the effect of rendering the animal permitted to be eaten, then surely it has the effect of rendering the limb clean so that it be not nibbler. Our Jeremiah raised the question, are we? Concerned at all about its offspring, what are the circumstances of the case if we say that it covered a normal cow? Then why is this question raised only with regard to this animal which has a limb forbidden on account of its protrusion prior to the slaughtering of the dam? Indeed, it might be raised with regard to the more general case of an animal that was taken out alive from the womb of the slaughtered dam. For our Meshashia said, according to him who maintains that we must take into account the seed of the male, if an animal that had been taken out alive from the womb of the slaughtered dam covered a normal cow, there is no remedy for the offspring. The question can be considered only in the case where it covered a cow which, like itself, had been taken out alive from the womb of the slaughtered dam. What then is the position of the offspring? Do we say that each limb of the progenitors produces the identical limb in the offspring so that here it must be cut off, but the rest? Is permitted, or do we hold that the seed is mixed up subsequently? Here, Jeremiah said it is obvious that the seed is mixed up, for otherwise the blind should produce a blind offspring and the crippled a crippled offspring. We therefore must say that the seed is mixed up, but the question that was raised was really this: an ordinary animal is the product of the forbidden fat and of the blood of the sire. Nevertheless, it is permitted, and here also it should be permitted, or perhaps we only permit the product of two prohibited substances, but not of three. But according to whom is it? According to our Meir, there are the prohibitions of the forbidden fat and of the blood, but not of the protruded limb. And according to our Judah, there is indeed the prohibition of the protruded limb, but not of the forbidden fat, for it was taught the law of the sciatic nerve applies also to a photos, and the fat of the photos is forbidden. So our Meir, our Judah, says it does not apply to a photos, and the fat of it. Photos is permitted. We must therefore say that the outcome of prohibited causes is to be disregarded, and it is certainly permitted. And the question put was really this: May one drink the milk of this particular animal? After all, the milk of all animals is very much like a limb taken away from the living animal. Nevertheless, it is permitted. Likewise, in this case, it should be permitted. Or perhaps we ought to distinguish this case. For in all other cases, the prohibition can be remedied by slaughtering. But in this case, it cannot. This must remain undecided. Whatsoever is cut off, etc. Whence do we know this? For it is written, and every beast that partake the hoof in the beast that you may eat. This includes the photos. If so, one ought to be able to make it a substitute for a consecrated animal. How is it then that we have learned one cannot make a limb a substitute for a consecrated photos, or a photos for a consecrated limb, or a limb or a photos for a whole consecrated animal, or a Whole animal for either of these rather it is derived from the expression and every in the beast which includes the photos if so even if part of the spleen or of the kidneys of the animal was cut away and left inside it should also be permitted wherefore have we learned whatsoever is cut off from the photos in the womb and left inside may be eaten but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or the kidneys of the animal and left inside may not be eaten the verse adds it you may eat that is when it is whole you may eat everything found therein but not one part is wanting but then according to this if one slaughtered an animal and found therein a sort of dove the latter should be permitted wherefore has our Yohanan stated if one slaughtered an animal and found therein a sort of dove it is forbidden to be eaten Talmud, must and be that which is found within the animal must have cloven hoofs in order to be permitted but this is not the case here but then according to this an animal with uncloven hoofs found in the womb of a cow should be forbidden. Surely the following teaching of the school of our Ishmael was taught in the school of our Simeon. Behoheb is the verse states the hoof in the beast. Yamei Arshimai Bashi said in truth it is as was suggested originally and as for your difficulty from the Mishnah one cannot make a limb a substitute etc. The answer is that that is the opinion of our Simeon who compares the law of substitution to the law of cattle. Tithe so that just as the law of cattle tithe does not apply to limbs or a photos so also the law of substitution does not apply to limbs or a photos. Whence do you know this because we have learned our Jose said is it not the case that in connection with animal offerings if one said let the foot of this animal be a burnt offering the whole is a burnt offering. Similarly if one said let the foot of this animal be a substitute for that consecrated animal the whole animal should become consecrated. As a substitute now with whom does our Jose argue thus do you say with our Meir and our Judah but they do not hold this view surely it was taught I might have thought that if one said let the foot of this animal be a burnt offering the whole would become a burnt offering it is therefore written all that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy that is of such shall be holy but not the whole
Indeed, consistent in their views, for it was also stated if a third of the firstling was extracted from the side and two thirds came forth normally through the womb, Arhuna says it is not holy, Rabbi says it is holy, Arhuna says it is not holy, for he maintains his principle that the holiness is retrospective, and here when the greater part first came forth, it had not entirely passed through the womb, Rabbi, however, says it is holy because he maintains his principle too that the holiness is perspective, and here the greater part had come forth through the womb. Now both disputes had to be reported, for if we had learned only this dispute, we might have said that only here does Arhuna hold that the holiness is retrospective, for if he were to hold otherwise, he would be tending to leniency, whereas in the other dispute, since he would by such a view be tending to stringency, I might say that he would agree with Rabbi Talmud, Mastulan A, and if we had garnered only the other dispute. We might have said that only there does Rabbi hold that the holiness is perspective, whereas in this dispute I might say that he would agree with Arhuna, therefore both disputes had to be reported and objection was raised. We have learned if an animal was in difficult labor with its first young one may cut off each limb as it comes out and throw it to the dogs. Presumably this means each limb is cut off and left where it is now. If you hold that the holiness is retrospective, then it is Each limb ought to be buried. No, the meaning is that each limb is cut off and thrown to dogs, but where each limb was cut off and left there you would hold, would you not that it must be buried? If so, why does the tannis state in the second clause if the greater portion came forth it must be buried? He should have made a distinction in the first case, thus this holds good only where each limb was cut off and thrown to the dogs, but where each limb was cut off and left there it must be buried. This is actually what is meant. This holds good only where each limb was cut off and thrown to the dogs, but where each limb was cut off and left there, it is considered as if the greater portion came forth at the same time and must be buried. Robber raised the question: Do we apply the principle of the greater part to limbs or not? What are the circumstances of the case? Should you suggest the following case, namely that the greater part of the young came out of the womb and this included the lesser part of the limb? The question, therefore, being: Are we to reckon this lesser part of the limb which is outside together with the greater part of its limb or with the greater part of the young? But it is obvious that we do not ignore the greater part of the young and take into consideration the greater part of the limb. Rather, the case must be as follows: Half of the young came out and this included the greater part of the limb. The question, therefore, is: Are we to reckon the lesser part of it? Limb which is inside together with the greater part of the limb or not come and here we have learned if the greater portion came forth it must be buried now what is meant by the greater portion does it mean actually the greater portion of the young but surely we have learned before now the principle that the greater part is like the whole it would mean therefore that only half came out but it included the greater part of the limb no the fact was that the greater part of the young came out and it included the lesser part of the limb and the Mishnah teaches us that we must not ignore the greater part of the young and consider the greater part of the limb robber raised these questions what is the law if one wrapped it up in vast or in a garment or in its afterbirth you ask in its afterbirth but that is the normal condition render l and the afterbirth of another animal what if she wrapped it up and got hold of it and brought it out but what are the circumstances if you say it came out with the head first, then it has thereby opened the womb. Rather, it must be that it came out with the legs first. What if a weasel inserted its head into the womb and took the foetus into its mouth and thus extracted it? You ask and thus extracted it, then it has brought it forth. Render thus, what if the weasel took the foetus into its mouth, extracted it, thus inserted its head again into the womb and spewed it out therein, and then the foetus came forth of its own? What is the law of one? Join two wombs of two animals to each other, and the foetus issued from the one womb and entered the other. Shall we say that it exempts only its own dam from the law of the firstling, but it does not exempt another animal, or perhaps it exempts also another animal? These questions remain undecided. Araha raised this question: What is the law if the walls of the womb opened wide and the foetus fell out of it? Is it the airspace of the womb that renders the firstling holy a condition which? Exists in our case, or is it the contact with the womb that renders the firstling holy a condition which is absent in our case? Marsan of Arashi raised this question: What if the walls of the womb were torn away? You asked, torn away, then there is no womb here at all. It means, what if the walls of the womb were torn away and it now rested on the neck of the young? Can the womb only render holy when it is in its natural place and not when it is out of its place, or even when out of its place it can? Also, render holy. Our Jeremiah put this question to our Zara: What if the walls of the womb were peeled? He replied, You are touching upon a question which we have already discussed. For our Zara had raised this question. Others say, Our Zara had put this question to our See, what is the law if what was left of the womb was more than what was gone, but the young passed through the part that was gone, or if what was gone was more than what was left, but the young passed through that part that was left of it now? I was in doubt only in such a case as where what was gone of the womb was more than what was left for there at least something was left of it but in the case where the walls of the wombs were entirely peeled I have no doubt at all Talmud, Mastulin be Talmud, Mastulin be Mishnah if a photos had died within the womb of its dam and the shepherd put in his hand and touched it he is clean whether it was a clean or unclean animal our Jose the Galilean says if it was an unclean animal he would be unclean and if it was a clean animal he would be clean tomorrow what is the reason of the first tennis view Arhista said it is an fortiori argument for if the dam when slaughtered has the effect of rendering the photos permitted to be eaten then surely whilst alive it will at least have the effect of rendering it clean so that it be not nibble we find that this is so of clean animals whence do we know it of unclean animals from the verse and if any beast die that is an unclean animal of which he may eat that is a clean animal the unclean animal is equated with the clean as the photos within a clean animal is clean so the photos within an unclean animal is also clean and what is the reason for the view of our Jose the Galilean our Isaac said it is written and whatsoever goeth upon its paws among all beasts that go on all fours whoso touch it their carcass shall be unclean that is whatsoever goeth upon unparted hoofs within the living beast I have declared to be unclean unto you this being so even an animal with unparted hoofs found dead in the womb of a living cow should also be unclean for it is of those that go upon unparted hoofs within the beast the verse refers to those that go upon unparted hoofs within the beast that go on four hoofs but this is a case of one that goes upon unparted hoofs within a beast that goes on eight hoofs then a cow found in the womb of a camel should not be unclean for it is a case of one that goes upon eight hoofs Within a beast that goes on four goeth might have been written, but there is actually written whatsoever goeth thus, including the case of a cow found in the womb of a camel, then an animal with unparted hoofs found in the womb of an animal also with unparted hoofs should be unclean, for it is a case of one that goes upon four hoofs within a beast that goes on four for this purpose. Arhistas a fortiori argument might be applied to this Arahid boy BMI demurred, then the pig within the womb of a sow should not be unclean, for it is a case of one that goes upon eight hoofs within a beast that also goes upon eight. Arnaman B. Isaac therefore said, Our Jose's view is derived from the following verse. If anyone touch any unclean thing, whether it be the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things, now it will be asked, Does the carcass of unclean cattle alone render unclean, but not that of clean cattle? What is it then? It is a young. Within the womb in unclean animals it is unclean and in clean animals clean but since this has been derived from the verse it is by Arnaman B. Isaac to what purpose do I put the verse stated by our Isaac were it not for the verse stated by our Isaac I might have said that the entire verse it is by Arnaman B. Isaac is employed for the purpose of Rabbi's teaching he therefore teaches us otherwise it was taught our Jonathan said I said to Ben Aze we have learned that the carcass of clean cattle conveys uncleanness that the carcass of unclean cattle conveys uncleanness and that the carcass of unclean wild animals conveys uncleanness but we have not learned it about the carcass of clean wild animals whence do we know it said he to me it is written whatsoever goeth upon its paws among all beasts that go on all four said I to him the verse does not say all beasts it says among all beasts and this clearly deals with the rule concerning animals that go upon unparted hoofs found Within the beast said he to me and what does Ishmael say in this matter said I to him it is written and if any cattle die that is unclean cattle of which ye may eat that is clean cattle and we have learned that wild animals are included under the term cattle and cattle are included under the term wild animals hence clean wild animals would come under clean cattle unclean
Animal or a bird, whether it be a clean or unclean species, if it was a male, she must observe the periods prescribed for a male, and if it was a female, she must observe the periods prescribed for a female. If its sex was not known, she must observe the periods prescribed both for a male and for a female. So, Armadir, the sages say, whatsoever has not the human form is not considered a child. According to the rabbis, what need is there for that verse? It serves entirely for rabbis' exposition mission. If the foetus of a woman died within the womb of its mother and the midwife put in her hand and touched it, the male will rendered unclean for seven days, but the mother is clean until the foetus comes out. Gemara Rabbis said, just as an unclean object that has been swallowed cannot render unclean, so a clean object that has been swallowed cannot be rendered unclean. Once do I learn that an unclean object that has been swallowed cannot render unclean, for it is written, and he that eat the bit. Carcass of it shall wash his clothes. Does this not hold good, even though he ate of it a short while before sunset? And yet the Torah says that he becomes clean. Perhaps there it is different. For the reason is that it is no longer fit for a stranger. Now, according to our Yohanan, it is well. For he says, for either purpose, it is nibble until it becomes unfit for a dog. But according to Barpata, who says it is nibble for conveying the greater uncleanness until it becomes unfit for a stranger, and for conveying the lighter uncleanness until it becomes unfit for a dog, the reason might well be that it is no longer fit for a stranger. Even so, granted that it is not fit for a stranger if it was swallowed in his presence, it is however fit for a stranger if swallowed not in his presence. We have thus learned that an unclean object that has been swallowed cannot render unclean. Once do we learn that a clean object that has been swallowed cannot be rendered unclean by an aforciora? Argument if an earthenware vessel that is covered with a closely fitting lid which cannot prevent the unclean matter that is in it from conveying uncleanness for a master has stated uncleanness that is closed up breaks through upwards to the sky nevertheless protects any clean matter that is within it from becoming unclean Talmud, Mosul and be how much more so in the case of a man who prevents the unclean matter that is in him from rendering him unclean that he should protect the clean matter that is in him from becoming unclean but perhaps that is so only in the case of an earthenware vessel since it cannot render unclean by its outside will you then say that it is so also in the case of a man who can convey uncleanness from the outside are we dealing with the outside no on the contrary we are dealing with the inside and with regard to the inside of an earthenware vessel the jaw is more strict since it can convey uncleanness by its airspace we have thus learned the law Regarding uncleanness swallowed from above, but whence do we know that it is so even when the uncleanness was swallowed from below from the following a fortiori argument if in the upper part of the body where no decomposition of food takes place the fact that it is swallowed prevents the unclean matter from conveying uncleanness how much more so in the lower part where the actual decomposition takes place but decomposition takes place below only if the food comes from above even so the fact that decomposition takes place below is a stronger point we have now learned the law regarding uncleanness swallowed by man but whence do we know it with regard to uncleanness swallowed by an animal from the following a fortiori argument if in the case of man who is capable of conveying uncleanness whilst alive the fact that it is swallowed prevents the unclean matter from conveying uncleanness how much more so is it in the case of animals which are incapable of conveying uncleanness Whilst alive that the fact that it is swallowed prevents the unclean matter within from conveying uncleanness but perhaps that is so only with regard to man since he must tarry a prescribed period in a house stricken with leprosy will you then say that it is so also with regard to animals which need not tarry a prescribed period in a house stricken with leprosy in respect of what things do you say that an animal need not tarry the prescribed period in a house stricken with leprosy it is obviously in respect of those things that are laid upon it but for such things man do need not tarry within for we have learned if a person entered a house stricken with leprosy carrying his clothes over his shoulders and his sandals and rings in his hand she and they become unclean forthwith if he was clothed in his garments his sandals on his feet and his rings on his fingers he becomes unclean forthwith but they remain clean until he tarries there the length of time required for eating half a loaf of wheaten bread but not barley bread reclining and eating it with a condiment Rabbah said but we have learned both these rules we have learned the rule concerning swallowed unclean matter and we have learned the rule concerning swallowed clean matter concerning swallowed unclean matter we have learned the following mission if a person swallowed an unclean ring he must immerse himself and thereafter may eat teramah if he vomited it forth after this immersion it is still unclean and has rendered him unclean and concerning swallowed clean matter we have learned the following mission if a person swallowed a clean ring entered a tent wherein lay a corpse was sprinkled with purification waters the first time and the second time immersed himself and then vomited it forth it remains as it was before Rabbah had in mind the case where a person swallowed two rings one clean and the other unclean and he teaches that the unclean ring will not render the clean ring unclean Talmud. Mosul but is not the case of the Fotis and the midwife of our mission is similar to two rings nevertheless the Fotis renders the midwife unclean Rabbah replied it is different in the case of the Fotis because it must eventually come out Rabbah retorted the Fotis you say must eventually come out and must not the ring also eventually come out Rabbah therefore replied the Pumadivans by which our Joseph is meant know the reason for it for our Joseph said in the name of Rab Judah who said it in the name of Samuel this uncleanness of the midwife was not imposed by biblical law but by decree of the scribes why is it said was not imposed by biblical law but by decree of the scribes so that you should not say that our mission agrees only with our Akiba who holds that a dead Fotis whilst yet in the womb of its mother is unclean for indeed it is even in accordance with our Ishmael who holds that the dead Fotis whilst yet in the womb of its mother is clean yet here the Uncleanness to the midwife was imposed by rabbinic decree why our Hashai said as a precaution lest the foetus protrude its head beyond the antechamber then this should apply to the mother too the mother would feel it then she might tell the midwife of it she is too distraught where do we find the respective views of our Ishmael and our Akiba it was taught the verse and whosoever touch it in the open field a dead body excludes a dead foetus whilst yet in the womb of its mother so our Ishmael our Akiba says it includes the stone that covers the grave and the stones that support it and our Ishmael the uncleanness of the covering stone and supporting stones is established by tradition and our Akiba he maintains that the dead foetus whilst yet in the womb of its mother is unclean once does he our Akiba derive this from the Torah our Hashai answered it is written whosoever touch it a dead body in a human body now what can a dead body in a human body refer to you must say it refers to a dead foetus in the womb of its mother and our Ishmael he requires this verse to establish the law that a quarter log of blood that issued from a dead body conveys uncleanness for it is written whosoever touch it a dead body or the life element of man now what is the life element of a man that renders unclean you must say it is a quarter log of blood our Akiba on the other hand adheres to his view that a quarter log of blood that issued from two corpses will render unclean men and vessels that are in the tent for it was taught our Akiba says once do I know that a quarter log of blood that issued from two corpses renders unclean men and vessels that are in the tent from the verse he shall not go into any dead bodies which suggests one quantity of blood from two corpses mission if an animal was in difficult labor and the foetus put forth its forelimb and the person immediately cut it off and then slaughtered the damn the flesh of the foetus is clean if he Slaughtered the dam first and then cut it off the flesh is unclean like that which had touched Nibbala so are but the sages say it is unclean like that which had touched a slaughtered truff animal Talmud, Mosul and B for just as we find that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean so the slaughtering of the animal should render the protruding limb clean Armadir replied to them no for when you say that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean you are concerned with the animal itself but can you say that it will render clean the limb which is not part of the animal itself but once do we learn that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean ought we not rather to argue thus an unclean animal may not be eaten and truff also may not be eaten and just as slaughtering does not render an unclean animal clean so slaughtering should not render a truff animal clean no you may state this of an unclean animal for at no time was if fit for slaughtering can you also state this of a truff animal which had a time when it was fit for slaughtering away with this argument that you have put forward for once would we know this of an animal that was born truffa from the womb substitute therefore this argument no you may state this of an unclean animal since it belongs to the class to which
If a piece of cloth three finger breadth square was cut away from a large garment that had contracted Midra's uncleanness, all agree that it is rendered unclean by virtue of contact with the rest of the garment at the moment that it was severed from the rest. Here too, it will be said that at SC the photos is rendered unclean by virtue of contact with the limb at the moment that it is severed from the limb. Rubbin said a garment is not intended for cutting up, but a photos is and whatsoever is intended for cutting up Talmud, Mosulan is already accounted as cut up according to whom is this teaching is it only according to our measure for we have learned vessels that have very long handles which are to be cut down need be immersed only as far as the measure that has been determined our Judah says the whole of it must be immersed you can even say that the teaching of our mission is in accordance with the view of the sages for a mass of footstuffs is always to be regarded as separated into parts and the parts as touching each other now according to Allah it is well that the mission states and then cut it off but according to Rabbana why does it state and then cut it off since it states in the first clause and cut it off it states in the second clause too and then cut it off but the sages say it is unclean like that which had touched a slaughtered truff animal but does a slaughtered truff animal render anything unclean it does indeed as stated by Samuel's father for Samuel's father stated a truff animal that was slaughtered renders holy things unclean for just as we find that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean so the slaughtering of the animal should render the protruding limb clean it was taught our mayor said to them but what was it that rendered this limb clean so that it be not nibble or was it not the slaughtering of its dam and it should also render it permitted to be eaten they replied it is often the case that an act has a greater effect upon that which is not part of itself than upon that which is part of itself for we have learned whatsoever is cut off from the photos within the womb and left inside may be eaten but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or the kidneys of the animal and left inside may not be eaten what does this mean Rob others say cut he replied there is an omission here and this is the real teaching our mayor said to them but what was it that rendered this limb clean so that it be not nibble was it not the slaughtering of its dam and it should also render it permitted to be eaten they replied the case of a truff animal proves otherwise for the slaughtering renders it clean so that it be not nibble and yet does not render it permitted to be eaten he retorted it is not so for when you say that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean you are concerned with the animal itself but can it render clean the limb which is not part of the animal itself they replied it is often the case that an act has a greater effect upon that which is not part of itself than upon that which is part of itself for we have learned whatsoever is cut off from the photos within the womb and left inside may be eaten but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or the kidneys of the animal and left inside may not be eaten there is also a very good talk which expressly states it so our mayor said to them but what was it that rendered this limb clean so that it be not nibble they replied the slaughtering and said he it should also render it permitted to be eaten they replied the case of a truff animal proves otherwise for the slaughtering renders it clean so that it be not nibble and yet does not render it permitted to be eaten he retorted when you say that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean or that the slaughtering of an animal renders clean the limb that hangs loose you are concerned with the animal itself but can it render clean the limb of the photos which is not part of the animal itself they replied it is often the case that an act has a greater effect upon that which is not part of itself than upon that which is part of itself for we have learned whatsoever is cut off from the photos within the womb and left inside may be eaten but whatsoever is cut off from the spleen or the kidneys of the animal and left inside may not be eaten our simian belagish said just as they differ with regard to the Limb of the photos, so they differ with regard to loose limbs. Are Yohanan said they differ only with regard to the limb of the photos, but with regard to a loose limb of the animal, all agree that at the slaughtering it is accounted as detached. Our Jose Bihan said, What reason does our Yohanan suggest for the view of the rabbis in this case of the photos? There is a remedy for it by withdrawal into the womb, but in that case of the loose limb, there is no remedy for it by withdrawal and objection. Was raised, our mayor said to them, It is not so when you say that the slaughtering of a truff animal renders it clean, or that the slaughtering of an animal renders clean the loose limb, you are concerned with the animal itself, but can it render clean the limb of the photos, which is not part of the animal itself? Talmud, Mastul and B. Now this is all well according to our Simeon Bilagish, for then here our mayor would be arguing from their point of view, for according to my view, says our mayor there. Is no difference between the limb of the photos and the loose limb of the animal, they are both alike, but according to our Yohanan, this is a difficulty. We must therefore say that if the dispute was reported, it was reported as follows. Our Simeon Bilakish said, just as they differ with regard to the limb of the photos, so they differ with regard to loose limbs. Our Yohanan said they differ only with regard to the limb of the photos, but with regard to the loose limb of the animal, all agree that at the slaughtering it is not accounted as detached. Our Jose Bihanan said, What reason does our Yohanan suggest for our Mayor's view? One is part of the animal, but the other is not. Our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of our Yohanan, all agree that at death the limb is accounted as detached, and that at the slaughtering it is not accounted as detached. What is the subject that is spoken of? If you say the limb of the photos, surely there is a difference of opinion with regard to it, and if you say the loose limb of the animal, but we have already learned it both of death and also of slaughtering. We have learned it of death in the following mission. If the animal died, the flesh that was hanging loose must be made susceptible to contract uncleanness, but the limb that was hanging loose conveys uncleanness as the limb of a living animal and not as the limb of a dead animal. Nibbles, so our mayor, we have also learned it of slaughtering in the following mission. If the animal was slaughtered, they have been rendered susceptible to contract uncleanness by the blood. So our mayor, our Simeon says they have not been rendered susceptible to contract uncleanness from this last mission. I might have thought that rendered susceptible referred only to the loose flesh, but does it not say they have been rendered susceptible? It might have been thought that they refers to flesh that hangs loose from the animal and also to flesh that is severed from the limb. And why is one more certain than the other? I might have argued that since it conveys the graver uncleanness as long as it is with the whole limb it does not require to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness we are therefore taught that it does our Joseph said hold fast to the ruling of our Isaac B. Joseph for Rabbi B. Barhana is in agreement with him for it was taught the verse ye shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field includes within its prohibition any limb or flesh that hangs loose from cattle wild beasts or birds at the time of slaughtering but Rabbi B. Barhana added in the name of our Yohanan Talmud, Mastulan in such cases there is only the mere precept to keep aloof our Joseph was sitting before our Huna and recited as follows Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbi who eats this incurs a flogging thereupon a certain rabbi said to him our Huna pay no attention to him our Joseph for thus said our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha in the name of Rabbi who eats it does not incur a flogging our Huna then said upon whom should we rely thereupon? Our Joseph turned his face away in anger and remarked, What is the difficulty? I was speaking of the death of the animal when the limb is accounted as detached, but he was speaking of the slaughtering when the limb is not accounted as detached. Rabbi said, Whence is derived the rule of the rabbis that at death a loose limb is accounted as detached, and at the slaughtering it is not accounted as detached from the verse, and upon whatsoever any of them when they are dead. Doth fall, it shall be unclean. Now, what does this verse exclude? Should you say it excludes creeping things whilst they are alive, but these are expressly excluded by the words of their carcass? It clearly teaches that at death the limb is accounted as detached, but not at the slaughtering. Our Adabi Ahabah said to the rabbi, But the verse deals with creeping things. He replied, Since it serves no purpose in the case of creeping things to which slaughtering does not apply, you may refer it to cattle, but it is indeed necessary with regard to creeping things to teach that they must be as at death that is they convey uncleanness only when moist but not when dry the expression when they are dead occurs twice our hista said they differ only with regard to the limb of a live photos but with regard to the limb of a dead photos all agree that at the slaughtering the limb is accounted as detached rabbi however said as they differ in the one case so they differ in the other also the slaughtering of a live eight months birth for to its kind slaughtering does not apply but has it not been taught the slaughtering of a live eight months birth could prove otherwise for even though slaughtering applies to its kind the slaughtering does not render it clean our kahana answered it means that through its dam slaughtering applies to its kind and
Slaughtering for a man might put his hand into the womb and slaughter it there before it was rendered trifa. Rabbah said to him, Render an animal that was formed trifa from the womb, and this would be the case when he has five legs. Mission: If a man slaughtered an animal and found in it an eight months foetus, either living or dead, or a dead nine months foetus, he need only tear it open and let the blood flow out. If he found in it a living nine months foetus, it must be slaughtered, and he would thereby incur the penalty for infringing the law of it and its young so are mayor, But the sages say the slaughtering of its dam renders it permitted. Talmud, Mosul and B. R. Simeon Jizuri says even if it is five years old and is plowing the field, the slaughtering of its dam renders it permitted. If he ripped open the dam and found in it a living nine months foetus, it must be slaughtered since its dam has not been slaughtered. Gemara Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai, they argued about it. The foetus only with regard to slaughtering. What does this exclude? It excludes the fat and the sciatic nerve. What fat is meant is it the fat of the foetus, but is there not a dispute with regard to it? For it was taught the law of the sciatic nerve applies also to a foetus, and the fat of the foetus is forbidden. So our Meir Arjuna says it does not apply to a foetus, and the fat of the foetus is permitted. And our Eliezer had said in the name of our Ashai that their dispute referred to a living. Nine months foetus are Meir ruling according to his principle, and Arjuna according to his end. If it means the fat of the sciatic nerve, but is there not also a dispute about it? For it was taught one must trace the sciatic nerve as far as it goes and must cut away the fat thereof at its root. So our Meir Arjuna says one need only peel off the fat at the top of the hip bone. If indeed it was reported, it must have been reported as follows. Our Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai they argued about. It only with regard to the matters that affect the eating thereof, thus excluding the prohibitions of interbreeding and plowing with it. Our Simeon B. Lakish said, He who permits the fat of the foetus permits its blood, and he who forbids its fat forbids its blood. Our Yohanan says, Even he who permits its fat forbids its blood. Our Yohanan raised this objection against our Simeon B. Lakish. We have learned he need only tear it open and let the blood flow out. Our Zara said, He, our Simeon B. Lakish, only meant to say that one would not be liable to the penalty of Karath, whose view are we considering our Judas, are we not, but let it be accounted no more than the blood that oozes out. Has it not been taught with regard to the blood that oozes out of the animal after the slaughtering? There is only a formal prohibition. Our Judas says there is a penalty of Karath. Our Joseph, the son of our Salah, the pious, explained it in the presence of our Papa. Our Judas interprets the expressions blood and no manner of blood hence. Whenever one would be liable to the penalty of Karath for the lifeblood, one would also be liable for the blood that oozes out, and whenever one would not be liable for the lifeblood, one would not be liable for the blood that oozes out. The question was raised: May one redeem the first ling of an ass with a lamb extracted out of the ewe's womb? According to our Meir's view, there is no question at all, for since he declares that it must be slaughtered, it is obviously an ordinary lamb. The question only arises according to the view of the rabbis who maintain that the slaughtering of its dam renders it clean. Now, what is the law? Since they maintain that the slaughtering of its dam renders it clean, it is to be regarded as meat in the basket, is it not? Or shall we say, since it runs to and fro, we apply to it the term lamb? Marzitra says we may not redeem with it. Or Ashi says we may. Or Ashi said to Marzitra, How do you arrive at your view? You no doubt deduce it from the word lamb used here and. Also in the verse dealing with the paschal lamb, and it should follow just as there the lamb must be a male without blemish of the first year, so here too it must be a male without blemish of the first year. Marzitra replied, The repetition of thou shalt redeem extends the scope of the law, said Arashi, if as you say, namely that the repetition of thou shalt redeem extends the scope of the law, then everything should be allowed. Marzitra replied, If that were so, of what use do you use it? Inference made by the term lamb, the question was raised, Do we reckon here the first and second degree of uncleanness or not? Our Yohanan said, We do reckon here the first and second degree of uncleanness. Our Simeon B. Lakish said, We do not reckon here the first and second degree of uncleanness, for it is regarded as a nut that rattles in its shell. Our Simeon B. Lakish raised this objection against our Yohanan, We have learned the flesh is unclean like that which had touched Nebula, so our Meir, but the sages say. It is unclean like that which had touched the slaughtered trifa animal. Now, according to my view, that they, the photos and the dam are one body, it is clear for it the photos was rendered susceptible to contract uncleanness by the blood of its dam. But according to you, it will be asked whereby was it rendered susceptible to uncleanness? He replied by the slaughtering, and it is in accordance with our Simeon's view. Our Yohanan raised this objection against our Simeon B. Lakish if it waded through a river, it has thereby become susceptible to uncleanness, and if it next passed through a cemetery, it has thereby become unclean. Now, according to my view, that they are two separate beings, it is clear that only if it had thus become susceptible to uncleanness by passing through a river, it becomes unclean. But if it had not thus become susceptible to uncleanness, it is not unclean. But according to your view, that they are one body, it is difficult for surely it had long ago become susceptible to. Uncleanness by the blood of its dam Talmud, Mosul and Talmud, Mosul and it was a dry slaughtering and this ruling is not in accordance with our Simeon's view who is the tenor that taught if it waded through a river it has thereby become susceptible to uncleanness and if it next passed through a cemetery it has thereby become unclean. Our Yohanan said it is our Jose the Galilean for it was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer says in the name of our Jose the Galilean it contracts food uncleanness and needs to be rendered susceptible to contract uncleanness. The sages say it does not contract food uncleanness for it is a living being and whatsoever lives cannot contract food uncleanness. Our Yohanan is indeed consistent in his view for our Yohanan had also said that our Jose the Galilean and Beth Shammai held the same view. Our Jose the Galilean expressed it in the very we quoted above Beth Shammai expressed it in the following mission for we learned when do fish contract uncleanness Beth. Shammai say as soon as they have been caught Beth Hillel say only when they are dead our Akiba says from the moment that they cannot live what is the difference between them or Yohanan replied a fish that is struggling our histo raised the question what is the law of such defects as render an animal trifa occurred in fish this question can be asked both according to him who holds that a trifa animal can continue to live for 12 months or more and also according to him who holds that a trifa cannot continue to live according to him who holds that a trifa can continue to live this question can be asked for perhaps this is so only in the case of animals whose vital force is considerable but not in the case of fishes whose vital force is slender and according to him who holds that a trifa cannot continue to live this question can also be asked for perhaps this is so only in the case of animals since to its kind slaughtering applies but not to the case of fishes since Slaughtering does not apply to its kind, it remains undecided if an animal cast forth an abortion. The fat thereof says, Our Yohanan is as the fat of an animal. Our Simeon B. Lakish says it is as the fat of a wild beast. Our Yohanan said, The fat thereof is as the fat of an animal because the coming into the world renders it an animal. Our Simeon B. Lakish said, The fat thereof is as the fat of a wild beast because the fulfillment of the months of pregnancy is also essential in order to render it an animal. Others reported thus where the months of pregnancy had not been fulfilled, there is no doubt at all that it is of no consequence. They differ only in the case where a person put his hand into the womb of an animal to away some fat from the living nine months foetus within an aid. Our Yohanan says, This fat is as the fat of an animal because the fulfillment of the months of pregnancy alone renders it an animal. Our Simeon B. Lakish says, It is as the fat of a wild beast because it Fulfillment of the months of pregnancy coupled with the coming into the world renders it an animal. Our Yohanan raised this objection against our Simeon B. Lakish. It was taught just as the fat and the two kidneys refer to in the case of the guilt offering precludes that of a photo. So wherever fat is stated, it precludes that of a photo. Now, according to my view, says our Yohanan, it is right that the verse finds it necessary to preclude it, but according to you, why is it necessary to preclude it? He replied, I derive my view from this very passage. Others reported as follows. Our Simeon B. Lakish raised this objection against our Yohanan. It was taught just as the fat and the two kidneys refer to in the case of the guilt offering precludes that of a photo. So wherever fat is stated, it precludes that of a photo. Now, according to my view, says our
clean and does not convey uncleanness by carrying follows the rabbi's view this is no difficulty at all for our high deals with the case where it was found dead in the dam's womb this is however a difficulty for you he replied it is no difficulty for me either for the divine law permits of foetus by the slaughtering of any two out of four organs when our went up to palestine he found rc sitting and reciting the above statement of our hisda well spoken said our zero and also Said so are we to infer that our Simeon Belakish disagrees with our Yohan and some say he was waiting and was silent and others say he was drinking and was silent. Our Simeon Chizuri says even if it is five years old is not his view identical with that of the first ten. Our Kahana replied the difference between them is where it stood upon the ground. Our Meshashi said according to him who maintains that we must take into account the seed of the male if an animal which had been extracted alive out of the womb of its dam covered in normal cow there is no remedy for the offspring of a said all agree that if the animal which was extracted alive out of the womb of its dam had uncloven hoofs it is permitted why because everything extraordinary people remember very well others reported thus of a said all agree that if this animal with uncloven hoofs was extracted alive out of the womb of its dam which also was with uncloven hoofs and had been extracted out of the womb of its dam it is Permitted why because a case with two extraordinary conditions people remember very well Zeiri said in the name of our Hanan the Holocaust is in accordance with our Simeon Chizuri indeed our Simeon Chizuri permitted without slaughtering its young and the offspring of its young and so on unto the end of all time our Yohanan said it alone is permitted without slaughtering but its young is forbidden out of behavior had an animal that had been extracted alive out of the slaughtered dam's womb it was attacked by a wolf so he came to our Ashi who advised him to slaughter it immediately but argued at it did not Zeiri say in the name of our Hanan that the Holocaust was in accordance with our Simeon Chizuri and indeed our Simeon Chizuri permitted without slaughtering its young and the offspring of its young and so on unto the end of all time moreover even our Yohanan disagreed only regarding its young but not regarding itself he replied our Yohanan merely stated what he thought to be the view of our Simeon Chizuri but did not Rabin son of Arhanana say in the name of Allah on the authority of Arhanana that the Halachah was in accordance with our Simeon of Chizuri moreover is it not an established rule that wherever our Simeon Chizuri stated his view the Halachah is in accordance with him he replied I accept the following view for our Jonathan said the Halachah accords with our Simeon Chizuri only in the case of the dangerously ill person and in the case of the terrible separated from the tithe of he may produce the case about the dangerously ill person is as we have learned at first it was held if a man whilst being let out in chains to execution said write out a bill of divorce for my wife I was to be written and also to be delivered to her later they laid down that the same rule applied also to one who was leaving on a sea journey or setting out with a caravan our Simeon Chizuri says it also applies to a man who was dangerously ill and the case about the terrible separated from the tithe of Dime produces as we have learned if the terrible that had been separated from the tithe of Dime produce fell back into its place our Simeon Chizuri says even on a weekday one need only ask him see the seller about it and eat it by his word Talmud Mosul and Amishnah if the hind legs of an animal were cut off below the joint it is permitted if above the joint it is trifa so too if the juncture of the tendons was gone it is trifa if the bone was broken but the greater part of it Flesh around the fracture remained it is rendered clean by the slaughtering otherwise it is not rendered clean by the slaughtering Amara Rab Judah said in the name of Rab who reported it in the name of Arhai below means below the joint and above means above the joint and the joint referred to as the joint which is sold together with the head Ula said in the name of Arashai it is that joint which is clearly distinguishable in the camel Ula said to Rab Judah according to me holding his eye do that it is that joint which is clearly distinguishable in the camel it is right that the mission also states so too if the juncture of the tendons was gone but according to you why does it state so too if the juncture of the tendons was gone he replied it teaches that the animal is true whether the bone was gone and the juncture of the tendons remained or the juncture of the tendons was gone and the bone remained but the mission expressly states were cut off he Rab Judah was silent and did not reply but when Eula had left Rab Judah said to himself why did I not answer him thus below means below the joint but above means above the juncture of the tendons later he said and did I not suggest an answer to him but he retorted that the mission expressly states were cut off and to the suggestion too he would have retorted that the mission expressly states above the joint our papa reported the passage thus Rab Judah said in the name of Rab who reported it in the name of R. High below means below the joint and the juncture of the tendons and above means above the joint and the juncture of the tendons so too if the juncture of the tendons was gone it is true and the actual joint meant is that which was referred to in the statement of Ola in the name of Arashai but is it possible to conceive of such a case namely that if the limb were cut off higher up the animal would live and it would be permitted and if it were cut off lower down the animal would die. Arashi retorted are you comparing defects with one other amongst the various defects we do not say that this resembles that for one may cut the animal in one place and it will die and in another place and it will live and this is the extent of the juncture of the tendons Rabbi said in the name of Arashi that part which is off the bone Rabbi son of Arhuna said in the name of Arashi that part which is on the bone Rabbi the son of Rabbi son of Arhuna said in the name of Arashi that part which is Above the hill a certain rabbi was sitting before Arabah and recited it is that part which is on the hill whereupon Arabah said pay no attention to him for thus said Rab Judah it is that part which the butchers strike and this corresponds with the view reported by Rabbah the son of Rabbah son of Arhuna in the name of Rab Judah Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel the juncture of the tendons of which the rabbi spoke is the place where the tendons converge and how far does it extend a certain rabbi whose name was our Jacob said when I was at the school of Rab Judah he said to us accept from me the following ruling which I heard from a great man that is Samuel is the juncture of the tendons of which they spoke is the place where the tendons converge and it extends from the place where the tendons converge up to the place where they part how much is this Abbe said four finger breadths in an ox what is the extent in small cattle Abbe said where the tendons bulge it is part of it Juncture but not where they are sunken and where they are hard it is part of the juncture but not where they are soft where they are large it is part of the juncture but not where they are small where they are white it is part of the juncture but not where they are not white Talmud, Mosul and Bimar son of Arashi said where they are transparent though not white it is part of the juncture of the tendons Amimar said in the name of Arzi but it consists of three tendons one thick and two thin if the thick one was severed it is true for the greater part of its structure has gone and if the thin ones were severed it is true for the greater number of tendons has gone Mar son of Arashi reports the above in favor of leniency thus if the thick one was severed it is permitted for there remains a greater number of tendons and if the thin ones were severed it is permitted for there remains a greater part of its structure in birds the juncture consists of sixteen tendons if one was severed it is true Mar son of Arashi said I was once standing before my father when there was brought to him a bird which he examined and found there in only fifteen tendons one however appeared different from the other so he split it and found that it was composed of two tendons he therefore declared it to be permitted Rab Judah said in the name of Rab with regard to the juncture of the tendons if the greater part was severed it is true what is meant by the greater part the greater part of any one of them when I stated this in the presence of Samuel he said to me consider there are three tendons are there not even if one was entirely severed there still remain two now the reason is because there still remain two but if there did not remain two it would not be permitted this clearly is in conflict with the view of Rabbi for Rabbi I stated in the name of Samuel if of the juncture of the tendons there only remained as much as the thread of a woolen cloak it is permitted others say by the greater part is meant the greater part of each tendon when I stated this in the presence of Samuel he said to me consider there are three tendons are there not even if the greater part of each was cut there still remains one third of each one this accordingly supports the view of Rabbi I for Rabbi I stated in the name of Samuel if of the juncture of the tendons there only remained as much as the thread of a woolen cloak it is permitted if the bone was broken etc Rab said where the fracture was above the joint if the greater part of the flesh remained both are permitted and if not both are forbidden where the fracture was below the joint if the greater part of the flesh remained both are permitted and if not the limb is forbidden but the animal is permitted Samuel said whether the fracture was above or below the joint
Jeremiah B. Abba sitting and reciting the above statement of Rav Arzara thereupon remarked well spoken so too did Arik teach it in Babylon but who is Arik it is Samuel is it not but does he not disagree with Rav Samuel retracted his opinion in favor of Rav's our rabbis taught where the bone was broken and it protruded outside if the skin and flesh covered the greater part of it it is permitted otherwise it is forbidden what is meant by the greater part of it when Ardimi came from. Palestine he reported in the name of Aryohanan that it means the greater part of its thickness others say it means the greater part of the flesh that surrounds it our papa said we therefore require the greater part of its thickness to be covered by flesh as well as the greater part of the flesh that surrounds it to be intact Allah said in the name of Aryohanan the skin is like the flesh our said to Allah why does not the master rather say that the skin is to be reckoned with the flesh to make up the required amount does not the above bury the state skin and flesh he replied we interpret that bury the demean either skin or flesh others report this as follows Allah said in the name of Aryohanan the skin is to be reckoned together with the flesh to make up the required amount our said to Allah why does not the master rather say that the skin merely completes the required amount of flesh adopting the stricter interpretation he replied I only know of the following Incident at the house of our Isaac there was a young pigeon whose leg was broken and the skin if reckoned together with the flesh covered up the greater part of the fracture the case was brought before Aryohanan and he declared it to be permitted thereupon Arnaman retorted you are speaking of a young pigeon but the case of a young pigeon is quite different because its skin is tender the case of a fracture which was covered for the most part with flesh and tender sinews came before Rabbah. Said Rabbah what have we to fear in the first place Aryohanan has declared that in respect of the sinews which later will become hard Talmud, Mosul and the people may be counted in to partake thereof in the Passover offering secondly the Torah doth spare the money of Israel whereupon our Papa said to Rabbah but on the other hand there is a view of our Simeon Belakish and moreover it is here a question involving a prohibition of the Torah and you say what have we to fear you Rabbah remained silent. But why did he remain silent? Has not Rabbah himself declared that the law agrees with Arsimian Belakish only in those three cases? In this case, it is different for Aryohanan retracted his view in favor of that of Arsimian Belakish, where he said, Do not worry me with any more of your arguments, for I regard that mission as the opinion of an individual there once came to obey the case where the bone was broken and had protruded outside and a fragment thereof had broken off. He held the case over. Three festivals thereupon our Abbe Matina said to the owner of the animal, Go and put the case to Rabbah, the son of our Joseph Behama, whose knife is sharp. He took it to him, and Rabbah said, Let us see the berry that taught if the bone was broken and protruded outside. What does it matter to me whether a portion had fallen away or it was all there? Rabbah inquired of Rabbah, What is the law if the required amount of flesh was scattered around the fracture or was in shreds or had decomposed? Arhu Navi. Son of Arjashu replied, Any flesh that has decomposed so that the surgeon must scrape it away is to be regarded as gone entirely. The question was raised, What is the law if the flesh that covered the fracture was perforated or had peeled off the bone or was slit or the inner layer of flesh close to the bone was gone? Come and hear Allah said in the name of Aryohan, and the skin is as good as the flesh, perhaps there the skin holds its own place. Arashi said, When we were at the school of R. Poppy, he inquired of us, What is the law if some of the flesh around the fracture was cut away in a circle like a ring? And I suggested an answer from the following statement of Rab Judah in the name of Rabbi inquired about this of scholars and doctors, and they said one should make incisions around the edges of the flesh with a bone and it will then heal up, but not with an iron instrument, for it would case inflammation. Our Papa said, Provided the bone was firmly attached to admission of a person. Slaughtered an animal and found in it an afterbirth he who is not fastidious may eat it it does not contract uncle Anes either food uncle Anes or the uncle Anes of Nibla if he intended to eat it it can contract food uncle Anes but not the uncle Anes of Nibla if part of the afterbirth emerged before the slaughtering of the damn it may not be eaten for it is a sign of birth in a woman and also a sign of birth in an animal if an animal which was with young for the first time cast forth an afterbirth it may be thrown to dogs but in the case of a consecrated animal it must be buried it may not be buried at crossroads or hung on a tree for these are Amorite practices Gamara once do we know it from the following our rabbis taught the verse whatsoever in the beast that shall ye eat includes the afterbirth I might say that even if part of it came forth out of the womb it is also permitted the verse therefore states that that shall ye eat but not the afterbirth but let us consider it is accepted that there can be no afterbirth without young why then is any verse necessary to exclude an afterbirth that had come forth indeed the verse is merely a support it does not contract uncle ns or isaac b napaha raised this question what is the position with regard to an ass's skin which was seated in what respect does the question arise if in respect of food uncleanness we have learned at talmud mosul and b and if in respect of the uncleanness of nibla we have also learned it as to food uncleanness it was taught a skin or an afterbirth cannot contract food uncleanness if the skin was seated or the afterbirth intended to be eaten it can contract food uncleanness as to the uncleanness of nibla it was taught it is written he that touched the carcass thereof but not its skin or its bones or its sinews or its horns or its hoofs and rabbis son of our had said that the verse was only necessary to exclude these when they were stewed in a pot Indeed the question was raised in respect of food uncleanness but the law might be different in the case of an ass's skin since it is loathsome if part of the afterbirth emerged R. Eliezer said the rule in the mission applies only to the case where there was no photos within but where there was a photos within we have no apprehension that it contained another photos R. Yohanan said whether there was a photos within or not we apprehend another photos but this surely is not so for our Jeremiah has declared that R. Eliezer adopts a stricter view than R. Yohanan indeed if it was reported it must have been reported as follows R. Eliezer said the rule in the mission applies only to the case where it was not attached to the photos but where it was attached to the photos we do not apprehend another photos R. Yohanan said we are guided by the rule that there can be no afterbirth without a photos but where it contained a photos whether it was attached to the photos or not we do not Apprehend another photos this now accords with the dictum of our Jeremiah that our Eliezer adopted a stricter view there is a very the taught in support of our Eliezer's view as if a woman brought forth an abortion which resembled a beast or a wild animal or a bird and there was an afterbirth too if the afterbirth was attached to it we do not apprehend another photos but if it was not attached to it I must impose upon this woman the restrictions of two births for I may suppose that the photos of this afterbirth as well as the afterbirth of this photos had dissolved if an animal which was with young for the first time cast forth an afterbirth it may be thrown to dogs why rik the son of rm i said because the majority of animals give birth to something which is holy as a firstling whereas a minority of animals give birth to something which is not holy as a firstling to wit and now all animals that bear young bear half males and half females add therefore the minority of nidmet to the half females with the result that the males constitute a minority but in the case of a consecrated animal it must be buried why because the majority of young born by a consecrated animal is holy it may not be buried at crossroads abay and rabba both stated whatever is done for medicinal purposes is not prohibited as amorite practices and whatever is not done for medicinal purposes is prohibited as amorite practices but has it not been taught that a tree which casts its fruit may be painted with red paint or laden with stones now it may be laden with stones so that talmud mosul and its productive strength be weakened but why may it be painted with red paint the purpose is that people will observe it and pray for its recovery as it was taught it is written and he shall cry unclean unclean that is to say he shall make known his affliction to his fellow men that they may pray for him likewise he upon whom a calamity has befallen should make known his trouble to his fellow men that they may pray for him. Rabbin said, According to whom is it that we suspend a cluster of dates on a tree which casts its fruit? It is in accordance with the above Hannah. Chapter mission of the law of it and its young is in force both within the land of Israel and outside it, both during the existence of the temple and after it, in respect of both unconsecrated and consecrated animals. Thus, if one person slaughtered an animal and another its young, both animals being unconsecrated and they slaughtered them outside the sanctuary, they are both valid. But he who slaughtered the second incurs forty strip
and it is invalid if the first was slaughtered outside the sanctuary and the second inside both being unconsecrated animals the first is valid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable but he who slaughtered the second incurs 40 stripes and it is invalid if the first was slaughtered outside the sanctuary and the second inside both being consecrated animals he who slaughtered the first incurs the penalty of Karath each incurs 40 stripes and both animals are invalid if it first was slaughtered inside the sanctuary and the second outside both being unconsecrated animals the first is invalid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable but he who slaughtered the second incurs 40 stripes and it is valid if the first was slaughtered inside the sanctuary and the second outside both being consecrated animals the first is valid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable but he who slaughtered the second incurs 40 stripes and it is invalid Gemara R. Rabbis taught once do we know that the law of it and its young applies to consecrated animals because the verse states when a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth thenceforth it may be accepted for an offering and there immediately follows the verse and whether it be an ox or a sheep they shall not kill it and its young both in one day thus indicating that the law of it and its young applies to consecrated animals perhaps then it applies only to consecrated animals and not to unconsecrated animals this cannot be for the word ox interrupts the subject matter perhaps then it applies to unconsecrated animals only and not to consecrated animals since it is written and an ox the conjunction and connects it with the previous subject it should then follow should it not that as a hybrid cannot be a consecrated animal so the law of it and its young should not apply to a hybrid wherefore has it been taught the law of it and its young applies to a hybrid and to a goat. And there is also this difficulty for it is written here sheep and Rabbah has declared Talmud, Mosul and B. This verse establishes the rule that wherever sheep is stated the hybrid is excluded since the verse states or it includes the hybrid but is not or necessary to indicate this junction for I might have thought that one is not culpable unless one kills an ox and its young and also a sheep and its young it therefore teaches us that it is not so disjunction is indicated in the expression it's young but it is still necessary for the following teaching it was taught had scripture stated an ox and a sheep and its young ye shall not kill I would have said that one is not culpable unless one kills an ox and a sheep and the young of any one of them the text therefore says and whether it be an ox or a sheep ye shall not kill it and its young not presumably this teaching is derived from the expression or no it is derived from the expression it and its young this is well, according to the rabbis who regard it as superfluous, but according to Hananiah who does not regard it as superfluous, whence would he derive the principle of disjunction? No verse is necessary to indicate disjunction, for he concurs with the view of our Jonathan. For it was taught for any man that curses his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. From this I know only that he is liable for cursing his father and his mother if he curses his father and not his mother or his mother and not his father. Whence do I know that he is liable? Because it also says his father and his mother he hath cursed. That is, he has cursed his father, he has cursed his mother. So our Josiah, our Jonathan says it may imply both together or each separately, unless the verse expressly states together what is this dispute between Hananiah and the rabbis? It was taught the law of it and its young applies to the female parent only and not to the male. Hananiah says it applies both to the male and Female parent, what is the reason of the rabbis? It was taught I might have said that the law of it and its young applies to both male and female parents. There is, however, an argument against this because there is a prohibition here, and there is also a prohibition with regard to the dam with the young, just as the prohibition of the dam with the young applies only to the female parent and not to the male. So the prohibition here applies only to the female parent and not to the male, but it will be retorted. It is not so for you may say this of the dam and its young, since it has this distinctiveness in that the law does not place upon the same footing birds that are at one's disposal and birds that are not at one's disposal. Can you then say this of it and its young, seeing that it has not this distinctiveness for the law places upon the same footing beasts that are at one's disposal and beasts that are not at one's disposal? The verse therefore states it that is it refers to one parent. And not to both since therefore scripture discriminates between the parents I am justified in applying the above argument because there is a prohibition here and there is also a prohibition with regard to the dam with the young just as the prohibition of the dam with the young applies only to the female parent and not to the male so the prohibition here applies only to the female parent and not to the male and if you desire to say anything against this I submit the following the expression. Its young relates to that parent to whom the young clings thus excluding the male parent to whom the young does not cling what is meant by but if you desire to say anything against this if you say that it indicates the male parent I therefore submit another argument the expression its young relates to that parent to whom the young clings thus excluding the male parent to whom the young does not cling Talmud, Mastul and Talmud, Mastul and according to Hanani however the implication. Of the verses this it says it which indicates the male parent and it also says it's young which relates to that parent to whom the young clings hence it is clear that the law applies both to the male and female parent are who not be high said in the name of Samuel the Halachah is in accordance with Hananiah's view moreover Samuel is consistent in his opinion for we have learned our Judah says the offspring of Amir even though their sire was an ass are permitted to interbreed but the offspring of a she ass may not interbreed with the offspring of Amir but Rab Judah had stated in the name of Samuel that this was a view of our Judah only who maintained that we do not take into consideration the seat of the male parent the sages however say all mules are one kind who is meant by the sages it is Hananiah who maintains that we must take into consideration the seat of the male parent accordingly the one is the offspring of Amir and an ass stallion and the other is the offspring of a she as and a horse but they are both one kind the question was raised was our Judah certain that we do not take into consideration the seat of the male parent or was he in doubt about it what practical difference would this make on the question of permitting the offspring to breed with the species of the dam if you say that he or Judah was certain of it then the offspring is permitted to breed with the species of the dam but if you say that he was in doubt about it then it is forbidden for the offspring to breed with the species of the dam what is to be said about this come and here our Judah says all the offspring of Amir even though their sire was an ass are permitted to interbreed now what are the circumstances of the case if you say that the sire of this offspring was an ass stallion and of that also an ass stallion then was it necessary to state this you must therefore say that the sire of this offspring was a horse and of that an ass stallion and our Judah declares that they may interbreed hence is it clear that he or Judah was certain about it it is not so I still say that the sire of this offspring was an ass stallion and of that also an ass stallion and as to your retort was it necessary to state this I reply that you might have argued that the horse in the one copulates with the ass in the other and the ass in the one copulates with the horse in the other he therefore teaches us that it is not so come and here our Judah says if a mule was unheated may not be mated with a horse or an ass but only with one of its own kind now if you say that our Judah was certain about it why may it not be mated with the species of its dam because we know not the species of its dam but it says only with one of its own kind it means this it may not be mated with any kind of horse or any kind of ass because we do not know its true species then let us examine it by the following signs for Abbe has stated if its voice is harsh it is the offspring of a she. As if its voice is shrill it is the offspring of Amir and our papa has stated if its ears are long and its tail short it is the offspring of a she as if its ears are short and its tail long it is the offspring of Amir we must suppose here that it was dumb and mutilated what has been decided then come and hear Aruna the son of our Joshua said all agree that the offspring is forbidden to breed with the dam hence it is clear that our Judah was in doubt about it this proves it our Abba said to his servant when you harness the mules to my carriage see that they are very like each other and then harness them this shows that he is of the opinion that we do not take into consideration the seat of the male parent Talmud, Mastul and B and also that the aforementioned signs are reliable by biblical law rabbis taught the law of it and its young applies to a hybrid and a koi our Eliezer says to a hybrid the offspring of a goat and a you the law of it and its young applies to a koi. The law of it and its young does not apply. Our Hisda said, What is the koi about which our Eliezer and the rabbis differ? It is the offspring of a he goat and a hind. What are the circumstances if you suggest that a he goat covered a hind and the hind gave birth to a young and then one slaughtered the dam and its young? But this cannot be for our Hisda has also stated that all agree that if the dam was a hind and its young, the offspring of a he goat one is not culpable for slaughtering the dam and its young on the same day for the div
us the above dispute considered in the following case we have learned a person may not slaughter a koi on a festival and if he did slaughter it he may not cover up its blood now of what koi are we speaking here if you suggest that a he goat covered a hind and it gave birth to the koi then both according to the rabbis and our Elizer, he may slaughter it on the festival and cover up its blood for the law of covering up the blood applies to deer and even to that which is deer in part and if you suggest that a heart covered a she goat and it gave birth to the koi then according to the rabbis he may slaughter it on the festival and cover up its blood and according to our Elizer, he may slaughter it on the festival and need not cover the blood indeed the fact was that a heart covered a she goat but the rabbis are undecided whether or not we must take into consideration the seed of the male parent it follows does it not that since the rabbis are undecided on this point our Elizer, has no doubts at all about it considered in the following case it was taught the law of the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw applies to a koi and to a hybrid our Elizer says a hybrid the offspring of a goat and a you is subject to these dues a koi is not subject to these dues now of what koi are we speaking here if you suggest that a he goat covered a hind and it gave birth to the koi then the view of our Elizer that it is not subject to these dues is clear for he is of the opinion that we do not say that the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only but according to the view of the rabbis granting that they hold that the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only it is clear therefore that there is certainly no obligation to give him one half of the dues and even as regards the other half he could say to him bring proof that we take into consideration the seat of the male parent and then you shall have it and if you suggest that a heart covered a she goat then according to the rabbis it is perfectly clear for by subject they meant subject to half the dues but according to our Elizer it ought to be subject to the whole of the dues indeed the case was that a heart covered a she goat and it gave birth to the koi but our Elizer is undecided whether or not we must take into consideration the seat of the male parent but if the rabbis are undecided about it and our Elizer too is undecided wherein do they differ Talmud, Mastulin. They differ in this whether or not the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only the rabbis maintain that the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only whereas our Elizer maintains that the term sheep does not include that which is a sheep in part only therefore said our papa with regard to the law of covering up the blood and also with regard to the priests dues the koi spoken of can only be the offspring of such interbreeding as where a heart covered a sheep. Goat for both the rabbis and our Elizer are undecided whether we must take into consideration the seat of the male parent or not but they differ as to whether the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only or not with regard to the law of it and its young the dispute can arise both where a he goat covered a hind and where a heart covered a she goat the dispute in the case where a he goat covered a hind is as to whether there is any prohibition or not the rabbis holding that it Maybe that we ought to take into consideration the seat of the male parent in which case it is a part sheep and since we say that the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only it is therefore forbidden whilst our Elizer maintains that even though we do take into consideration the seat of the male parent in which case it is a part sheep we do not say that the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only and it is therefore permitted in the case where a heart covered a she goat the dispute is as to whether stripes are inflicted or not the rabbis holding that even though we take into consideration the seat of the male parent since we say that the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only we therefore inflict stripes upon him whilst our Elizer maintains there is only a prohibition but stripes cannot be inflicted there is only a prohibition perhaps we do not take into consideration the seat of the male parent and therefore this is a proper sheep but stripes cannot be inflicted for it may be that we ought to take into consideration the seat of the male parent so that it is only a part sheep and we do not say that the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only Rab Judah said a koi is a separate creature but the rabbis have not decided whether it belongs to the class of wild animals or cattle are and said a koi is a wild ram Tanaim also differ about it for it was taught a koi is a wild ram others say it is the offspring of a he goat and a hind are Jose says a koi is a separate creature but the rabbis have not decided whether it belongs to the class of wild animals or cattle are Simeon B. Gamaliel says it is a species of cattle and the house of Desai used to breed herds and herds of the Marzara said in the name of our Safra who reported it in the name of our Hamna forest goats are fit for the altar he is of the same view as our Isaac who said scripture has enumerated ten species of animals that may be Eaten and no more now as I N C E these forest goats are not reckoned among the wild animals mentioned it follows that they are of a species of goats are a hobby Jacob demurred saying perhaps we should say that the heart and the gazelle etc are particular terms and every beast is a general proposition which includes these particulars hence we have an enumeration of particulars followed by a general proposition in which case the scope of the proposition extends beyond the kind specified thus. There are many animals that may be eaten although not enumerated in the Torah if so what is the purpose of the enumeration of all these particulars are the son of R I K demurred saying perhaps they the forest goats are included within the class Ako Arava the son of Rabba said to Arashi others say Araha the son of Arawiya said to Arashi perhaps they are included within the class Teo or Zemarahin and said to Arashi Amimar permitted the fat of these forest goats to be eaten Abba the son. Of our Minjamin Bihai inquired of Arhuna Bihai what is the law with regard to the offering of these forest goats upon the altar he replied it was only with regard to the wild ox that our Jose disagreed with the rabbis for we have learned the wild ox is a species of cattle our Jose says it is a species of wild animal and their arguments are these the rabbis maintain since the Targum renders Teo as the wild ox it is certainly a species of cattle whereas our Jose maintains since it is reckoned together with the other species of wild animals it is a species of wild animal but these forest goats according to all views belong to the species of goats Araha the son of R.I.K. Demur perhaps they are included within the class Ako Robin said to Arashi perhaps they are included within the class Teo or Zemarahin and said to Arashi Amimar permitted the fat of these to be eaten thus if one person slaughtered etc Arashi said our entire mission is not in agreement with our Simeon once too. You gather this for it reads if both animals were consecrated and were slaughtered outside the sanctuary he who slaughtered the first incurs the penalty of Kareth both animals are invalid and each incurs forty stripes now let us consider we know that according to our Simeon a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit is no slaughtering Talmud, Mosul and be accordingly as the first animal was merely killed the second is acceptable as an offering within and he who slaughtered it should also incur the penalty of Kareth moreover it reads if both animals were unconsecrated and were slaughtered inside the sanctuary both animals are invalid and he who slaughtered the second incurs forty stripes let us consider we know that according to our Simeon a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit is no slaughtering accordingly the first animal was merely killed why then should he who slaughtered the second have incurred forty stripes further it reads if both Animals were consecrated and were slaughtered inside the sanctuary the first is valid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable but he who slaughtered the second incurs forty stripes and it is invalid let us consider we know that according to our simian a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit is no slaughtering now the slaughtering of a consecrated animal is by itself a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for so long as the blood has not been sprinkled it flesh is not permitted to be eaten why is it then that he who slaughtered the second has incurred forty stripes and why is it invalid indeed you may conclude that it is not in agreement with our simian is it not obvious it is so it was only necessary to have said it on account of the clause dealing with the slaughtering of consecrated animals for you might have submitted that the slaughtering of a consecrated animal is by itself a slaughtering which renders fit for if one were to stab it Animal and sprinkle its blood the flesh would not thereby be permitted to be eaten whereas if one were to slaughter it the flesh would thereby be permitted to be eaten consequently it is a slaughtering which renders the animal fit he therefore teaches us that it is not so should he not have incurred stripes also on account of the prohibition of out of time for it was taught once do we know that the offering of a bullock or a sheep that has any disqualifying defect is a transgression of the prohibition of it shall not be accepted from the verse either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything too long or too short it shall not be accepted implying that the offering of a bullock or a sheep that has a disqualifying defect is a transgression of the
The force of the positive command but is not this verse required for our Aftura key's exposition for our Aftura key pointed out a contradiction between verses the verse says it shall be seven days under the dam accordingly on the night following the seventh day it is valid and then it continues from the eighth day and henceforth it may be accepted that is only from the eighth day and henceforth but not on the night following the seventh day how is this to be reconciled on the night following the seventh day it is fit for consecration but on the eighth day it is acceptable as an offering there is another verse to the same effect is likewise shalt thou do with thine oxen and thy sheep seven days it shall be with its dam on the eighth day thou shalt give it me or him said our Simeon used to say that the law of it and its young does not apply to consecrated animals why for since our Simeon has stated that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit is no slaughtering the Slaughtering of consecrated animals is by itself a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit. Robber raised the following objection: If two persons slaughtered a dam and its young on the same day, both being consecrated animals outside the sanctuary, he who slaughtered the second says, "Our Simeon has transgressed a negative command." For our Simeon used to say, "For slaughtering outside the sanctuary, any consecrated animal which is fit to be brought as a sacrifice at a later time there is a negative command, but not the penalty of correct." The sages, however, say, "Where there is no penalty of correct, there is neither the transgression of a negative command." Now, upon this was raised the following difficulty: You say, "Where both were consecrated animals and they were slaughtered outside, he who slaughtered the second has transgressed a negative command, and nothing more." But surely the first animal is merely regarded as killed, and the second would therefore be acceptable as a. Sacrifice within consequently he who slaughtered it should also incur the penalty of Kareth whereupon Rabbi others say cut he answered there is an omission here and this is how it should read if both animals were consecrated and were slaughtered outside the sanctuary according to the rabbis he who slaughtered the first incurs the penalty of Kareth and the second animal is invalid but he who slaughtered it is not culpable and according to our Simeon both incur the penalty of Kareth if both animals were consecrated and were slaughtered the first outside and the second inside the sanctuary according to the rabbis he who slaughtered the first has incurred the penalty of Kareth and the second animal is invalid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable according to our Simeon the second animal is valid if the first was slaughtered inside and the second outside the sanctuary according to the rabbis the first animal is valid and he who slaughtered it is not culpable and the second is invalid and he who slaughtered it is likewise not culpable according to our Simeon he who slaughtered the second has transgressed a negative command now if you were to assume that according to our Simeon the law of it and its young does not apply to consecrated animals then why is it stated that he who slaughtered the second has transgressed a negative command and no more he should also have incurred the penalty of Kareth rather said Rabbah this is what our Hamnana meant to say the punishment of stripes for the transgression of the law of it and its young does not apply to consecrated animals why for inasmuch as the flesh is not permitted to be eaten so long as the blood has not been sprinkled the warning that is given to the slaughterer while he is slaughtering is a dubious warning and a dubious warning is no warning Rabbah is consistent in this view of this for Rabbah said if the dam was an unconsecrated animal and the young peace offering and a man slaughtered First the unconsecrated animal and later on the same day the peace offering he is not culpable if he first slaughtered the peace offering and then the unconsecrated animal he is culpable. Rabbah also said if the dam was an unconsecrated animal and the young burnt offering it goes without saying that if a man first slaughtered the unconsecrated animal and later on the same day the burnt offering he is not culpable. Talmud, Mosul and B but even if he first slaughtered the burnt offering and later on the same day the unconsecrated animal he also is not culpable because the first slaughtering was not a slaughtering such as renders the animal fit for food. Our Jacob however said in the name of our Yohan and the consumption of sacrifices upon the altar is deemed eating why because it is written and if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be at all eaten the verse speaks of two eatings the eating by man and the eating by the altar Mishnah if a person slaughtered and Animal and it was found to be trivial, or if he slaughtered it as an offering to idols, or if he slaughtered a red cow or an ox which was condemned to be stoned, or a heifer whose neck was to be broken. Our Simeon says he does not thereby transgress the law of it and its young, but the sages say he does. If a person slaughtered an animal and it became nibbled under his hand, or if he stabbed it or tore away the organs of the throat, he does not thereby transgress the law of it and its young. Gemara, our Simeon Belaish said they said so only where the person slaughtered the first animal to idols and the second for his table needs, but if he slaughtered the first animal for his table needs and the second to idols, he is certainly not culpable on the ground of it and its young, for he suffers the heavier penalty. Whereupon our Yohanan said to him, Why even school children know that? But I say that sometimes even where he slaughtered the first animal for his table needs and it. Second to idols he is culpable on the ground of it and its young if for example he was warned of the prohibition of it and its young but not of idolatry our Simeon Belagish however maintains since if he had been warned of idolatry he would not be culpable on account of it and its young then even if he had not been warned of idolatry he is likewise not culpable on account of it and its young they are indeed consistent in their views for when our Dimi came from Palestine he reported as follows he who committed inadvertently an act which if he had committed it willfully would have been punishable with death or with stripes and the act committed is punishable also with something else our Yohanan says he is liable but our Simeon Belagish says he is not liable our Yohanan says he is liable for he had not been warned of the major penalty our Simeon Belagish says he is not liable for since if he had been warned of the major penalty he would not be liable so too if he had not been Warned of it, he is also not liable now. Both disputes are required, for if only this dispute were reported, I might have said that only here does our Simeon Belagish assert his view, but there I should have said that he is in agreement with our Yohanan, and if the other dispute only were reported, I might have said that only there does our Yohanan assert his view, but here I should have said that he is in agreement with our Simeon Belagish. Both disputes therefore had to be reported. Do you say that? According to our Simeon, the slaughtering of the red cow is a slaughtering which does not render it fit for food. Surely it has been taught. Our Simeon says the red cow contracts food uncleanness since it had a period of fitness to be used for food. Talmud, Mosul and A, and our Simeon Belagish said our Simeon used to say that the red cow may be redeemed even on its wood pile. Our Shaman B Abba therefore suggested in the name of our Yohanan, the red cow is not part of our mission. Do you also say that? The slaughtering of the heifer whose neck was to be broken is a slaughtering which does not render it fit for food. Surely we have learned if the murderer was found before the heifer's neck was broken, it is set free to pasture among the herd. Our Simeon Belagish therefore said in the name of Arjane, the heifer whose neck was to be broken is not part of our mission, but could Arjane have said so? Did not Arjane say, I have heard a time limit for it, but have forgotten it? But our colleagues maintain its descent to the rugged valley renders it forbidden. Now, if this is so, it can be answered that there it was before it was taken down to the rugged valley, and hereafter it was taken down. Our Phineas, the son of our MI, replied, We report the statement in the name of our Simeon Belagish. Our Ashi said, When we were at our poppies, this difficulty was raised. Did our Simeon Belagish really say so? But it has been reported from what time our leper's birds forbidden our Yohanan said from the moment of it. Slaughtering our Simeon Belagish said from the moment they are taken and we explained that the reason for the view of our Simeon Belagish was that he derived it by analogy from the word taking used here and also in connection with the heifer whose neck was to be broken rather say thus our high B Abba said in the name of our Yohanan the heifer whose neck was to be broken is not part of our mission a mission if two persons bought a cow and its young he who bought first shall slaughter first but if the second forestalled him he holds his advantage Gemara our Joseph said what we have learned in our mission is with regard to the rights of each attendant taught if the second forestalled him he is sharp and gains an advantage sharp and that he cannot now transgress the law and gains an advantage in that he eats meat today mission if a person slaughtered a cow and then two of its calves he incurs eighty stripes if he slaughtered its two calves and then the cow he incurs forty stripes if he Slaughtered it and then its calf and then the calf's offspring he incurs eighty stripes if he slaughtered it and then its calf's offspring and then the calf he incurs forty stripes. Simicos in the name of our Mayor says he incur
liable to two sin offerings and by right this view of Simcoe should have been recorded elsewhere but it is recorded here to show you to what length the rabbis will go for the rabbis exempt him from an additional penalty even in a case of separate prohibitions or is it that he holds that if a man during a spell of forgetfulness ate two olives bulk of forbidden fat he is only liable to one sin offering but here the reason is that there are two separate prohibitions he replied yes he holds that if a man ate two olives bulk of forbidden fat during a spell of forgetfulness he is liable to two sin offerings whence do you gather this from the following it was taught if a person sowed diverse kinds diverse kinds he incurs stripes now what is meant by he incurs stripes should you say it means he incurs the penalty of stripes once but this is obvious moreover why does it repeat diverse kinds diverse kinds it must therefore mean he incurs stripes twice and what would be the Circumstances of the case should you say he sowed diverse kinds twice one after the other and there were two warnings but we have already learned this elsewhere if a Nazir drinks wine the whole day long he incurs only one penalty if he is warned do not drink do not drink and he drinks he is liable for each warning clearly then he sowed diverse kinds twice but simultaneously and there was only one warning now who is the author of the statement should you say it is the rabbis who differ with Simicos but surely if in that case in our mission where there are separate prohibitions the rabbis exempt the wrongdoer from an additional penalty how much more so in this case hence it is no doubt Simicos no I maintain it is the rabbis but they incidentally teach us something else that there are two sorts of diverse kinds they thus reject the view of our Josiah who said a man is not guilty until he sows wheat barley and great kernels with one throw of the hand for they teach us that if a man sowed wheat and great kernels or barley and great kernels he is also guilty come and here if a person ate an olive's bulk of the sciatic nerve of this thigh and another olive's bulk of the other thigh he has incurred 80 stripes our Judah says he has only incurred 40 stripes now what are the circumstances of the case if you say that he ate them one after the other and there were two warnings then what is our Judah's reason for saying that he has incurred 40 stripes? Is not the warning with regard to each dubious and we have learned that according to our Judah dubious warning is no warning for it was taught if he struck one and then struck the other or if he cursed one and then cursed the other or if he struck them both simultaneously or if he cursed them both simultaneously he is liable our Judah says if simultaneously he is liable if one after the other he is not liable obviously then the case is that he ate them together and there was only one warning. Now whose view is expressed by the first tana should you say that of the rabbis who differ with Simicos but surely if there in our mission where there are separate prohibitions the rabbis exempt the wrongdoer from an additional penalty how much more so in this case hence it is no doubt that of Simicos no I maintain that he ate them one after the other and that there were two warnings and that the view expressed by the first tana is that of the rabbis the statement however expressed above by the tana in the name of Arjuna agrees with the view of another tana who declares also in the name of Arjuna that a dubious warning is a warning for it was taught and he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire Talmud Mosul in a scripture here came and provided a positive precept as a remedy for the disregarded prohibition to indicate that the prohibition is not punishable by stripes. So our Judah, our Jacob says this is not the reason but because it is a prohibition which involves no action in the contravention thereof and any prohibition which involves no action in the contravention thereof is not punishable by stripes come and here if a person ate two sciatic nerves from the two right thighs of two animals he has incurred 80 stripes our Judah says he has only incurred 40 stripes now what are the circumstances of the case if you say that he ate them one after the other and that there were two warnings then what is the reason of our Judah who says that he has incurred 40 stripes and no more obviously than he ate them together and there was only one warning now whose view is expressed by the first tana if you say that of the rabbis who differ with Simicos but surely if there in our mission where there are separate prohibitions the rabbis exempt the wrongdoer from an additional penalty how much more so in this case hence it is no doubt that of Simicos no I maintain that he ate them one after the other but when you ask then what is our Judah's reason I reply that in this case one was not as much as an olive's bulk for it has been taught if a person ate the whole of it but it was not as much as an olive's bulk he is liable our Judah says he is not liable unless it was as much as an olive's bulk mission at four periods in the year he who sells a beast to another must inform him I sold today it's damned to be slaughtered or I sold to day it's young to be slaughtered namely on the eve of the last day of the feast of tabernacles on the eve of the first day of Passover on the eve of Pentecost and on the eve of the new year according to our Jose the Galilean also on the eve of the day of atonement in Galilee our Judah says this is so only when there was no interval but if there was an interval he need not inform him yet our Judah agrees that if he sold the damned to the bridegroom and the young to the bride he must inform them of it. For it is certain that they will each slaughter their beast on the same day at these four periods a butcher can be compelled to slaughter a beast against his will even if the ox was worth eight thousand dinars and the purchaser has only paid a dinar the butcher is compelled to slaughter it therefore if the animal died the loss falls upon the purchaser at other times of the year it is not so therefore if the animal died the loss falls upon the seller Gamar a tanda taught if he did not inform him he the purchaser may go and slaughter it without any hesitation whatsoever our Judah says this is so if he sold the dam to the bridegroom etc why does he particularly state the dam to the bridegroom and the young to the bride he incidentally tells us that it is the proper thing for the bridegroom's family to make greater festivities than the bride's family at these four periods etc but he the purchaser has not drawn it into his possession our answered we must assume that he had done so if so why does it say in the last clause at other times of the year it is not so therefore if the animal died the loss falls upon the seller but he has already drawn the animal into his possession our Samuel son of our Isaac answered in fact he had not drawn it into his possession but here the case was that the seller had transferred a portion to the purchaser through a third party now at these four periods it is an advantage for him to have meat and it is an established rule that one may act to another's advantage in his absence whereas at other times of the year it is a disadvantage for him and one may not act to another's disadvantage save in his presence our Eliezer answered in the name of our Yohanan that at these four periods the rabbis adopted the biblical law for our Yohanan has said by biblical law the payment of money confers title why then was it decreed that only Meshika confers title as a precautionary measure lest he the vendor say to him the purchaser your wheat was burnt in the loft mission of the one day mentioned in connection with the law of it and its young means the day and the night preceding it this was expounded by our Simeon BZOMA the expression one day is mentioned in connection with the creation and also in connection with the law of it and its young as the one day mentioned in connection with the creation means the day and the night preceding it so too the one day mentioned in connection with the law of it and its young means the day and the night preceding it tomorrow our rabbis taught this was expounded by our Simeon BZOMA since the whole passage deals only with the laws concerning consecrated animals and with regard to consecrated matters a day means the day and the night following it I might have thought that here also it is the same it is therefore written here one day and also one day in connection with the creation as the one day mentioned in connection with the creation means the day and the night preceding it so to the one day mentioned in connection with the law of it and its young means the day and the night preceding it Talmud, Mosul and B. Rabbi says one day means a special day on which an announcement with regard to it and its young must be made hence the rabbis have said at four periods of the year he who sells a beast to another must inform him of the sale of its dam or of its young chapterv I mission the law of covering up the blood is enforced both within the holy land and outside it both during the existence of the temple and after it in respect of unconsecrated animals or birds but not consecrated birds it applies only to wild animals and birds whether they are at one's disposal or not it applies also to a koi for it is an animal about which there is a doubt it may therefore not be slaughtered on a festival and if it was slaughtered thereon one may not cover up its blood tomorrow why does it not apply to consecrated birds is it because of our zeros? Teaching for our Zara said he who slaughters a bird or a wild animal must place dust underneath the blood and dust above it for it is written he shall pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust before it does not say afar but before this is to indicate that he who slaughters must place dust underneath the blood and dust above it and here in the case of consecrated birds this is not possible for how should he do it if he were to place dust upon
Knife must also be covered up. It is clear therefore that he must scrape it away and cover it up. Here too he should scrape it away from off the altar and cover it up. If it was a bird consecrated for sacrifice, it would indeed be so. But here in our mission we are speaking of a bird consecrated for the temple treasury Talmud, Mastral and why should he not redeem it and then cover up its blood? Because in order to redeem a consecrated living thing, it must be stood up and appraised. By the priest according to whom is this teaching if according to our mayor who said that all consecrated living things are subject to the law of standing up whilst being appraised but he holds does he not that a slaughtering which does not render fit for food is a proper slaughtering and if according to our simian who said that a slaughtering which does not render fit for food is no slaughtering but he holds does he not that not all are subject to the law of standing up whilst being appraised. Our Joseph answered the Tana of our Mishnah is rabbi who incorporates the views of both these Tanaim with regard to a slaughtering which does not render fit for food he adopts the view of our Simeon and with regard to the law of standing up whilst being appraised he adopts the view of our mayor alternatively you may say the entire Mishnah is in conformity with the views of our Simeon but it is different here for the verse reads and he shall pour out and cover it implying that the law of covering up applies only to that case which requires pouring out and covering up but not to this case which requires pouring out redeeming and covering up and now that you have adopted this argument you might even say that our mission refers also to birds consecrated for sacrifice for the law of covering up applies only to those that require pouring out and covering up but not to those that require pouring out scraping away from off the altar and covering up our son of Arashi said the reason is because scripture says any wild animal or bird and just as it cannot refer to a consecrated wild animal so it cannot refer to a consecrated bird but I might say just as the law refers to wild animals none of which can be consecrated so it only refers to those birds which cannot be consecrated hence I would exclude turtle doves and young pigeons since they can be consecrated this cannot be for it is likened to the wild animal and just as in the case of wild animals you make no distinctions so in the case of birds you ought not to make any distinctions Jacob the men said to Rabbah it is established that the term cattle includes wild animals with regard to the characteristics of cleanness should I not say then that the term wild animal includes cattle with regard to the law of covering up the blood he replied to confute such as you the verse says thou shalt pour it out upon the earth as water and as water does not require to be covered up so the blood of cattle does not require to be covered up if so one should be allowed to immerse unclean things in its scripture says nevertheless a fountain or a cistern any gathering of water shall be clean only these render clean but any other liquid does not perhaps this verse only excludes other liquids which are not described as water but blood since it is described as water should be allowed for purposes of immersion there are two limiting qualifications is a fountain of water and a cistern of water perhaps both these limitations serve to exclude other liquids one excluding liquids in a running state and the other liquids when collected there are three limiting qualifications is a fountain of water a cistern of water and any gathering of water our rabbis taught it is written who taketh in hunting I only know from this that the law applies to that which is taken in hunting once would I know that it also applies to such as are always taken hunting e.g. geese and fowl the text therefore adds a hunting the law thus applies to all cases why then does scripture say who taketh in hunting the Torah teaches a rule of conduct that a person should not eat meat except after such preparation as this our rabbis taught when the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border as he hath promised thee and thou shalt say I will eat flesh the Torah here teaches a rule of conduct that a person should not eat meat unless he has a special appetite for it I might think that this means that a person should buy Meat in the market and eat it. The text therefore states then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock. I might then think that this means that he should kill all his herd and eat and all his flock and eat. The text therefore states of thy herd and not all thy herd of thy flock and not all thy flock. Hence are Eliezer B. Ezra I said a man who has a mana may buy for his two litre of vegetables. If he has ten mana he may buy for his two litre of fish. If he has fifty mana he may buy for his two litre of meat. If he has a hundred mana he may have a pot set on for him every day and how often for the others from Sabbath Eve to Sabbath Eve said Rab we must defer to the opinion of the elder Aryohan and said Abba comes from a healthy family but as for us whosoever amongst us has a penny in his purse should hasten with it to the shopkeeper Arnam and said as for us we must even borrow to eat the lambs are for thy clothing of the fleece of your own lambs should be your clothing and it. Goats the price of the field the person should always sell his field and buy goats rather than sell his goats and buy a field and there will be goats milk enough it is enough for a person to sustain himself with the milk of the goats and lambs in his home for thy food for the food of thy household your own sustenance comes first before the sustenance of your household and life for thy maidens Mars the son of Arnam and said discipline your maidens in the way of life hence the Torah teaches a rule of conduct that a parent should not accuse Tom his son to flesh and wine are you and said Talmud Mastral and be whoso wishes to become rich should engage in the breeding of small cattle are his dust and why the expression the young Ashtaroth of thy flock because they enrich me Ashtaroth their owners are you and also said rather drink a couple of witchcraft than a couple of lukewarm water that is so only if it is in a metal vessel but in an earthenware vessel it does no harm moreover even in a metal vessel we say it is harmful only if no spice roots were thrown into it but if some spice roots were thrown into it it does no harm moreover even if no spice roots were thrown into it we say it is harmful only if the water had not been boiled but once it had boiled it can do no harm are you and also said if a person is left a fortune by his parents and wishes to dissipate it let him wear linen garments use glassware and engage workmen and not be with them let him wear linen garments especially of roman linen use glassware especially white glass and engage workmen and not be with them especially to work with oxen which can cause much damage are used to give the following exposition sometimes quoting it in the name of rmi and sometimes in the name of rc what is the meaning of the verse well is it with the man that dealeth graciously that ordereth his affairs rightfully a man should always eat and drink less than his means allow clothe himself in accordance with Means and honor his wife and children more than his means allow for they are dependent upon him and he is dependent upon him who spake and the world came into being are he lectured at the entrance of the exilarch's house as if a person slaughtered a bird on the sabbath for an invalid he must cover up its blood whereupon rabbi said he is talking nonsense removed from him is a for it has been taught our jose says a coin may not be slaughtered on a festival and if it was slaughtered its blood may not be covered up by reason of the following a fortiori argument if circumcision which in a case of certainty overrides the sabbath yet in a case of doubt does not even override the festival the covering up of the blood which even in a case of certainty does not override the sabbath will surely not override the festival in a case of doubt they said to him but the sounding of the shofar in the provinces could prove otherwise for even though in a case of certainty it does not override it. Sabbath yet it does override the festival in a case of doubt our Eliezer Hakapur Gurubai raised this objection against the argument of our Jose you may say so of circumcision since it is not allowed on the night of a festival will you then say the same of the covering up of the blood which is allowed on the night of a festival our Abba said this is one of the instances about which our Hayah had said I have no objection to raise against it but our Eliezer Hakapur Gurubai did find an objection now it actually was stated above the covering up of the blood which even in a case of certainty does not override the Sabbath to what does the ruling that the covering up of the blood even in a case of certainty does not override the Sabbath refer no doubt to the case where one slaughtered on the Sabbath for an invalid but perhaps it refers to the case where one transgressed and slaughtered it must be under similar conditions as circumcision as circumcision does not involve the transgression of a Precept so the case of the covering up of the blood must not have involved the transgression of a precept they said to him but the sounding of the shofar in the provinces could prove otherwise for even though in a case of certainty it does not override the sabbath yet it does override the festival in a case of doubt what is this case of doubt is it the doubt whether the day is a holy day or a weekday but surely if it the sounding of the shofar overrides a certain holy day is there any question about a doubtful holy day Talmud, Mastral and or rather the case of doubt is whether the person that is sounding the shofar is a man or a woman or Jose however does not regard this as a refutation for he is of the opinion that even a woman may sound the shofar on the festival for it was taught the sons of Israel lay on their hands up
slaughtered unto idols or if he slaughtered that which was unconsecrated inside the sanctuary or that which was consecrated outside or if he slaughtered a wild animal or a bird that was condemned to be stoned our mayor says that he is bound to cover up the blood but the sages say that he is exempt if he slaughtered a wild animal or a bird and it became nibbla under his hand or if he stabbed tea or tore away the organs of its throat he is exempt from covering up the blood gemara arhaya b abba said in the name of our yohanan rabbi approved of our mayor's view in connection with the law of it and its young and stated it in the mission as the view of the sages and he approved of our simeon's view in connection with the law of covering up the blood and stated it in our mission as the view of the sages what is the reason for our mayor's view with regard to the law of it and its young our joshua b levi answered he derives it by an inference made from the term slaughtering used both here and in connection with the slaughtering of consecrated animals outside the sanctuary as in the latter case a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering so here in connection with it and its young a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering and what is the reason for our simeon's view armani b patish answered he derives it by analogy from the verse and slay the beasts and prepare the meat as their fit. slaughtering rendered the animals fit for food so here the slaughtering must render the animal fit for food why does not our mayor infer it by analogy from and slay the beast one may infer slaughtering from slaughtering but one may not infer slaughtering from slaying but what does this variation matter was it not taught in the school of our ishmael that in the verse and the priest shall come again and the priest shall come in the expression coming again and coming in have the same import for purposes of deduction this variation is of no consequence only where there is no alternative analogy based on identical expressions but where there is an alternative analogy based on identical expressions we must then make the inference from the identical expressions and why does not our simian infer it by analogy from the law of consecrated animals slaughtered outside the sanctuary one may infer by analogy unconsecrated animals from unconsecrated animals but not unconsecrated from consecrated and is this not an objection against our mayor no for does not the law of it and its young apply also to consecrated animals it was on account of this reply that our high b abba said that rabbi approved of our mayor's view in connection with the law of it and its young and stated it in the mission as the view of the sages what is the reason for our mayor's view with regard to the law of covering up the blood our simian like answered he derives it by an inference made from the term for out use both here and in connection with consecrated animals slaughtered outside the sanctuary as in the latter case a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering so here in connection with covering up the blood a slaughtering which does not render fit for food is deemed a slaughtering and is not this against our simian no for it is written that may be eaten and our mayor it serves to exclude unclean birds from the law of covering up the blood and our simian why is it that an unclean bird is excluded because it may not be eaten and a trifle may not be eaten it was on account of this reply that our high b abba said that rabbi approved of our simian's view in connection with the law of covering up the blood and stated it in our mission as the view of the sages our abba said talmud master and be not for all things did our mayor say that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering in dr Mayor would agree that such a slaughtering does not render the animal permitted to be eaten. Similarly, not for all things did our simian say that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is no slaughtering. Indeed, our simian would agree that such a slaughtering renders the animal clean so that it be not nibble. The master stated, not for all things did our mayor say that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering. Indeed, our mayor would agree that such a slaughtering does not render the animal permitted to be eaten. Is not this obvious? Would a trough animal be permitted to be eaten by its slaughtering? It was only necessary to be stated concerning the case where one slaughtered a trough animal and found in its womb a living nine months. Foetus. Now I might have argued since our mayor maintains that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering that the slaughtering of its dam should. Serve for it too, and it should not require slaughtering. He therefore teaches us that it is not so. How could you have thought so? Does not our mayor hold that a living animal extracted out of its slaughtered dams will require slaughtering? This was necessary to be stated since Rabbi agrees with our mayor in one matter and with the rabbis in another. He agrees with our mayor that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is deemed a slaughtering, and he agrees with the rabbis that the slaughtering of its dam renders it permitted. Now, since the rabbis hold that the slaughtering of its dam renders it permitted, then in this case too, where the dam was a trifle, I would say that the slaughtering of the dam should serve for it too, and it should not require slaughtering. He therefore teaches us that it is not so. Not for all things did our simian say that a slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is no slaughtering. Indeed, our simian would agree that such a Slaughtering renders the animal clean so that it be not nibble is not this obvious for Rabjuda reported in the name of Rab others say it was so taught in a very it is written and if there dieth of the beast he that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean that is to say some beasts convey uncleanness and some do not and which are they that do not convey uncleanness they are trifle animals which have been slaughtered it was only necessary to be stated concerning the case where one slaughtered an unconsecrated animal which was a trifle in the temple court for it was taught if one slaughtered a trifle animal or if one slaughtered an animal and it was found to be trifle both being unconsecrated in the temple court our simian permits to derive benefit therefrom but the sages forbid it now I might have argued since our simian holds that one is permitted to derive benefit therefrom that there was no slaughtering at all consequently it is not even rendered clean that it be not Nebula he therefore teaches us that it is not so our papa said to have a is our simian of the opinion that unconsecrated animals slaughtered in the temple court are forbidden biblically he replied yes he is for we have learned our simian says unconsecrated animals which were slaughtered in the temple court must be burned by fire so to a wild animal that was slaughtered in the temple court now if you say that they are forbidden biblically we therefore forbid wild animals on account of cattle but if you say that they are forbidden rabbinically it is indeed difficult for it was not the reason for the rabbis forbidding cattle that one might not fall into the error of eating consecrated food outside the sanctuary this in itself is a precautionary measure shall we come and superimpose a precautionary measure upon a precautionary measure the flax of our high was infested with worms and he came to rabbi for advice rabbi said to him take a bird and slaughter it over the tub of water so that the worms will smell the blood and depart but how was he permitted to do so surely it has been taught if a man slaughtered even though he requires the blood for use he must nevertheless cover it up what then should he do so that he may use the blood he should either stab it or tear away the organs when Ardini came from Palestine he reported that he rabbi said to him Arhai go and make it trip and then slaughter it when Rabin came from Palestine he reported that he said to him go and stab it at the throat why does not he who says that he told him go and make it trip except the other view that he told him go and stab it if you say because he rabbi is of the opinion that by biblical law bird does not require to be slaughtered and therefore stabbing is all the slaughtering that is required but this cannot be for it has been taught rabbi says the verse and thou shalt slaughter as I have commanded thee teaches us that Moses was instructed concerning the Gullet and the windpipe that the greater part of one of these organs in the case of birds and of both organs in the case of cattle is required Talmud, Mostul and Talmud, Mostul and this is a case of it goes without saying it goes without saying that the advice go and stab it is good for in that case there is no slaughtering at all but against the advice go and make it trip one might argue and say that a slaughtering which does not render fit for food is nevertheless deemed a slaughtering consequently its blood must be covered up he therefore teaches us as our high Abba reported above and why does not he who says that rabbi told him go and stab it except the other view that he told him go and make it trip should you say because he rabbi is of the opinion that a slaughtering which does not render fit for food is deemed a slaughtering this cannot be for our high Abba reported in the name of our Yohanan that rabbi approved of our simian's view in connection with the law of covering up the blood and therefore stated it in our mission as the view of the sages this is a case of it goes without saying thus it goes without saying that the advice go and make it trip is good for it slaughtering which does not render the animal fit for food is no slaughtering but against the advice go and stab it one might argue and say that by biblical law bird does not require to be slaughtered and stabbing is all the
Law of it and its young if these slaughtered while others watched them it is forbidden to slaughter after them the young but if they were alone are mayor permits to slaughter after them the young but the rabbis forbid it they agree however that if a person did slaughter after them he has not incurred 40 strikes Gemara as to the rabbis why is it that in the first clause they do not dissent and in the second clause they do because in the first clause if they were to say that the blood must be covered up people might think that the slaughtering was a valid one and would even eat of what they slaughtered and in the second clause too since the rabbis say that it is forbidden to slaughter the young after them people might think that the slaughtering was a valid one and would even eat of what they slaughtered in the second clause people would say that he does not need any meat and in the first clause two people might say that he is covering up the blood only to keep his yard Clean could this be said if he slaughtered on a dunghill or could this be said if he came to ask for a ruling but according to your own argument even in the case of the second clause what would you say if he came to ask for a ruling rather we must say that the rabbis differ with the whole teaching of the mission but they merely waited until our mayor had completely stated his case and then they expressed their dissent now as to the view of the rabbis it is clear that they apply in a case of doubt the stricter rule but what is the reason for our mayor's ruling our Jacob stated in the name of our Yohan and that according to our mayor one would be culpable for eating nibble if one were to eat of their slaughtering wise ITRM I answered because in the majority of cases what they do is bungled our papa said to our who not the son of our Joshua others say our who not the son of our Joshua said to our papa why in the majority of cases the same would be the result if this were so only in a minority of Cases for since our mayor takes into account the minority by adding the minority to the presumption the majority is shaken for we have learned if a child was found by the side of dough with a piece of dough in his hand our mayor declares it clean but the rabbis declare it unclean because it is a child's nature to meddle and we ask what is our mayor's reason and the answer was given he is of the opinion that most children meddle but a minority do not now this dough is presumed to be clean Talmud, Moss. Children be therefore by adding the minority to the presumption the majority is shaken if they said in a case of doubt concerning uncleanness that it is clean will they also say in a case of doubt concerning a prohibition that it is permitted rabbi decided a case according to the view of our mayor and rabbi also decided a case according to the view of the rabbis now which was a later decision come and hear it from the following incident our abba the son of our high abba and our zero were standing. In the open square in Caesarea at the entrance of the Beth Hamidrash RMI came out and found them standing there and said have I not told you that during sessions at the house of study you shall not stand outside there may be someone within who is in difficulty about a matter and there might be a disturbance thereupon our Zara went into the house of study but our Abba did not now inside they were sitting and considering the question which was a later decision our Zara said to them what a pity. You did not let me ask that old man about this he might have heard something about this from his father our high B Abba and his father from our Yohanan for our high B Abba used to revise his study in the presence of our Yohanan every 30 days what has been decided about the matter come and hear it from the message which our Eliezer had sent to the exile rabbi decided in accordance with our mayor now had he not decided according to the rabbis too it must be therefore that this was a later decision. This proves admission if a person slaughtered a hundred wild animals in one place one covering suffices for all if he slaughtered a hundred birds in one place one covering suffices for all if he slaughtered a wild animal and a bird in one place one covering suffices for both our Judah says if he slaughtered a wild animal he should cover up its blood and then slaughter the bird and cover it up also Gemara our rabbis taught the expression wild animal includes all wild animals whether many or few the expression bird includes all birds whether many or few hence they said if a person slaughtered a hundred wild animals in one place one covering suffices for all if he slaughtered a hundred birds in one place one covering suffices for all if he slaughtered a wild animal and a bird in one place one covering suffices for both our Judah says if he slaughtered a wild animal he must first cover up its blood and then slaughter the bird for it is written any wild animal or bird they Replied, but it also says for as to the life of all flesh, the blood thereof is all one with the life thereof. What did they mean by this reply? This is what the rabbis meant is not the particle or required to show disjunction. And our Judah he derives the principle of disjunction from the expression the blood thereof. And the rabbis they say that the expression the blood thereof means the blood of many, as it is written for as to the life of all flesh, the blood thereof is all one with the life. Thereof our Hanan said our Judah agrees that with regard to the benediction, he has only to say one benediction. Rabbi ask our Aha, the son of Rabbi, others say our Aha, the son of Rabbi, ask our Ashi. In what way is this different from the incident concerning Rab's disciples? For our Baron and our Hanan, all the disciples of Rab were sitting at a meal, and our Yebba the elder was waiting on them. They said to him, Let us say the grace after meals, and immediately after they said to him, Pass the cup of wine that we. May drink thereupon our Yebba said to them, Thus said Rab, as soon as a man says, Let us say the grace, it is forbidden to drink wine in this case too, since he must first attend to the covering up of the blood, he is bound to say another benediction Talmud. Mas Chulina, there is no comparison between the two, for there it is impossible to drink and say grace simultaneously, but here it is possible to slaughter with one hand and to cover up the blood with the other. Mishnah, if a person slaughtered and did not cover up the blood, and another person saw it, the other must cover it up. If he covered it up and it became uncovered, he need not cover it up again. If the wind covered it up, he must cover it up again. Gemara, our rabbis taught it is written, He shall pour out and cover it, that is, he who poured out the blood shall cover it up. If he slaughtered and did not cover it, and another person saw it, once do we know that the other person must cover it up? It therefore says, Therefore I said. Unto the children of Israel, this is a warning to all the children of Israel. Another berry the taught he shall pour out and cover it. That is with that with which he poured it out, he shall cover it. He must not cover it with his foot, so that precepts be not treated with contempt by him. Another berry the taught he shall pour out and cover it. That is he who poured it out shall cover it up. It once happened that a person slaughtered, but another anticipated him and covered up the blood and are. Gamaliel condemned the latter to pay ten gold coins. The question was raised: Was this the reward for being deprived of the performance of the commandment, or for being deprived of the benediction? But where would there be any practical difference between these two views in the case of the grace after meals? If you say that it was the reward for being deprived of the performance of the commandment, then here there is also but one commandment. But if you say that it was the reward for being. Deprived of the benediction, then here the reward should be forty gold coins. What is the answer? Then come and hear from the following incident. A certain man once said to Rabbi, He who formed the mountains did not create the wind, and he who created the wind did not form the mountains, for it is written, For lo, he that formeth the mountains and create the wind. He replied, You fool, turn to the end of the verse. The Lord the God of hosts is his name, said the other, Give me three days' time, and I will bring back an answer to you. Rabbi spent those three days in fasting thereafter as he was about to partake of food. He was told there is in waiting at the door. Rabbi exclaimed, Yet they put poison into my food, said he, The men, my master, I bring you good tidings. Your opponent could find no answer, and so threw himself down from the roof and died. He said, Would you dine with me? He replied, Yes, after they had eaten and drunk, he, Rabbi said to him, Will you drink the cup of wine over which the Benedictions of the grace after meals have been said, or would you rather have forty gold coins? He replied, I would rather drink the cup of wine. Thereupon there came forth a heavenly voice and said, The cup of wine over which the benedictions of grace have been said is worth forty gold coins. Our Isaac said, The family of that man is still to be found amongst the notables of Rome and is named the family of Barleyanus. If he covered it up and it became uncovered, he need not cover it up again. Our Aha, the son of Rabbah, said to our Ashi, In what way is this different from the obligation to return lost property? For the master has said, Thou shalt return implies even a hundred times. He replied, In that case, there is no limiting qualification, but here there is written a limiting qualification, namely, and he shall cover it. If the wind covered it up, he must cover it up again. Rabbi Barhanna said, In the name of our Yohan, and this is the rule only if it had become uncovered, but if it had not become. Uncovered he need not cover it up but what should it matter even if it had become uncovered has not the precept suffered a disability our papa answered this proves that the law of disability does not apply to precepts and why is it different from the following which was taught if a person slaughtered and the blood was
the blood but where the blood fell into the water each drop became neutralized as it fell into the water our papa said but it is not so with regard to the law of covering up for the law of disability does not apply to precepts rab judah said in the name of samuel as long as it is of a reddish color it makes atonement it renders susceptible to uncleanness and it must be covered up what does he teach us we have learned it with regard to its validity for atonement and we have also learned it with Regard to the obligation of covering up the statement that it renders susceptible to uncleanness was necessary but even that statement is unnecessary for if it is blood it renders susceptible to uncleanness and if it is water it renders susceptible to uncleanness it was only necessary to be stated for the case where the blood was mixed with rainwater but even in the case of rainwater since it was collected in a vessel and poured into the blood it was surely intended for the purpose it was necessary only in the case where they were mixed without human effort R.C. of Neharbal says it refers to the thin blood R. Jeremiah of Dipti said he incurs the penalty of Kareth but only if there was an olive's bulk in the very it was taught it renders unclean men and vessels that are in the tent but only if there was a quarter log we have learned elsewhere all liquids that issue from a corpse are clean accepting blood as long as it has a reddish color it will render Unclean men and vessels that are in the tent do you say then that the liquids that issue from a corpse are clean but I can point out a contradiction for we have learned the liquids that issue from a tea bullion are like the liquids which he touches Talmud, Mastulin and neither the one nor the other conveys uncleanness as for all others that are unclean whether they suffer light or grave uncleanness the liquids that issue from them are like the liquids they touch both are unclean in the first degree accepting the liquid which is a primary source of uncleanness now what is meant by light or grave uncleanness presumably light uncleanness means that of a dead reptile or of a man that has a flux and grave uncleanness that of a corpse no light uncleanness is that of a reptile and grave uncleanness is that of a man that has a flux and why is it that the liquids that issue from a man that has a flux the rabbis decree to be unclean but the liquids that issue from a corpse the Rabbis did not decree to be unclean the liquids that issue from a man that has a flux since people do not keep away from him the rabbis decree to be unclean but the liquids that issue from a corpse since people keep away from it the rabbis did not decree to be unclean the blood that spurted out and that which is upon the knife etc our rabbis taught the expression and he shall cover it teaches that the blood which spurted out and that which is upon the knife must be covered up are Judah said when is this the case when there is no other blood but that but when there is other blood besides this it need not be covered up another very the taught the expression and he shall cover it teaches that the whole of the blood must be covered up hence they said the blood which spurted out and that which remains about the sides of the throat must also be covered up our Simeon B. Gamaliel said this is so only if he did not cover up the life blood but if he covered up the life blood this Need not be covered wherein do they differ the rabbis maintain that the blood thereof means the whole of its blood our Judah maintains that the blood thereof implies even part of its blood and our Simeon B. Gamaliel maintains that the blood thereof means the vital blood mission with what may one cover up the blood and with what may one not cover it up one may cover it up with fine dung with fine sand with lime with a pot's earth or a brick or an earthenware stopper of a cask that have been ground into powder but one may not cover it up with coarse dung or coarse sand nor with a brick or an earthenware stopper of a cask that have not been ground into powder nor may one turn a vessel over it our Simeon B. Gamaliel laid down the rule one may cover it with anything in which plants would grow but one may not cover it with anything in which plants would not grow tomorrow what is meant by fine sand Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohan and such as the potter does not need to crush some there are who apply the statement to the second clauses, but one may not cover it up with coarse dung or coarse sand. What is meant by coarse sand? Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohan and such as the potter needs to crush. What is the difference between these two versions where it is not absolutely necessary to crush it as it crumbles with the hand our rabbis taught and he shall cover it? I would have thought that he may cover it with stones or turn a vessel over it. The verse. Therefore adds with dust and I only know dust whence would I know to include fine dung, fine sand, crushed stones, crushed pots, herds, fine scraps of flax, tall wood, moss, tool, and be fine sawdust, lime, or a pots, herd, or a brick, or an earthenware stopper of a cask that have been ground into powder. The text therefore says and he shall cover it. Then I might also include even coarse dung, coarse sand, crushed metal vessels, or a brick or stopper that have not been ground into powder or flour bran or coarse. Brand the text therefore says with dust and why do you prefer to include the one and exclude the other since the verse includes some and excludes others I include those that are a kind of dust and exclude those that are not a kind of dust perhaps I should argue thus and he shall cover it is a general proposition dust is a specified particular we thus have a general proposition followed by a specified particular in which case the scope of the proposition is limited by the particular specified. That is dust only but nothing else Armari replied here it is a general proposition complemented by a specified particular and a general proposition complemented by a specified particular is not to be interpreted by the same rule as a general proposition followed by a specified particular Arnam and son of Arhis expounded one may only cover up the blood with that which if sown would produce growth Robert remarked this is an absurdity said Arnam and B. Isaac to Robert wherein lies its absurdity told it him and L derived it from the following very day if a person was traveling through a desert and can find no dust wherewith to cover up the blood he may grind a golden denar to powder and cover it up there with if a person was traveling on a ship and has no dust wherewith to cover up the blood he may burn his garment and cover up with the ashes thereof now this is clear concerning the burning of a garment and covering up therewith for we find that ashes are referred to as dust but whence do we know this of a golden denar our Zara answered it is written it hath dust of gold our rabbis taught one may cover up the blood only with dust so Beth Shammai but Beth Hillel say we find ashes referred to as dust for it is written and for the unclean they shall take of the dust of the burning of the purification from sin Beth Shammai however say it as ashes might be referred to as the dust of the burning but it is never referred to as dust simply attended taught to these they Added gold dust to be stone dust some add even orpiment Rabbah said as a reward for our father Abraham having said I am but dust and ashes his descendants were worthy to receive two commandments the ashes of the red cow and the dust used in the ceremony of a woman suspected of adultery why does he not reckon also the dust used for the covering up of the blood because that is only the perfection of the commandment but it is of no advantage to the performer Rabbah also said as a reward for our father Abraham having said Talmud Mastulin I will not take a thread or a shoe strap his descendants were worthy to receive two commandments the thread of blue and the strap of the tefillin now as for the strap of the tefillin the blessing bestowed on its account is clear for it is written and all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of the Lord is called upon thee and they shall be afraid of thee and it has been taught our Eliezer the Great says this refers to the Tefillin worn upon the head but what is the blessing bestowed on account of the thread of blue it has been taught our Meir says why is blue singled out from all the varieties of colors because blue resembles the color of the sea and the sea resembles the color of the sky and the sky resembles the color of a sapphire and a sapphire resembles the color of the throne of glory as it is said and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone. And it is also written the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone our Abba said grave indeed is theft that has been consumed for even the perfect righteous cannot make amends for it as it is said save only that which the young men have eaten our Yohan and said in the name of our Eliezer son of our Simeon wherever you find the words of our Eliezer the son of our Jose the Galilean and in Agata make your ear like a funnel for he said it is written it was not because you were greater than. Any people that the Lord set his love upon you and shows you the Holy One, blessed be he said to Israel, I love you, because even when I bestow greatness upon you, you humble yourselves before me, I bestowed greatness upon Abraham, yet he said to me, I am but dust and ashes upon Moses and Aaron, yet they said, and we are nothing upon David, yet he said, but I am a worm and no man, but with the heathens it is not so, I bestowed greatness upon Nimrod, and he said, come let us build us a city upon Pharaoh, and he said, who is the Lord upon Sennacherib, and he said, who are they among all the gods of the countries upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds upon Hiram, king of Tyre, and he said
For all uses CEIRI answered it can only refer to the earth of its soil for the verse and thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the broad place thereof and shalt burn with fire applies only to that which requires to be gathered and burned but that which requires to be dug up and then gathered and burned is excluded Rabba said the performance of precepts is not accounted as a personal benefit Rabba was sitting and reciting the above statement of Rabba whereupon are we Raised this objection against Rabba it was taught a man may not blow on the new year a shofar which has been used for idolatry's purposes now presumably if he did blow it he will not have fulfilled his obligation no if he did blow it he has fulfilled his obligation a man may not take on the festival alalab which has been used for idolatry's purposes presumably if he did take it he will not have fulfilled his obligation no if he did take it he has fulfilled his obligation but it has been taught if he sounded it he has not fulfilled his obligation if he took it he has not fulfilled his obligation Rashi answered there is no comparison at all dear Talmud, Mastulan be Talmud, Mastulan be a minimum size is prescribed and since it has been used for idolatry it is regarded as though the size were diminished whereas here the more broken up it is the better it is for covering up chaptervii -E mission the prohibition of the sciatic nerve is enforced both within the holy land and outside it both during the existence of the temple and after it in respect of both unconsecrated and consecrated animals it applies to cattle and to wild animals to the right and left it but it does not apply to birds because they have no spoon shaped hip it also applies to a photos our Judah says it does not apply to a photos and its fat is permitted butchers are not trustworthy with regard to the removal of the sciatic nerve so our Meir the sages say they are trustworthy with regard to it as well as with regard to the forbidden fat gemara in respect of consecrated animals but is not this obvious surely because one consecrated the animal the prohibition of the nerve has not thereby vanished and if you were to say that our tana is of the opinion that nerves impart a taste to the meat and he teaches us that the prohibition of a consecrated animal can be superimposed upon the prohibition of the nerve and the tana should have said the prohibition of eating consecrated meat applies to the nerve too rather we must say that he is of the opinion that nerves do not impart a taste and he thus teaches us that in regard to the sciatic nerve of a consecrated animal there is only the prohibition of the nerve but not the prohibition of consecrated things but does our tana hold that nerves do not impart a taste surely we have learned if a thigh was cooked together with the sciatic nerve it is forbidden if it imparts a taste into the thigh Rather we must suppose that he is dealing with the young of consecrated animals and he is of the opinion that it sc the prohibition of the sciatic nerve applies to a photos and also that the young of a consecrated animal is holy even when in its dam's womb accordingly the prohibition of the nerve and the prohibition of consecrated things come into force simultaneously but how can you suggest that the mission is dealing with the photos surely since in a subsequent clause it says it also applies to a photos it is obvious that the first clause is not dealing with the photos this is what he means this is indeed a matter of dispute between Arjuna and the rabbis but how can you say that both prohibitions come into force simultaneously surely we have learned by reason of uncleanness contracted from the following sources the Nazirite must shave his head a corpse and olives bulk of the flesh of a corpse etc now the question was asked if he must shave his head on account of an olives bulk of the flesh of the corpse then surely he must shave his head for the whole corpse and our Yohanan answered that it was necessary to mention the corpse itself only for the case of an abortion whose limbs were not yet knit together by nerves Talmud, Mastulin hence it is possible for the prohibition of consecrated things to come into force first notwithstanding that the prohibition of consecrated things comes into force first the prohibition of the nerve can be superimposed upon if for its prohibition is binding even upon the sons of Noah whom did you hear maintain this view our Judah is it not but our mission cannot be in agreement with our Judah for it reads it applies to cattle and to wild animals to the right and left if this tana of our mission agrees with him our Judah on one point and disagrees on the other point but perhaps you heard our Judah apply this argument only to the case of an unclean animal since it is forbidden by prohibition only but have you heard him apply it also to consecrated things for which there is a penalty of Kareth rather it must be that we are dealing with the case of the firstling which is consecrated only when it comes forth out of the womb alternatively you may say that the young of consecrated animals are themselves consecrated only when they come into being our high be Joseph said they taught this only concerning consecrated animals that may be eaten but with regard to consecrated animals that are not eaten the prohibition of the nerve does not apply but our Yohanan said the prohibition of the nerve applies both to consecrated animals that may be eaten and to those that are not eaten said our Papa there is really no dispute between them for the one refers to the question of stripes whereas the other refers to the question of offering it others report our Papa's statement thus there is really no dispute between them for the one refers to the removal thereof whereas the other refers to the offering up of it our B. Isaac said they disagree about offering it up for it was taught and the priest shall burn the whole upon the altar this includes bones nerves horns and hoofs I might think that it is so even if they were severed the text therefore states and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood but since it is written the flesh and the blood I might think that one must first cut away the nerves and bones and then offer the flesh upon the altar it is therefore written and the priest shall burn the whole upon the altar how are these verses to be reconciled if they are still attached to the limb they may be offered up if they are severed even if they are already on the top of the altar they must come down now which tana have you heard say that if they were severed and offered up they must come down it is rabbi for it has been taught and the priest shall burn the whole this includes bones nerves horns and hoofs even if they are severed and how do I explain the verse and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood with reference to those portions which have jumped off the altar thus only half burnt flesh you may replace if it had jumped off the altar but you may not replace half burnt nerves and bones rabbi says one verse reads and the priest shall burn the whole which includes everything whilst another verse reads and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood which excludes everything else how are the verses to be reconciled thus if they are still attached to the limb they may be offered up if they are severed even if they are on the top of the altar they must come down and the rabbis they maintain that when they are still attached to the limb no verse is necessary to include them for they are on the same footing as the head of the burnt offering consequently the verse is only necessary to include them when severed and rabbi he says as regards the permitted parts which are still attached to the limb I admit that Talmud, Mastulin be Talmud, Mastulin be no verse is necessary to include them but a verse is necessary to include the forbidden sciatic nerve when still attached to the thigh and the rabbis they say it is written from the liquor of Israel that is from that which is permitted to Israel and rabbi he says it is on the same footing as the forbidden fat and blood and the rabbis they say these are on a different footing since with regard to these there is an express command Arhuna said the sciatic nerve of a burnt offering must be cut away and thrown onto the ash heap said to him Arhista O master of this teaching is it written therefore the altar shall not consume it is written therefore the children of Israel do not eat and Arhuna he maintains it is written from the liquor of Israel that is from that which is permitted to Israel an objection was raised from the following the sciatic nerve of a peace offering must be swept into the Channel that of a burnt offering must be offered up. Presumably, this means it must be offered up and burnt. No, it means it must be offered up and then cut away. But if he must cut it away, why is it necessary to offer it up? Because it is written present it now unto thy governor. There was taught a very the which supports Arhunab is the sciatic nerve of a peace offering must be swept into the channel, and that of a burnt offering must be cut away and thrown onto the ash heap. We have learned there. There was an ash heap in the middle of the altar, and sometimes there were on it about three hundred core of ashes. Said Rabbah, it is an exaggeration. They gave the lamb which was to be the daily offering to drink from a cup of gold. Said Rabbah, it is an exaggeration. RMI said the Torah, the prophets, and the sages sometimes spoke in exaggerated terms. The sages spoke in exaggerated terms, as in the cases we have just quoted. The Torah spoke in exaggerated terms, as in the verse the cities are great and. Fortified up to heaven the prophets spoke in exaggerated terms as in the verse so that the earth rent with the sound of them or Isaac bin Amani said in the name of Samuel in three places the sages spoke in exaggerated terms namely about the ash heap the vine and the curtain about the ash heap as we have quoted above about the vine we have learned the golden vine
must be burnt on the sixteenth day and we argued upon it as follows what nerves are meant if you say the nerves in the flesh then why does he not eat them and if they happen to be left over then they came under the heading of flesh that was left over and if you say the nerves of the throat but surely since they are not like flesh he may throw them away and our histah suggested it can only refer to the sciatic nerve and the tan adopts the view of our Judah who said that it only applies to the one hit now if you say that he was in doubt about it as well but if you say that he was certain about it then he should eat the permitted one and throw away the forbidden one rikb hanada said indeed i maintain that he was certain about it but here we must suppose that they were first distinguished but subsequently were mixed up talmud mastulin ar ashi said it can only refer to the fat thereof for it was taught the fat thereof is permitted but israel being a holy people have treated it is forbidden Rabbanah said it can only be explained according to the statement of Rab Judah in the name of Samuel for Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel it consists of two nerves the inner next the bone is forbidden and one is liable on account of it the other next to the flesh is forbidden but one is not liable on account of it come and here if a person ate an olive's bulk of the sciatic nerve of this thigh and another olive's bulk of the sciatic nerve of the other thigh he has incurred 80 stripes our Judah says he has only incurred 40 stripes now if you say that he was certain about it then it is well but if you say that he was in doubt about it then the warning with regard to each was dubious and we have heard that according to our Judah dubious warning is no warning for it was taught if he struck one and then struck the other or if he cursed one and then cursed the other or if he struck them both simultaneously or if he cursed them both simultaneously he is Liable to the death penalty, our Judah says if simultaneously he is liable, if one after the other he is not liable, this Tana who expressed the view of our Judah is in agreement with that other Tana who declares also in the name of our Judah that a dubious warning is a warning for it was taught and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Scripture here came and provided a positive precept as a remedy for the disregarded prohibition to indicate that the prohibition is not punishable by stripes. So our Judah, our Jacob says this is not the reason for it, but because it is a prohibition which involves no action in the contravention thereof, and any prohibition which involves no action in the contravention thereof is not punishable by stripes. Come and here if a person ate two sciatic nerves from two thighs of two animals, he has incurred eighty stripes. Our Judah says he has only incurred forty stripes now. Since it says from two thighs of two animals, it is obvious that the prohibited one of each is intended, and the case was necessary to be stated in order to set forth our Judah's view. It follows therefore that he was certain about it. This stands proved. But if he or Judah was certain about it, why does he incur forty stripes and no more? Surely he should incur eighty. We must suppose here that in one alone there was not as much as an olive's bulk as it has been taught. If a person ate it and the whole of it was not as much as an olive's bulk, he is nevertheless liable to stripes. Our Judah says he is not liable unless there is as much as an olive's bulk of it. And what is the reason? Rabbi said the verse says the thigh. This implies the right thigh, and the rabbis they would say that verse indicates that the prohibited nerve is the one that is spread over the whole of the thigh, namely the inner one, but not the outer one. Our Joshua believe I said the reason is this. The verse says as he wrestled with him which suggests as when a person locks another in his arms and his right hand reaches the hollow of that other's right thigh our Samuel Binaman he said he appeared to him as a heathen and the master has said if an Israelite is joined by a heathen on the way he should let him walk on his right our Samuel Biaha said in the name of Rabbi Biola in the presence of our Papa he appeared to him as one of the wise and the master has said whosoever walks at the right hand of his teacher is uncultured and the rabbis they say he the angel came from behind and dislocated both thighs and how do these rabbis interpret the verse as he wrestled with him they interpret it as in the other statement of our Joshua B. Levi for our Joshua B. Levi said this verse teaches that they threw up the dust of their feet to the throne of glory for it is written here as he wrestled be with him and it is written there and the clouds are the dust of back of his feet our Joshua B. Levi also said why is it the sciatic nerve called Gidhanasha because it slipped away Nasha from its place and rose up for so it is said their strength has slipped away they are become as women are Hosea B. Our Hannah said what is the meaning of the verse the Lord sent a word unto Jacob and it hath lighted upon Israel the Lord sent a word unto Jacob that is the injury to the sciatic nerve and it hath lighted upon Israel for the prohibition thereof has spread throughout Israel our Hosea B. Our Hannah also said what is the meaning of the verse and slaughter the animals and prepare the meat and slaughter the animals that is uncovered for them the place that has been slaughtered and prepare the meat that is removed the sciatic nerve in their presence this is in accordance with the view that the sciatic nerve was prohibited to the sons of Noah and Jacob was left alone said our Eliezer he remained behind for the sake of some small jars hence it is learned that to the righteous their money is dearer than their Body and why is this because they do not stretch out their hands to robbery and they wrestle the man with him until the breaking of the day said our Isaac hence it is learned that a scholar should not go out alone at night our Abu Bikahana said you can derive it from the verse Talmud, Mosul and be behold he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor our Abab said you can derive it from the verse and Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass the rabbi say you can derive it from the verse go now see whether it is well with thy brethren and well with the flock rab says you can derive it from the verse and the sun rose upon him our Akiba said I once asked Argamaliel and our Joshua in the meat market of Emmaus where they had gone to buy a beast for the wedding feast of Argamaliel's son it is written and the sun rose upon him did the sun rise upon him only did it not rise upon the whole world our Isaac said it means that the sun which had set for his sake now rose for him for it is written and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran and it is further written and he lighted upon the place when he reached Haran he said to himself shall I have passed through the place where my fathers prayed and not have prayed to he immediately resolved to return but no sooner had he thought of this than the earth contracted and he immediately lighted upon the place after he prayed he wished to return to where he was but the Holy One blessed be he said this righteous man has come to my habitation shall he depart without a night's rest there upon the sunset it is written and he took up the stones of the place but it is also written and he took the stone our Isaac said this tells us that all the stones gathered themselves together into one place and each one said upon me shall this righteous man rest his head there upon all the stones and Tanatot were merged into one and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth eight Tanatot what was the width of the ladder eight thousand parts for it is written and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it at least two were ascending and two descending and when they met each other on the ladder there were four and of an angel it is written his body was like the Tarsish and we have a tradition that the Tarsish is two thousand parts ang's long attended taught they ascended to look at the image above and descended to look at the image below they wished to hurt him when behold the Lord stood beside him our Simeon Belakish said were it not expressly stated in the scripture we would not dare to say it God is made to appear like a man who is fanning his son the land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed what is the greatness of the set our Isaac this teaches us that the Holy One blessed be he rolled up the whole of the land of Israel and put it under our father Jacob to indicate to him that it would be very easily conquered by his Descendants and he said, Let me go for the daybreak. Jacob said to him, Are you a thief or a rogue that you are afraid of the morning? He replied, I am an angel, and from the day that I was created, my time to sing praises to the Lord had not come until now. This supports the statement of our Hanel in the name of Rab for our Hanel said in the name of Rab three divisions of ministering angels sing praises to the Lord daily. One proclaims holy, the other proclaims holy, and the third proclaims. Holy is the Lord of hosts, an objection was raised. Israel are dearer to the Holy One, blessed be he than the ministering angels for Israel sing praises to the Lord every hour, whereas the ministering angels sing praises but once a day, others say once a week, and others say once a month, and others say once a year, and others say once in seven years, and others say once in a jubilee, and others say once in eternity, and whereas Israel mentioned the name of God after two words, as it is said here, Israel did. Lord etc. The ministering angels only mention the name of God after three words as it is written Holy 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 the Lord of hosts moreover the ministering angels do not begin to sing praises in heaven until Israel have sung below on
In the land of Israel and one is here and the rabbi set their eyes upon Rabbi Akbah and Rabbi Nehemiah the sons of Rab's daughter Rabbi said these are the three princes of the nations who plead in Israel's favor in every generation it was taught our Elizer says the vine is the world the three branches are the patriarchs Abraham Isaac and Jacob and as it was budding its blossoms shot forth these are the matriarchs add the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes these are the tribes. Thereupon our Joshua said to him is a man shown in a dream what has happened surely he is only shown what is to happen therefore I say the vine is the Torah the three branches are Moses Aaron and Miriam and as it was budding its blossoms shot forth these are the members of the Sanhedrin and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes are the righteous people of every generation our Gamaliel said we still stand in need of the Modiah for he explains the verse as referring to one place for our Eliezer the Modiah says the vine is Jerusalem the three branches are the temple the king and the high priest and as it was budding its blossoms shot forth these are the young priests and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes these are the drink offerings our Joshua B. Levi interprets it in regard to the gifts bestowed by God upon Israel for our Joshua B. Levi said the vine is the Torah the three branches are the well the pillar of smoke and the manna and as it was budding its blossoms Shot forth these are the first fruits and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes these are the drink offerings are Jeremiah B. Abba said the vine is Israel for so it is written out its pluck up the vine out of Egypt the three branches are the three festivals on which Israel go up to the temple every year and as it was budding the time is come for Israel to be fruitful and to multiply for so it is written and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly its blossoms shot forth the time is come for Israel to be redeemed for so it is written and their lifeblood is dashed against my garments and I have stained all my raiment and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes the time is come for Egypt to drink the cup of staggering and this is in accordance with what Rabbah had said why are three cups mentioned in connection with Egypt one refers to the cup which she drank in the days of Moses the other to that which she drank in the days of Pharaoh and the Third to that which she is destined to drink together with all the nations our Abba said to our Jeremiah B. Abba when Rabbi expounded this verse in an Agatic lecture he expounded it as you have done our Simeon B. Lakish said this people Israel is like unto a vine its branches are the aristocracy its clusters the scholars its leaves the common people its twigs those in Israel that are void of learning this is what was meant when word was sent from their Palestine let the clusters pray for the leaves for were it not for the leaves the clusters could not exist so I bought her W. A. Akrahashimi for fifteen pieces of silver and a homer of barley and a half homer of barley said are you in the name of our Simeon B. Jehoshadak the word Kira must mean buying for so it is written in my grave which I bought Karatai for me for fifteen that is the fifteenth day of Nisan when Israel was redeemed out of Egypt pieces of silver these are the righteous for so it is written he has taken the bag of Silver with him and a homer of barley and a half homer of barley these are the forty-five righteous men on account of whom the world continues to exist but I know not whether thirty of them are here in Babylon and fifteen in the land of Israel or thirty in the land of Israel and fifteen here in Babylon but when the verse says and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them into the treasury in the house of the Lord I know that thirty righteous men are in the land of Israel and fifteen here said Abbe most of them are to be found in the synagogue under the side chamber and I said to them if you think good give me my hire and if not forbear so they wait out for my hire thirty pieces of silver said Rab Judah these are the thirty righteous men among the nations of the world by whose virtue the nations of the world continue to exist Allah said these are the thirty commandments which the sons of Noah took upon themselves but they observe three of them namely Talmud, Mas. Chulin B.I. They do not draw up a Ketuba document for males too. They do not weigh flesh of the dead in the market. And three, they respect the Torah. It does not apply to birds because they have no spoon shaped hip, but we see that they have it. They have it indeed, but it is not convex. Our Jeremiah raised the question what if a bird happened to have it convex or if an animal happened to have it flat and not convex? Do we consider the particular creature by itself or do we consider the class to which it belongs? It is undecided. It also applies to a photos. Samuel said the ruling its fat is permitted is agreed to by all. What fat should you say that of a photos? But this is a matter of dispute for it has been taught it applies to a photos and its fat is forbidden. So our Meir says it does not apply to a photos and its fat is permitted. And our Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai they differ in the case of a nine month fetus which was extracted alive from its dams. Um, Therefore ruling according to his principle and our Judah according to his end should you say the fat of the nerve but there too there is a dispute about it for it has been taught as to the sciatic nerve one must follow it up as far as it goes and must cut away the fat thereof at its source so our Meir our Judah says one merely cuts it away from off the cap of the bone in truth it refers to the fat of the nerve Samuel however agrees that according to our Meir it is forbidden by rabbinic decree for it has been taught its fat is permitted but Israel being a holy people have regarded it as forbidden and presumably the author of this barrier is our Meir who maintains that by the law of the Torah it is permitted but is forbidden by rabbinic decree but once this perhaps it is our Judah but according to our Meir it is forbidden even by the law of the Torah you cannot think of this for it has been taught as to the sciatic nerve one must follow it up as far as it goes and its fat is permitted now whom have you heard say that it is necessary to follow it up our Meir and here it expressly says its fat is permitted our Isaac B. Samuel B. Martha said in the name of Rab the Torah forbade only the branch nerves of Ibola said although it is like wood the Torah makes one liable for it Abbe said the view of Ola is the more probable for our she's hate said in the name of R.C. the veins in fat are forbidden but one is not liable to the penalty of Karath on account of them it is evident therefore that the divine law forbade the fat but not the veins likewise the divine law forbade the nerve but not the branch nerves to turn to the main text R.C. said in the name of R.C. the veins in fat are forbidden but one is not liable on account of them the veins in the kidney are forbidden but one is not liable on account of them as to the white substance of the kidney there is a difference of opinion between Rabbi and our high one forbids it and the other permits it Rabbi used to scrape it all away our Yohanan also used to scrape it all away R.C. used to cut away only the surface thereof Abbe said the view of R.C. is the more probable for our Abbe said in the name of Rab Judah on the authority of Samuel Talmud Mastulin a fat that is covered with flesh is permitted it is evident therefore that the divine law spoke of that which is upon the loins and not of that which is in the loins likewise here the divine law spoke of that which is above the kidneys and not of that which is in the kidneys to revert to the above text our Abbe said in the name of Rab Judah on the authority of Samuel fat that is covered with flesh is permitted but this cannot be for has not our Abbe also said in the name of Rab Judah on the authority of Samuel that the fat which is under the loins is forbidden Abbe answered an animal whilst alive has its limbs dislocated even as our Yohanan said I am no butcher nor the son of a butcher but I remember the statement that was generally quoted in the Beth Hamidrash, an animal whilst alive has its limbs dislocated, our Abba said in the name of Rab Judah who said it in the name of Samuel, the fat which is upon the Omesum and Reticulum is forbidden and one is liable to the penalty of Karath on account of it. This is the fat that is upon the inwards, our Abba further said in the name of Rab Judah who said it in the name of Samuel, the fat which is upon the innominate bone is forbidden and one is liable to the penalty of Karath on account of it. This is the fat which is upon the loins, our Abba also said in the name of Rab Judah who said it in the name of Samuel, the small things in the forelimb are forbidden, said our Safra, you Moses does the divine law forbid the eating of meat, Rabba replied, you Moses does the divine law allow the eating of blood, but if it the forelimb was cut and salted, it may even be cooked in a pot, Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, the fat upon the first cubit of the intestines must be scraped away, this is the Fat upon the intestines, Rab Judah said the veins in the rump are forbidden. There are five veins in the loins, three on the right side and two on the left. Each one of the three veins branches into two, and each one of the two veins branches into three. The practical importance of this is that if one removes them while the flesh is still warm, they will slip out easily. Otherwise, one must follow them up to this number. Abbe others say Rab Judah said there are
On account of it, the membrane which is upon the kidney is forbidden, but one is not liable on account of it, but it has been taught one is liable on account of it with regard to the spleen. There is no contradiction because the latter ruling refers to the fat which is at the top and the former to that which is not at the top, and with regard to the kidney, there is no contradiction because the latter ruling refers to the upper membrane and the former to the lower membrane as to crushed testicles. There is a dispute between RMI and RC, one forbids them and the other permits them. He who forbids them argues thus Talmud, Mostel and B, since they will never recover, they are to be considered as a limb torn loose from the living animal, and he who permits them argues thus since they do not rot, there is obviously vitality in them, and the former he maintains that they do not rot only because the outside air does not penetrate into them, and the latter he maintains that they do not. Recover only because emaciation has set in our Yohan and said to our shaman B. Abba crushed testicles are permitted but you must not eat them for it is written forsake not the teaching of thy mother Marsan of our Ashi said the testicles of a kid that is not yet 30 days old are permitted without having to peel off the membrane thereafter if they contain semen they are forbidden if they do not contain semen they are permitted how does one know this if there are red streaks in the membrane they are forbidden I, if there are no red streaks they are permitted as to dark red meat testicles and the arteries of the neck there is a dispute between Araha and Rubina in any law of the Torah whenever there is a dispute between them Rubina always adopts the lenient view and Araha the strict view and the law is always in accordance with Rubina's view thus tending towards leniency excepting in these three cases where Araha adopts the lenient view and Rubina the strict view and the law is in Accordance with our Ahas view and thus tending towards leniency as to dark red meat if it was cut up and salted it is even permitted to be cooked in a pot if it was thrust on a spit and held over the fire the blood would easily flow out if it was placed on the coals in this there is a dispute between our Aha and Rubina one says that they the coals would draw out the blood and the other says that they would cause the meat to contract the same rules apply to the testicles and also to the arteries of the neck if a head was put on hot ashes and it was made to stand up upon the open cut of the neck the blood would then flow out and it is permitted if it was placed upon its side the blood would become clotted and it is forbidden if it was made to stand up upon its nostrils and something was thrust into them it is permitted otherwise it is forbidden some there are who say if it was made to stand up upon its nostrils or upon the cut of the neck the blood would flow out if it was Placed upon its side and it was pierced with something it is permitted otherwise it is forbidden to revert to the above text Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel it consists of two nerves the inner next to the bone is forbidden and one is liable on account of it the outer next to the flesh is forbidden but one is not liable on account of it but it was taught that the inner is nearer the flesh Araha explained in the name of Arkahana that is so further on where it is embedded in the flesh. But it was taught that the outer is nearer the bone Rab Judah answered that is so only at the part where the butchers cut it open it was stated if a butcher was found to have overlooked forbidden fat even only as much as a barley grain says Rab Judah he is punishable Aryohan and says only if he overlooked as much as an olive's bulk our Papa said they do not disagree for here it is a question of punishing him with stripes and there of removing him Marzitra said if there was found as much. As a barley grain in one place or as much as an olive's bulk scattered in two or three places he is punishable the law is in order to punish him with stripes he must have overlooked as much as an olive's bulk and in order to remove him even if he overlooked only as much as a barley grain butchers are not trustworthy etc. Our high Abba said in the name of our Yohan and later they held that they were to be trusted our nom and exclaimed have the generations become more virtuous at first they did. Sages held the view of our Meir and so they were not to be trusted but later they held the view of our Jude others report this with reference to the last clause the sages say they are trustworthy with regard to it as well as with regard to the forbidden fat our high Abba said in the name of our Yohan and later they held that they were not to be trusted our nom and said today they are to be trusted have the generations then become more virtuous at first they the sages held the view of our Judah and Later they held the view of our Meir and as long as people still remembered the view of our Judah they were not to be trusted but now that our Judah's view has been forgotten they are to be trusted as well as with regard to the forbidden fat but who has mentioned the forbidden fat at all this is what he our Meir said they are not trustworthy with regard to it nor with regard to the forbidden fat but the sages say they are trustworthy with regard to it as well as with regard to the forbidden fat. Mishnah one may send to a Gentile a thigh in which there is yet the sciatic nerve because its place is known Gemara only a whole thigh one may send but not if it was cut up but what are the circumstances if we are speaking of a place where they do not proclaim it Talmud, Mosul and then one should be allowed to send it even though it was cut up for no Jew would buy it from him and if we are speaking of a place where they do proclaim it then one should not be allowed to send even Entire thigh for he the Gentile will cut it up and sell it if you wish I can say that it is a place where they do proclaim it and if you wish I can say that it is a place where they do not proclaim it if you wish I can say that it is a place where they do proclaim it and yet there is nothing to fear because the cutting up of the thigh by a Gentile is recognizable and if you wish I can say that it is a place where they do not proclaim it and yet it is forbidden to send a portion lest he should give it to the Gentile in the presence of another Israelite alternatively I can say it is forbidden because he thereby deceives him and Samuel holds that it is forbidden to deceive people even Gentiles this view of Samuel was not expressly stated but was inferred from the following incident Samuel was once crossing on a ferry boat and he said to his attendant reward the ferryman he rewarded him but Samuel became angry why was he angry Abbe said because he the attendant had a Trifahan and he gave it to the ferryman representing it as one that was ritually slaughtered Rabbah said because he Samuel told him to give him the Gentile and take it to drink and he gave him mixed wine to drink and what if it was only inferred because according to him who says that he gave him a trifahan it can be said that Samuel was angry with his attendant for keeping with him a forbidden thing and according to him who says that he told him to give him and take it can be said that Samuel was angry because and really means unmixed wine it was taught our mayor used to say a man should not urge his friend to dine with him when he knows that his friend will not do so and he should not offer him many gifts when he knows that his friend will not accept them and he should not open for a guest casks of wine which are to be sold by the shopkeeper unless he informs the guest of it and he should not invite him to anoint himself with oil if the jar is empty if however the Purpose is to show the guest great respect it is permitted but surely this cannot be right for Ola once came to Rab Judah's house and the latter opened up for him casks that were later to be sold by the shopkeeper he must have informed him of this fact or if you wish I can say that the case of Ola is different for he was so dear to Rab Judah that he would have opened for him even those that were not to be sold by the shopkeeper our rabbis taught a man should not go to the house of a mourner with a bottle in which the wine shakes about neither should he fill it with water because he thereby deceives him if however there is a large assembly present it is permitted our rabbis taught a man should not sell to his neighbor shoes made of the hide of an animal which died representing them as made of the hide of a living animal which was slaughtered for two reasons first because he is deceiving him and secondly because of the danger a man should not send to his neighbor a Barrel of wine with oil floating at the mouth of it. It once happened that a man sent his friend a barrel of wine, and there was oil floating at the mouth of the barrel. He went and invited some guests to partake of it. When they came and he found that it was only wine, he went and hanged himself. The guest may not give from what is set before them to the son or daughter of the host unless they have the host's permission to do so. It once happened that a man in a time of scarcity invited three guests to his house, and he only had three eggs to set before them. When the child of the host entered, one of the guests took his portion and gave it to him. The second guest did likewise, and so did the third. When the father of the child came and saw him stuffing one egg in his mouth and holding two in his hands, he enraged, knocked him to the ground so that he died. When the child's mother saw this, she went up to the roof and threw herself down, and died. He too went up to the roof and threw himself down. And died our Eliezer B. Jacob said because of this three souls in Israel perish what does he our Eliezer B. Jacob tell us it means that the whole story was related by our Eliezer B. Jacob our rabbis taught if a man sends to his friend a whole thigh he need not remove beforehand the sciatic nerve if he sends it cut up he must remove beforehand the sciatic nerve to a gentile however whether he sends it
because they might sell him meat of anibla or truff animal. Now, if as you say it is a place where they do proclaim it, then surely if there happened to truff, it would have been proclaimed. Obviously, then we are dealing with the place where they do not proclaim it, so that the position is the first and last clauses deal with the place where they do not proclaim it, whilst the middle clause deals with the place where they do proclaim it. Abay answered, it is so the first and last clauses deal with a place where they do not proclaim it, but the middle clause deals with the place where they do proclaim it. Rob answered, the whole barrier deals with the place where they do proclaim it, and in the first and last clauses, the case was that a proclamation had been made this day, but in the middle clause, the case was that no proclamation had been made. Arashi answered, the whole barrier deals with the place where they do not proclaim it, but the ruling in the middle clause is merely a precautionary. Measure lest he sell it to the Gentile in the presence of another Israelite. What is the form of the proclamation? Our Isaac B. Joseph said, Meat has fallen into our hands for the army, and why not proclaim Trophimeat has fallen into our hands for the army? They would not then buy it, or are we not then deceiving them? No, they are deceiving themselves, as in the following incident. Marzitra, the son of Arnaman, was once going from Sakara to Mahuza while Rabbah and Arsafra were going to Sakara, and they met. On the way, believing that they had come to meet him, he said, Why did the rabbis take this trouble to come so far to meet me? Arsafra replied, We did not know that the master was coming. Had we known of it, we should have put ourselves out more than this. Rabbah said to him, Why did you tell him this? You have now upset him. He replied, But we would be deceiving him otherwise. No, he would be deceiving himself. A butcher once said to his fellow Talmud, Mastulin, if only you had been on good terms with. Me, I would have given you a portion of the fat ox which I had prepared yesterday. He replied, I did eat of the choicest meat. Where did you get it? Asked the other, that Gentile who bought the animal from you gave me a portion. He replied, said the other, I did indeed prepare two, but that one became Trufa. Said, Rabbi, are we to prohibit all the meat stalls today because of that fool who acted improperly? Rabbi, here is consistent with his principle, for he said, Where the meat stalls kept by Gentiles are supplied with meat by Israelite butchers. Any meat found in the possession of the Gentile is permitted. Some there are who give this version. Rabbi said, Are we to prohibit all the meat stalls because of that fool who wanted to annoy his fellow? Now the only reason is because he wanted to annoy his fellow, but where there was no such intention, all the meat stalls would be forbidden. Surely it was taught, Rabbi says, Where the meat stalls kept by Gentiles are supplied with meat by. Israelite butchers any meat found in the possession of the Gentile is permitted here it is different for the forbidden meat is clearly established Rab said meat which had disappeared from sight is forbidden an objection was raised Rabbi says where the meat stalls kept by Gentiles are supplied with meat by Israelite butchers any meat found in the possession of the Gentile is permitted it is different where it is found in the possession of the Gentile come and here if there were nine meat shops all of them selling ritually slaughtered meat and one shop selling carrion and a man bought meat from one of them but he does not know from which of them he bought it is forbidden because of the doubt but if meat was found one goes after the majority here too we must suppose that it was found in the hand of a Gentile come and here we have learned if one found raw meat in the city one must determine the meat according to the majority of butchers if it was cooked meat one must Determine it according to the majority of the people that eat meat, and should you say that here too we must suppose that it was found in the hand of a Gentile, then why is it said if it was cooked one must determine it according to the majority of the people that eat meat? Let us see whether the Gentile has it in his possession or the Israelite here we must suppose that he the finder was standing by and kept his eye on it all the time. Come and here we have learned if meat was found within the borders, if it was an entire limit is deemed to be nibble, but if it was a cut from a limit is permitted, and should you say that here too we must suppose that he the finder stood by keeping his eye on it all the time, then why is it deemed to be nibble in the case of an entire limb is not this intended as an objection against Rab's teaching, but with regard to it there has been reported Rab said it is permitted only insofar as it is not deemed to be nibble Levi, however said it. Is permitted to be eaten. This rule of Rab was not expressly stated, but was inferred from the following incident. Rab was once sitting by the ford of the Ishtatai Canal when he saw a man Talmud, Mastulin, be washing the head of an animal in the water. It fell out of his hand, so he went and fetched the basket, threw it into the water, and brought up two heads. Said Rab, "Is this what usually happens?" And he forbade him both heads. Thereupon Arkahana and Rc said to Rab, "Are only forbidden heads found here and not permitted?" Once he replied, "The forbidden ones are more frequently found." But what if it was only inferred? It was a jetty frequented mostly by Gentiles. Indeed, you may be certain of this from his reply. The forbidden ones are more frequently found here. According to this, how could Rab eat meat? You may say that he ate meat soon after the slaughtering, so that he did not lose sight of it, or only if it was wrapped up and sealed, or if it were some distinguishing mark. Thus, Rab. Son of Arhuna used to cut up the meat in the shape of a triangle. Rab was once going to his son in law Arhanan when he saw a ferry boat coming towards him. Said he to himself, When the ferry boat comes to meet one, it is a good omen. As he came to the door, he looked through the crack of the door and he saw the meat of an animal hanging up. He then knocked at the door and everybody came out to meet him, even the butchers too. Rab, however, did not take his eyes off the meat and said to them, If that is how you look after things, then you are giving my daughter's children forbidden meat to eat. And Rab did not eat of that meat, but why? If because of meat that had disappeared from sight, but here he did not lose sight of it, and if because of the omen, but Rab himself has said an omen which is not after the form pronounced by Elijah Abraham's servant or by Jonathan the son of Saul is not considered a divination. The reason is that it was a meal of free choice and Rab would not partake of a meal. A free choice Rab used to regard a fairy boat as a sign Samuel a passage in a book and Ar Yohanan a verse quoted by a child during the lifetime of Rab Ar Yohanan used to address him thus in his letters greetings to our master in Babylon after Rab's death Ar Yohanan used to address Samuel thus greetings to our colleague in Babylon said Samuel to himself is there nothing in which I am his master he thereupon sent to Ar Yohanan the calculations for the intercalation of months for sixty years said Ar Yohanan he only knows mere calculations so he Samuel wrote out and sent Ar Yohanan thirteen camel loads of questions concerning doubtful cases of Trifa said Ar Yohanan it is clear that I have a master in Babylon I must go and see him so he said to a child tell me the last verse you have learned he answered now Samuel was dead said Ar Yohanan this means that Samuel has died but it was not the case Samuel was not dead then and this happened only that Ar Yohanan should not trouble. Himself it was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer says although a house or a child or a marriage must not be used for divination they may be taken as a sign our Eliezer added provided it was established so on three occasions for it is written Joseph is not and Simeon is not and ye will take Benjamin away upon me all these things come our who not inquired of Rab what if pieces of meat were strung together he replied don't be a fool if strung together it is certainly a distinguishing sign others report this. As follows our who not said in the name of Rab if pieces of meat were strung together this is regarded as a distinguishing sign our Naman of Nihardia once came to Arkahana at Pumnahar on the eve of the day of atonement when they saw ravens dropping from their beaks pieces of liver and kidneys said Arkahana to the other pick them up and eat them for today that which is permitted is more common our high B. Abin once lost a large intestine of an animal amongst a stack of barrels and subsequently Found it and he came to inquire about it of Arhuna have you a distinguishing mark on it asked Arhuna no he replied would you be able to recognize it by general impression yes he replied then you may go and take it Arhana Hosea once lost a side of meat and subsequently found it he came to Arnaman who said to him have you a distinguishing mark on it he replied no would you be able to recognize it he replied yes then you may go and take it Arnathan B. Abe once lost a ball of blue wool. He came before Arhista who said to him have you a distinguishing mark on it he replied no would you be able to recognize it he replied yes then you may use it Rabbi said at first I thought that identification by a distinguishing mark was more reliable than identification by general impression since we must return a lost article to anyone who mentions a distinguishing mark on it Talmud, Mastulin, whereas we do not return it to anyone who recognizes it by mere general impressions but now having heard the above decisions I maint
Only cutting away the surface of the nerve so Samuel said to him go down deeper had I not seen you you might have given me forbidden meat to eat he was alarmed at this and a knife fell out of his hand said Samuel to him be not alarmed for he who taught you this taught you according to the view of Arjuna Arshis hate said that part which Barpayulai had removed is according to Arjuna forbidden by the Torah then it follows does it not that the part which he Barpayulai did not remove is according to Arjuna forbidden rabbinically if so according to whose view was he Barpayulai taught this Arshis hate therefore said that part which Barpayulai had removed is according to our Meir forbidden by the Torah but that part which he did not remove is forbidden rabbinically only according to our Meir for according to Arjuna it is permitted even rabbinically if a person ate an olive's bulk of the sciatic nerve etc Samuel said the Torah forbade only that part of the nerve which is on the Spoon for it is written which is upon the spoon of the thigh. Our Papa said the statement of Samuel is the subject of dispute between Tanaim for it was taught if a person ate the whole of it and it was not as much as an olive's bulk he is nevertheless liable. Our Judah says he is not liable unless it was as much as an olive's bulk. What is the reason of the rabbis because it is a complete entity in itself. Talmud, Mosul and B and what does our Judah say to this the term eating is used in connection there with and the rabbis the term eating is to teach that if it the sciatic nerve consisted of four or five olive's bulk and he ate thereof the size of one olive he is liable and our Judah that is derived from the expression which is upon the spoon of the thigh and the rabbis this verse is required for Samuel's teaching for Samuel said the Torah forbade only that part of the nerve which is on the spoon and our Judah it is written the thigh that is the entire thigh and the rabbis. That is to indicate that the prohibited nerve is the one that is spread over the whole of the thigh, namely the inner one and not the outer one, but of course only so much of it is prohibited as is upon the spoon, but is not the expression spoon required to teach that the prohibition of the sciatic nerve does not apply to birds as they have not a spoon shaped hip. The word spoon is written twice in the verse Mishnah if the thigh was cooked together with the sciatic nerve and there was so much of the nerve as to impart a flavor to the thigh. It is forbidden. How does one measure this as if it were meat cooked with turnips? If the sciatic nerve was cooked with other nerves in a broth and it can still be recognized, then it depends whether it imparted a flavor or not, but if it can no longer be recognized, then all the nerves are forbidden, and as for the broth, it depends whether it the sciatic nerve imparted a flavor or not, and so it is with a piece of nibble or a piece of an unclean fish that was cooked together with other pieces of flesh or fish if it can still be recognized and it depends whether it imparted a flavor or not and if it can no longer be recognized then all pieces are forbidden and as for the broth it depends whether it imparted a flavor or not Amara Samuel said this ruling of our mission applies only to the case where they were cooked together but if they were roasted together one may then cut away the meat and eat it until one reaches the nerve but surely this is not so for did not Arhuna say that if a kid was roasted together with its forbidden fat it is forbidden to eat even of the tip of its ear Talmud, Mosul and it is different with fat for it spreads throughout the flesh is it then forbidden in the case of fat but surely Rabbi B. Barhana has related a case which came before Aryohanan at the synagogue of Mahan of a kid that was roasted with its fat and on inquiring of Aryohanan he ruled that one may Cut away the meat and eat it until one reaches the fat that was a lean kid. Arhuna Bijuda suggested that it was the case of a kidney roasted with its fat and here Yohanan declared it to be permitted. Rabin son of Arada said it was the case of a kid that was found in a pot of stew and on inquiring of Arhuna he ruled that a Gentile cook should taste it. Rabba said in the past the following was always a difficulty to me it was taught in a pot wherein meat had been cooked a person may not. Oil milk and if he did boil milk therein it depends whether the pot imparted a flavor to the milk or not in the pot wherein terima food had been cooked a person may not cook common food and if he did cook common food therein it depends whether the pot imparted a flavor to the common food or not now in the case of terima it is clear for a priest could taste the food but in the case of meat and milk who may taste it but now that Arhuna ruled that we can rely upon a Gentile cook. In this case too we could rely upon a Gentile cook. Rabbi also said in certain cases the rabbis ruled that the test whether or not it imparts a flavor applies and in other cases the rabbis ruled that one may rely upon a Gentile cook Talmud, Mosul and B and yet in other cases the rabbis ruled that the test is 60 to 1 therefore we say where substances of different kinds each kind being permitted by itself were mixed together the test is whether or not one imparts a flavor to the other and if one of the substances was forbidden then we rely upon the opinion of a Gentile cook where substances of like kind were mixed together in which case it is impossible to discern whether one imparts a flavor to the other or where substances of different kinds one of which was forbidden were mixed together and no Gentile cook is available then the test is 60 to 1 in the house of the eggs large sides of meat were once salted with the sciatic nerve and the rubbin declared them to be forbidden whilst Araha son of Arashi declared them to be permitted when this case was put to Mar son of Arashi he said my father declared them to be permitted and said Araha son of Arashi to Rabbana what is the reason for your view is it not Samuel's dictum that whatsoever is salted is counted as hot and whatsoever is preserved is counted as cooked but remember did not Samuel say this ruling of our mission applies only to the case where they were cooked together but if they were roasted together one may then cut away the meat and eat it until one reaches the nerve and should you say that the term counted as hot means hot as when cooked surely this cannot be for since he said whatsoever is preserved is counted as cooked it follows that in the first clause counted as hot means hot as when roasted this is indeed a difficulty our said when measuring one should measure the broth the sediments the pieces and the pot some say the actual thickness of the pot must be taken into account but others say only that which is absorbed in the pot is to be taken into account our Abba said in the name of our Yohanan as regards all things prohibited by the Torah one should measure them as though they were onions or leeks our Abba said to Abba why not measure as though they were pepper or spices in which case the flavor would not become neutralized even in a thousandfold he replied the rabbis have estimated that among forbidden substances there is none that can impart a stronger flavor than onions or leeks our Naman said the sciatic nerve is neutralized in sixtyfold but the nerve itself is not to be included to make up this number the udder is neutralized in sixtyfold but the udder itself is to be included an egg is neutralized in sixtyfold but the egg itself is not to be included our Isaac the son of our measure she said but the udder itself is forbidden and if it fell into another pot it renders the contents forbidden our Ashi said when we were at Arkahan as the question was put before us when measuring should one measure the prohibited substance itself or only the essence which exuded from it it is obvious surely that one should measure the substance itself for if only the essence which exuded from it the question arises how do we know how much it is but if so if it subsequently fell into another pot it should not render the contents forbidden since our Isaac the son of our Meshachia had said that the udder itself was forbidden the rabbis declared it to be as a piece of nibble and egg is neutralized in sixtyfold but the egg itself is not to be included to make up this number redb oven said to have can it be said that it imparts a flavor but people usually say as a mere water of eggs he replied we are dealing here Talmud, Mastulin with an egg which contained a chicken but not with an egg of an unclean bird he raised an objection against him and was taught if clean eggs were cooked with Unclean eggs and the latter can impart a flavor in the others they are all forbidden here too we must suppose that they contained in them chickens why then are they called unclean since they contain chickens they are called unclean but surely since the following clause deals with eggs containing chickens for it reads if eggs were cooked together and in one of them was found a chicken and this one can impart its flavor into the others all are forbidden it follows that the first clause deals with eggs which do not contain chickens the one clause is merely explanatory of the other thus if clean eggs were cooked with unclean eggs and the latter can impart a flavor in the others all are forbidden as for instance if they were cooked together and in one of them was found a chicken this indeed stands to reason for if you assume that the first clause deals with eggs that have no chickens in them seeing that the exudation of eggs that have no chickens in them can render forbidden is it necessary to teach this in the case where they had chickens in them? This is not a conclusive argument. It may be that the second clause was stated to make clear the first lest you might think that the first clause deals with eggs that have chickens in
Jacob as follows those of Benesai's house said a forbidden egg among sixty eggs renders them all forbidden a forbidden egg among sixty one eggs renders them all permitted thereupon our Zara said to our shaman B. Abel look you are stating a definite point at which they are permitted whereas the two greatest men of the day did not give a definite ruling on this matter for our Jacob B. E. D. and our Samuel B. Naman he both reported in the name of our Joshua B. Levi that a forbidden egg among sixty eggs rendered them all forbidden and a forbidden egg among sixty one eggs rendered them all permitted and when the question was put to them does sixty one included the forbidden egg or excluded they were unable to give a definite answer and you seem to be so certain of it it was stated our Helbo said in the name of our Huna with regard to a forbidden egg cooked with permitted ones if there were sixty besides this one they are forbidden but if there were sixty one besides this one they are permitted a Certain man once came before Argamaliel the son of Rabbi with his case said Argamaliel did not my father permit such a case by the standard of 47 fold then I might just as well be satisfied with 45 fold a certain man once came before Arsimian the son of Rabbi with his case I said Arsimian did not my father permit such a case by the standard of 45 fold then I might just as well be satisfied with 43 fold a certain man once came before Arhai with his case said Arhai but there is not here 30 fold the reason then why he declared it forbidden was because there was not 30 fold but if there was 30 fold could we then adopt the standard Arhana answered it was merely an exaggerated expression Arhai B Abba said in the name of our Joshua B Levi who said it in the name of Barkapra all prohibited substances of the Torah are neutralized in 60 fold thereupon our Samuel son of our Isaac said to him master do you say so but are as he stated in the name of our Joshua B. Levi who said it in the name of Barkapra all prohibited substances of the Torah are neutralized in a hundredfold now both derive their views from the cooked shoulder as it is written and the priest shall take the cooked shoulder and it was taught cooked Talmud. Mosulin B implies that it must be whole Arsimian B. Yohe says cooked implies that it must have been cooked together with the ram now in fact both agree that it must be cooked with the ram. But they differ in the following one holds that it must first be cut away and then cooked and the other holds that it must first be cooked and then cut away alternatively I can say all agree that it must first be cut away and then cooked but they differ in this one holds that it must be cooked together with the ram in the same pot and the other holds that it must be cooked in a separate pot now according to the first version from either view and according to the second version from it. View of Arsimian B.O.A. can the required standard be derived? He who holds a 60 fold standard maintains that the flesh and bone of the shoulder must be measured against the flesh and bone of the ram, and the latter is 60 times as much as the former, but he who holds a 100 fold standard maintains that only the flesh of the shoulder must be measured against the flesh of the ram, and the latter is 100 times as much as the former, but can one derive the standard from it? Above, surely it has been taught this is a case of a substance being permitted, even though it has absorbed the forbidden substance. Now, what does this exclude? Presumably, it excludes every other substance which has absorbed any matter forbidden by the Torah. Abay answered the exclusion was necessary only according to our Judah, who maintains that in all other cases homogeneous substances cannot neutralize each other, hence we are taught that here they do neutralize each other, but why does he not? Infer the rule from here because the divine law has expressly stated and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat which shows that though they are both mixed up together one does not neutralize the other but why do you prefer to infer the rule of non-neutralization of homogeneous substances from this verse rather than from the other because that is an anomaly and one cannot draw any inferences from an anomaly if so how may we infer the rule of neutralization in hundredfold or in sixtyfold from it for so do we infer leniency from it we infer a restriction for according to the rule of the Torah a substance is neutralized in a bare majority of other substances Rabbah answered the exclusion was necessary with reference to the rule that the taste of a forbidden substance is treated as a substance itself now as this see the taste is forbidden in the case of consecrated matter we are therefore taught that here it is permitted. Talmud, Mosulin, why then does he not infer the rule from this because the divine law is expressly stated with regard to the sin offering whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy that is to say it shall be as the sin offering itself if the latter is ritually unfit to be eaten the other is also unfit and if it is permitted the other is also permitted to be eaten but only under the conditions of stringency as the sin offering itself but why do you prefer to infer it from this verse rather than from the other because that is an anomaly and one cannot draw any inferences from an anomaly if so how may we infer the rule of neutralization in hundredfold or in sixtyfold from it for so do we infer leniency from it we infer a restriction for according to the rule of the Torah a substance is neutralized in a bare majority of other substances Rabbin has said the exclusion was necessary only in regard to the side of the cut for generally it is said that the Side of the cut is forbidden, but here it is permitted. Ardimi was sitting and reciting the statement of our Samuel B. R. Isaac when Abay said to him, Are then all forbidden substances of the Torah neutralized only in hundredfold? Surely we have learned with regard to what did they say that every substance of terima which leavens or flavors or is mixed with common food must be treated with stringency. It is with regard to homogeneous substances and with regard to what did they say that every substance of terima which leavens etc. must be treated with leniency as well as with stringency. It is with regard to heterogeneous substances and in the next clause it reads with regard to heterogeneous substances there is leniency as well as stringency. Thus if crushed beans of terima were cooked with lentils of common food and they impart a flavor to the lentils, the whole is forbidden whether there was so little of the beans as to be neutralized in hundred and one or not if they do not impart a flavor to the lentils they are permitted whether there was so little of the beans as to be neutralized in a hundred and one or not now in the case where there was not so little of the beans as to be neutralized in a hundred and one is it not to be assumed that there was little enough to be neutralized in sixty Talmud, Mosul and B know it could be neutralized in a hundred but surely since the first clause deals with neutralization in a hundred the second deals with neutralization in sixty for it reads in the first clause as follows with regard to homogeneous substances there is always stringency thus if wheat and leaven of terima fell into wheat and dough of common food and there was sufficient of it to leaven the dough it is forbidden whether there was so little of the leaven as to be neutralized in a hundred and one or not if there was not so little of the leaven as to be neutralized in a hundred and one it is forbidden whether it could leaven it. Though or not can it then be said that both the first and second clauses are alike and that neutralization takes place only in a hundred? No, the first clause deals with neutralization in a hundred and one, whereas the second clause deals with neutralization in a hundred. Why is it then where there were a hundred and one times the quantity of the forbidden leaven, even though it can still leaven the dough that it is not neutralized? He Ardimi remained silent, said Abbe to him, perhaps it is different with leaven, for leaven is very sharp, said Ardimi to him. You have now reminded me of that statement of our Jose, son of Arhanab, is not all standards are alike, for in the case of brine, the standard of neutralization is almost two hundred, for we have learned where unclean fish was pickled together with clean fish. If in a barrel holding two seahs there was a weight of ten zeus Judean measure, which is five cells Galilean measure of unclean fish, the brine thereof is forbidden, Arjuna. Says it is forbidden if there was a quarter log of unclean brine in two seahs clean brine, but has not Arjuda said that homogeneous substances cannot be neutralized? It is different with brine, for it is only the moisture of the fish. How does one measure this? Arhuna said as if it were meat cooked with turnip heads. Our mission is not in agreement with the following tenet, for it was taught our Ishmael, the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka, says that nerves cannot impart a flavor. A man once came in before Arhana and Arjuda B. Zabino was sitting at the doorstep of Arhana's house when the man came out. Here Arjuda asked him, How did he Arhana decide he permitted it unto me? He replied, Then go in again to him, said Arjuda B. Zabino. Thereupon Arhana said, Who is this that worries me? So go tell him who is sitting at the doorstep that nerves cannot impart any flavor. When a person with such a case came to RMI, he would always send him to our Isaac B. Halib, who used to rule that. It was permitted on the authority of our Joshua B. Levi, although he or MI himself was not of that opinion. The law's nerves cannot impart a flavor if the sciatic nerve was cooked with other nerves, etc.
Sediments and in the pieces of the scurab thereupon appointed an amora who stated as follows as soon as it the piece of nebula imparted its flavor to one piece the piece itself is rendered forbidden like nebula and it in turn renders all the other pieces forbidden for the Arab like kind are safra said to have a consider Rab's ruling agrees does it not with the opinion of Arjuna who maintained that homogeneous substances cannot neutralize each other in a mixture why then does he declare as soon as it imparted its flavor surely even if it did not impart any flavor to it it would also render the entire contents of the pot forbidden he replied we are dealing here with the case where he straightway removed it Rabba replied Talmud, Mastulan B you may even say that he did not remove it at once but this is a case of one kind being mixed with a like kind and also with a different kind and wherever one kind is mixed with a like and also with a different kind you must Disregard the like kind as if it were not present, and if the different kind is more than the forbidden substance, it will neutralize it. Mishnah it applies to clean animals, but not to unclean. Arjuda says even to unclean animals, Arjuda argued was not the sciatic nerve prohibited from the time of the sons of Jacob, and at that time unclean animals were still permitted to them. They replied, This law was ordained at Sinai, but was written in its proper place. Gemara is Arjuda of the opinion that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition. Surely it has been taught. Arjuda says, I might have thought that the carcass of an unclean bird, whilst in the gullet, should render clothes unclean. The verse therefore reads, That which dieth of itself or is not a beast, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith. That is to say, this applies only to that carcass which bears the prohibition of eating nibble, but not to that which does not bear the prohibition of eating nibble, but the prohibition of eating what is unclean should you however say that he or Judah is of the opinion that nerves do not impart a flavor so that in the case where one ate the nerve of an unclean animal there is only the prohibition of the nerve but not the prohibition of eating what is unclean but are we right in assuming that our Judah is of the opinion that nerves do not impart a flavor behold it has been taught if a person ate the sciatic nerve of an unclean animal our Judah declares that he has incurred guilt twice but our Simeon holds that he has not incurred guilt at all in truth he or Judah is of the opinion that nerves do impart a flavor but he also holds that at SC the prohibition of the sciatic nerve applies to a photos too so that the prohibition of the nerve and the prohibition on account of uncleanness come into force simultaneously but how can you assume that our Judah holds it applies to a photos behold we have learned it also applies to a photos but our Judah says it does not apply to a photos and its fat is permitted that is so only with regard to a clean animal concerning which the divine law declares everything in the beast you may eat but with regard to an unclean animal the prohibition of the nerve applies but again how can you assume that both prohibitions come into force simultaneously behold we have learned by reason of uncleanness contracted from the following sources the Nazi right must shave his head a corpse and all its bulk of the flesh of a corpse etc and the question was asked if he must shave his head on account of an olive's bulk of a corpse then surely he must shave his head on account of an entire corpse but our Yohanan answered that it was only necessary to mention the corpse itself for the case of an abortion whose limbs were not yet knit together by nerves hence we see that the prohibition of uncleanness comes first notwithstanding the fact that the prohibition of uncleanness comes first the prohibition of it Nerve can indeed be superimposed because this latter prohibition is binding even upon the sons of Noah and this is precisely implied in the teaching of the Mishnah Arjuda argued was not the sciatic nerve prohibited from the time of the sons of Jacob and at that time unclean animals were still permitted to them the above text stated if a person ate the sciatic nerve of an unclean animal Arjuda declares that he has incurred guilt twice Talmud, Mastulana but Arsimian holds that he has not incurred guilt at all but whatever you think is the opinion of Arsimian there is always a difficulty if he holds that one prohibition can be superimposed upon a pre-existing prohibition then he should have incurred guilt on account of the nerve too and if he holds that one prohibition cannot be superimposed upon a pre-existing prohibition then he should have incurred guilt on account of uncleanness for that came first and if he holds that nerves do not impart a flavor then he should have Incurred guilt at least on account of the nerve. Rob answered in truth he holds that nerves do not impart a flavor but it is different in that case for the verse says therefore the children of Israel eat not the sciatic nerves that is the nerve is forbidden but the flesh permitted this case therefore must be excluded since the nerve would be forbidden and the flesh forbidden to Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if a person ate the sciatic nerve of a nibble he has according to Armadir. Incurred guilt twice but the sages hold that he has incurred guilt once only the sages however agree with Armadir that if a person ate the sciatic nerve of a burnt offering or of an ox that was condemned to be stoned he would have incurred guilt twice who is this authority who holds that a comprehensive prohibition alone cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition whereas a comprehensive prohibition which also imposes a graver penalty can Rab said it is our Jose the Galilean for we have Learned if a person that was unclean ate either unclean or clean consecrated food he is liable. Our Jose the Galilean says if a person that was unclean ate clean consecrated food he is liable but if he ate unclean consecrated food he is not liable for he has only eaten what was unclean they reply to him even where he that was unclean ate what was clean as soon as he touched it he has rendered it unclean now it was asked thereon the rabbis have surely replied well to our Jose the Galilean and Rabbah. Explained that where the person was rendered unclean and only later the meat was rendered unclean all agree that he is liable for the prohibition involving the penalty of Gareth came first they differ only where the meat was first rendered unclean and later the person became unclean the rabbis adopt the principle of a comprehensive prohibition arguing thus since he would now be liable for eating any piece of consecrated food that was clean he is also liable for eating a piece that was Unclean our Jose the Galilean does not adopt the principle of a comprehensive prohibition for he does not accept the argument since but according to our Jose the Galilean even though he holds that the comprehensive prohibition which involves only a light penalty cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition surely the comprehensive prohibition which involves a graver penalty ought to be superimposed upon the prohibition with the light penalty and what is the gravity here it is in respect of the uncleanness of the person since it involves the penalty of Gareth Arashi replied but who shall say that it is in respect of the uncleanness of the person that the gravity lies perhaps the gravity is in respect of the uncleanness of the meat since it can never be rendered clean by immersion in Amikwe Talmud, Mastul and B and does our Jose the Galilean hold the view that a comprehensive prohibition cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition behold it has been taught of it. Day of Atonement happened to fall on the Sabbath and the person inadvertently did work thereon. Once do we know that he is guilty for each separately because it is written it is a Sabbath and also it is a Day of Atonement. So our Jose the Galilean our Akiba says he has only incurred guilt once Rabin sent from Palestine the following message in the name of our Jose son of Arhanan. The construction of the teaching is as stated save that the authorities must be reversed. Our Isaac B. Jacob B. Jory sent the following in the name of our Yohanan according to the view of our Jose the Galilean. Now that we have reversed the authorities if a person being unaware that it was a Sabbath but knowing full well that it was a Day of Atonement did work thereon he is liable if he did so knowing full well that it was a Sabbath but being unaware that it was a Day of Atonement he is not liable. What is the reason for this distinction? Have they answered the Sabbath is fixed and determined from all time but the day of atonement is determined by the Beth Din said Rabbah to him but in fact both prohibitions set in simultaneously rather explained Rabbah it was a time of religious persecution and they sent word from their Palestine that the day of atonement of that year should be observed on a Sabbath when Rabin came and also all those who came down from Palestine to Babylon they explained it as Rabbah did Arjuda argued was not the sciatic nerve forbidden from the time of the sons of Jacob etc. It was taught the rabbi said to Arjuda does it say in the Torah therefore the children of Jacob eat not surely it says therefore the children of Israel eat not now they were first styled the children of Israel only at the giving of the law at Sinai therefore we must say that the law of the sciatic nerve was given at Sinai but was written in its present place to indicate the reason why it was prohibited Rabbah raised an objection against this it is written and the sons of Israel carried. Jacob their father that was after the incident Araha the son of Rabbah said to Arashi that it should be
Even to the sons of Noah indeed this is so and the verse is necessary only to explain our Eliezer's view it has been taught likewise the prohibition of the limb of a living creature applies to cattle wild beasts and birds either clean or unclean for it is written only be steadfast in not eating the blood etc. That is to say where you are forbidden the blood you are also forbidden the limb severed therefrom and where you are not forbidden the blood of an animal you are not forbidden the limbs. Severed therefrom so our Eliezer the sages say it applies only to clean animals for it is written thou shalt not eat the life with the flesh but the flesh alone you may eat therefore where you are permitted the flesh you are then forbidden the limb severed therefrom but where you are not permitted the flesh you are then not forbidden the limb severed therefrom our mayor says it applies only to clean cattle Nemotic Samuel Sheila Shimei Rabbi Samuel said in the name of our or as some say are. Joseph others say Rabbi Sheila said in the name of our his daughter as some say our Joseph and others say Rabbi Shimei said in the name of our his daughter as some say our Joseph what is the reason for our mayor's view because the verse reads thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock our said in the name of Rabbi the dispute refers only to an Israelite but as for a descendant of Noah all agree that he is warned against eating the limb of unclean as well as clean animals it has been taught likewise as to the limb of a living creature a descendant of Noah is warned against eating it whether it be of a clean or unclean animal whereas an Israelite is warned only against eating the limb of a clean animal some read of a clean one and it is in accordance with our mayor's view but others read of clean ones and it is in accordance with the view of the sages our said we have also learned it in the following mission if a person ate a limb severed from it whilst alive he does not suffer forty. Stripes and the slaughtering thereof does not render it clean of whom is the said should you say of an Israelite but is it not obvious that the slaughtering does not render it clean it could only have been said of a descendant of Noah and this proves that it is forbidden to him or Mahdi B. Paddish pointed out a contradiction between the first clause and the second clause and resolved it thus the first clause speaks of an Israelite but the second clause of a descendant of Noah Rab Judah said in the name of Rab the prohibition of a limb severed from a living creature requires at least an olive's bulk because the expression eating is used with regard to it or Amram raised an objection against this we have learned if a person ate a limb from it whilst alive he does not suffer forty stripes and the slaughtering thereof does not render it clean now if you were to hold that there must be an olive's bulk and guilt is established because of eating an olive's bulk of what is unclean. As Arnaman suggested elsewhere that there was only a little flesh but the sinews and bones combined to make up the olive's bulk so here too we must say that there was only a little flesh but the sinews and bones combined to make up the olive's bulk come and hear from the following statement of Rab Talmud, Mastulan B if a person ate a clean bird whilst it was yet alive however small it was he is liable if dead only if it was as large as an olive's bulk if he ate an unclean bird. Whether alive or dead however small it was he is liable here too we must suppose there was only a little flesh but the sinews and bones combined to make up the olive's bulk come and here it was taught if a person took a clean bird the whole of which was not as large as an olive's bulk and ate it Rabbi holds that he is not liable and our Eliezer son of Arsimian declares him liable our Eliezer son of Arsimian said is there not here an aforciori argument if he is liable for a limb thereof. Surely he is liable for the whole of it if he strangled it and ate it. All agree that there must be as much as an olive's bulk in order to render him liable. Now their disagreement is only on this point. This one holds that an animal even whilst alive stands to be dismembered into limbs, and the other holds that whilst alive it does not stand to be dismembered into limbs. But thus far they are agreed, namely that in the case of a limb the size of an olive's bulk is not necessary. Said Arnaman. It is a case where there was only a little flesh, but the sinews and bones combined to make up the olive's bulk. But is there such a creature the whole of which does not carry an olive's bulk of flesh? And yet in one limb there is as much as an olive's bulk made up of a little flesh and sinews and bones. Our Sharebi replied, Yes, it is a call on Consider then the final clause. It reads, If he strangled it and ate it, all agree that there must be as much as an olive's bulk in order to render him. Liable is not the call on an unclean bird and Rab has stated if a person ate an unclean bird whether alive or dead however small it was he is liable what was meant was a clean bird like the call on Rabbi said if you can find authority for saying that Rabbi holds an intention with regard to foodstuffs is of consequence then if a person intended to eat this bird limb by limb but actually ate it whole he is liable said to him Abbe is there anything which if another were to eat that other would not be liable and if this person were to eat he would be liable he replied each man is considered according to his intention with regard to it Rabbi also said if you can find authority for saying that our Eliezer son of our Simeon holds an intention with regard to foodstuffs is of consequence then if a person intended to eat the bird dead and he ate it alive he is not liable said to him Abbe is there anything which if another were to eat that other would be liable and if this person were to eat he would not be liable he replied each man is considered according to his intention with regard to it or Yohanan said the verse thou salt not eat the life with the flesh refers to a limb severed from a living creature and the verse ye shall not eat any flesh in the field that is trifid torn of beasts refers to flesh severed from a living creature and also to flesh of a trifid animal our Simeon Belakish said the verse thou shalt not eat the life with the flesh refers to a limb severed from a living creature and also to flesh severed from a living creature and the verse ye shall not eat any flesh in the field that is trifid torn of beasts refers to flesh of a trifid animal if a person ate a limb severed from a living creature and also flesh severed from a living creature according to our Yohanan he is liable twice and according to our Simeon Belakish he is liable but once if a person ate flesh severed from a living creature and also flesh of a trifid animal According to our Simeon B. Lakish, he is liable twice, and according to our Yohanan, he is liable. But once, if a person ate a limb severed from a living creature and also flesh of a trifid animal, according to both, he is liable twice. A contradiction was pointed out from the following Talmud: Mastulan, if a person ate a limb severed from a living animal that was trifid, our Yohanan says he is liable twice. But our Simeon B. Lakish says he is liable. But once, I grant that this is right according to our Yohanan. But according to our Simeon B. Lakish, this is a difficulty. Is it not? Our Joseph answered, it is no difficulty. For one case deals with one animal, and the other case with two animals. In the case of two animals, he is liable twice, according to both views. But in the case of one animal, they differ. On what principle do they differ? In the case of one animal, Abbe said it is a case where the animal was rendered trifid as soon as the greater part of it had come forth out of the womb. One are. Yohanan holds that an animal even whilst alive stands to be dismembered into limb so that the prohibitions of trifid and of a limb from a living creature come into force simultaneously the other our Simeon Belakish holds that an animal whilst alive does not stand to be dismembered into limb so that the prohibition of the limb when it does arise cannot be superimposed upon the already existing prohibition of trifid alternatively you may say all agree that an animal whilst alive does not stand to be dismembered into limbs but they differ whether or no the prohibition of the limb severed from a living creature can be superimposed upon the existing prohibition of trifid one our Yohanan holds that the prohibition of the limb can be superimposed upon the existing prohibition of trifid and the other our Simeon Belakish holds that the prohibition of the limb cannot be superimposed upon the existing prohibition of trifid alternatively you may say all agree that an animal Whilst alive stands to be dismembered into limbs, but in this case the animal was rendered trifid later on and not at birth, and they differ whether or no the prohibition of trifid can be superimposed upon the existing prohibition of the limb. One, our Yohanan holds that it can be superimposed, and the other, our Simeon B. Lakish holds that it cannot. Rabbi said it is a case where the person tore away a limb from the living animal and thereby rendered it trifid. One, our Yohanan holds that an animal, whilst alive, does not stand to be dismembered into limbs, so that the prohibitions of trifid and of the limb come into force simultaneously. The other, our Simeon B. Lakish holds that an animal, even whilst alive, stands to be dismembered into limbs, so that the prohibition of trifid cannot be superimposed upon the existing prohibition of the limb. Our Hibi Abba said in the name of our Yohanan, if a person ate forbidden fat which was torn away from a living animal which was trifid, he is liable. Twice whereupon our I said to him and why do you not say thrice indeed I'll say in the name
This case the animal was rendered true later on and not at birth and they differ whether or no the prohibition of trufa can be superimposed upon the prohibition of a limb from a living creature one holds it can be superimposed just as it is the case with the forbidden fat for a master has said the Torah has expressly indicated that the prohibition of nibla can be superimposed upon the prohibition of forbidden fat and that the prohibition of trufa can be superimposed upon it. Prohibition of forbidden fat the other however maintains that at SC the prohibition of trufa can indeed be superimposed upon the prohibition of forbidden fat inasmuch as there is an exception Talmud, Mostul and B to its general restriction but it cannot be superimposed upon the prohibition of a limb inasmuch as there is no exception to its general restriction when Ardini came from Palestine he reported that our Simeon Belagish put the following question to our Yohan and what is the law? If he divided it outside and he replied he is not liable and what if he divided it inside his mouth and he replied he is liable when Rabin came from Palestine he reported as follows if he divided it outside he is not liable if he divided it inside his mouth our Yohanan says he is liable our Simeon Belagish says he is not liable our Yohanan says he is liable because his gullet has derived enjoyment from an olive's bulk our Simeon Belagish says he is not liable because there must enter in his Stomach at one time the full amount that constitutes eating and this is not the case here but it will be asked according to our Simeon Belagish how can it ever happen that one who eats an olive's bulk of the limb should be liable our Kahana suggested in the case where he ate a small bone our Eliezer however said even if he divided it outside he is also liable because the fact that it is not consumed in one whole does not render it an incomplete act our Simeon Belagish said the quantity of it. Olive's bulk of which they the rabbis have spoken does not include that which is between the teeth our Yohanan said it includes even that which remains between the teeth said our papa as to that which remains between the teeth they certainly do not disagree they disagree only as to that which remains in the palate and tongue one our Yohanan maintains that he is liable since his gullet has derived enjoyment from a whole olive's bulk the other our Simeon Belagish maintains that he is not liable. Because there must enter his stomach the full amount which constitutes eating R.C. said in the name of our Yohanan if a person ate one half olive's bulk of a forbidden substance and vomited it forth and then ate another half olive's bulk he is liable why because his gullet has derived enjoyment from an olive's bulk our Eliezer inquired of R.C. what is the law if a person ate one half olive's bulk of a forbidden substance vomited it forth and then ate it once again let us see what was his. Real question if the question was whether it SC what has been vomited forth is considered as digested food or not then he might have put the question with regard to a complete olive's bulk and if the question was whether we regard eating from the enjoyment of the gullet or from the enjoyment of the stomach then he might have solved this himself from R.C. statement above R.C. had forgotten the tradition he had received from our Yohanan and our Eliezer came and reminded him of it in. The following matter why speak of another half olive's bulk the master could have dealt with the same half olive's bulk by which two results would have been established as we would have learned from it that at SC what is vomited forth was not considered as digested food and we would also have learned from it that one is liable if only the gullet had derived enjoyment from an olive's bulk he remained silent and made no reply at all thereupon he or Eliezer said to him oh wonder of it. Generation did you not often say this before our Yohanan and he agreed with you saying his gullet has in fact derived enjoyment from an olive's bulk C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I mission every kind of flesh is forbidden to be cooked in milk excepting the flesh of fish and of locusts and it is also forbidden to place upon the table flesh with cheese excepting the flesh of fish and of locusts Talmud, Mastulin if a person vowed to abstain from flesh he may partake of the flesh of fish and of Locusts Kamara it follows from our mission that the flesh of fowls is prohibited by the law of the Torah now in accordance with whose view would this be it surely is not in accordance with our Akiva's view for our Akiva maintains that the flesh of wild animals and of fowls is not prohibited by the law of the Torah consider now the final clause if a person vowed to abstain from flesh he may partake of the flesh of fish and of locusts it follows however that he is forbidden the flesh of fowl which is in accordance with our Akiva's view namely that any variation concerning which the agent would ask for special instructions is deemed to be of the same species for we have learned if a person vowed to abstain from vegetables he is permitted gourds our Akiva forbids them they said to our Akiva is it not a fact that when a man says to his agent bring me vegetables the other might come back and say I can only obtain gourds he replied exactly so for he surely would not come back and say I can only Obtain pulse. This proves that gourds are included among vegetables, and pulse is not included among vegetables. Must it then be that the first clause of our mission is in accordance with the view of the rabbis, and the second clause is in accordance with our Akiva's view? Our Joseph said the author of our mission is Rabbi who incorporated the views of various Tanaim with regard to vows. He adopted the view of our Akiva, and with regard to flesh cooked in milk, he adopted the view of the rabbis. Are as she said, the whole of our mission is in accordance with our Akiva's view. For this is what it means: every kind of flesh is forbidden to be cooked in milk, some being forbidden by the law of the Torah, and others by the enactment of the scribes, excepting the flesh of fish and of locusts, which are neither prohibited by the law of the Torah nor by the enactment of the scribes, and it is also forbidden to place, etc. Our Joseph said, you can infer from this that the flesh of fowl cooked in milk is. Prohibited by the law of the Torah for were it only prohibited by the enactment of the rabbi seeing that the actual eating thereof is prohibited only as a precautionary measure would we forbid the placing of them together upon the table as a safeguard against the eating thereof and whence do you derive the rule that we do not impose a precautionary measure upon a precautionary measure from the following mission which we have learned the dough offering of produce grown outside the land of Israel Talmud, Mastul and B may be eaten by a priest in company with a non-priest at the table and may be given to any priest one like said Abbe to him I grant you if we were told that the dough offering of produce grown outside the land may be eaten in the land in company with a non-priest at the table in which case there would be good cause to enact a precautionary measure on account of the dough offering of produce grown in the land which is ordained by the Torah and Yet we do not take this precaution that the inference can be made but outside the land of Israel it is allowed surely because there is no reason to take any precautionary measure in the case of our mission however if you permit one to place upon the table fowl and cheese one might even place upon the table flesh and cheese and so come to eat flesh with milk which is prohibited by the law of the Torah our cheese hate demurred saying yet after all it is but cold food with cold food having answered it is prohibited lest it be placed upon the table in a boiling pot but even in that case it is only in a second vessel and a second vessel cannot bring anything to the boil it is only prohibited lest it be placed upon the table in the first vessel mission a fowl may be placed upon the table together with cheese but may not be eaten with it so Beth Shammai Beth Hillel say it may neither be placed upon the table together with cheese nor eaten with it our Jose said this is an instance where Beth Shammai adopt the lenient ruling and Beth Hillel the strict ruling of what table did they speak of the table upon which one eats but on the table whereon the food is set out one may without any hesitation place the one food beside the other Gemara is not our Jose's opinion identical with that of the first Tana and should you say that there is a difference between them with regard to the actual eating of fowl with cheese the first Tana maintaining that they differ only with regard to the placing upon the table but not with regard to the eating thereof whereas our Jose says that they differ even with regard to the eating thereof Beth Shammai adopting the lenient ruling and Beth Hillel the strict ruling but surely we have already learned our Jose reports six cases in which Beth Shammai adopt the lenient ruling and Beth Hillel the strict ruling and this is one of them is a fowl may be placed upon the table together with cheese but may not be eaten with it so Beth Shammai but Beth Hillel say it may neither be placed together with it nor eaten with it rather what the teacher of our Mishnah tells us is merely that the first Tana whose opinion is expressed anonymously is our Jose for whosoever reports a thing in the name of him that said it brings deliverance into the world as it is said and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai Agra the father-in-law of our Abba recited a fowl and cheese may be eaten without restriction he recited it and he himself explained. It thus it means without washing the hands or cleaning the mouth between the eating of the one and the other our Isaac the son of our Meshachia once visited the house of our Ash
Hillel say one must rinse the mouth and also clean it, but one school mentions one requirement, the other school another, and they do not really differ. The above text stated Arzara said cleaning the mouth must be done with bread only. This means only with wheaten bread, but not with barley bread, and even with wheaten bread it is allowed only if it is cold, but not if it is still warm, for it cleaves to the palate and it must be soft and not hard. The law is cleaning the mouth may be done with everything except flour, dates, and vegetables. Arasi inquired of Aryuhan and how long must one wait between flesh and cheese? He replied, nothing at all, but this cannot be for Aris. Da said if a person ate flesh, he is forbidden to eat after it. Cheese if he ate cheese, he is permitted to eat after it. Flesh this indeed was the question. How long must one wait between cheese and flesh? And he replied, nothing at all. The above text stated Aris. Da said if a person ate flesh, he is forbidden. To eat after it cheese if he ate cheese he is permitted to eat after it flesh are ahabi Joseph asked Arhista what about the flesh that is between the teeth he quoted in reply the verse while the flesh was yet between their teeth Marakba said in this matter I am as vinegar is to one compared with my father for if my father were to eat flesh now he would not eat cheese until this very hour tomorrow whereas I do not eat cheese in the same meal but I do eat it in my next meal Samuel said in this matter I am as vinegar is to one compared with my father for my father used to inspect his property twice a day but I do so only once a day Samuel here follows his maxim for Samuel declared he who inspects his property daily will find an Iskir Abbe used to inspect his property daily one day he met his farmer tenant carrying away a bundle of twigs said to him Abbe where is this going to he replied to my master's house said Abbe the rabbis have long ago anticipated you are used. To inspect his property daily he exclaimed where are all those istirahs of the master Samuel one day he saw that a pipe had burst on his land he took off his coat rolled it up and stuffed it into the hole he then raised his voice and people came and stopped it up he exclaimed now I have found all those istirahs of the master Samuel R.E.D.B. Abin said in the name of R. Isaac B. Ashi and the first washing of the hands is a meritorious act the last washing is a bounden duty and objection was raised from the following the first and last washing of the hands are bounden duties the middle washing is a matter of free choice a meritorious act as compared with a matter of free choice can well be termed a bounden duty to return to the main text the first and last washing of the hands are bounden duties the middle washing is a matter of free choice the first washing may be performed either over a vessel or over the ground the last washing must be performed over a vessel others read the last Washing may not be performed over the ground. What is the real difference between these two versions? There is a difference where one washes over twigs. The first washing may be with either hot or cold water. The last washing must be with cold water only because hot water softens the hands and does not remove the grease. The first washing may be with either hot or cold water. Our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of Arjane, they said this only of hot water wherein the hand is not Talmud. Moss. Chulin be scalded, but one may not wash the hands with water wherein the hand would be scalded. Others refer this distinction to the final clause. Thus, the last washing must be with cold water only and not with hot water. Our Isaac B. Joseph said in the name of Arjane, they said this only of hot water wherein the hand is scalded, but one may wash the hands with water wherein the hand is not scalded. It follows, however, from this that for the first washing one may use even water wherein the hand is. Scalded the middle washing is a matter of free choice. Our said they said this only of the washing between one course and another course, but between a meat course and cheese it is a bounden duty to do so. Our Judah the son of Arhai said, Why did the rabbi say that it was a bounden duty to wash the hands after the meal because of a certain salt of Sodom which makes the eyes blind? Said Abbe, one grain of this is found in a core of ordinary salt. Araha the son of Rabbah asked Arashi what is the rule if one measured out salt. He replied, Undoubtedly, Abbe said, At first I thought the reason why the last washing may not be performed over the ground was that it made a mess, but now my master has told me it is because an evil spirit rests upon it. Abbe also said, At first I thought the reason why one should not remove anything from the table whilst another is holding a cup and drinking was the fear lest there occur a mishap at the table, but now my master has told me it is because it may. Cause vertigo this applies however only if the thing is taken away and not returned but if taken and returned it does not matter moreover it applies only if the thing is taken away a distance of more than four cubits from the table but if it remains within four cubits distance it does not matter moreover it applies only to such things as may be required at the table but if it is not required at the table it does not matter Marsan of Arashi used to be particular even about the removal of a pestle and mortar for pounding spices for these are required at the table Abbe also said at first I thought the reason why one collects the crumbs from the floor was mere tidiness but now my master has told me it is because it might lead to poverty once the angel of poverty was following a certain man but could not prevail over him because the man was extremely careful about collecting the crumbs one day he ate some bread upon the grass now said the angel he will certainly fall into my hand after he had eaten he took a spade dug up the grass and threw it all into a river he then heard the angel exclaiming alas he has driven me out of his house Abbe also said at first I thought the reason why one does not drink froth was that it was nauseous but now my master has told me it is because it may cause Qatar to drink it may cause Qatar to blow it away may cause headache and to skim it with the hand may cause poverty what then should one do one must let it settle down by itself for Qatar contracted from drinking the froth of wine one should drink beer for that from beer one should drink water for that from water there is no remedy this bears out the popular saying poverty follows the poor Abbe also said at first I thought the reason why one should not eat vegetables from the bunch which was tied up by the gardener was because it had the appearance of gluttony but now my master has told me it is because one lays oneself open thereby to the dangers of Magic Arhista and Rabbi Arhuna once were traveling on a ship. A certain lady said to them, Take me with you, but they would not. She then pronounced a spell, and the ship was held fast. They in return pronounced a spell, and it was free. She said, What power have I over you, seeing that you do not cleanse yourselves with a pot's hurt, neither do you crush a louse on your clothes, nor do you eat vegetables from a bunch tied up by the gardener? Abbe also said, At first I thought that the reason why one does not eat vegetables which had fallen onto the tray was because it was not clean, but now my master has told me it is because it causes a foul smell in the mouth. Abbe also said, At first I thought the reason why one does not sit under a drain pipe was that there was waste water there, but my master has told me it is because demons are to be found there. Certain carriers were once carrying a barrel of wine, wishing to take a rest. They put it down under a drain pipe, whereupon the barrel burst so. They came to Marsan of Arashi, he brought forth trumpets and exorcised the demon who now stood before him, said he to the devil, Why did you do such a thing? He replied, What else could I do, seeing that they put it down on my ear? The other Marsan of Arashi retorted, What business had you in a public place? It is you that are in the wrong, you must therefore pay for the damage, said the devil. Will the master give me a time wherein to pay a date was fixed when the day arrived? He defaulted, he came to court, and Marbi Arashi said to him, Why did you not keep your time? He replied, We have no right to take away anything that is tied up, sealed, measured, or counted, but only if we find something that has been abandoned. Abbe also said, At first I thought the reason why one pours off a little water from the mouth of the jug before drinking therefrom was the fear of scraps that may be on the surface, but now my master has told me it is because of evil waters, a demon in the service of our papa once. Went to fetch water from the river but was away a long time when he returned he was asked why were you so long he replied I waited until the evil waters had all gone in the meantime Talmud, Mastulin he saw them pouring off a little water from the mouth of the jug he exclaimed had I known that you were in the habit of doing this I would not have been away so long when Ardini came from Palestine he reported the omission to wash the hands before the meal caused one to eat swine's flesh and the omission to wash the hands after the meal caused a separation of a wife from her husband when Rabin came from Palestine he reported the omission to wash before the meal caused one to eat nibble and the omission to wash after the meal caused the murder Arnam and B. Isaac said in order to remember the statements of each bear in mind the following mnemonic Ardini came first and separated her and then Rabin came and killed her Arab reported the graver result in each case it was stated as regards water heated by fire, Hezekiah says one may not wash the hands there with
differ in this one is of the opinion that we must forbid a channel on account of a vessel and the other is of the opinion that we do not impose this precautionary measure R.E.D.B. Abin said in the name of our Isaac B. Ashi and the washing of the hands for common food was ordained only in order to acquire the habit with regard to Terra Moreover, it is a meritorious act. What is this meritorious act? Abay answered it is a meritorious act to hearken to the words of the sages. Rabbi answered it is a meritorious act to hearken to the words of our Eliezer Birak for it was taught it is written and whomsoever he that hath the issue touch it without having rinsed his hands in water he rinsed it our Eliezer Birak the sages found the biblical support for the law of washing the hands Rabbi asked Arnaman wherein is this indicated for it is written without having rinsed his hands in water can this mean that if he had rinsed his hands whatsoever he touched would be clean surely he requires immersion does he not the meaning must be and any other person that has not rinsed his hands is unclean our Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai they enjoyed the washing of the hands before eating fruit only for reasons of cleanliness the disciples understood from this that it was not a duty but that it was nevertheless a meritorious act Rabbi however said to them it is neither a duty nor a meritorious act but is merely an act of free choice this opinion of Rabbi differs from that of Arnaman for Arnaman Said whosoever washes his hands for fruit is of those that are haughty in spirit. Rabbi Barhanna said, I was once standing in the presence of RMI and RC when a basket of fruit was brought before them. They ate without first washing their hands, they gave me none of it. And each said the grace after meals for himself. Draw three conclusions from this I that the law of washing the hands does not apply to fruit, two that the law of common grace does not apply to fruit, and three that if two ate together it is a meritorious act on their part to separate, it has also been taught to the same effect. If two ate together it is a meritorious act on their part to separate, this is so only if both of them are learned. But if one is learned and the other illiterate, the former says grace and the other fulfills his obligation by listening. Our rabbis taught the washing of the hands for common food must reach up to the joint for terima, it must reach Talmud, must and be up to the joint. Sanctification of the hands and feet for temple service must reach up to the joint whatsoever is deemed to be an interposition with regard to the immersion of the body is also an interposition with regard to the washing of the hands and the sanctification of the hands and feet for the temple service rab set up to here is the washing for common food up to here for terima Samuel set up to here both for common food and for terima adopting the stricter view Arshis hate set up to here both for common food and for terima adopting the lenient view Barhide said I was once standing before RMI and he set up to here both for common food and for terima adopting the stricter view and you must not suppose that RMI said so because he was a priest for Armeisha the grandson of our Joshua B. Levi who was a Levi also set up to here both for common food and for terima adopting the stricter view rab said a person may wash both his hands in the morning and stipulate that it shall Serve him the holy long our Abana said to the inhabitants of Talmud, Mastul and the valley of Arab, both people like you that have not much water may wash the hands in the morning and stipulate that it shall serve the holy long. Some say this is allowed only in a time of need but not at ordinary times, hence it is at variance with Rab's view. Others say this is allowed even at ordinary times, and so it corresponds with Rab's view. Our Papa said a person may not wash the hands in a dike used for irrigation because the water here does not run directly from the human act. If however he is quite close to the bucket, he may wash his hands in the dike because there it runs directly from the human act. If the bucket was cracked so that liquid could filter in the waters are then considered as connected and he may immerse the hands in the dike. Rabba said a vessel which has a hole in it so that liquid can filter into it may not be used for washing the hands. Rabba also said a vessel in which there is not a quarter log of water may not be used for washing the hands but this surely cannot be for Rabbah has said a vessel which cannot hold a quarter log may not be used for washing the hands now it follows that if it can hold a quarter log even though there is not that much in it it may be used this is no difficulty for the one passage refers to one person and the other to two persons and we have learned a quarter log of water is sufficient for washing the hands of one person or even of two persons are she's hate asked Amimar are you particular about the vessel used he replied yes about the color of the water used he replied yes about the amount of water used he replied yes others report that he replied thus we are particular about the vessel and the color of the water but we are not particular about the amount of water used for we have learned a quarter log of water is sufficient for washing the hands of one person or even of two persons this however is not correct for it is different in that case since it is the residue of what was the proper amount for purification our Jacob of Nihar Pekot had a standard washing vessel made that contained a quarter log our Ashi had a standard jug made in Husel that contained a quarter log Rabbah also said if the stopper of a jar was fashioned into a vessel it may be used for washing the hands it has also been taught to the same effect as if the stopper of a jar was fashioned into a vessel it may be used for washing the hands if a water skin or a leather bottle was fashioned into a vessel it may be used for washing the hands a sack or a basket even though they were made to hold water may not be used for washing the hands the question was raised may one eat with a cloth wrapped around the hand or not must we apprehend lest the bare hand touch the food or not come in here but when they gave our less than an egg's bulk of food to eat they took it with a cloth aided outside the Sukhan did not say the grace after it now presumably if it was as large as an egg's bulk it would have been necessary to wash the hands no perhaps the only inference is if it was as large as an egg's bulk it would have been necessary to eat it in the Sukhan and to say the grace after it come and here from the following incident Samuel once found Rab eating with a cloth and said to him Talmud, Mastul and B is it right to do so and Rab replied I am very sensitive when Arzera went up to Palestine he found RMI and RC eating food with leather rags around their hands he exclaimed two great men like you to be in error about the incident of Rab and Samuel did not Rab reply I am very sensitive in truth here had forgotten the statement of our Talafa by me in the name of Samuel because they permitted those that eat Terima the use of a cloth but they did not permit those that eat common food in conditions of cleanness the use of a cloth and RMI and RC were Priest, the question was raised: Must he that is being fed by another wash his hands or not come and hear our Hunabi Sihar once was standing before our Hamdana and put some meat into our Hamdana's mouth, which he ate? Said our Hunabi, if you were not our Hamdana, I would not have fed you. Now, what was the reason for the exception in our Hamdana's case? Was it not because he was very careful not to touch the food? No, it was because he was most scrupulous and had certainly washed his hands previously. Come and here, our Zara said in the name of Rab, one should not put a piece of bread into the mouth of the waiter unless one knows that he has washed his hands. The waiter must say a benediction for each cup of wine that he receives, but does not say a benediction for each piece of bread. Our Yohanan said he must also say a benediction for each piece of bread. And our Papa said, in fact, there is no contradiction between Rab and our Yohanan. For one refers to the case where a notable person is sitting at the table and the other to a case where there was no notable person at the table nevertheless it expressly says unless one knows that he has washed his hands in the case of a waiter it is different because he is kept busy our rabbis taught a man should not give any bread to the waiter while the cup of wine is in the hand of the waiter or in his host's hand lest there occur a mishap at the table if the waiter has not washed his hands one may not put bread into his mouth the question was raised must he that feeds another wash his hands or not come and here it was taught in the school of Manasseh our Simeon B. Gamaliel says a woman may wash one hand in water and give some bread to her small child it was said of Shammai the elder that he would not feed a child even with one hand and the sages ordered him that he feed it with both hands Abay answered there it was on account of evil spirits come and here from the following incident the father of Samuel once found Samuel crying and asked him why are you crying because my teacher beat me but why because he said to me you were feeding my son and you did not wash your hands before doing so and why did you not wash he replied it was he that was eating so why should I wash said the father of Samuel it is not enough that he your teacher is ignorant of the law but he must also beat you the law is he that is fed by another must wash his hands he that feeds another need not wash his hands mission a person may wrap up flesh and cheese in one cloth provided they do not touch one another our Simeon B. Gamaliel says two people at an inn may eat at the same table the one flesh and the other cheese without hesitation Gamara and what does it matter if they do touch one
People will say Talmud, Mastulin and all cakes are forbidden but the cakes of Boethis are permitted. Surely Marsan of Arashi has explained that his girdle proves his special case mission if a drop of milk fell on a piece of flesh and it imparted a flavor into that piece it is forbidden if the pot was stirred then it is forbidden only if the drop of milk imparted a flavor into all that was in the pot. Gamar Abbe said in all cases wherever the flavor of a forbidden substance is perceptible but not the substance itself the mixture is forbidden by the law of the Torah for should you say that it is forbidden by rabbinic law only and the reason why we may not draw any conclusions from the case of flesh and milk is that it is an anomaly then by reason of that anomaly the mixture of flesh and milk should be forbidden even though the one does not impart a flavor in the other said Robert to him the Torah has expressed this prohibition by the term cooking rab said as soon as if the drop of milk imparted a flavor to the piece of flesh that piece becomes forbidden like nibble and it in turn renders all the other pieces forbidden for the Arab like kind Marzich or the son of Armari said to Rabbin let us consider Rabbin the statement of his evidently follows the view of Arjuda who holds that homogeneous substances can never neutralize each other but must we say that he disagrees with Rabba for Rabba said Arjuda is of the opinion that where one kind is mixed with a like kind and also with a different kind you disregard the like kind as if it were not there and if the different kind is more than the forbidden substance it will neutralize it he replied had it fallen into thin broth this would have been the case but here we must suppose that it fell into thick broth then what is his view if he holds that when the forbidden essence can be considered extracted it becomes permitted why should the piece of flesh be deemed as nibble one must say that he holds that even when it is considered extracted it is still forbidden and indeed it was so reported Rabbi Arhanan and Aryohanan hold that even when it can be considered extracted it is still forbidden Samuel Arsimian B. Rabbi and Arsimian B. Lakish hold that when it is considered extracted it becomes permitted is Rabbi of the opinion that even when it can be considered extracted it is still forbidden but it has been reported if an olive's bulk of flesh fell into a pot of milk the flesh says Rab is forbidden but the milk is permitted now if you maintain that Rab holds even when it is considered extracted it is still forbidden Talmud, Mastulin B. Talmud, Mastulin B. Why is the milk permitted is not the milk as nibble I still maintain that Rab holds that even when it can be considered extracted it is still forbidden but there it is exceptional for the verse states thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk whence it is clear that the Torah forbade the kid only and not the milk but does Rab hold that the Torah forbade the kid only and not the milk but it has been reported if a person cooked half an olive's bulk of flesh with half an olive's bulk of milk he suffers stripes says Rab if he eats it but does not suffer stripes for cooking it now if you maintain that Rab contends that the Torah forbade the kid only and not the milk why should he suffer stripes for eating it there was only half the minimum quantity rather we must say that Rab holds of you that the milk is also forbidden but in this case we must suppose that the olive's bulk of flesh fell into a boiling pot in which case it will absorb all the time and not discharge at all but eventually when the boiling subsides it will discharge the milk which it had absorbed by then he had already removed it the text stated above if a person cooked half an olive's bulk of flesh with half an olive's bulk of milk he suffers stripes says Rab if he eats it but does not suffer stripes for cooking it but say what you will if the two combine to make the prohibition then he should also suffer stripes for cooking it and if they do not combine then he should not suffer stripes even if he ate it really they do not combine but this is a case where each half an olive's bulk came from a large pot Levi however said he also suffers stripes for cooking it moreover Levi taught so in a very just as he suffers stripes for eating it he suffers stripes for cooking it and of what kind of Cooking did they speak of such cooking as others would eat thereof with regard to the law where the forbidden essence is considered extracted there is a dispute between Tanaim for it was taught if a drop of milk fell on a piece of flesh as soon as it imparted a flavor to the piece the piece itself is forbidden as nibble and it will in turn render all the pieces in the pot forbidden for the error of like kind so Arjuna but the sages say it is not forbidden at all until it imparts a flavor to the broth the sediments and the pieces said Rabbi the words of Arjuna are acceptable in the case where he neither stirred nor covered the pot and the words of the sages in the case where he either stirred it or covered it now what is meant by neither stirred nor covered should you say it means that he did not stir it at all or that he did not cover it at all then this piece will indeed have absorbed the drop of milk but will not at any time have given it out wherefore then are the other piece is forbidden and if it means that he did not stir it straightway but only later on or that he did not cover it straightway but only later on wherefore are any of the pieces forbidden true this piece had absorbed the drop of milk but it has also given it out he is of the opinion that even when the forbidden substance can be considered extracted it is still forbidden Talmud, Mastulin it follows then from this that Arjuna holds that the entire contents of the pot are forbidden even though he stirred it straightway and continued to do so till the very end or covered it straightway and kept it so till the very end but why should this be so the one piece has not absorbed any more than the others perhaps he did not stir it so well or he did not cover it so well the master further stated above and the words of the sages in the case where he either stirred it or covered it what is meant by either stirred it or covered it should you say it means that he Stirred it only later on but not at the beginning or that he covered it only later on but not at the beginning but in this case you have said that the words of Arjuna are acceptable it must therefore mean that he stirred it straightway and continued to do so till the very end or that he covered it straightway and kept it so till the very end from which it follows that the sages maintain that everything in the pot is permitted even though he stirred it only later on but not at the beginning or he covered it only later on but not at the beginning it is evident then that they hold that when the forbidden substance can be considered extracted it becomes permitted Araha Vifti said to Rabbanu why say they differ as to the law where the forbidden substance can be extracted perhaps all are of the opinion that even when the forbidden substance can be is extracted it is still forbidden but they differ about the neutralization of homogeneous substances Arjuna maintaining his Principle that homogeneous substances cannot neutralize each other and the rabbis maintain theirs that homogeneous substances can neutralize each other. This argument cannot be entertained if you concede that the sages in this dispute accept Arjuna as view concerning homogeneous substances, but they differ only as to the law in the case where the forbidden substance can be considered extracted. Then the meaning of rabbi is clear when he says the words of Arjuna are acceptable in this case and the words of the sages in that. But if you insist that all agree that even where the forbidden substance can be considered extracted, it is still forbidden, but they differ concerning the law of homogeneous substances, then surely rabbi should have said the words of Arjuna are acceptable in this, but not in that. And there is no more to be said about this mission. The gutter must be cut open and emptied of its milk. If he did not cut it open, he has not transgressed the law on account thereof. It Heart must be cut open and emptied of its blood if he did not cut it open he has not transgressed the law on account thereof Talmud, Mastulin B. Gamara Arzara said in the name of Rab he has not only not transgressed the law on account thereof but it is even permitted but have we not learned he has not transgressed the law on account thereof which implies that there is no transgression of the law but that it is forbidden strictly it is not forbidden at all but only because the second clause reads the heart must be cut open and emptied of its blood if he did not cut it open he has not transgressed the law on account thereof in which case it is true that there is no transgression of the law but clearly it is forbidden the Tana also stated in the first clause he has not transgressed the law on account thereof shall we say that the following teaching supports him and was taught the utter must be cut open and emptied of its milk if he did not cut it open he has not transgressed the law on account thereof the heart must be cut open and emptied of its blood if he did not cut it open he must cut it open after it had been cooked and it is permitted to be eaten now it is only the heart that must be cut open after the cooking but the udder need not be cut open at all perhaps the inference is only for the heart does the cutting open after the cooking suffice but for the udder the cutting open after the cooking would not be sufficient others report the passage thus Arzara said in the name of Rab he has not transgressed the law on account thereof but it is forbidden to be eaten shall we say that our mission supports him it reads he has not transgressed the law on account thereof which implies no doubt that there is no transgression of the law but that it is forbidden strictly it is not even forbidden but only because the second
Two and the one the milk is collected inside and the other it is not collected inside. How should one cut it open? Rab Judah replied, one must cut it lengthwise and breadthwise and press it against the wall. Our Eliezer once said to his attendant, cut it up for me and I will eat it. What does he teach us? Is it not a clear statement in our Mishnah? He teaches us that it is not necessary to cut it both lengthwise and breadthwise, or he teaches us that this would be sufficient even for cooking in a pot. Yalfa once said to Arnaman, observe for everything that the divine law has forbidden us, it has permitted us an equivalent, it has forbidden us blood, but it has permitted us liver, it has forbidden us intercourse during menstruation, but it has permitted us the blood of purification, it has forbidden us the fat of cattle, but it has permitted us the fat of wild beasts, it has forbidden us swine's flesh, but it has permitted us the brain of the Shibuta, it has forbidden us the gyrutha, but it has permitted us the tongue of fish, it has forbidden us the married woman, but it has permitted us the divorcee during the lifetime of her former husband, it has forbidden us the brother's wife, but it has permitted us the Levirate marriage, it has forbidden us the non-Jewish, but it has permitted us the beautiful woman taken in war. I wish to eat flesh and milk, where is its equivalent there upon Arnam and said to the butchers, give her roasted udders, but have we not learned the udder must be cut open? That is only when it is to be cooked in a pot, but does it not state in the Beritha above if the udder was cooked, which implies that only after the act it is permitted, but not in the first instance. Indeed, it is even permitted in the first instance, but only because the Tana of the side of Beritha desired to state the second clause. Visit the stomach Talmud, Mosulina was cooked with its milk, it is forbidden, in which case it is not permitted even after the act he stated in the first. Clause 2 If it was cooked when our Eliezer went up to Palestine, he met Zeiri to whom he said, Is there to be found here a Tana who recited to Rab the law of the udder? He immediately pointed out to him, or Isaac be a me there upon the latter said unto him, I did not recite to him any provision at all about the udder. Rab, however, found an open space and put a fence around it, for Rab once happened to be a Tatlush and overheard a woman asking her neighbor how much milk is required for. Cooking a ribbe of meat said Rab, do they not know that meat cooked with milk is forbidden? He therefore stayed there some time and declared the udder forbidden to the Markahana reported the passage as above, but our Jose B. Abba reported it as follows. Our Isaac B. Abudimi said, I taught him the prohibition only with regard to the udder of a milch cow and relying upon the keen perception of our high, he had stated this law in general about the udder Rabin and our Isaac B. Joseph once happened to be at our poppies and they were served with a dish of udder. Our Isaac B. Joseph ate of it, but Rabin did not say, Abbe, wherefore did not this childless Rabin eat? Consider this our poppies wife was the daughter of our Isaac Napaha and our Isaac Napaha was most strict in his actions. Now had she not seen this practice in her parents' home, she certainly would not have served them with it. In Surah, people did not eat the udder at all in Pumat, either they used to eat it. Rami B. Tamri, also known as Rami B. Dikulio. Pumadiva once happened to be in Surah on the eve of the Day of Atonement when the townspeople took all the udders of the animals and threw them away. He immediately went and collected them and ate them. He was then brought before Arhista who said to him, Why did you do it? He replied, I come from the place of Rab Judah who permits it to be eaten, said Arhista to him. But do you not accept the rule when a person arrives in a town he must adopt the restrictions of the town he has left and also the restrictions of the town he has entered. He replied, I ate them outside the city's boundary and with what did you roast them? He replied, with the kernels of grapes. Perhaps they were the kernels of wine used for idolatrous purposes. He replied, they had been lying there more than twelve months. Perhaps they were stolen goods. He replied, the owners must have certainly abandoned all rights to them for lichen was growing amongst them. He Arhista noticed that the other was not wearing the tefillin. And said to him, Why do you not wear the tefillin? He replied, I suffer from the bowels. And Rab Judah has said, One who suffers from the bowels is exempt from wearing the tefillin. He further noticed that the other was not wearing fringes on his coat and said to him, Why are you not wearing fringes? He replied, The coat I am wearing is borrowed. And Rab Judah has said, Talmud, Mosul and B.A. borrowed coat is for the first thirty days exempt from the tzitzis. While this was going on, a man was brought into the court for not honoring his father and mother. They bound him to have him flogged. Whereupon Rami said to them, Leave him alone, for it has been taught every commandment which carries its reward by its side does not fall within the jurisdiction of the court below. Said Arhista to him, I see that you are very sharp. He replied, If only you would come to Rab Judah's school, I would show you how sharp I am. Abbe said to Arsafra, When you go up there to Palestine, inquire of them how to. You deal with the liver when he came up, he met Arzerika who told him in reply, I once cooked the liver well for RMI and he ate it when he Arsafra returned. Abe said to him, I had no doubt at all that it itself was forbidden. I was only in doubt whether it could render forbidden other pieces that were in the pot with it or not. But why had you no doubt that it itself was forbidden? For we have learned it is not itself rendered forbidden, and you should have no more doubts as to whether it renders others forbidden. For we have learned the liver renders other pieces in the pot forbidden, but is not itself rendered forbidden, for it exudes and does not absorb. He replied, Perhaps there it refers to the liver of a forbidden animal Talmud. Mostul and A and the point is about the fat. What I wish to know is the law about the blood when he went up to Palestine a second time, he met Arzerika who told him in reply, This too should not cause you any doubt, for I and Janay, the son of R. And I once came to the house of Judah, the son of our Simeon, Bipazi, and we were served with the windpipe and its appendages, and we ate them. Our Ashi others say our Samuel of Zirakini had emerged at any proof from this saying, perhaps there the mouth of the windpipe was outside the pot, or perhaps that the liver was first dipped, for Arhuna used to dip it in vinegar, and Arnaman used to dip it in boiling hot water. Our Papa once suggested to Rabba that the vinegar in which the liver was dipped should be forbidden, but Rabba answered him, thus if the vinegar is forbidden, then it the liver too should be forbidden, for just as it exudes its juice into the vinegar, it will later on absorb it. Rabbi Shabbat once visited Arnaman's house and was served with well cooked liver, but he would nor eat it thereupon. They told him, Arnaman, there's a young scholar inside, namely Rabbi Shabbat, who will not eat it. Arnaman replied, Force Shabbat to eat it. This indeed is a matter of dispute between Tan Amar Eliza. Says the liver renders other pieces in the pot forbidden, but is not itself rendered forbidden because it exudes and does not absorb. Our Ishmael, the son of our Yohanan B. Baraka, says if it the liver was seasoned with spices, it renders others forbidden and is itself also rendered forbidden, and so too if it was well cooked, it renders others forbidden and is itself also rendered forbidden. Rabbi son of Arhuna once visited the house of Rabbi son of Arnaman and was served with three seahs of honey cakes. He said to them, Did you know that I was coming? They replied, You are no more important than it, and it is written and called the Sabbath a delight. In the meantime, he noticed the liver and in the artery thereof there was much blood. He said to them, Is it right to do so? They replied, What then should we do? He said, Cut it open lengthwise and breadthwise, and the part cut should be below. This is so only with the liver, but as to the spleen, it contains merely a fatty juice. Thus on the day when Samuel was blood they prepared for him spleen broth it was stated to roast the liver on top of meat is permitted for the blood glides off to roast the udder on top of meat is forbidden because the milk clings to and penetrates into the meat Ardemi of Nihardi reports this just the reverse thus to roast the udder on top of meat is permitted because the milk of a slaughtered animal is but a rabbinic prohibition liver on top of meat is forbidden because the blood is a biblical prohibition. Mirmar declared in a public exposition the law is both with regard to the liver and the udder under meat it is permitted on top of meat it is permitted only after the act but one may not do so in the first instance Arashi once visited the house of Rami B. Abba his father-in-law when he saw the son of Rami B. Abba Talmud, Mostul and B. putting liver on the spit on top of meat how presumptuous this young scholar is he exclaimed the rabbis may have permitted it after the act but did they permit it? In the first instance, but if a vessel was placed below to collect the drippings, even though the meat was on top of the liver, it is forbidden. But in what way is this different from the blood of flesh? The blood of flesh settles at the bottom of the vessel, whereas the blood of liver floats at the top. Our and said in the name of
been taught in a pot wherein meat had been cooked, the person may not boil milk, and if he did boil milk, therein it is forbidden if the pot imparts a flavor to the milk in the pot wherein terima food had been cooked, the person may not cook common food, and if he did cook common food, therein it is forbidden if the pot imparted a flavor to the common food, and when we put the question to you in the case of terima, I grant you that a priest could taste the food, but in the case of meat and Milk who may taste it, you replied a gentile cook could taste it. Now in our case too could not a gentile cook taste it, you replied that is so, but I am speaking of a case where there is no gentile cook available. It was stated if hot fish was served on a meat plate, Rab says it is forbidden to eat it with milk sauce. Samuel says it is permitted to eat it with milk sauce. Rab says it is forbidden because it imparted a flavor to it. Samuel says it is permitted because it imparted a flavor. Indirectly, this ruling of Rab, however, was not expressly stated by him, but was inferred from the following incident. Rab once visited the house of Arshai Mai Bihai, his grandson, he felt a pain in his eyes, and so they prepared for him an ointment on a dish. Later on he was served with stew in the same dish and he detected the taste of the ointment in it. He remarked, Does it impart such a strong flavor? But this does not prove anything in that case, it is different for the bitterness of the ointment. His very pungent R. Eliezer was once standing before Mar Samuel who was being served with fish upon a meat plate and was eating it with milk sauce. He Samuel offered him some but he would not eat it. Samuel said to him I once offered some to your master and he ate it and you won't eat it. He R. Eliezer then came to Rab and asked him has my master withdrawn his view. He replied heaven forfend that the son of Abba B. Abba should give me to eat that which I do not hold to be permitted. Arhuna and R. I. B. Ashi were once sitting one on the one side of the ferry of Surah and the other on the other side. One was served with fish on a meat plate which he ate with milk sauce. The other was served with figs and grapes in the course of the meal which he ate without reciting a benediction over them. One called out to the other ignoramus would your master do so. The other called back ignoramus would your master do so. The one answered and said I accept Samuel's view. The other answered I hold the view. Of Arhai for Arhai taught the benediction over bread exempts all other kinds of food and that over wine exempts all other kinds of drink from the necessity of another benediction. Hezekiah said in the name of Abbe the law is fish that was served on a meat plate may be eaten with milk sauce and a radish that was cut with a meat knife may not be eaten with milk sauce. This is so only in the case of a radish Talmud, Moss Tulin on account of its pungency it absorbs from the knife. But in the case of a cucumber one need only scrape away the surface of the cut and then one may eat it with a milk sauce. Turnip stocks are permitted, beet stocks are forbidden. But if one cut these and turnips alternately they are permitted. Ardini inquired of Arnaman may one place a jar of salt close to a jar of milk sauce. He replied it is forbidden and what about a jar of vinegar? He replied it is permitted. What is the difference between the two if you will measure out a core of salt? I will tell you the difference and what is it l in the one case the forbidden substance is discernible in the other it is not discernible a young pigeon once fell into a jar of milk sauce and our highness son of rabba pashronia permitted it thereupon rabba remarked to save our highness son of rabba pashronia is so wise as to permit such a thing for he our highness is of the opinion that samuel's dictum whatsoever is salted is counted as hot applies only to the case of food salted so much that it cannot be eaten on account of the salt but this milk sauce can be eaten together with the salt that is in it this was allowed only in the case of a raw pigeon but if it was roasted it would require to be peered around moreover if there were cuts in it it would be wholly forbidden likewise if it was seasoned with spices it would be wholly forbidden our said in the name of samuel a loaf of bread upon which one cut roast meat may not be eaten but only if the meat was red and only if it Blood penetrated through the bread, and only if the juice which exuded from the meat was thick. But if it was thin, then it does not matter. Samuel would throw that loaf of bread to the dogs. Arhunas used to give it his attendant, say, "What you will, if it is permitted, it is permitted to all, and if it is forbidden, it is forbidden to all." Arhunas was quite a special case, for he was fastidious in his food. Rabbi used to eat it and called it meat. One Arnaman again said, "In the name of Samuel, one may not place a vessel beneath meat that is roasting until all the redness of the meat has gone." How does one know this? Marzitra answered, "In the name of our Papa, when the smoke rises, our Ashi demurred, saying, perhaps the lower half has been roasted and the upper half has not. Our Ashi therefore said, there is no other remedy but to cast into the vessel two lumps of salt, Talmud, Mastul, and B, and to pour off the fat. But did Samuel really say so? Has not Samuel stated that a loaf of bread upon? Which one cut roast meat may not be eaten, it is different in that case for it the blood exudes only by reason of the pressure of the knife. Arnaman said if fish and fowl were salted together they are forbidden. What are the circumstances here if the vessel in which they were salted was not perforated then fowl with other fowl would also be forbidden and if the vessel was perforated then even fish with fowl should be permitted indeed the vessel was perforated but fish having a soft skin. Very quickly exude their juice whereas fowl are constricted and exude blood long after the fish have ceased to do so so that the latter will absorb from the fowl it happened to Armari Bira held that ritually slaughtered meat had been salted with trifamid he came before Rabbi who sad to him it is written the unclean to signify that the juice and the broth and the sediment of these which are unclean are forbidden Talmud, Mastulina why did he not tell him that it was forbidden? Because of Samuel's dictum, whatsoever is salted is counted as hot, and whatsoever is preserved is counted as cooked. As for Samuel's dictum, I would have thought that it applies only to the blood, but not to the juice and broth. He therefore teaches us the very that an objection was raised. It was taught if a clean fish was salted together with an unclean fish, it is permitted. Presumably, this is a case where both were salted. Is it not? No, it is a case where the clean fish was salted, but the unclean was not. But surely, since the subsequent clause states if the clean fish was salted and the unclean was not, it is permitted. It follows that the first clause deals with the case where both were salted. The second clause merely explains the first. Thus, if a clean fish was salted together with an unclean fish, it is permitted. When is this? So, when, for instance, the clean fish was salted, but the unclean was not, and indeed the supposition is reasonable, since if we assume the first clause to Refer to the case where both were salted, seeing that where both were salted, it is permitted. Is it necessary to tell us that it is permitted where only the clean fish was salted and not the unclean? This, however, is not a conclusive argument. It may be that the second clause was put in to make clear the reference in the first, lest you might think that the first clause refers to where the clean fish was salted and the unclean was not, leaving us to infer that where both were salted, it would be forbidden. He therefore adds the second clause where the clean fish was salted and the unclean was not, which shows that the first clause speaks of the case where both were salted, and even so, it is permitted. Come in here from the very last clause. But if the unclean fish was salted and the clean was not, it is forbidden. Now it is forbidden only where the unclean was salted and the clean was not, from which it follows that where both were salted, it would be permitted not at all, but since in the Preceding clause it teaches of the case where the clean fish was salted and the unclean was not. It teaches also in the second clause of the case where the unclean fish was salted and the clean was not. Mnemonic flesh put on the neck bone. Samuel said flesh cannot be drained of its blood unless it has been salted very well and rinsed very well. It was stated Arhuna said one must salt the flesh and then rinse it in a very that it was taught one must rinse it salted and then rinse it again. Indeed, they are not at variance for in the one case it was washed down by the butcher and in the other it was not washed by the butcher. Ardemi of Nihardia used to salt meat with coarse salt and then shake it off. Our measure she said we do not assume that the internal organs contain blood. This is explained as referring specifically to the rectum, the small intestines, and the coil of the colon. Samuel said one may not put salted meat except into a perforated vessel. Arshis had used to salt each piece of meat. Separately, but why not two together? Because the blood would run out of one piece and be absorbed by the other. Then in one piece also the blood may run out of one side and be absorbed by the other side. Indeed, there can be no difference. Samuel said in the name of our high if a man breaks the neck bone of an animal after it has been slaughtered, but before the life departed from it, he thereby makes the meat heavy, robs mankind, and causes the blood to remain in the limbs. It was asked, What is the true meaning? Is it that he makes the meat heavy and
Nebula is also forbidden to be cooked in milk. The verse therefore says in its mother's milk, Pesaphal is excluded since it has no mother's milk. Gemara, whence do we know this? Our Eliezer said because the verse says, and Judah sent the kid of the goats Talmud. Mas be here, it was a kid of the goats, but elsewhere, wherever kid is stated, it includes the young of the cow and the ewe, and might we not derive the rule from that? There is another verse which says the skins of the kids of it. Goats here it was kids of the goats but elsewhere wherever kid is stated it includes the young of the cow and the ewe and might we not derive the rule from the latter no because we have here two verses which teach the same thing and one may not draw any conclusions from two verses which teach the same thing this is well according to him who maintains that one may not draw conclusions from such verses but what can be said according to him who maintains that one may draw conclusions from such verses there are here two limiting particles goats the goat Samuel said kid includes the forbidden fat kid includes that which died of itself kid includes the photos kid excludes the blood kid excludes the afterbirth kid excludes the unclean animal in its mother's milk and not in the milk of a male in its mother's milk and not in the milk of a slaughtered animal in its mother's milk and not in the milk of an unclean animal but is not the term kid written only three times yet we give six Interpretations to it Samuel holds a view that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition so that the application of the prohibition of flesh and milk to forbidden fat and also to that which died of itself is derived from one verse blood is excluded because it does not come under the term kid the afterbirth also because it is a mere excretion two verses now remain one to include the photos and the other to exclude an unclean animal does Samuel then hold that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition surely Samuel has said in the name of our Eliezer once do we know that if a priest who was unclean ate unclean terima he would not be liable to death from the verse and die therein if they profaned it thus excluding this unclean terima since it already stands profaned you may say if you will that in all cases a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition but it is different therefore the divine law expressly Disallowed it by the expression and die therein if they profane it or you may say if you will that in all cases Samuel is of the opinion that a prohibition cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition but it is different here for the divine law expressly allowed it by the expression kid or further you may also say if you will the one is his own opinion the other is the opinion of his teacher our boy bm i inquired of rabba what is the law if one cooked flesh in the milk of a she-goat that had not given suck he replied since it was necessary for Samuel to state the expression in its mother's milk and not in the milk of a male it is clear that only a male is excluded for it cannot become a mother but in the milk of the she-goat since it can become a mother it is forbidden it was stated in the case where a man cooked forbidden fat in milk there is a dispute between rmi and rc one says he incurs stripes the other says he does not incur stripes shall we say that they differ in this he who says he incurs stripes maintains that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition and he who says he does not incur stripes maintains that a prohibition cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition no all agree that a prohibition cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition and consequently there is no dispute at all that for eating this he does not incur stripes they differ only with regard to the cooking thereof he who says he incurs stripes argues that there is only one prohibition here and he who says he does not incur stripes argues that for this very reason did the divine law express the prohibition of eating by the term cooking to signify the Talmud Mastulin whenever a man does not incur stripes for the eating he likewise does not incur stripes for the cooking thereof another version runs as follows there is no dispute at all that for the cooking he certainly incurs stripes they differ only with Regard to the eating thereof, he who says he does not incur stripes contends that a prohibition cannot be superimposed upon an existing prohibition, and he who says he incurs stripes contends that for this very reason did the divine law express the prohibition of eating by the term cooking to signify that whenever a man incurs stripes for the cooking, he likewise incurs stripes for the eating thereof. Alternatively, you may say one teaches one thing, the other teaches another thing, but they do not differ at all. An objection was raised if a man cooked flesh in way, he is not liable if he cooked blood in milk, he is not liable if he cooked bones, nerves, horns, or hoofs in milk, he is not liable if he cooked consecrated flesh that was pickle or leftover or unclean flesh in milk, he is liable. The tan is of the opinion that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition if a man cooked flesh in way, he is not liable. This supports the view of our simian be for we have. Learned way is counted as milk and the sap of olives is counted as oil said our simian belagish they taught this only in respect of rendering seeds susceptible to contract uncleanness but in respect of the prohibition of cooking flesh in milk way is not counted as milk our rabbis taught it is written thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk from this I know that the kid is forbidden in its mother's milk but once do I know that it is also forbidden in cow's milk or in ewe's milk. From the following a fortiori argument if in the milk of its mother a species with which the kid may be made it is forbidden to cook the kid how much more in the milk of a cow or of a ewe with which species the kid may not be made it is it forbidden to cook the kid and the text also states in its mother's milk but why is this latter verse necessary it has been inferred from the a fortiori argument has it not Arashi answered because one can argue that the first proposition of a for your argument is unsound once do you this the argument from its mother is against this it may be argued that is so in the case of its mother since it is forbidden to be slaughtered with the kid on the same day will you then say the same in the case of a cow which is not forbidden to be slaughtered with the kid on the same day the text therefore teaches in its mother's milk another berry that teaches it is written in its mother's milk from this I know that the kid is forbidden in its mother's milk but where do I know that it is forbidden in the milk of its older sister from the following a fortiori your argument if in the milk of its mother which enters the cattle pen together with the kid to be tithed it is forbidden to cook the kid how much more in the milk of its older sister which does not enter the cattle together with the kid to be tithed is it forbidden to cook the kid and the text also teaches in its mother's milk but why is this latter verse Necessary it has been inferred from the fortiori argument has it not Arashi answered because one can argue that the first proposition of the fortiori argument is unsound once do you this the argument from its mother as against this it may be argued that is so in the case of its mother since it is forbidden to be slaughtered with the kid on the same day will you then say the same in the case of its older sister which is not forbidden to be slaughtered with the kid on the same day the text therefore teaches in its mother's milk we have thus learned the prohibition with regard to the older sister but once do we know it with regard to the younger sister it can be inferred from both together but from which do you proceed to make the inference you may infer it from its mother but if it be objected to that this is so in the case of its mother since it may not be slaughtered with the kid on the same day then the case of the older sister argues otherwise and if it be objected to that this is so in the case of the older sister since it does not enter the cattle with the kid to be tithed then the case of its mother argues otherwise the argument thus goes around the reason given for this does not apply to the other and the reason given for the other does not apply to this one what they have in common is that each is flesh and in the milk of each the kid may not be cooked thus I will include the younger sister too for since it is flesh the kid may not be cooked in its milk but by this argument the older sister can also be inferred from both together this is indeed so then for what purpose do I require the verse in its mother's milk it is required for what has been taught it is written in its mother's milk we know that it is forbidden in its mother's milk Talmud Mastul and B but once do we know that it is forbidden in its own milk from the following a fortiori argument if where the fruit is not forbidden with the fruit as in the Case of slaughtering the fruit with the dam is forbidden how much more therefore where the fruit is forbidden with the fruit as in the case of cooking is the fruit forbidden with the dam and the text also teaches in its mother's milk but why is this latter verse necessary it has been inferred from the a fortiori argument has it not arahat boy bm i answered because we can refute the argument thus a cold the offspring of a mare and which is also the brother of a mule could prove otherwise for the fruit is forbidden with the fruit nevertheless the fruit with the dam is permitted but surely this is no refutation since that is due to the seed of the sire only for in truth the case of a male mule the offspring of a mare and which is also the brother of a female mule could prove the reverse for the fruit is permitted with the fruit and the fruit with the dam is forbidden rather said mar the son of robina because one can refute the argument thus a slave the son of a bond
of our Eliezer wherever scripture says it shall not be eaten or thou shalt not eat or ye shall not eat a prohibition both in respect of eating and in respect of deriving benefit is implied unless scripture expressly states otherwise as it did in the case of Nibble for it has been taught the verse ye shall not eat of anything which dieth of itself unto the stranger that is within thy gates thou mayest give it that he may eat it or thou mayest sell it unto a Gentile only tells me that it may be given away as a gift to a stranger or sold to a Gentile how do I know that it may be sold to a stranger because scripture says unto the stranger thou mayest give it or thou mayest sell it how do I know that it may be given away to a Gentile because scripture says thou mayest give it or thou mayest sell it unto a Gentile hence it may be derived that both giving and selling may be applied to a stranger or to a Gentile so our Meir Arjuda says the words are to be taken literally this Giving away to a stranger and selling to a Gentile, what is the reason for our Judah's view? He contends thus were the words to be interpreted according as our Meir suggested. Upon law should have said, Ye shall not eat of anything that dieth of itself unto the stranger that is within thy gates, thou mayest give it that he may eat it as well as sell it. Wherefore does it say, or to prove that the words are to be taken literally, this giving away to a stranger and selling to a Gentile, and our Meir he would reply that or indicates that it is preferable to give it away as a gift to a stranger rather than sell it to a Gentile, and our Judah he would say that no scriptural term is needed to indicate this preference of giving it away to the stranger rather than selling it to a Gentile. It stands to reason since the one you are bidden to support, whereas the other you are not bidden to support, Nemotic Sabbath plowing divers kinds of seeds and its young letting the mother bird go from the nest. According to this Talmud, Mosul and not what has been unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath be forbidden since I have declared it to be abominable unto you. Scripture says, For it is holy unto you, that means it is holy, but what has been prepared on it is not holy. Furthermore, if a man plowed with an ox and an ass together, or if he muzzled a cow when it was treading out the corn, should it not be forbidden since I have declared these acts to be abominable to you? Surely, if what has been unlawfully prepared on the Sabbath, which is a grave matter, is permitted, how much more so these should not the produce of a field sown with diverse kinds of seeds be forbidden since I have declared it to be abominable to you from the fact that the divine law states with regard to diverse kinds in the vineyard, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled, tikdash, which has been interpreted as lest it be burnt in fire, took it as it follows. That diverse kinds of seeds sown in a field are permitted, but perhaps the inference is this: whereas diverse kinds in a vineyard are forbidden to be eaten, and also to be made use of diverse kinds of seeds are forbidden to be eaten, but are permitted to be made use of. These latter have been compared with diverse kinds of cattle. For it is written, Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with the diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with two kinds of seed. And just as the issue of the mating of diverse kinds of thy cattle is permitted, so the produce of diverse kinds of seed sown in thy field is permitted. And whence do we know that the issue of diverse kinds of cattle is permitted from the fact that the divine law has prohibited the offering of a crossbreed to the Most High? We may infer that to the common person it is permitted, should not it, and its young be forbidden, since I have declared it to be abominable to you, since the divine law has forbidden an animal that is out of. Time for an offering to the Most High it follows that such is permitted to the common person should not the mother bird which has been sent away from the nest be forbidden since I have declared it to be abominable to you the Torah would not order to send it away if it would thereby lead to transgression our Simeon Belagish said whence do we know that flesh cooked in milk is forbidden to be eaten from the verse eat not of it raw nor cooked in any cooking with water now the verse need not have added in any cooking why then does it say in any cooking to teach you that there is another cooking which is also forbidden to be eaten like this and which is it, it is flesh cooked in milk said to him are Yohan and Talmud, Mosul and B and is the following teaching of Rabbi so unsatisfactory for it was taught the verse thou shalt not eat it refers to flesh cooked in milk you say it refers to flesh cooked in milk perhaps it refers to some other thing that is forbidden in the Torah. You can reply go forth and derive it by one of the thirteen exegetical principles by which the Torah is expounded namely the meaning of a verse is to be deduced from its context now what does this context deal with with that which partakes of the characteristics of two kinds then this verse also deals with that which partakes of the characteristics of two kinds from that teaching I might have thought that the prohibition was only in respect of eating but not in respect of deriving benefit from it he therefore teaches us another teaching and whence does Rabbi infer that it is also forbidden to derive any benefit from it he infers it from the following argument it is written here for thou art a holy people unto the Lord and it is written there there shall be no consecrated prostitutes of the sons of Israel just as there the prohibition refers to the pleasure derived therefom so here to the pleasure derived therefrom the school of our Eliezer taught ye shall not eat of anything that Dieth of itself thou mayest sell it thou shalt not see the kid etc. The Torah here implies that when you sell it you may not first cook it in milk and then sell it the school of our Ishmael taught thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk is stated three times one is a prohibition against eating it one a prohibition against deriving benefit from it and one a prohibition against cooking it it was taught Isi B. Judah says whence do we know that flesh cooked in milk is forbidden it is written here for thou art a holy people and it is written there and ye shall be holy men unto me therefore ye shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field just as there it is forbidden as food so here it is forbidden as food we have thus learned that it is forbidden as food how do we know that it is forbidden for all use I will tell you it follows a for shiori for law which is not produced by transgression is forbidden for all use and surely flesh cooked in milk which is Produced by transgression is forbidden for all use, but if you object this may be true of Orla only since it had no period of fitness. I reply the law concerning leaven during Passover shows otherwise, namely that although it had a period of fitness, it is nevertheless forbidden for all use, and if you object this may be true of leaven during Passover only since it carries with it the penalty of Karath. I reply the law concerning diverse kinds in the vineyard shows otherwise, namely that although it does not carry with it the penalty of Karath, nevertheless it is forbidden for all use, wherefore is the analogy necessary? Surely it can all be inferred from the aforciori argument derived from Orla. Thus if Orla which is not produced by transgression is forbidden both as food and for all use, how much more than is flesh cooked in milk which is produced by transgression is forbidden both as food and for all use, because one could refute the argument thus the law in the case where one Plowed with an ox and an ass together, or where one muzzled a cow when it was treading out the corn, can prove otherwise. Namely, although it was produced by transgression, it is nevertheless permitted. Wherefore, was it necessary to reply in the argument? The law concerning diverse kinds in the vineyard shows otherwise. He could have replied. The law of Orla shows otherwise. The argument would then have gone round again with the result that S.C. The law of flesh cooked in milk would have been inferred from the common features of the others. Are Ashi answered because one could have refuted the argument. Thus, the law of Nibla would show otherwise. For although it is forbidden as food, nevertheless it is permitted for all use. Said Armorde to Arashi, we have learned the following on the authority of our Simeon Belakish. An inference drawn from cases with common features can be refuted only by those cases and not by other cases. If so, I can very well be inferred from the common features. Can it not because one can refute it thus the cases which present these common features are peculiar in that they are both products of the soil but now too the argument can be refuted thus this may be so of diverse kinds in the vineyard since it deals with products of the soil said our Mordecai to our Ashi we have learned the following on the authority of our Simeon B. Lakish, an inference drawn from cases with common features can be refuted by indicating any peculiarity whatsoever but an argument which employs the expression no if you say it in this will you say it and that can only be refuted by inducing a feature in the one which is less or more grave than in the other and not by any peculiarity whatsoever but we may refute all the cases thus this may be so of all these cases since they all deal with products of the soil our Mordecai then said to our Ashi we have learned the following on the authority of our Simeon B. Lakish, Talmud, Mastulin, and argument inferring one case from Another case can be refuted only by inducing a feature in the one case which is less or more grave than in the other and not by any peculiarity whatsoever an argument inferring one case
The vineyard they are forbidden as soon as they have taken root if sown elsewhere and brought into the vineyard if they increase the two hundredth part they are forbidden but if they had not increased they would not be forbidden our mission is not in accordance with the following tenet for it has been taught our Simeon be Judah says on behalf of our Simeon flesh cooked in milk is forbidden as food but is permitted for general use for it is written for thou art an holy people unto the Lord. Thy God thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk whilst elsewhere it is written and ye shall be holy men unto me therefore ye shall not eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field ye shall cast it to the dogs just as there it is forbidden as food but is permitted for general use so here too it is forbidden as food but is permitted for general use our Akiba says wild animals and fowls etc but have not these been applied to Samuel's interpretations our Akiba is of the opinion that a prohibition can be superimposed upon an existing prohibition therefore no specific verse is necessary to show that the prohibition of flesh and milk applies to forbidden fat or to the flesh of an animal that died of itself moreover the prohibition naturally applies to an embryo for it is as an ordinary kid consequently all the expressions are superfluous and serve therefore to exclude wild animals foul and unclean animals our Jose the Galilean says it is written ye shall not eat of anything etc what is the difference between the views of our Jose the Galilean and our Akiba the difference between them is as regards wild animals our Jose the Galilean holds that wild animals are prohibited biblically whereas our Akiba holds that wild animals are prohibited rabbinically or you may say the difference between them is as regards fowls our Akiba maintains that wild animals and fowls are not included in the prohibition of the Torah but are prohibited rabbinically whereas our Jose the Galilean maintains that fowls are not even prohibited by the rabbis. There is also a very taught to the same effect in the place of our Eliezer. They used to cut wood on the Sabbath to make charcoal in order to forge an iron instrument. In the place of our Jose the Galilean, they used to eat fowls flesh cooked in milk. Levi once visited the house of Joseph the Feller and was served with a peacock's head cooked in milk and said nothing to them about it when he came to Rabbi and related this. Rabbi said to him, Why did you not lay them under a ban? He replied, Because it was the place of our Judah be there, and I imagine that he must have expounded to them the view of our Jose the Galilean who said a fowl is excluded since it has no mother's milk. Mishnah the milk in the stomach of an animal of a Gentile or in the stomach of a nibble is forbidden if a man curdled milk with the skin of the stomach of an animal that was validly slaughtered. Talmud, Mosul and B and it imparted its. Flavor to the milk it is forbidden the milk in the stomach of a validly slaughtered animal which had sucked from a trophy animal is forbidden the milk in the stomach of a trophy animal which had sucked from a valid animal is permitted because the milk remains collected inside Gemara but is not the stomach of an animal of a Gentile nibbler are whom I answered we are dealing here with the case of a kid that was bought from a Gentile and we apprehend that it sucked from a trophy animal but do we apprehend that it sucked from a trophy animal behold it has been taught one may buy eggs from Gentiles and need have no fear lest they are of birds that were nibbler or trophy say rather we apprehend lest it sucked from an unclean animal and why is it that we do not apprehend sucking from a trophy animal but we do apprehend sucking from an unclean animal because trophy animals are not common whilst unclean animals are if these are common and even with regard to our own kids we should be apprehensive with regard to our own since we keep away from unclean animals and whenever we see them together we separate them the rabbis impose no restriction as a precaution with regard to theirs however since they do not keep away from unclean animals and whenever they see them together they do not separate them the rabbis impose a restriction as a precaution Samuel answered they are to be taken as one thus the milk in the stomach of an animal slaughtered by a Gentile is nibbler and therefore forbidden but how could Samuel have said so behold Samuel has stated the reason for forbidding the cheese of Gentiles is because they curdle it with the skin of the stomach of a nibbler this implies does it not that the milk in the stomach is permitted there is no contradiction here this SC our mission was taught before here Joshua retracted the other after he retracted the milk in the stomach of a validly slaughtered animal which had sucked from a trophy animal is forbidden etc but does not the first clause state the milk in the stomach of an animal of a gentile or in the stomach of a nibble is forbidden or as she answered in the first clause it would appear that one is eating nibble but here in the final clause the animal has been slaughtered said to him rabba but is this not all the more reason to forbid it for if in the case of nibble which is a loathsome matter and if you were to permit the milk in its stomach one would not come to eat of its flesh you say it is forbidden is it not then all the more reason to forbid the milk in the stomach of a trophy animal which had been slaughtered for if you were to permit it one would come to eat of its flesh rather said our isaac in the name of our yohan and there is no contradiction here this the first clause was taught before here joshua retracted the other the final clause after he retracted the first clause however of our mission was allowed to stand our high b said in the Name of our Yohanan one may curdle milk with the milk in the stomach of a nibbler but not with the milk in the stomach of an animal slaughtered by an idolater thereupon our Simeon B. Abba said before him this is, is it not in accordance with the view of our Eliezer who maintains that the thoughts of an idolater are usually directed towards idolatry he replied of course according to whom else could it be when our Samuel B. Our Isaac came from Palestine he reported in the name of our Yohanan one may curdle milk with the milk in the stomach both of a nibbler and an animal slaughtered by an idolater for we are not concerned with the view of our Eliezer the law is one may not curdle milk with the skin of the stomach of a nibbler but one may with the milk in the stomach of a nibbler and also with the milk in the stomach of an animal slaughtered unto idolatry one may also curdle milk with the milk found in the stomach of a validly slaughtered animal which had sucked from a trifle. Animal and certainly with the milk found in the stomach of a trophy animal which had sucked from a valid animal because the milk that is collected within is considered as dung mission in certain respects the prohibition of the fat is more strict than the prohibition of the blood and in certain respects the prohibition of the blood is more strict than the prohibition of the fat the prohibition of the fat is more strict than that the fat Talmud, Mosul and I is subject to the law of sacrilege. And the penalty for pickle nut heart and uncle and is incurred by it which is not the case with the blood and the prohibition of the blood is more strict for it applies to cattle wild animals and birds whether clean or unclean but the prohibition of the fat applies to clean cattle only tomorrow once do we know this Arjan answered it is written as it is taken off from the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings now what do we learn from the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings indeed it Comes as a teacher but turns out to be a pupil we must compare the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings with the bullock of the anointed high priest as the bullock of the anointed high priest is subject to the law of sacrilege so the ox of the sacrifice of peace offerings is also subject to the law of sacrilege said our hand to him and is the following teaching of rabbi unsatisfactory the verse all the fat is the lord signifies that the sacrificial portions of the less holy sacrifices are also subject to the law of sacrilege Abbe answered both verses are necessary for our purpose for had the divine law only stated all the fat I should have said that only the fat is subject to the law of sacrilege but the call and the two kidneys are not the divine law therefore stated the verse as it is taken off and had the divine law only stated the verse as it is taken off I should have said that the fat of the fat tail of a lamb which is not found in an ox is not subject to the law of sacrilege the divine law therefore stated all the fat is the Lord said Armari to Arzi but if the fat tail of a lamb is included under the term fat should it not then be forbidden to be eaten he replied it is for your sake that it is written you shall eat no fat of ox or sheep or goat thus the Torah has forbidden only such fat as is common to ox sheep and goat Arashi answered it is always referred to as the fat of the fat tail but never as fat simply if so it should not be subject to the law of sacrilege obviously then the better answer is that of Arzi but which is not the case with the blood once do we know this all answered scripture says to you that is it shall be yours the school of our Ishmael taught scripture says to make atonement that is I have given it to you for an atonement and not that you be liable for sacrilege on its account are Yohanan said scripture says it is that is it is the same before the atonement as after the atonement just as after the atonement did. Residue of the blood is not subject to the law of sacrilege so before the atonement the blood is not subject to the law of sacrilege perhaps I ought to say it is the same
Draw conclusions from such texts, but according to him who maintains that one may draw conclusions from such texts, what is to be said? There are two Talmud, Mashul and B limiting particles stated here. It is written, and he shall put them, and there it is written, whose neck was broken. Why are the three different texts with regard to the blood necessary? One excludes blood from the law of Nahar, another excludes it from the law of sacrilege, and the third excludes it from the law of uncleanness. No. Text, however, is necessary to exclude it from the law of pickle, for we have learned whatsoever is rendered permissible, whether for man or for the altar, by a certain right is subject to the law of pickle, but the blood is itself that which renders other parts of the offering permissible. C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-X mission of the high meat juice sediment, A-L-A-L bone sinews, horns, and hoofs are to be included to make up the minimum quantity in order to convey food uncleanness, but not to make up the minimum quantity in order to convey nibble uncleanness. Similarly, if a man slaughtered an unclean animal for a gentile and it still rides convulsively, it can convey food uncleanness, but it can only convey nibble uncleanness after it is dead or its head has been chopped off. Scripture has thus intimated more cases that convey food uncleanness than those that convey nibble uncleanness are Judah says if so much of A-L-A-L was collected together so that there was an olive's bulk in one place, one would. Thereby become liable tomorrow we have learned here in our mission what our rabbis have taught elsewhere protections can be included to make up the quantity required for a lighter uncleanness but protections cannot be included to make up the quantity required for a graver uncleanness whence do we know that protections can be included for a lighter uncleanness from the following teaching of the tana of the school of our Ishmael it is written upon any sowing seed which is to be sown that is to say in the manner in which men take out the seeds for sowing wheat in its husk barley in its husk lentils in their husks and whence do we know that protections cannot be included for a graver uncleanness from the following which our rabbis taught he that toucheth the carcass thereof shall be unclean but not he that touches the hide which has not an olive's bulk of flesh attached to a talmud mostul and might also think that he that touches the hide at a part where the flesh is Attached on the other side shall not be unclean. Scripture therefore says shall be unclean. What does this mean? Rabbi other say cut. He replied there is something missing. Fin that passage and it should read as follows. He that touches the carcass thereof shall be unclean, but not he that touches the hide which has not an olive's bulk of flesh attached to it. Even though the hide brings it up to an olive's bulk, I might then also exclude the case of the hide which has an olive's bulk of flesh attached to it. So that if a man were to touch the hide at a part where the flesh is attached on the other side, he would not, I suggest, be unclean for it. The hide does not act even as a handle. Scripture therefore says shall be unclean. We have learned elsewhere whatever serves as a handle to a bulk, but not as a protection is a medium whereby the bulk contracts uncleanness and conveys uncleanness, but is not included together with the bulk to make up the size of an egg to convey uncleanness. Whatever serves as a protection even if it does not serve as a handle is a medium whereby the bulk contracts uncleanness and conveys uncleanness and is included together with the bulk whatever serves neither as a handle nor as a protection is no medium so that the bulk neither contracts uncleanness nor conveys uncleanness thereby where is there any scriptural authority for the law of handles it is written but if water be put upon the seat and out of their carcass fall thereon it is unclean unto you unto you that is everything that you make use of with regard to the food stuff thus the verse includes handles it is also written and if any animal which serves as food unto you die unto you that is everything that you make use of with regard to this carcass conveys uncleanness thus the verse includes handles hence we see that a handle can convey uncleanness to the bulk in the case of food stuffs and also that a handle can convey uncleanness from the bulk in the case of a carcass that a protection can convey uncleanness to and from the bulk does not require any verse for it is inferred by an fortiori argument from a handle thus if a handle which affords no protection can convey uncleanness to and from the bulk how much more that which affords protection why then does the divine law state a verse with regard to a protection it is surely to teach that it is to be included together with the bulk but I might say a handle can convey uncleanness to the bulk but not from it and a protection can convey uncleanness both to and from the bulk but a handle cannot convey uncleanness from the bulk neither is a protection to be included together with the bulk you surely cannot say that a handle can convey uncleanness to the bulk but not from the bulk for if it can bring in the uncleanness it certainly can pass it on then I might say a handle can convey uncleanness from the bulk but not to the bulk and a protection can convey Uncleanness both to and from the bulk, but a handle cannot convey uncleanness to the bulk, neither is a protection to be included together with the bulk. There is another verse which also teaches the law of handles, for it is written whether of an arranged for pots it shall be broken in pieces, they are unclean and shall be unclean unto you, unto you, that is everything that you make use of with regard to it is unclean, thus the verse includes handles, which of these verses is superfluous if it. Divine law had stated the law of handles in connection with seeds, and it was intended that the others be inferred from them, the objection could be raised, thus that is so with seeds only since they have more conditions of uncleanness than the others, and if the divine law had stated it in connection with the oven, and it was intended that the others be inferred from it, the objection could be raised, thus that is so with the oven only since it renders foodstuffs unclean by its airspace, and if the divine law had stated it in connection with nibble and it was intended that the others be inferred from it the objection could be raised thus that is so with the nibble only since it can render man unclean it can convey uncleanness by carrying and it is its own source of uncleanness one could not indeed infer one case from the other but one could infer one case from the other two cases which one would you infer if the divine law had not stated it in connection with seeds but you would have inferred it from the other two the objection could be raised thus that is so with the other cases since they become unclean without first having been rendered susceptible thereto will you say the same of seeds which become unclean only if first they have been rendered susceptible thereto said Arhuna the son of our Joshua but surely fruit which has not been rendered susceptible to uncleanness is in the same condition as an oven which is not yet finished rather you could raise this Objection that is so with the other cases since they both become unclean without contact with unclean matter will you say the same of seeds which become unclean only by contact and if the divine law had not stated it in connection with the oven but you would have inferred it from the others the objection could be raised thus that is so with the other cases since each is a foodstuff the fact is the divine law need not have stated it in connection with nibble for you could have inferred it from the others for what purpose then is the law of handle stated in connection with nibble if then the law of handle serves no purpose in connection with nibble you may apply it to other cases hence you derive that a handle can convey uncleanness both to and from the bulk and that a protection can be included together with the bulk but still the law of handle stated in connection with nibble was absolutely necessary for had not the divine law stated it in connection with nibble I should have said it is enough if the inferred law is as strict as that from which it is inferred and therefore just as the others cannot render a man unclean so nibble cannot render a man unclean in truth the law of handles in connection with nibble is really necessary but it is the law of protections in connection with nibble that is unnecessary why did the divine law state it will you say to teach that it can be included together with the bulk surely you have already said that it cannot be included and to teach that it can convey the uncleanness from the bulk is unnecessary for it is already inferred by an fortiori argument from the law of handles if then the law of protections in connection with nibble serves no purpose you may apply it to the law of handles in connection with nibble and if the law of handles in connection with nibble also serves no purpose you may then apply it to the law of handles in connection with other cases hence we derive that a Handle can convey uncleanness both to and from the bulk and a protection can be included together with the bulk Talmud, Mostul and B but I could say this if the law of protections in connection with Nibla serves no purpose then you may apply it to the law of protections in connection with other cases with the result that we learn that a protection can convey uncleanness to the bulk and also that a protection can be included together with the bulk but a handle I maintain cannot convey uncleanness to the bulk indeed at the very outset it must be admitted that the law of handle stated in connection with foodstuffs refers to the handle as conveying the uncleanness to the bulk then for what purpose is the law of protection stated in connection with Nibla for its own purpose but for what will you say to teach that it can be included together with the bulk surely you have already said that it cannot be included and to teach that it can convey uncleanness to and from the bulk is unnecessary for it can surely be inferred by an fortiori
as a connective for the uncleanness but a handle does not serve as a connective for rendering susceptible to uncleanness or Yohanan says a handle serves as a connective both for the uncleanness and for rendering susceptible to uncleanness wherein do they differ if you wish you may say that they differ in the interpretation of a verse or if you wish you may say that they differ in the logical reasoning if you wish you may say that they differ in the interpretation of a verse 1. Maintains a scriptural expression may be interpreted as referring to the immediately preceding subject but not to what is anterior thereto whilst the other maintains a scriptural expression may be interpreted as referring both to the immediately preceding subject and to what is anterior thereto or if you wish you may say that they differ in the logical reasoning one maintains being rendered susceptible to uncleanness is the first stage of uncleanness whilst the other maintains being rendered. Susceptible to uncleanness is not the first stage of uncleanness. There is a very the taught which accords with the view of our Yohanan. It was taught as a handle serves as a connective for the uncleanness, so it serves also as a connective for rendering susceptible to uncleanness. And as seeds can contract uncleanness only when they have been plucked up, so can they be rendered susceptible to uncleanness only when they have been plucked up. Rap said a handle cannot serve as a connective to anything less than the size of an olive, and a protection cannot serve as a protection to anything less than the size of a bean. Our Yohanan said a handle can serve as a connective to anything less than the size of an olive, and a protection can serve as a protection to anything less than the size of a bean. An objection was raised if there were two bones of a corpse that bore each a half olive's bulk of flesh at one end, and a man brought into a house the other two ends, and the house. Overshadowed them, the house becomes unclean. Judah Binakosa says in the name of our Jacob, how can two bones each bearing only a half olive's bulk of flesh at the other end be reckoned together to make up an olive's bulk? Talmud, Mosulin, and now how does Rab interpret this teaching to accord with his view if he regards it the bone as a handle? Then the first opinion conflicts with his end if he regards it as a protection, and the second opinion conflicts with his if you wish you may say he regards it as a handle, or if you wish you may say he regards it as a protection, if you wish you may say he regards it as a handle, and he is in agreement with Judah Binakosa, or if you wish you may say he regards it as a protection, and he is in agreement with the first Tanna. Our Yohanan, however, says that it can only be regarded as a handle, and so he is in agreement with the first Tanna. Come and here, our Judah says if a thigh bone has an olive's bulk of flesh attached to it, it brings about the Uncleanness to the whole other say even if it has flesh only the size of a bean attached to it it is sufficient to bring about the uncleanness to the whole now how does Rab interpret this teaching if he regards it the bone as a handle then the second opinion conflicts with his and if he regards it as a protection then the first opinion conflicts with his if you wish you may say he regards it as a handle and he is then in agreement with Arjuna or if you wish you may say he regards it as a protection and he is in agreement with the others Arjuna however says that it can be regarded as a protection and so he is in agreement with the others but do not the others expressly mention the size of a bean it is only because the first ten SC Arjuna stated a fixed quantity that they also stated a fixed quantity Rabba said there is indeed a proof that the very the regards it as a protection for it states a thigh bone this is conclusive it was stated Arjuna said that that was the Minimum size, but our Yohanan said that that was not the minimum size. But does it not expressly say the size of a bean? It was only because the first ten is stated a fixed quantity that they two stated a fixed quantity. Come and here we have learned our Eliezer B. Ezra declares that of a bean clean, but that of other poles unclean, since one is pleased with it when handling them. As Araha, the son of Rabbah, had suggested in another case that it referred to the stock which is considered a handle. So here too it refers to the stock and it is considered here a handle. And what is meant by when handling them? It means when moving them about. Come and here from the following teaching of the ten of the school of our Ishmael, it is written upon any sowing seed which is to be sown. That is to say, in the manner in which men take out the seeds for sowing wheat in a tusk, barley in a tusk, lentils in their husks, it is different with a separate entity. Our Ashai raised the question. Talmud, Mosulin. B. Can two protections be reckoned together or not? But what is the actual case if you say that one is over the other? But can it be said that a protection over a protection has the law of protection? Behold, we have learned our Judah says an onion has three skins, the innermost skin, whether it is entire or has holes in it, is reckoned together with the edible part. The middle skin, if it is entire, is reckoned together, but if it has holes in it, it is not reckoned together, the outermost skin in either. Case is clean. Our Ashai really raised this question. What is the law of the protection of a foodstuff was divided since this half of the protection does not protect the other half of the foodstuff, and the other half of the protection does not protect this half of the foodstuff, they cannot be reckoned together, or it may be since each half of the protection protects its own half of the foodstuff, they can be reckoned together. Come and here our Elias or B. Ezra declares that of the bean. Clean, but that of other poles unclean since one is pleased with it when handling them. Araha, the son of Rabba answered, it refers to the stock which is considered as a handle, and what is meant by when handling them, it means when moving them about. Come and here from the following teaching of the Tana of the school of our Ishmael, it is written upon any sowing seed which is to be sown, that is to say, in the manner in which men take out the seeds for sowing wheat in its husk, barley in its husk lentils. In their husk, says Araha, the son of Rabba had suggested above that it referred to the stock which is considered a handle, so here it refers to the stem of the ear of wheat which is considered a protection granted, however, that the upper rows need the lower ones, but do the lower need the upper ones? We are dealing here with one row only, but is there ever as much as an egg's bulk of food stuff in one row? Yes, in the wheat grains of Simeon, be and now that you have arrived at this, you may say. That it refers to a single grain of wheat, but of the wheat grains of Simeon be shaded to revert to the above text. If there were two bones of a corpse that bore at one end a half olive's bulk of flesh, and a man brought into a house the other two ends, and the house overshadowed them, the house becomes unclean. Judah Binakosa says in the name of our Jacob, how can two bones each bearing only a half olive's bulk of flesh at the other end be reckoned together to make up an olive's bulk? Our Simeon. Belakish said this was taught only with regard to a bone which is considered a handle, but a hair is not considered a handle. Our Yohanan, however, said even a hair is considered a handle. Our Yohanan raised the following objection against our Simeon. Belakish, if there was an olive's bulk of unclean flesh adhering to the hide, and a man touched a shred hanging from it, or a hair that was opposite it, he becomes unclean. It is, is it not because it, the hair is regarded as a handle? No, it is because it is. Regarded as a protection, but can there be a protection over another protection? It penetrates right through our Ahabi Jacob Demert saying, If so, how may we write Tefillin? Surely it is necessary that the writing be perfect, and it is not so in raising this objection. He must have overlooked the statement of the rabbis in the West is any hole in parchment over which the ink can pass is not considered a hole, or if you wish you may answer, each is considered a handle for as our referred elsewhere to a bristle among many bristles. So here too it refers to a hair among many hairs, and where was this view of our stated in connection with the following mission of the bristles of ears of corn bring in uncleanness and convey uncleanness, but are not included together with the rest to make up the quantity necessary to convey uncleanness of what uses a bristle. Our replied, It refers to a bristle among many bristles. Another version renders the argument as follows, it is more. Reasonable to say that a hair is regarded as a protection for should you say it is regarded as a handle it will be asked of what use is one hair as our referred elsewhere to a bristle among many bristles so here too it refers to a hair among hairs and where was this view of our stated in connection with the following mission of the bristles of ears of corn bring in uncleanness and convey uncleanness but are not included together with the rest of what use is a bristle our replied it refers to a bristle among many bristles some refer it Talmud, Mastral and A to our mission thus the hide meat juice sediment bones are to be included to convey food uncle and S thereupon our Simeon B. Lakish said this was taught only with regard to a bone which is considered a protection but a hair is not considered a protection our Yohanan however said even a hair is considered a protection said Rush Lakish to our Yohanan but can there be a protection over another protection he Replied it penetrates right through our Ahad saying if so how may we write Tefillin it is necessary that the writing be perfect and it is not so he must have overlooked the statement of the rabbis in the West is any hole in parchment over which the ink can pass is not considered a hole our Yohan
Elsewhere, if a man clotted blood and ate it, or if he melted forbidden fat and gulped it down, he is culpable. Now it is quite clear in the case where he clotted blood and ate it, for since he clotted it either by determined it as a food stuff, but why should he be culpable? Where he melted fat and gulped it down, scripture uses the term eating in connection with it, and this is not eating. Reshlakish said the verse says soul to include one who drinks the same has been taught in respect of leavened bread, where a man dissolved it and gulped it down. If it was leavened, he is liable to the penalty of karath, and if it was unleavened, he has not thereby fulfilled his obligation on the Passover. Now it is quite right to say if it was unleavened, he has not thereby fulfilled his obligation on the Passover. For the divine law says bread of affliction, and this is not bread of affliction, but why does it say if it was leavened, he is liable to the penalty of karath? Does not scripture use the term? Eating in connection with it, Reshlakish said the verse says soul to include one who drinks and the same has been taught in respect of the carcass of a clean bird. If he dissolved it with fire and gulped it down, he is unclean, but if in the sun he is not unclean, whereupon we put the questions is not the expression eating written in connection with it. And Reshlakish replied the verse says soul to include one who drinks, but if so, even if he dissolved it in the sun, he should also be unclean in the sun. It becomes putrid now. This was necessary to have been taught with regard to each of these cases, for if the divine law had stated it only with regard to the fat, one could not have inferred the same with regard to leavened bread, for in the case of the former there was never a moment when it was permitted, nor could one have inferred the same with regard to the carcass of a clean bird, for the former is punishable by karath, and had the divine law stated it only with regard to leavened. Bread one could not have inferred the same with regard to the fat for the former does not admit of any exception nor could one have inferred the same with regard to the carcass of a clean bird for the former is punishable by karath and had the divine law stated it only with regard to the carcass of a clean bird one could not have inferred the same with regard to the others for the former conveys uncleanness clearly one case could not have been inferred from the other but could not one case have been inferred from the other two which could have been inferred had not the divine law stated it with regard to the carcass of a clean bird but this latter was to be inferred from the other such inference could be refuted thus it is so with the other cases since they are punishable by karath and had not the divine law stated it with regard to leavened bread but this latter was to be inferred from the other such inference could be refuted thus it is so with the other cases since they were never permitted at any time and had not the divine law stated it with regard to the forbidden fat, but this latter was to be inferred from the other such inference could be refuted thus it is so with the other cases since they admit of no exceptions will you then say the same of the forbidden fat which admits of an exception what is this exception is it that the forbidden fat of cattle is permitted to the most high but a carcass of a bird too is permitted to the most high namely a bird whose head has been nipped off or is it that the fat of a wild animal is permitted to a common man but a carcass namely the sin offering of a bird whose head has been nipped off is also permitted to priests in truth the exception is that the fat of a wild animal is permitted to a common man and as for your difficulty from the case of the priest it must be remembered that the priests enjoy this privilege from the table of the most high wherefore is the following teaching Necessary it is written the unclean to signify that the juice and the broth and the sediment of these are forbidden surely it could have been inferred from the above cases it is necessary for had not the divine law stated it expressly I would have said it is enough if the inferred law is as strict as that from which it is inferred and as there a minimum of an olive's bulk is essential so here a minimum of an olive's bulk is essential Talmud, Mosul and be the divine law then could have stated it with regard to creeping things and the other cases would have been inferred therefrom such inference could be refuted thus it is so with the case of creeping things since they convey uncleanness no matter what their size and as for the very which was taught the liquids that exuded from produce of people or from new produce or from consecrated produce or from seventh year produce or from the produce of diverse kinds are like the produce themselves whence is this derived should you say it can be inferred from the other cases but it will be refuted thus it is so with the other since each is an original prohibition now this inference could stand in respect of those that are original prohibitions but once would we know it in respect of prohibitions which are not original we could infer it from the law of the first fruits and once do we know it with regard to the first fruits from the following teaching of our Hosea it is written the fruit that is to say you shall bring fruit but not liquids and once do we know that where a man brought grapes and trod them into wine they are acceptable as first fruits the verse therefore says thou shalt bring but the inference can be refuted thus it is so with first fruits since they require the recital of a passage and also setting down rather it must be inferred from Terima and once do we know it with regard to Terima itself because it has been likened to the first fruits for a master has said the offering if Thine hand refers to the first fruits, but it will be refuted, thus it is so with regard to Terima, since on account of it people incur the penalty of death and the penalty of the added fifth, rather it must be inferred from the two from Terima and the first fruits, but it will be refuted, thus it is so with regard to Terima and the first fruits, since on account of them people incur the penalty of death and the penalty of the added fifth, rather it must be inferred either from Terima and one of the other cases or from the first fruits and one of the other cases, and as for the mission of which we learned, if a non-priest drank in error, date honey cider vinegar from winter grapes or any other juices of Terima, our Eliezer declares him liable to the payment of the value and the added fifth, but our Joshua declares him exempt from the added fifth. On what principle do they differ? They differ as to whether we say deduce from it and entirely from it or deduce from it and establish. It L in its own place our Eliezer holds deduce from it and entirely from it thus deduce from it just as in the case of first fruits the liquids which exude from them are like the fruits themselves so in the case of Terimatu the liquids which exude from it are like the fruit itself and entirely from it just as this law of first fruits applies even to the other kinds so with regard to Terimatu this law applies even to the other kinds our Joshua holds deduce from it and establish it in its own place thus deduce from it just as in the case of first fruits the liquids which exude from them are like the fruits themselves so in the case of Terimatu the liquids which exude from it are like the fruit itself and establish it in its own place just as the liquids that can be consecrated as Terimatu are only wine and oil but no other liquids so to the rule that the liquids which exude from it are like the fruit itself applies only to wine and oil but to no other liquids and as for the mission which we learned no liquid may be brought as first fruits accepting the product of olives and grapes who is the author thereof it is our Joshua who holds the principle deduced from it and establish it in its place and then he infers the law as to first fruits from Terima and as for the mission which we learned one would not suffer the penalty of forty stripes incurred through the transgression of the law of Orla for the liquid which issued from any Orla fruit save for that which issued from olives and grapes who is the author thereof it is our Joshua who holds the principle deduced from it and establish it in its own place he then infers the law as to first fruits from Terima Talmud, Mosul and A and finally he derives the law as to Orla by means of the word fruit stated here and also in connection with the first fruits and ALAL what is ALAL or Yohanan said it is withered flesh Resh said it is flesh which the knife has cut away and objection was raised it is written but yet are plasterers of lies ye are all physicians of ill now according to him who says it is withered flesh it is well for such cannot be healed but according to him who says it is flesh which the knife has cut away surely this can be healed there is no dispute at all about the ill mentioned in the verse they only disagree as to the meaning of ill and our mission come and here from our mission our judah says if so much of ill was collected together so that there was an olives bulk in one place one would thereby become liable and to this are added provided he collected it together now according to him who says it is the flesh which the knife has cut away it is clear that when there was an olives bulk of it in one place one would thereby become liable but according to him who says it is withered flesh what if there was an olives bulk of it it is surely only regarded as would they certainly do not disagree as to the allow referred to by our judah they only disagree as to the meaning of the Allah according to the rabbis, our Yohanan maintains that even withered flesh can be included together with ordinary flesh to make up the minimum quantity to convey uncleanness, but Reshlakish maintains that only the flesh which the knife has cut away can be included, but withered flesh cannot be included. What is the case with regard to the flesh which the knife had cut away? If he intended it as a foodstuff, it should contract uncleanness alone, and if he did not intend it as a foodstuff, he has then surely abandoned it. Our Abin and
ultimately convey the greater uncleanness required to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness by a liquid in like manner whatever will not ultimately convey the greater uncleanness requires to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness by a liquid and it has also been taught our Jose says why did the rabbis rule that in the case of the carcass of a clean bird there must be an intention to use it as food but it does not need to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness by a liquid because Talmud, Moss. Chulin B it will ultimately convey the greater uncleanness Hezekiah answered the case in our mission is different since he could cut it up into pieces each smaller than an olive's bulk said our Jeremiah to our Zerah but could Hezekiah really have said so behold it has been reported if a man cut ritually both or the greater part of both organs of the throat of an unclean animal and the animal was still struggling Hezekiah said it is no more subject to the prohibition of limbs from the living animal but our Yohanan said it is still subject to the prohibition of limbs from the living animal Hezekiah said it is no more subject to the prohibition of limbs because it is now considered as dead our Yohanan said it is still subject to the prohibition of limbs because it is not actually dead he replied it is really out of the category of living animals but has not yet come within the category of dead animals the text above stated if a man cut ritually both or the greater part of both Organs of the throat of an unclean animal and the animal was still struggling. Hezekiah said it is no more subject to the prohibition of limbs from the living animal, but our Yohanan said it is still subject to the prohibition of limbs. Our Eliezer said, Hold fast to this view of our Yohanan, for our Ashai has taught in agreement with him. For our Ashai taught if an Israelite slaughtered an unclean animal for a Gentile as soon as he has cut both or the greater part of both organs of the throat, even though it still struggles, it conveys food uncleanness, but not the uncleanness of nibble. A limb severed from it is regarded as severed from the living animal, and flesh severed from it is regarded as severed from the living animal, and it may not be eaten by a Gentile even after the life of the animal has departed. If he only cut one or the greater part of one organ, it does not convey food uncleanness. If he stabbed it, it has no uncleanness whatsoever. If a Gentile slaughtered a clean animal for an Israelite as soon as he has cut both or the greater part of both organs even though it still struggles it conveys food uncleanness but not the uncleanness of nibble a limb severed from it is regarded as severed from the living animal and flesh severed from it is regarded as severed from the living animal and it may not be eaten by a gentile even after the life of the animal has departed if he only cut one or the greater part of one organ it does not convey food uncleanness if he stabbed it has no uncleanness whatsoever if the gentile cut only so much as does not render the animal trifa and an Israelite came and finished it the slaughtering is valid if an Israelite slaughtered whether he had cut so much as would render the animal trifa or not and a gentile came and finished it the slaughtering is invalid if a person desires to eat the flesh of an animal before the life has departed from it he should cut off an olive's bulk of flesh from around the throat salt and well rinse it well, wait until the light departs from the animal and then eat it. Both Israelite and Gentile may eat it in this manner. This very the lens support to the view of R.E.D.B. Avin for R.E.D.B. Avin said in the name of our Isaac B. Ashi. And if a person desires to be in good health, he should cut off an olive's bulk of flesh from around the throat, salt it, well rinse it. Well, wait until the light departs from the animal and then eat it. Both Israelite and Gentile may eat it in this manner. Our Eliezer are raised. The question What is the law if he paused or pressed down the knife whilst cutting the organs there upon a certain old man answered the said, Are you It requires the same ritual acts of slaughtering as in the case of a clean animal. To what extent are the ritual acts essential? Our Samuel B. Isaac said, Even to the examination of the knife, our Zara inquired of our she's hate, can the animal protect the articles that are swallowed within it from becoming unclean or not? He replied, It already conveys. Food uncleanness is it then possible that it should afford protection? The other retorted it does not yet convey the uncleanness of nibble. Why then should it not afford protection? Abe said it does not protect the articles that are within it from becoming unclean since it already conveys food uncleanness and he who commits an unnatural crime upon it is culpable since it does not yet convey the uncleanness of nibble. Our Judah says if so much of ALAL was collected etc. Aruna said provided he collected it together of set purpose. Aruna also said if there were two pieces of flesh on the hide each a half olive's bulk the hide renders them negligible. Talmud, Mastulin according to whose authority is this ruling if according to our Ishmael's but he maintains that the hide does not render them negligible and if according to our Akibas but it is obvious for he maintains that the hide renders them negligible in fact it is in accordance with our Ishmael's view for our Ishmael only. Maintains that the hide does not render them negligible in the case where the pieces were torn away by a wild beast, but where they were cut away by the knife, he concedes that the hide renders them negligible. Come and hear from our mission. Our Judah says if so much of ALAL was collected together so that there was an olive's bulk in one place, one would thereby become liable. And to this Arhuna added, provided he collected it together. Now, if you say that even where the knife cut it away, it is not rendered negligible according to our Ishmael, it is well for then Arhuna is in agreement with our Ishmael. But if you say that where the knife cut it away, our Ishmael concedes that it is rendered negligible, then it will be asked with whom does Arhuna agree? You must therefore say that even where the knife cut it away, it is not rendered negligible according to our Ishmael, and Arhuna is in agreement with our Akiba, but this would be obvious. No, for you might have thought that our maintains its view only. Where the knife cut it away, but where it was torn away by a wild beast, he would concede that it is not rendered negligible. He therefore teaches us that the reason for our Akiba's view is because the hide renders it negligible, making us no difference whether it was torn away by a wild beast or cut away by the knife. For so it reads in the last clause. Wherefore does our Akiba declare him clean in the case of the hide, because the hide renders them negligible. Mishnah in the following cases: the skin is considered flesh, the skin of a man, the skin of a domestic pig. Our Judah says even the skin of the wild pig, the skin of the hump of a young camel, the skin of the head of a young calf, the skin around the hoofs, the skin of the pudenda, the skin of a foetus, the skin beneath the fat tail, the skin of the hedgehog, the chameleon, the lizard, and the snail. Our Judah says the lizard is like the weasel. If any of these skins was tanned or trampled upon as much as was usual for tanning, it becomes clean. Accepting the skin of a man, our Yohanan Binuri says that eight reptiles have real skins. Gemara Ola said, according to the law of the Torah, the skin of a man is clean. But for what reason did they say it was unclean as a precautionary measure, lest a man make rugs out of the skin of his father and mother? Others refer this dictum of Ola to the later clause of our mission. Of is if any of these skins was tanned or trampled upon as much as was usual for tanning, it becomes clean. Accepting the skin of a man, Ola said, according to the law of the Torah, if the skin of a man was tanned, it thereby becomes clean. But for what reason did they say it remained unclean as a precautionary measure, lest a man make rugs out of the skin of his father and mother? Now those who refer this dictum of Ola to the first clause will certainly refer it to the later clause. But those who refer it to the later clause maintain that in the first the uncleanness is by the law of the Torah, the skin of it. Domestic pig, etc. What is the issue between them? One is of the opinion that this is hard and only the other soft, whereas the other maintains that this too is soft. The skin of the hump of a young camel. How long is the camel considered young? Ola said in the name of our Joshua Bili by as long as it has not borne the burden. Our Jeremiah inquired what is the law with regard to its skin if it had reached the age for bearing burdens but had not actually borne any of a inquired what if it had actually borne burdens although it had not reached the age for it. These questions must stand. Reshlakish was once sitting and raised the question how long is the camel considered young? Our Ishmael B. Ab answered so said our Joshua Bili by as long as it has not borne the burden whereupon he Reshlakish said sit down opposite me. Our Zero was once sitting and raised the question how long is the camel considered young? Rabin behind and answered him so said Ola in the name of our Joshua Bili by as long as it has not. Born the burden, you then repeated it over again. Whereupon the other Arzera said to him, "It is the only thing you knew, and you have already told us it. Come and see the difference between the imperious men of the land of Israel and the pious men of Babylon. The skin of the head of a young calf. How long is the calf considered young?" Ola said, "Throughout its first year." Our Yohanan said, "As long as it sucks." The question was raised, "Did Ola mean throughout its first year
Connection with the law of uncleanness is in the following cases the skin is accounted as flesh meaning to include the skin of the pudenda at the improper place the sacrifice is invalid and he is not liable to the punishment of karef but at the improper time it would be pickle and he would be liable to the punishment of karef the skin around the hoose what is the meaning of around the hoose rab said it means actually around the hoose arhanana said it means the skin upon the nethermost limb which is usually sold with the head the skin of the hedgehog or rabbis taught the unclean includes their skins which are to be regarded as their flesh I might then say that this is so with regard to then all the verse therefore states these but does not the expression these refer to all reptiles mentioned rab said the phrase after its kinds interrupts the subject matter and why is not the mole also reckoned our Samuel B. Isaac said rab is himself a tana and he and his mission includes the mole but why does not our tana of our present mission include the mole Arshis hate the son of our Edi said our tana agrees with our Judah that it depends upon the feel of the skin but he differs with him about the feel of the skin of the lizard if any of these skins was tanned etc only if trampled upon does it become clean but if not trampled upon it does not become clean but our high has taught to the contrary as if a man patched up his basket with the ear of an ass it becomes Clean if he patched up something with it then it becomes clean even though it had not been trampled upon but if he had not patched up anything with it then if trampled upon it does become clean but if not trampled upon it does not become clean how much trampling would be sufficient for tanning our huna said in the name of our janay the equivalent of a four mils distance or a said in the name of resh lakish for needing for prayer and for washing the hands the standard is four mils. Our naman b isaac said talmud, mosul and it was Abu who reported this and he mentioned four things one of which was the trampling for tanning our jose b our said this teaching applies only to the distance ahead of him but as for going back he need not turn back even one mil our ahabi jacob said from this can be inferred that a distance of one mil he need not turn back but a distance of less than a mil he must turn back our rabbis taught if a roman legion which passes from place to place enters a house the house is unclean for there is not a legion that does not carry with it several scalps and be not surprised at this for our Ishmael's scalp was placed upon the head of king's mission if a man was slaying cattle or wild animals clean or unclean small or large in order to use the hide for a covering the hide is regarded as a connected with the flesh in respect of uncle s for the flesh to contract uncle s or convey uncle s until so much of the hide has been flayed as can be taken hold of or if it was being flayed for a water skin until the breast has been flayed or if it was being flayed from the feet upwards until the whole hide has been flayed as for the skin that is on the neck our Yohan and does not regard it as a connected but the sages do regard it as a connective until the whole hide has been flayed tomorrow what is the law and more than this has been flayed rap said that which has already been flayed is clean rc said it. Hand breadth nearest to the flesh is unclean. An objection was raised if a man had flayed this extent. Henceforth, whosoever touches that which has already been flayed is clean. Presumably, this is so. Even if he touches the hand breadth nearest to the flesh, no, except for the hand breadth nearest to the flesh. Come and here, whosoever touches the skin opposite the flesh is unclean. That is, presumably, whosoever touches the skin opposite the flesh only is unclean. But whosoever touches the skin in the hand breadth nearest to the flesh is clean. This tana expresses the hand breadth nearest to the flesh by the term the skin opposite the flesh. Come and here, if a man flayed cattle or wild animals, clean or unclean, small or large, in order to use the hide for a covering, and he flayed so much of the hide as can be taken hold of, it does not serve as a connective. And the hand breadth nearest to the flesh is clean. That refers to the first hand breadth. It was taught how much is meant by so much. As can be taken hold of a hand breadth, but it was taught two hand breadths. Abe explained the former very the meant a double hand breadth, and so it has been expressly taught how much is so much as can be taken hold of a double hand breadth. We have learned elsewhere if a man had begun to tear a garment which was unclean so soon as the greater part of it is torn, the parts can no longer be deemed to be joined, and it is clean. Our nom and said in the name of Rabbi Abba, this teaching applies only to a garment which had been immersed that same day. For since he did not shrink from immersing it, he likewise will not shrink from tearing the greater part of it. But it does not apply to a garment which had not been immersed that same day. For it is to be feared that he will not tear the greater part of it. Thereupon Rabbi said there are two objections to this argument. In the first place, it certainly cannot apply to a garment which had been immersed that same day. For people might say that. Immersion during the day is sufficient to render an article clean. Secondly, Talmud, Mastul and be the same is to be feared in the case of the burnt offering of a bird according to the view of our Eliezer son of Arsimian, namely that he will not divide the greater part of both organs of the throat. Our Joseph replied to him as for your objection people might say that immersion during the day is sufficient. My answer is the tearing explains the position and as for your objection the same is to be feared in the case of a burnt offering of a bird according to the view of our Eliezer son of Arsimian. My answer is priests are most careful come and here if a man was slaying cattle or wild animals clean or unclean small or large in order to use the hide for a covering until so much of the hide has been flayed as can be taken hold of etc. Now if more than this had been flayed it would be clean would it not but why should we not apprehend that he will have flayed only so much as can be taken? Hold of in which case by touching the hide he is as it were touching uncleanness and yet we declare him to be clean if it were a case of uncleanness as enjoined by the Torah this would indeed be so but here we really speak of uncleanness as enjoined by the rabbis this is well in the case of an unclean person flaying a clean animal but in the case of a clean person flaying an unclean animal surely the uncleanness is enjoined by the Torah it refers to a trifa animal and can a trifa animal render unclean yes as stated by Samuel's father for Samuel's father stated a trifa animal that was slaughtered renders holy things unclean come and here our dose Judah says in the name of our Simeon if a man was skinning reptiles the skin is regarded as a connective until the hole has been removed now it follows does it not that in the case of a camel it is not regarded as a connective draw not the inference that in the case of a camel it is not regarded as a connective but Rather that in the case of a camel the skin that is on the neck is not regarded as a connective and this accords with the opinion of our Yohanan bin Riyar who not said in the name of our Simeon son of our Jose this teaching applies only to the case where he did not leave untorn a portion sufficient for an apron but if he left untorn a portion sufficient for an apron if the garment is deemed to be joined Resh Lakish said this teaching applies only to a garment but in the case of leather what is left is firm but our Yohanan said even in the case of leather what is left is not firm our Yohanan raised an objection against Resh Lakish from the following mission if a hide had contracted midras uncleanness and a man had the intention to use it for straps and sandals so soon as he puts the knife into it it becomes clean so our Judah but the sages say not until he has reduced its size to less than five handbreadths it follows however that if he had reduced its size to less than five Hand breadths it would be clean but why surely we should say what is left is firm when do we say what is left is firm only in the case where the hide was cut with a straight cut but here we must suppose that it was trimmed on all sides our Jeremiah raised an objection if a man was slaying cattle or wild animals clean or unclean small or large in order to use the hide for a covering until so much of the hide has been flayed as can be taken hold of etc now if more than this had been flayed it would be clean would it not but why surely we should say that the residue of the hide that is attached to the carcass is firm our Robin explained it that with regard to the hide each portion flayed is considered as fallen away our Joseph raised an objection as for the skin that is on the neck our Yohan and Binary does not regard it as a connective but why surely it holds firm thereupon Abe said to him but read the next line but the sages do regard it as a connective in fact said Abe, Point at issue between them is concerning a protection that will soon fall away of its own accord. One maintains that it is still a protection, the other that it is no protection. Our Jeremiah raised an objection. If an oven had become unclean, how can one make it clean again? One should divide it into three parts and scrape off the plastering Talmud, Mosulina, so that it lies on the ground. Our Medir says one need not scrape off the plastering nor see to it that it lies on the ground, but one need only cut it down to less than four hand breadths high inside. It follows that if one did cut it down to less than four hand breadths high, it would be clean, but why surely we should say that it stands firm thereupon? Rabbi said to him, Why not rather quote
Greater portion of the oven how much is meant by no matter what its height Arjan A said at least one hand breadth high for it is usual to make an oven one hand breadth high as a plaything now only if there is a fragment of four hand breadths is it still unclean but if there is no fragment of four hand breadths it is clean I can answer there he split it across the width but here he split it lengthwise the master said and any fragment thereof is still unclean if it amounts to the greater portion of the oven but of what use can the greater portion of a hand breadth be of a said it means any fragment of a large oven is still unclean if it amounts to the greater portion of it but with regard to a large oven the sages say in agreement with our mayor that it is still unclean if the fragment is four hand breadths this is no difficulty one ruling refers to an oven nine hand breadths high the other to an oven seven hand breadths high another version reports the passage as follows are Huna said in the name of our Ishmael son of our Jose even if he left a portion sufficient for an apron the garment is rendered clean there upon Rush Lakish said this teaching applies only to a garment but in the case of leather what is left is of value but our Yohanan said even in the case of leather what is left is of no value our Yohanan raised the following objection against Rush Lakish if the hide had contracted Madras uncleanness and a man had the intention to use it for straps and sandals so soon as he puts the knife into it it becomes clean so our Judah but the sages say not until he has reduced its size to less than five hand breadths it follows however that if he had actually reduced its size to less than five hand breadths it would be clean but why surely we should say what is left is of value we must suppose here that he intended the hide to serve as a seed for one suffering with an issue mission if there was an olive's bulk of unclean flesh adhering to the hide and a man Touch the shred hanging from it or a hair that was opposite to it he becomes unclean if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk upon it they convey uncleanness by carrying but not by contact so our Ishmael our Akiva says neither by contact nor by carrying our Akiva however agrees that if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk stuck on a ship and a man swayed them he becomes unclean wherefore then does our Akiva declare him clean in the case where they adhere to the hide because the hide renders them negligible Gemara Ola said in the name of our Yohanan this rule applies only to the case where a wild beast tore it away but where it was cut away by the knife and flaying it certainly is deemed negligible our nomin inquired of Ola did our Yohanan also say so even if it was as large as a turtle he replied yes and even as large as a sieve he replied yes by God said the other even if our Yohanan himself had told it me by his own mouth I should not have accepted it. When Arashai went up to Palestine he met RMI and reported to him the discussion so said Ula and so answered Arnam and said RMI to him and even if Arnam is the son-in-law of the exilarch shall he make light of the teaching of our Yohanan on another occasion he Arashai found him RMI sitting and expounding it with reference to the second clause of our mission thus if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk upon it they convey Uncle Anas by carrying but not by contact so our Ishmael our Akiba says neither by contact nor by carrying thereupon our Yohanan had said this rule applies only to the case where a wild beast tore them away but where they were cut away by the knife and flaying they are deemed negligible then said Arashai does the master refer it to the second clause he replied yes did Ula tell it you with reference to the first clause said the other he did by God said RMI even if Joshua the son of Nun had told it me by his own mouth I should not have accepted it when Rabin came down with all the company that used to come down from Palestine to Babylon they reported that it referred to the first clause but is there not then a difficulty as our Papa suggested elsewhere Talmud, Mastulin be that the flesh was beaten thin so here it could also be explained that the flesh was beaten thin if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk upon it etc. Barpata said this ruling applies only to the case where a man touched them from the outside but where he touched them on the inside the two contacts can be reckoned together but our Yohanan said the two contacts cannot be reckoned together our Yohanan is consistent in his view for our Yohanan also said that our Ishmael and our Dosa Biharkina said the same thing our Ishmael taught it in the above passage and our Dosa Biharkina in the following mission which we learned if any matter which causes uncleanness in a tent was divided and the parts brought into a house our Dosa Harkinus declares everything under the same roof space clean but the sages declare it unclean now does not Ardosa B. Harkinus hold that two overshadowings cannot be reckoned together similarly two contacts cannot be reckoned together as it is established that Ardosa B. Harkinus is in agreement with our Ishmael it follows that the sages the opponents of Ardosa are in agreement with our Akiva the opponent of our Ishmael but does not our Akiva hold that they are entirely clean our Akiva only declares them clean when adhering to the hide but otherwise they convey uncleanness as stated in the latter part of the mission our Akiva however agrees that if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk stuck on a ship and a man swayed them he becomes unclean wherefore then does our Akiva declare him clean in the case where they adhere to the hide because the hide renders them negligible our Akbabi Hammer raised an objection it is written he that touches the carcass thereof but not the hide Upon which are two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk I might think that the same is the case with regard to carrying the verse therefore says and he that carrieth shall be unclean so our Ishmael our Akiva says it is written he that touch it and he that carrieth therefore what comes within the scope of uncleanness by contact comes within the scope of uncleanness by carrying and what does not come within the scope of uncleanness by contact does not come within the scope of uncleanness by carrying now if it were so it indeed comes within the scope of uncleanness by contact on the inside Rabbah answered he means to say this what comes within the scope of uncleanness by contact on every side thereof comes within the scope of uncleanness by carrying and what does not come within the scope of uncleanness by contact on every side thereof does not come within the scope of uncleanness by carrying are we the elder inquired of Rabbah son of our who not can close marabone according to our Ishmael convey uncleanness by carrying or not does our Ishmael accept the principle what comes within the scope of uncleanness by contact comes within the scope of uncleanness by carrying and what does not come within the scope of uncleanness by contact does not come within the scope of uncleanness by carrying but here in our mission of the reason is because it comes within the scope of uncleanness by contact on the inside or does he not accept this principle at all he replied see there's a raven flying past when our left his son Rabbah said to him was that not our the elder of Pumadai whom you sir have praised as a great man he replied I am today in the condition of the lover who said sustain me with raisin cakes and he asked me a matter which requires much reasoning Ola said if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk stuck on a ship and a man waved them to and fro even the whole day long he remains clean why because as written the word can be read be carried but by tradition we read carries it is necessary therefore that when one carries it it must be able to be carried at one time we have learned if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk upon it they convey uncle Anes by carrying but not by contact so our Ishmael wherefore is this so they surely cannot be carried at one time our papa suggested that there was a thin strip of flesh joining the two pieces come and here our Akiva however agrees that if there were two pieces of flesh each a half olive's bulk stuck on a ship and a man swayed them he becomes unclean wherefore is this so they surely cannot be carried at one time here too we must suppose that there was a thin strip of flesh tanning differ on this point it was taught it is all one whether one touches them or sways them or Eliza says even if one carries them but does not the one that carries them also sway them this must be the interpretation it is all one whether one touches them or sways them even Though they cannot be carried at one time whereupon our Eliezer comes to say no only if they can be carried at one time then what is the meaning of even read only if they can be carried at one time Mishnah with regard to a thigh of a corpse Talmud, Mastulin a Talmud, Mastulin or a thigh of a consecrated animal he who touches it whether it be stopped up or pierced becomes unclean with regard to a thigh of a carcass or of a dead reptile if it was stopped up he who touches it remains clean but if it was at all pierced it conveys Uncle Anes by contact whence do we know that it conveys Uncle Anes also by carrying the text says he that touch it and he that carrieth therefore what comes within the scope of Uncle Anes by contact comes within the scope of Uncle Anes by carrying and what does not come within the scope of Uncle Anes by contact does not come within the scope of Uncle Anes by carrying Gamar he who touches it does become unclean but he who overshadows it does
Consequence for our Maribia Boasa in the name of our Isaac bones of sacrifices which served as a holder for the meat left over from the sacrifice render the hands unclean since they have become auxiliary to forbidden matter. The clause concerning the carcass teaches us that even if there is an olive's bulk of marrow in the bone only when the bone is pierced does it convey uncleanness but when not pierced it does not convey uncleanness. Abbe said in fact I maintain that the marrow within the bone can restore the flesh outside it but here we are dealing with a bone which was sawn through transversely and it is in agreement with our Eliezer's view for our Eliezer stated if a man saw through a marrow bone lengthwise it is still unclean if transversely it is clean as a mnemonic think of the palm tree are you had and said in truth there was an olive's bulk of marrow in the bone and I maintain that the marrow within can restore the flesh outside it but the Expression he who touches stated in the Mishnah means also overshadowing, but surely if the marrow within can restore the flesh outside it, why is it that the thigh bone of a carcass or of a dead reptile, if not pierced, is clean? Our Benjamin Beagle said in the name of our Yohanan, we are dealing here with an olive's bulk of marrow that shakes about in the bone, so that with regard to a corpse, the uncleanness breaks through and rises upwards, but with regard to a carcass, since the marrow shakes about within, if the bone was pierced, it does convey uncleanness, but if it was not pierced, it does not convey uncleanness. Our Abin, others say, our Jose B. Abin said, we have also learned the same if a man touched one half olive's bulk of a corpse and at the same time overshadowed another half olive's bulk or the other half olive's bulk overshadowed him, he is unclean now. If you hold that they fall within one category, then it is quite right that they combine to render the person unclean, but if you hold that they fall within two categories can they in any way combine surely we have learned this is the general rule all means of conveying uncleanness which fall within one category combine to convey uncleanness but all which fall within two categories do not combine to convey uncleanness what do you say then that they fall within one category read the following clause but Talmud, Mastulin B if he touched one half olive's bulk and some other thing overshadowed both him and another half olive's bulk he is clean now if they fall within one category why is he clean but does not this clause conflict with the first clause Arzera answered we are dealing there in the first clause with uncleanness that was confined between two cupboards between which there was not a hand breadth of space in which case overshadowing is regarded as actual contact who then is the tana that includes overshadowing in the term he who touches it is our Jose for it was taught our Jose says a little full. A corpse mold conveys uncleanness by contact by carrying and by overshadowing. Now it is clear that a person is rendered unclean by carrying and by overshadowing, for he carries the whole quantity and overshadows the whole quantity. But with regard to uncleanness by contact, he surely does not touch the whole quantity. One must say, therefore, that the expression contact means overshadowing, but does it not expressly state by contact as well as by overshadowing? Abe suggested to overshadow. Uncleanness within a handbreadth thereof is termed overshadowing by contact, but more than a handbreadth away it is termed plain overshadowing. Rabba said, even more than a handbreadth away it is also termed overshadowing by contact, but what is meant by plain overshadowing where there is a projection? Rabba said, once do I derive this from what was taught in the following Barry the Jose says the woven cords of beds and the lattice work of windows serve as partitions between the house and it. Upper room to prevent the passage of uncleanness to the other side. If these were spread over a corpse being suspended in the air, whatever touches directly over a mesh is unclean, but whatever is not directly over a mesh is clean. Now, what are the circumstances if they were suspended within a handbreadth from the corpse? Why does that which was not directly over a mesh remain clean? Surely it is nothing else but the corpse in its shroud, and the corpse in its shroud conveys uncleanness. They must then have been suspended more than a handbreadth away from the corpse. Nevertheless, the expression whatever touches is used. Abe said, in fact, they were suspended within a handbreadth from the corpse. But as for your objection, surely it is nothing else but the corpse in its shroud. I reply that with regard to the corpse in its shroud, a man certainly ignores the existence of the shroud, but he does not ignore the existence of these. But is this not a case of concealed uncleanness, which? According to established law breaks through and rises upwards our Jose is of the opinion that concealed uncleanness cannot break through and rise upwards whence do you know this from the following mission which we learned if a drawer in a cupboard had the capacity of a cubic handbreadth within and the opening of the cupboard was less than a handbreadth square and there was some uncleanness in it the house becomes unclean if there was some uncleanness in the house what is in the drawer remains clean for the uncleanness must come forth eventually but need not come in at all our Jose declares the house clean for one could take out the uncleanness by apps or burn it in its place and the next clause reads thus if one set the cupboard in the doorway of the house and if the cupboard opened outwards and there was some uncleanness in it the house remains clean if there was some uncleanness in the house what is in the cupboard remains clean Talmud, Mastul and A and in. Connection with this, it was taught that our Jose declares the house clean. Now, to which clause does our Jose refer? If to the last clause, surely the first tana in that case also declares the house clean. It must therefore be this: the first tana had said, if there was some uncleanness in it, the house becomes unclean either by virtue of the fact that the uncleanness must come forth eventually, or by virtue of the rule that concealed uncleanness breaks through. Whereupon our Jose said to him, as for your argument, the uncleanness must come forth eventually. I reply that one could take out the uncleanness by halves or burn it in its place. And as for your ruling, concealed uncleanness breaks through. I maintain that concealed uncleanness does not break through. I can point out a contradiction in the views of our Jose, for we have learned if a dog ate the flesh of a corpse and died, and Jay upon the threshold, our Meir says, if its neck was one hand breadth wide, it brings the uncleanness into the House and if not, it does not bring in the uncleanness. Our Jose says we must see where the uncleanness lies. If it lies opposite the lintel and inwards, the house is unclean. But if opposite the lintel and outwards, the house is clean. Our Eliezer says if its mouth lies inside, the house remains clean. But if the mouth lies outside, the house is unclean because the uncleanness passes out by way of its lower parts. Our Judah B. But there says in all circumstances, the house is unclean. Now, presumably, our Jose deals with the case where its neck was not one hand breadth wide. Hence, you can deduce that he holds concealed uncleanness breaks through said Rabbi. Our Jose means to say we must consider the space in connection with the uncleanness. And our Jose consequently differs on two points, saying to our Meir, thus, as for your saying, if its neck was one hand breadth wide, it brings in the uncleanness. I maintain that we must consider only the space. And as for your saying, if it lies anywhere upon the threshold. The house is unclean. I maintain that if it lies on the inside of the lintel, the house is unclean. But if on the outside of the lintel, the house remains clean. Our Aha, the son of Rabbah, actually quotes the Mishnah with these words. Our Jose says we must consider the space in connection with the uncleanness. And who is the tana that disagrees with our Jose? It is our Simeon, for it was taught. Our Simeon says Talmud, Mastul, and B. There are three matters of uncleanness issuing from a corpse which convey uncleanness by two means, but not by the third. And these are the ladleful of corpse mold, the barley's bulk of bone, and the covering stone and side stones of the grave. A ladleful of corpse mold conveys uncleanness by carrying and by overshadowing, but not by contact. Uncleanness by contact, however, is to be found with each of the others. A barley's bulk of bone conveys uncleanness by carrying and by contact, but not by overshadowing. Uncleanness by overshadowing, however, is to be found with each. Of the others, the covering stone and side stones of the grave convey uncleanness by contact and by overshadowing, but not by carrying uncleanness by carrying, however, is to be found with each of the others. A thigh bone of a carcass or of a dead reptile, etc. Our rabbis taught it is written, he that touch it, the carcass thereof, but not a stopped up thigh bone. I might think that the same is the case, even if it was pierced. The verse therefore says, he that touch it shall be unclean, that is. Whatever can be touched is unclean, but whatever cannot be touched is clean. Our Zara said to Abe, in that case, a carcass with the hide still upon it should not convey uncleanness. He replied, just go and see how many apertures there are in it. Our Papa said to Rabba, in that case, the kidney of the carcass, so long as it is surrounded with fat, should not convey uncleanness. He replied, just go and see how many fibers run through it. Our Ashai raised the question, what is the position if a man intended to? Pierce the bone but did not pierce it does the absence of piercing make it incomplete
Thereupon our Joshua the son of Levi said provided the entire length of the creature had been developed he who reports it in reference to the first clause will with more reason apply it also to the last clause but he who reports it in reference to the last clause will hold that in the first clause even though the entire length of the creature had not been developed whosoever touches the fleshy part thereof becomes unclean our rabbis taught since scripture mentioned the mouse I would have said that it included the sea mouse for it bears the name mouse there is however an argument against the scripture declared the weasel unclean and the mouse unclean therefore as the weasel refers only to those that live upon the land so the mouse refers only to those that live upon the land or you might argue in this way scripture declared the weasel unclean and the mouse unclean therefore as the weasel refers to every creature which bears the name weasel so the mouse refers to every creature which bears the name mouse and so it will include the sea mouse since it bears the name mouse the text therefore teaches upon the earth but if I had only the expression upon the earth to go by I might say that while upon the earth it can render unclean but if it went down into the sea it cannot render anything unclean Talmud, Mosulin of the text therefore teaches that creep signifies wherever it creeps it renders unclean but perhaps it is not so but that the expression that creep signifies all that breed can render unclean but those that do not breed cannot render unclean and so I would exclude the mouse which is half flesh and half earth since it does not breed there is however a good argument against the scripture declared the weasel unclean and the mouse unclean therefore as the weasel refers to all that bear the name weasel so the mouse refers to all that bear the name mouse and in this way I include the mouse which is half flesh and half earth or you might Argue in this way as the weasel breeds so the mouse includes all species that breed and so I would exclude the mouse which is half flesh and half earth the text therefore teaches among the creeping things a certain rabbi said to rubble perhaps the expression among the creeping things includes the mouse which is half flesh and half earth and the expression that creep signifies all that creep thus including the sea mouse and as for the expression upon the earth it would be interpreted as follows while upon earth it can render unclean but if it went down into the sea it cannot render anything unclean he replied since you regard the sea as a place of uncleanness then it is all one whether here or there but is not the expression upon the earth required to exclude a floating uncleanness where there is a doubt concerning contact for our Isaac be of Demi stated the expression upon the earth excludes a floating uncleanness concerning which there is a doubt upon the earth is written Twice our rabbis taught the toad after its kind includes the Arad the Ben Nephilim and the Salamander when our Akiba read this verse he used to say how manifold are thy works O Lord thou hast creatures that live in the sea and thou hast creatures that live upon the dry land if those of the sea were to come up upon the dry land they would straightway die and if those of the dry land were to go down into the sea they would straightway die thou hast creatures that live in fire and thou hast creatures that live in the air if those of the fire were to come up into the air they would straightway die and if those of the air were to go down into the fire they would straightway die how manifold are thy works O Lord our rabbis taught every creature that is on the dry land is also to be found in the sea excepting the weasel our Zara said where is there proof for this from scripture give your all the inhabitants of the world are who not the son of our Joshua said the beavers around Nourish are not Land creatures are Papa said the band upon Nourish its fat its height and its tail are land 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 hear the word of the Lord said our Papa yet the inhabitants of Nourish would not hear the word of the Lord our said in the name of Rabbi if an inhabitant of Nourish has kissed you then count your teeth if a man of Nihar Pekat accompanies you it is because of the fine garments he sees on you if a Pumadai then accompanies you then change your quarters are who not be tortoise said I once went to W A and saw it. Snake wrapped round a toad after some days there came forth an arod from between them when I came before our Simeon the pious and related this to him he said to me the Holy One blessed be he said they have produced a new creature which I had not created into my world I too will bring upon them a creature which I had not created in my world but has not a master said all creatures whose manner of copulation is the same and whose period of gestation is the same can bear young from each other and Suckle each other, but all creatures whose manner of copulation is not the same and whose period of gestation is not the same cannot bear young from each other nor suckle each other. Rab said it was a miracle within a miracle, but this is for chastisement. It was a miracle within a miracle, even for chastisement. Mishal limbs or pieces of flesh which hang loose from the living animal are rendered unclean in respect of food. Uncle Anes, whilst they are in their place and required to be rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes Talmud, Mosul and B. If the animal was slaughtered, they have by the blood of the slaughtering become susceptible to Uncle Anes. So Armeir Arsimian says they have not become susceptible to Uncle Anes. If the animal died, the flesh requires to be rendered susceptible to Uncle Anes, and the limb is rendered unclean as a limb severed from the living creature, but is not rendered unclean as the limb of a carcass. So Armeir Arsimian declares it clean tomorrow. They are. Rendered unclean in respect of food, Uncle Anes, but not in respect of nibble uncleanness. Now, what are the circumstances? If they can be restored, they should not be rendered unclean, even in respect of food uncleanness. And if they cannot be restored, they should be then rendered unclean also in respect of nibble uncleanness. In fact, they cannot be restored, but with regard to nibble uncleanness, it is different for the divine law says, and if their fall, that is, they must absolutely fall away from the body. There was also taught a very to this effect with regard to the limbs or the pieces of flesh which hang loose from the animal and are attached by a hairbreadth. I might have said that they should contain nibble uncleanness. The text therefore states, and if their fall, that is, they must absolutely fall away from the body. Nevertheless, they are rendered unclean in respect of food uncleanness. This supports our high Ashi for our high Ashi said in the name of Samuel Fix, which had. Shriveled up on the branch are rendered unclean in respect of food uncleanness and he who plucks them on the Sabbath is liable to bring a sin offering shall we say that the following also supports him it was taught vegetables such as cabbages and pumpkins which had shriveled up on the stem are not rendered unclean in respect of food uncleanness if they were cut down and dried they are rendered unclean in respect of food uncleanness if they were cut down and dried but this is unthinkable for they are then like what our Isaac however explained that it means if they were cut down in order to be dried now this reasoning applies only to cabbages and pumpkins for these no sooner have they become dry than they are uneatable but other fruits even though they shriveled up on the stem are rendered unclean in respect of food uncleanness and what are the facts in the case of the shriveled up cabbages and pumpkins if both they and their stems dried up it is obvious it must be then that only they shriveled up but not their stems it is not so in fact both they and their stems had dried up but it was necessary to teach that if one cut them down in order to dry them they are still unclean in respect of food uncleanness come and here if a branch of the tree broke off with fruits upon it they are regarded as plucked if they had dried up they are regarded as attached presumably as the one is regarded as plucked for all purposes so the other is regarded as attached for all purposes is this an argument one means one thing and the other another if the animal was slaughtered etc what is the issue between them rabbi said they differ as to whether the animal can be regarded as serving as a handle to a limb one holds that the animal can be regarded as a handle to a limb and the other holds that the animal cannot be regarded as a handle to a limb they said they differ as to the ruling in the case whereby taking hold of the smaller part of a thing the greater part does not come away with it one is of the opinion that whereby taking hold of the smaller part of a thing the greater part does not come away with it it is regarded like it but the other is of the opinion that whereby taking hold of the smaller part of a thing the greater part does not come away with it it is not regarded like it or Yohanan also maintains that they differ as to the ruling in the case whereby taking hold of the smaller part of a thing the greater part does not come away with it for our Yohanan pointed out a contradiction in the views of Armeir did Armeir say whereby taking hold of the smaller part of a thing the greater part would not come away with it it is to be regarded like it but there is a contradiction to it for we have learned if a foodstuff of Terima was divided but was still attached in part Talmud Mastul and A Armeir says if by taking hold of the smaller part the greater part comes away with it it is regarded like it otherwise it is not regarded like it Whereupon our Yohanan suggested that he in this case changed his opinion but what was our Yohanan's difficulty perhaps our Meir distinguishes between the uncleanness of a T-Bulyam and other Uncle Anesses this surely is not the case for it was taught Rabbi says it is all one whether the uncleanness was that of a T-Bulyam or
Susceptible by the slaughtering thereupon I said to him Master did you not teach us that if a man gathered endives washed them for feeding cattle and then determined to use them as food for man they again need to be moistened in order to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness our Akiba then retracted and taught according to our Judah the one accepts the original teaching of our Akiba the other the teaching after he retracted our Aha the son of our Ika said they differ in the case where the blood was wiped away from the limb between the cutting of the first and second organs of the throat one maintains that the term Sheshita applies to the entire process of slaughtering from beginning to end consequently this blood that was upon the limb was the blood of slaughtering the other maintains that the term Sheshita applies only to the last stage of the slaughtering consequently this blood that was upon the limb was the blood of a wound our Ashi said they differ as to whether the Slaughtering only and not the blood renders susceptible to uncleanness. Rabba raised the following question: Can the living animal serve as a handle to the limb or not? It is undecided. Abay said, Behold, they have said, if a man planted a cucumber in a plant pot and it grew and spread outside the pot, it is clean. Said Arsimian, How does this come to be clean? Rather, what is unclean remains unclean, and what is clean remains clean. Now ask Abay according to Arsimian, Can it serve as a handle to the rest? It is undecided. Our Jeremiah said, Behold, they have said that if a man bowed down to half a pumpkin, he has thereby rendered it forbidden. Now ask our Jeremiah Talmud, Mosul and B, Can it serve as a handle to the other half? It is undecided. Our Papa said, Behold, they have said, if a branch of a fig tree was broken off but it was still attached by the bark and unclean matter came into contact with it, our Judah declares it to be clean, but the sages say if it can live, it is clean, but if not, it is. Unclean now ask our papa can it serve as a handle to the rest it is undecided our Zara said behold they have said as to a stone that is in a corner when it must be taken out the whole of it must be taken out and when the house must be pulled down a man need pull down only his own half of the stone but leaves his neighbors half now ask our Zara can it serve as a handle to the rest it is undecided if the animal died what difference is there between a limb torn from a living animal and a limb torn from a dead animal the difference is where some flesh is severed from a limb for flesh severed from a limb torn from a living animal is not rendered unclean but flesh severed from a limb torn from a dead animal is rendered unclean and where is there proof in scripture that a limb torn away from a living animal renders unclean Rab Judah said in the name of Rabbit is written and if there die of the beast but surely this verse is required for the other teaching of Rab Judah in the name of Rab for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab others say it was so taught in a it is written and if there die of the beast he that touch it the carcass thereof shall be unclean that is to say some beasts render unclean and some do not and which are they that do not render unclean they are trifed animals that have been slaughtered if that were so scripture should have stated of beast why does it state of the beast you may therefore infer two results from it then in that case even flesh severed from a living animal should also render unclean should it not you cannot say so for it has been taught I might think that flesh severed from a living animal should also be unclean scripture therefore states and if there die of the beast as death cannot be replaced so everything that is severed and cannot be replaced renders unclean so our Jose the Galilean our Akiba says it is written the beast as the beast is made up of veins and bones so everything Severed must be made up of veins and bones in order to render unclean. Rabbi says the beast as the beast is made up of flesh and veins and bones, so everything severed must be made up of flesh and veins and bones in order to render unclean. Wherein is there a difference between Rabbi and our Akiva in the case of the nethermost joint of the leg? And wherein is there a difference between our Akiva and our Jose the Galilean? Our Papa answered in the case of the kidney and the upper lip, the same has also been taught with regard to creeping things. Because I might think that flesh severed from living creeping things should also be unclean. Scripture therefore states when they are dead as death cannot be replaced, so everything that is severed and cannot be replaced renders unclean. So our Jose the Galilean, our Akiva says it is written the creeping things as the creeping thing is made up of veins and bones, so everything severed must be made up of veins and bones in order to render unclean. Rabbi says the creeping things as the creeping thing is made up of flesh and veins and bones, so everything severed must be made up of flesh and veins and bones between Rabbi and our Akiva. There is a difference with regard to the nethermost joint of the leg and between our Akiva and our Jose the Galilean. There is a difference with regard to the kidney and the upper lip. Now both teachings were necessary for if it had been taught only with regard to beasts, I should have said that the reason why the flesh torn from a living beast does not render unclean was that the beast when dead does not render unclean by a lentil's bolt thereof. But in the case of a creeping thing, since when dead it renders unclean by a lentil's bolt thereof, I should have said that the flesh of the living creeping thing should render unclean. And if it had been taught only with regard to creeping things, I should have said that the reason why the flesh torn from a living creeping thing does not render unclean. Was that creeping things do not convey uncleanness by carrying, but in the case of beasts, since they do convey uncleanness by carrying, I should have said that even the flesh torn from a living beast should render unclean. Therefore, both teachings were necessary. Our rabbis taught where a man cut off an olive's bulk of flesh from a limb that was severed from a living animal. If he first cut it off and then intended it as food, it is clean. But if he first intended it as food and then cut it off, it is unclean. Our was once absent from the Beth Hamid Rashi. Later met Arzara and asked him what was said in the Beth Hamid Rashi. Said the other, and what was your difficulty? He said, Well, it has been stated if he first intended it as food and then cut it off, it is unclean. Talmud, Mosulim, but it had only made covered contact with uncleanness, and covered contact with uncleanness does not render unclean. Said the other, I too had this difficulty, and I put it to our Abu and he told. Me that this ruling was in accordance with our mayor's view who maintains that covered contact with uncleanness does render unclean. He said indeed on many occasions he told me that too, but I replied to him that our mayor surely made a distinction between that which needed to be rendered susceptible to uncleanness by a liquid and that which did not need to be so rendered susceptible. Rabbi said, but what was the objection? Perhaps it was rendered susceptible to uncleanness, whereupon Rabbi son of Hanan asked Rabbi, why is it at all necessary that it be rendered susceptible? Originally it conveyed the greater uncleanness, he replied, but then it served only as would have a said, Behold, they have said that if a man especially set aside a lump of leaven to be used as a seed, he has thereby nullified it. The uncleanness thereof I say is not decreed by the law of the Torah, for should you say it is so by the law of the Torah, then we should have a case of footsteps being able to convey the greater. Uncleanness later on, no, not necessarily so, for it now serves as would have a said. Behold, they have said that footstuffs used as offerings to idols render unclean men and vessels that are in the same tent. This uncleanness, I say, is not decreed by the law of the Torah, for should you say it is so by the law of the Torah, then we should have a case of footstuffs being able to convey the greater uncleanness later on, no, not necessarily so, for they now serve as would have a said. Behold, they have stated that footstuffs that adhere closely to vessels are like the vessels themselves. The uncleanness in such a case, I say, is not decreed by the law of the Torah, for should you say it is so by the law of the Torah, then we should have a case of footstuffs being able to convey the greater uncleanness later on, no, not necessarily so, for they now serve as would our Papa said to Rabbah in view of that which has been taught is the forbidden fat of a carcass of a clean animal in villages. Needs the intention to be used as food and also needs to be made susceptible to uncleanness. I say the uncleanness that the fat conveys by reason of the kidney within it is not decreed by the law of the Torah. For should you say it is so by the law of the Torah, then we should have a case of footsteps being able to convey the greater uncleanness. No, not necessarily so, for it now serves as would our madness said. Behold, they have spoken of a house roofed with stocks. The uncleanness thereof I say is not decreed by the law of the Torah. For should you say that it is so by the law of the Torah, then we should have a case of stocks conveying the greater uncleanness. No, not necessarily so, for they now serve as would our Simeon declares it clean. But whichever view you take, it is difficult. If at death the limb is considered as already fallen off, then it should be unclean as a limb severed from a living animal. And if at death it is not considered as already fallen off, then it should be. Unclean as a limb severed from a carcass, our simian refers to the first clause which reads limbs or pieces of flesh which hang loose from a living animal are unclean in respect of food. Uncle Anas, whilst they are in their place and
Food which you may give others to eat is termed food, but food which you may not give others to eat is not termed food. But perhaps the reason for our Simeon's view there is that given by Rabbah or our Yohanan, indeed we must say it refers to the last clause. But our Simeon differs not with regard to the limbs, but only with regard to the pieces of flesh. Thus, if the animal died, the flesh requires to be rendered susceptible to Uncle Anas. Our Simeon declares it clean. Thereupon our Yohanan said, "What is the reason for our Simeon's view? Because Scripture says all food therein which may be eaten, therefore food which you may give others to eat is termed food. But food which you may not give others to eat is not termed food. Mishal limbs or pieces of flesh which hang loose from a man are clean. If the man died, the flesh is clean. The limb is unclean as a limb severed from the living body, but is not unclean as a limb severed from a corpse. So our Mayor, our Simeon declares it clean tomorrow, whichever you are. Simeon takes it as difficult if at death the limb is considered as already fallen off and it should be unclean as a limb severed from the living body and if at death it is not considered as already fallen off and it should be unclean as a limb severed from a corpse. Our Simeon refers to the law in general for the first tanna had stated the limb is unclean as a limb severed from the living body but is not unclean as a limb severed from a corpse and this clearly shows that the law in general is that a limb severed from a corpse is unclean. Thereupon our Simeon said to him that in general a limb severed from a corpse is not unclean for it has been taught. Our Eliezer said I have heard that a limb severed from the living body is unclean. Said to him, Our Joshua, do you mean only from the living body and not from a corpse? Surely it is all the more so for if a limb severed from the living body which is clean is unclean, how much more is a limb severed from a corpse unclean in like manner we find it? Stated in the scroll of fast on the minor Passover, no morning is allowed. Does this mean that on the major festival morning is allowed? Surely it is all the more so on the major festival. Similarly, here it is all the more so with regard to the limb severed from the corpse. He replied, So have I heard what difference is there between the limb severed from the living body and the limb severed from the corpse? The difference is with regard to an olive's bulk of flesh or a barley corn's bulk of bone cut. Away from the limb that was severed from the living body, for we have learned if an olive's bulk of flesh was cut away from a limb that was severed from the living body, our Eliezer declares it unclean, but our Nihunya Bihakana and our Joshua declare it clean. If a barley corn's bulk of bone broke away from a limb that was severed from the living body, our Nihunya Bihakana declares it unclean, but our Eliezer and our Joshua declare it clean. Now that you have come to this, you can also say that the difference. Between the first tana and our simian is with regard to an olive's bulk of flesh or a barley corn's bulk of bone chapterx talmud, mastul and omission of the law of the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw is enforced both within the holy land and outside it both during the existence of the temple and after it in respect of unconsecrated animals but not consecrated animals for it might have been argued thus if unconsecrated animals which are not subject to the law of the breast and it thigh are subject to these dues how much more are consecrated animals with are subject to the law of the breast and the thigh subject also to these dues scripture therefore states and I have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons as a due forever only what is mentioned in this passage shall be as all consecrated animals which had contracted a permanent physical blemish before they were consecrated and have been redeemed are subject to the law of the firstling and to these dues and like unconsecrated animals, they may be shorn and may be put to work, and after they have been redeemed, their young and their milk are permitted, and he who slaughtered them outside the sanctuary is not liable, and they do not render what was substituted for them holy, and if they die, they may be redeemed. The firstling and the tithe of cattle are accepted. All consecrated animals which had contracted a permanent blemish after they were consecrated, or if they had contracted a passing blemish before they were consecrated, and subsequently after consecration contracted a permanent blemish and have been redeemed, are exempt from the law of the firstling and from these dues, and they may not, like unconsecrated animals, be shorn or put to work, and even after they have been redeemed, their young and their milk are forbidden, and he who slaughtered them outside the sanctuary is liable, and they render what was substituted for them holy, and if they die, they must be buried. Tomorrow, the reason. Is that scripture stated them, but without it I should have argued that consecrated animals are subject to these dues, but surely the argument of the Mishnah can be refuted, thus that is so of unconsecrated animals, since they are also subject to the law of the firstling, it might have been inferred from male unconsecrated animals, but it can also be refuted, thus that is so of male, since they are also subject to the precept of the first of the fleece, it might then have been inferred from he goats, but it might be argued that is so of he goats, since they also enter the stall to be tithed, it might then have been inferred from old he goats, but it might be argued that is so of old he goats, since they have in the past entered the stall to be tithed, it might then have been inferred from a bot or orphan animal, but it might be argued that is so of bot or orphan animal, since their kind enters the stall to be tithed, their kind you say then it is the same with Consecrated animals too for their kind enters the stall to be tithed, but can it not be inferred that unconsecrated animals are subject to the precept of the breast and the thigh from the following a fortiori argument? Thus, if consecrated animals which are not subject to the priestly dues are subject to the precept of the breast and the thigh, how much more are unconsecrated animals which are subject to the priestly dues subject also to the precept of the breast and the thigh? The verse therefore reads, and this shall be the priests do this, yes, but nothing else. Now the reason is that scripture stated this, but without it I should have said that unconsecrated animals are subject to the precept of the breast and the thigh, but is not the right of waving essential, and where can they be waved outside the sanctuary? But it is written before the Lord Talmud, Mastul and be inside the sanctuary, then he is bringing what is unconsecrated into the temple court, it is therefore inapplicable. Wherefore then do I require the word this for Arhistas teaching for Arhistas said if a man destroyed or consumed the priestly dues before they were given to the priest he is not liable to make restitution to turn to the main text Arhistas said if a man destroyed or consumed the priestly dues before they were given to the priest he is not liable to make restitution for what reason if you wish I can say because it is written the word this or if you prefer I can say because it is property which has no definite claimant an objection was raised the verse and this shall be the priest's do Mishpat teaches that the dues are a matter of right what is the effect of this is it not that they can be claimed in court no it is that they are to be distributed by the advice of the court and this is in agreement with our Samuel B. Namani for our Samuel B. Namani said in the name of our Jonathan whence do we know that one should not give any dues to a priest and am higher from it Verse moreover he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the levites that they might hold fast to the law of the Lord whosoever holds fast to the law of the Lord has a portion and whosoever does not hold fast to the law of the Lord has no portion come and here our Judah be but there says the expression do Mishpat teaches that the dues are a matter of right I might say that the breast and the thigh are also a matter of right the text therefore states and this now what is the effect of this rule is it that they are to be distributed by the advice of the court and surely the breast and thigh are also to be distributed by the advice of the court it must therefore mean that they can be claimed in court we are dealing here with the case where they had come into the priest's possession but if they had come into his possession already then this is obvious they came into his possession unseparated and this tana is of the opinion that Priestly dues, although not separated from the bulk, are regarded as virtually separated. Come and here, if a householder was traveling from place to place and is obliged to take the gleanings, the forgotten sheaf, or the corners of the field, or the foreman's tithe, he may take them, and when he returns to his house, he must make restitution. So our Eliezer Arhistah said they taught this only as a rule of conduct for the pious, said Rabba, but the Tana stated he must make restitution. How then can one say that this was stated here only as a rule of conduct for the pious? Moreover, can any objection be raised from the statement of our Eliezer? Indeed, it was from the following clause that the objection was raised, viz. But the sages say he was a poor man at that time. Now, this is so only because he was a poor man, but had he been a rich man, he would have had to make restitution. But why is this not a case of a man destroying or consuming the priestly dues? Whereupon Arhistah answered, they taught this only. As a rule of conduct for the pious come and here once do we know that if an owner consumed his produce without having separated the tithes or if a Levite consumed his tithe without having separated the priestly tithe therefrom he is exempt from making restitution because scripture says and they shall not profane the holy
considered the property of the priest surely and that they can be claimed in court no but as we have learned why did they say that the first fruits are the property of the priest because with them he may buy slaves immovable property and unclean cattle and a creditor can take them in payment of his debt or a woman in payment of her ketubah and he may also buy with them a scroll of the law there was once a Levite who used to snatch the priestly dues when this was reported to Rab he said is it not enough for him that we do not take the dues from his own slaughtering but he must also snatch them but what was Rab's view if they love it are included within the term the people we should exact the dues from them too and if they are not included within the term the people then the divine law has exempted them Rab was in doubt whether they are included within the term the people or not our papa was once sitting and reciting the above statement whereupon R.E.D.B. Aben raised this Objection against our Papa it was taught the four gifts assigned by the Torah to the poor in a vineyard namely the fallen grapes the small clusters the forgotten cluster and the corner of the vineyard and the three in the cornfield namely the gleanings the forgotten sheaf and the corners of the field and the two in the fruit of the tree namely the forgotten fruits and the corner of the tree with regard of these the owners have not the benefit of disposal and even from the poorest in Israel. They are exacted with regard to the poor man's tithe which is distributed in the house the owner has the benefit of disposal and it is exacted even from the poorest in Israel the other priestly do such as the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw are not exacted from one priest in favor of another priest nor from one Levite in favor of another Levite the four gifts to the poor in the vineyard namely the fallen grapes the small clusters the forgotten cluster and the corner for it is. Written and thou shalt not glean the small clusters of thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather the fallen fruit of thy vineyard, and it is written when thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean the small clusters after thee, and our Levi said after thee implies that which is forgotten as to the corner of the vineyard, this is inferred by the use of the expression after thee, both here with regard to a vineyard and also with regard to the olive tree, for it is written when thou eatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs after thee, and a tana of the school of our Ishmael expressed it thus, thou shalt not cut off the crown thereof the three in the cornfield, namely the gleanings Talmud, Mosul and be the forgotten sheep and the corners of the field, for it is written, and when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corner of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleaning of thy harvest, and it is written when thou reapest thy Harvest in thy field and hast forgot a sheep in the field thou shalt not go back to fetch it the two in the fruit of the tree namely the forgotten fruits and the corner of the tree for it is written when thou beatest thine olive tree thou shalt not go over the boughs after thee and the of the school of our Ishmael expressed it thus thou shalt not cut off the crown thereof and the expression after thee refers to the forgotten fruits with regard to all of these the owners have not the benefit of disposal because the term leaving is used in connection with them and even from the poorest in Israel they are exacted for it is written neither shalt thou gather the gleaning of thy harvest thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger this is an admonition to a poor man who himself owns a field in regard to his own gleanings with regard to the poor man's tithe which is distributed in the house the owner has the benefit of disposal because the term giving is used in Connection with it and it is exacted even from the poorest in Israel for our Ilay said an inference is to be made by means of the common expression for the stranger from the other dues to the poor as with the other dues there is an admonition to a poor man in regard to his own so here with regard to the poor man's tithe there is an admonition to a poor man in regard to his own the other priestly dues such as the shoulder the two cheeks and the maw are not exacted from one priest in favor of another priest nor from one Levite in favor of another Levite it follows however that they may be exacted from a Levite in favor of a priest apparently because they are included within the term the people it only stated such as the shoulder but not actually the shoulder what is really meant is the first tithe but is not the first tithe due to the Levite the view expressed here is that of our Ilay's or Bezerai for it has been taught Terima belongs to the priest the first tithe to the Levite so our Akiva our Eliezer B. Ezra says it belongs to the priest also but our Eliezer B. Ezra said to the priest also did he say to the priest and not to the Levite yes after Ezra had penalized them perhaps Ezra had penalized them and one should not give it the first tithe to them but did he intend that it should be taken away from them we must therefore say such as the shoulder but not actually the shoulder what is really meant is the first of the fleece come and here this is the general rule whatsoever is sacred as terima the terima of the tithe and the dough offering is exacted from their hands and whatsoever is not sacred as the shoulder the two cheeks and the maw is not exacted from them it states such as the shoulder but not actually the shoulder what is meant is the first tithe and this refers to the state of things after Ezra had penalized them come and here if a man slaughtered an animal for a priest or for a gentile he is exempt from the dues it follows. Does it not that for a Levite or an Israelite he is liable? Say not it follows that for a Levite or an Israelite he is liable, but rather it follows that for an Israelite he is liable, but for a Levite you say he is exempt. In that case, the Mishnah should have taught us if a man slaughtered an animal for a Levite or a Gentile he is exempt from the dues. Moreover, it has been taught in the Beritha if a man slaughtered an animal for a priest or a Gentile he is exempt from the dues, but if he slaughtered for a Levite or an Israelite he is liable. Surely this is a refutation of Rab's view. Rab can reply that it is a matter of dispute between Tanaim, for it has been taught scripture says, and he shall make atonement for the most holy place. This means for transgression of the laws of uncleanness occurring in the Holy of Holies and the tent of meeting. This means in the holy place and the altar. This is to be taken in its usual sense. He shall make atonement. This means for transgression. Of the laws of uncleanness occurring in the various temple courts and for the priests, this is to be taken in its usual sense, and for all the people of the assembly, this means the Israelites, he shall make atonement, this means the Levites, and another very the taught, he shall make atonement, this means even slaves, surely then the Tanaim differ in this one holds that they, the Levites are included under the term the people, and the other holds that they are not included under the people, and Rab, if he agrees with the one Tana, he should have ruled accordingly, and if he agrees with the other Tana, he should have ruled accordingly, Rab was in doubt whether to accept the ruling of the one Tana or of the other Mirmar stated in a discourse, the law is in accordance with Rab's view, and the law is also in accordance with our Histas view, Allah used to give the priestly dues to the daughter of a priest, Rab raised the following objection to Allah, we have learned the meal offering of a priest. Daughter is eaten, but the meal offering of a priest may not be eaten. Now, if you say that priest includes a priest's daughter too, is it not written? And every meal offering of the priest shall be holy made to smoke, it shall not be eaten. He replied, Master Talmud, Mastul and I borrow your own argument, for in that passage are expressly mentioned Aaron and his sons, the school of our Ishmael taught unto the priest, but not unto the priest's daughter, for we may infer what is not explicitly stated. From what is explicitly stated, the school of our Eliezer B. Jacob taught unto the priest, and even unto the priest's daughter, for we have here a limitation following a limitation, and the purpose of a double limitation is to extend the law. Our Kahana used to eat the priestly dues on account of his wife, our Papa used to eat them on account of his wife, our Yamar used to eat them on account of his wife, our EDB Abin used to eat them on account of his wife, Rabbin said, Mirmar told me that the law was in. Accordance with Rab's view that the law was in accordance with Aristotle's view that the law was in accordance with Allah's view and that the law was in accordance with the view of our Adabi Agaba that if a Levite's daughter gave birth to a firstborn son the child is exempt from the payment of the five cellars our rabbis taught the law of the shoulder the two cheeks and the multiplies to a hybrid and to a koi our Eliezer says a hybrid the offspring of a goat and a you is subject to these dues the offspring of a goat and a hind is exempt from these dues let us consider the case it has been established that with regard to the law of covering up the blood and also with regard to the priestly dues the dispute between our Eliezer and the rabbis as to the koi can arise only in the case where a heart covered a goat for both our Eliezer and the rabbis are undecided whether or not to take into consideration the seed of the male parent but they differ as to whether the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only one maintains that the term sheep includes even that which is a sheep in part only the other maintains that we do not say that the term sheep includes that which is a sheep in part only now our Eliezer's view that the offspring
Wherefore does it state whether it be sheep to include the koi according to our Eliezer what is the purpose of whether it is necessary in order to indicate disjunction and whence do the rabbis derive the principle of disjunction from the verse from them at slaughter is slaughtering and to what purpose does our Eliezer put this verse from them at slaughter is slaughtering he requires it for Rabbis teaching for Rabbis said the claim is made against the slaughter of Mishnah if the firstling got mixed. Up with a hundred other animals and a hundred and one person slaughtered them all they are all exempt from the dues if one person slaughtered them all only one animal is exempt from the dues if a man slaughtered an animal for a priest or a gentile he is exempt from the dues if he had a share in the animal with them he must indicate this by some sign if he said except the dues he is exempt from giving the dues if a man said sell me the entrails of a cow and among them were the priestly dues. He must give them to a priest and the seller need not allow any reduction in the purchase price on that account but if he bought them from him by weight he must give them to a priest and the seller must allow a reduction in the price on that account tomorrow why is this so the priest can surely approach him with a double claim saying of each animal if it is the firstling it is all mine and if it is not the firstling then give me my dues Talmud, Mastul and B. Arashai said this firstling had already been received by the priest but when it suffered a blemish he sold it to an Israelite if a man slaughtered an animal for a priest or a Gentile he is exempt from the dues why does not the Mishnah teach simply priests and Gentiles are exempt from giving the dues Rabbah said this proves that the claim is made against the slaughterer Rabbah stated in his discourse scripture says from the people but not from the priest but when it further says from them that slaughter is slaughtering I say. This includes even a slaughterer who is a priest. Our tablet's host was a priest and in sore need when he came to our tablet. The latter said to him, Go and take a share in the animals of the Israelite butchers, for since they will thereby be exempt from giving the dues, they will give you a share with them. Our Naman, however, declared him liable to give the dues, said he, But our tablet has exempted me. Go at once, ordered our Naman, and give up the dues, or else I will put our tablet out of your mind thereupon. Our tablet came before our Naman and said to him, Why has the master done so? He replied, When our Ahabi Hanani came from the schools in the south, he reported that our Joshua Belibai and the elders of the south ruled that a priest who became a slaughterer was exempt from giving the dues for the first two or three weeks, but thereafter he was liable to give the dues, then said the other, Why does not the master at least deal with him in accordance with our Ahabi Hanani? He replied, That is the ruling only when he has not set up a butcher's stall, but here he has set up a stall. Our Hisda said a priest, a butcher who does not give a deuce to another priest is to be put under the ban of the Lord God of Israel. Rabbi son of Arshila said the butchers of Yusuf have been under the ban of our Hisda for the last 22 years. Now, what is the point of this? Does it mean to say that we do not continue the ban, but it has been taught this applies only to negative precepts, but in the case of positive precepts, is for instance when a man is told make a sukkah and he does not make it or perform the commandment of the Lalab and he does not perform it, he is flogged until his soul departs. It means that we may penalize them now without warning, as when Rabbah penalized a man by taking away from him a side of meat, and Arnaman B. Isaac penalized a man by taking away from him his cloak. Our Hisda also said the entire shoulder is to be given to one priest, the to another, and the two cheeks to two priests. But surely this is not so for when our Isaac B. Joseph came from Palestine he reported that in the west they even divide every bone amongst a number of priests that is only in the case of an ox Rabbi B. Barhana said in the name of our Yohanan it is forbidden to eat from an animal from which the priestly dues have not been taken Rabbi B. Barhana also said in the name of our Yohanan whosoever eats from an animal from which the priestly dues have not been taken is as one who eats untithed produce. The law however is not in accordance with him or his da said the priestly dues may be eaten only roasted and with mustard what is the reason because scripture says for a consecrated portion that is as a mark of eminence and must therefore be eaten as kings take their food our his da also said a priest who is not conversant with the twenty-four priestly endowments should not be given any gifts at all this however is not right for it has been taught our Simeon says a priest who does not believe in it. Temple service has no portion in the priesthood, for it is written he among the sons of Aaron that offered the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. I only know it with regard to the service, whence do I know it with regard to the fifteen other services in the temple? Is the rites of pouring, mingling, breaking into pieces, seasoning with salt, waving, bringing near, taking out the handful, and burning it the rite of nipping off Talmud, Mosul, and of receiving the blood in a vessel and sprinkling it the ceremony of giving the water to a woman suspected of adultery, of breaking the heifer's neck, of purifying the leper, and of raising the hands for the priestly benediction, both inside the temple and outside the text. Therefore, states among the sons of Aaron that is every service ordained for the sons of Aaron, hence a priest who does not believe in the temple services has no portion in the priesthood. Now the reason for this is that he does. Not believe in them, but if he does believe in them, although he is not conversant with them, he is entitled to the priestly dues. Our Abba said in the name of Arhuna, who said it in the name of Rabba Bains in the cheek are forbidden, and a priest who does not know how to remove them should not be given this portion. But this is not correct, for if the meat is roasted, then the blood will run out, and if it is cooked in the pot, having first been cut up and salted, then the blood will have run out. Rabba said our Joseph once tested us by the following question If a priest snatches the priestly dues, is this a token of his zeal for the precept or of his contempt for the precept? And we replied, Scripture says they shall give, but he shall not take it himself. Abba said, At first I used to snatch the priestly dues, for I said to myself, I am showing my zeal for the precept, but when I heard the teaching they shall give, but he shall not take it himself, I would no more snatch it, but would say to all. Give them to me, and when I heard the teaching of the following Barry, though which was taught, they turned aside after Luker Armeyer said Samuel's sons used to ask for the portions themselves. I decided not to ask for them, but would accept them if they were given to me. And when I heard the following Barry, though which was taught, the modest withdrew their hands from it, but the greedy took it. I decided not to accept them at all, save on the day before the day of atonement, so as to establish myself as one of the priests. But he could have raised his hands for the priestly benediction. Time pressed him, or Joseph said, a priest in whose neighborhood there lives a scholar who is in sore need may assign to him the priestly dues, even though they have not yet come into his hands, provided the priest is popular among the priests and love its rabbi. And our Saffir once visited the house of Mariana, the son of Arhanabi, at others say the house of Mariana, the son of Arhanabi, Bizna, and he prepared for them. A third born calf thereupon Rabbah said to the attendant who waited upon them, assigned to me the dues for I wish to eat the tongue with mustard, he assigned them to him, Rabbah ate it, but our Saffir would not eat it. There came to our Saffir the following verse in a dream as one that taketh off a garment in cold weather and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. He then came before our Joseph and said to him, Perhaps it was because I did not do in accordance with the masters. Teaching that this verse came to me, but here our Joseph replied, I said it of a stranger only, but an attendant perforce must assign it. Moreover, I said it in respect of one who was needy, but here it was not a case of need. Then why did this verse appear to me? It referred to Rabbah. Then why did it not appear to Rabbah? He was under divine censure. Abbe said to our Dimi, to what does the plain meaning of the above verse refer? He replied to one who teaches a disciple that is unworthy for Rab Judah stated in. The name of Rab, whosoever teaches a disciple that is unworthy will fall into Gehenim as it is written, All darkness is laid up for his treasures of fire not blown by man shall consume him that hath an unworthy remnant Sarat in his tent and Sarat can refer only to the scholar as it is written and among the remnant you base those whom the Lord shall call Arzara said in the name of Rab, whosoever teaches a disciple that is unworthy is as one that throws a stone at a merhulis for it is written. As a small stone in a heap of stone so is he that giveth honor to a fool and honor is nothing but the Torah as it is written the wise shall inherit honor and the perfect shall inherit good Arham Abihan said whosoever does good to one that does not appreciate it is as one that throws a stone at a merhulis for it is written as a small stone in a heap of stone so is he that giveth honor to a fool and it is also written luxury is not seemly for a fool if he had a share in the animal with. Then he must indicate this by
For sacrifice made after they have been redeemed be sold in the market may be slaughtered in the market and may be weighed out by the pound our Abbi Ahab has suggested before our Papa that our case refers only to those animals that are sold in the house Arhuna said if he has a share in the head of the animal only one is exempt from giving the cheeks if he has a share in the forelimb one is exempt from giving the shoulder and if he has a share in the entrails one is exempt from giving the maw. Hi Rab said even if he has only a share in one of these parts one is nevertheless exempt from all the dues and objection was raised if he said the head shall be mine and the rest yours or even if he said one hundred part of the head shall be mine he is exempt the forelimb shall be mine and the rest yours or even one hundred part of the forelimb shall be mine he is exempt the entrails shall be mine and the rest yours or even one hundred part of the entrails shall be mine. He is exempt now this means does it not that he is exempt from the cheeks but liable to give the others likewise that he is exempt from the shoulder but liable to give the others and so also that he is exempt from the mob but liable to give the others no it means he is exempt from all the dues then why does it not expressly state he is exempt from all the dues furthermore it has been expressly taught if he said the head shall be mine and the rest yours or even one hundred part of it. Head shall be mine he is exempt from giving the cheeks but he is liable to give the others this is surely a refutation of the view of Hibi Rab it is a refutation Arhista said the following very the misled Hibi Rab for it was taught there are twenty four priestly endowments all bestowed upon Aaron and his sons first in general terms and then specified separately and finally confirmed by a covenant of salt whosoever observes them is as though he observes the whole Torah which is Expounded by generalizations and specifications and the sacrifices which were confirmed by a covenant of salt and whosoever neglects them is as though he neglects the whole Torah which is expounded by generalizations and specifications and the sacrifices which were confirmed by a covenant of salt and these are the ten that are to be eaten within the precincts of the temple for that are enjoyed in Jerusalem and ten that are given to them within the borders of the land of Israel. The ten that are to be eaten within the precincts of the temple are the sin offering of an animal, the sin offering of a bird, the guilt offering for a known sin, the guilt offering for a doubtful sin, the peace offerings of the congregation, the log of oil of the leper, the two loaves, the shoe bread, the remnant of the meal offerings, the remnant of the omer, the four that are enjoyed in Jerusalem are the firstling, the first fruits that which is taken away as a heave offering from the thank offering. And from the realm of the Nazi right and the heights of the most holy sacrifices, the ten that are given to them within the borders of the land of Israel are the terimah, the terimah of the tithe, the dough offering, the first of the fleece, the priestly dues, the redemption of the firstborn son, the redemption of the firstling of an ass, the field of possession, the devoted field, and the restitution for robbery committed upon a proselyte. Now he thought that since the priestly dues were counted as one item in the list, they are considered one, but it is not the case, for can it be said that what is taken away as a heave offering from the thank offering and from the realm of the Nazi right are considered one merely because they are counted as one item, surely they are counted as one item because they are similar to each other, then in this case too they are counted as one item only because they are similar to each other. The question was raised, what is the law if he said the head shall be? Yours and all the rest shall be mine. Do we have regard to the part of the animal on which the obligation rests and this part belongs to the Israelite, or do we have regard to the major portion of the animal and this belongs to the priest? Come and here if a Gentile or a priest delivered sheep to an Israelite to shear them, he is exempt from the first of the fleece. If a man bought the fleeces of a flock belonging to a Gentile, he is exempt from the first of the fleece in this respect. The law of the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw is more strict than the law of the first of the fleece. This proves that we have regard to the part of the animal upon which the obligation rests. This proves that if he said except the dues, he is exempt from giving the dues Talmud. Mastulane, I can point out a contradiction to this. It was taught if he said on condition that the dues shall be given to me, he may nevertheless give them to any priest he chooses. Do you oppose the terms except and on? Condition that against each other the term except is a reservation but the term on condition that is no reservation there is however a further contradiction for it was taught if he said on condition that the dues shall be given to me the dues must then be given to him they differ in this one holds that on condition that is a reservation the other holds that on condition that is no reservation if a man said sell me the entrails of a cow etc rab said they taught this only where the purchaser weighed them for himself but if the butcher weighed them for him then the priest's claim is against the butcher also rc said even though the butcher weighed them for him his claim is with him only shall we say that they differ in the ruling of Arhista for Arhista stated if a person misappropriated an article and before the owner gave up hope of recovering it another person came and consumed it the owner has the option of collecting payment from either the one or the other now is it too? He said that the one rab agrees with Arhista and the other RC does not agree with Arhista. No, all agree with Arhista, but there they differ as to whether the priestly dues are subject to the law of theft. The one rab holds that they are subject to the law of theft and the other RC holds that they are not. Some report the above argument independently. Thus, rab said the priestly dues are subject to the law of theft. RC said the priestly dues are not subject to the law of theft. Mishnah, if a proselyte had a cow and he slaughtered it before he became a proselyte, he is exempt from giving the priestly dues. If he slaughtered it after he became a proselyte, he is liable. If there was a doubt about it, he is exempt for the burden of proof lies upon the claimant. Tomorrow, when Ardimi came from Palestine, he reported that our Simeon Belakish pointed out the following contradiction to our Yohan, and we have learned if there was a doubt about it, he is exempt, which shows that the doubt is. Decided in favor of leniency, but there is a contradiction to this. For we have learned the grain found in ant holes among the standing corn belongs to the owner. As for the grain found in ant holes behind the reapers, the uppermost layer belongs to the poor. But what is beneath belongs to the owner. Our Meir says it all belongs to the poor, since leanings that are in doubt are deemed to be gleanings to this. Are Yohanan answered? Do not weary me with your arguments, since I quote that mission as the opinion of an individual. For it has been taught our Judah be Agra says in the name of our Meir, leanings that are in doubt are deemed to be gleanings. Forgotten sheep that are in doubt are deemed to be forgotten sheep, and corners of the field that are in doubt are deemed to be corners of the field. The other Reshlakish retorted, teach it even in Ben Tattle's name. The difficulty, however, remains for he adduces a reason for his view. For Reshlakish said it is written, do justice to it. Afflicted and poor, what is meant by do justice? Can it mean favor him in his lawsuit? Surely it is written, Thou shalt not favor a poor man in his cause, rather it means be liberal with what is yours and give it to him. Rob answered, Here the cow has the status of exemption from dues, but the standing corn has the status of being subject to the due set of a to him. Behold, the case of the dough of a proselyte of which we learned if it was mixed before he became a proselyte, he is exempt. From giving the dough offering, if after he became a proselyte, he is liable to give it. If there was a doubt about it, he is liable. He replied, Where the doubt concerns a religious prohibition, we must take the more stringent view. Where the doubt concerns a monetary matter, we take the more lenient view for our Hista stated, and so also did our high teach eight cases of doubt were cited in connection with the proselyte, and for he is held liable, and in for he is held exempt, and these are they with regard. To his wife sacrifice the dough offering the firstling of an unclean animal and the firstling of a clean animal he is held liable Talmud, Mastul and be with regard to the first of the fleece the priestly dues the redemption of his firstborn son and the redemption of the firstling of an ass he is exempt when Rabin came from Palestine he reported that he had pointed out to him a contradiction with regard to the standing corn itself Levi once sowed grain in Kishore and there were no poor to collect the gleaning so he came before Arshis Hate he told him it is written thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger but not for ravens and bats an objection was raised one is not obliged to bring in the terima from the threshing floor into the town nor from the desert into the inhabited place if however there is no priest there in the district one must hire a cow and bring it in for otherwise there would be a waste of terima in the case of terima it is different for without Setting apart the terimah the whole is forbidden and therefore one has no choice but to set it apart but take the case of the priestly dues they do not render the whole forbidden nevertheless it has been taught where the custom is only to scrape away with boiling water the hair of calves one should not remove the skin from the shoulder moreover where the
shoulder from the joint up to the shoulder socket of the forelimb and this is the same for the Nazi right the corresponding part of the hind leg is called the thigh or Judah says the thigh extends from the joint up to the fleshy part of the leg what counts as the cheek from the joint of the jaw to the prominence of the windpipe Gemara our rabbis taught the shoulder that is the right shoulder you say it is the right shoulder but perhaps it is the left scripture therefore says the shoulder how is this implied as Rabbah said the thigh means the right thigh so the shoulder means the right shoulder and for what purpose is the cheek stated to include the wool upon the head of sheep and the hair of the beard of goats and for what purpose is the maw stated to include the fat that lies upon the stomach and the fat within the stomach for our Joshua said the priests were in the habit of being generous with this and used to return it to the owners the only reason for returning it is that they were in the habit of doing so but had they not been of this habit it certainly would have belonged to them the interpreters of scripture by symbol used to say the shoulder represents the hand of Phinehas for it is written and took a spear in his hand the cheeks represent his prayer for so it is written and stood up Phinehas and prayed the maw this is to be taken in its literal sense for so it is written and the woman through her stomach ate and it derives it from the following it is written and the right thigh from this I only know the right thigh once do I know this of the shoulder of consecrated animals because the text states as a heave offering and once do I know this of the shoulder of unconsecrated animals because the text states yes I'll give what counts as the cheek from the joint of the jaw to the prominence of the windpipe but it has been taught one should cut it away and the place of slaughtering should go with it this is no contradiction for the one armisha gives the opinion of the rabbis and the other the bury the opinion of our hand of B Antigonus for it was taught any deflection of the knife outside the top ring invalidates the slaughtering our hand of B Antigonus testified that a deflection is permitted or if you wish you may say that both statements accord with the opinion of the rabbis for with it in the bury the means with the rest of the animal chapterx i talmud mostulin omission the law of the first of the fleece is in Force both within the Holy Land and outside it both during the existence of the temple and after it in respect of unconsecrated animals but not consecrated animals the law of the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw is of wider application than the law of the first of the fleece for the law of the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw applies both to herds and flocks whether they are many or few whereas the law of the first of the fleece applies only to sheep and only when there are many. What is meant by many Beth Sham I say at least two sheep as it is said a man shall rear a young cow and two sheep Beth Hillel say five as it is said five sheep ready dressed are dosa Biharkina says five sheep which produce each a fleece of the weight of a mina and a half are subject to the law of the first of the fleece but the sages say five sheep whatever their fleeces weigh and how much should one give him the weight of five cellars in Judah which is equal to ten cellars in Galilee of Bleach wool but not dirty wool sufficient to make from it a small garment for it is written thou shalt give him that is there shall be enough worthy to be called a gift if the owner did not manage to give the fleece to the priest until it had already been dyed he is exempt if he only bleached it but did not dye it he is still liable if a man bought the fleeces of the flock belonging to a gentile he is exempt from the law of the first of the fleece if a man bought the fleeces of the flock belonging to his neighbor and the seller kept back some for himself the seller is liable but if he kept not back the buyer is liable if he had two kinds of wool gray and white and he sold the gray but not the white or if he sold the wool of the males but not of the females each must give the first of the fleece for himself tomorrow why does not the law of the first of the fleece apply to consecrated animals because scripture says of the sheep but not of the sheep of the sanctuary now this is so because scripture stated of thy sheep but without this scriptural indication I should have said that consecrated animals are subject to the law of the first of the fleece but surely they may not be shorn for it is written thou shalt not shear the firstling of thy flock in respect of animals consecrated for the altar this is indeed so but we were referring to animals consecrated to the temple treasury but has not our Eliezer said that animals consecrated to the temple treasury are forbidden to be shorn and to be used for work this is forbidden by rabbinic decree only now I might have thought that since by law of the Torah they may be shorn where a man did shear them he should give the priest the first of the fleece scripture therefore teaches that they are not subject to the law but it is consecrated is it not I might think that he must redeem it and give it to the priest but surely it has to stand up to be appraised this is well according to him who says that Animals consecrated to the temple treasury are not subject to the law of standing up to be appraised but what can you say according to him who says that they are subject to this law Armani B. Paddish suggested in the name of Arjan A. We are referring here to the case of a man who consecrated to the temple treasury his animal apart from its fleece now I might have thought that he should shear it and give the portion to the priest scripture therefore states of the sheep but not of the sheep of the sanctuary in that case it can also refer to an animal consecrated to the altar it would thereby become weak then the animal consecrated to the temple treasury would also become weak thereby we must assume that he said I consecrate the animal except for its fleece and the debility resulting from the shearing of the fleece then even with regard to an animal consecrated to the altar we can assume that he said I consecrate the animal except for its fleece and the debility resulting from the shearing thereof even so the sanctity extends over the whole animal whence do you gather this because we have learned our Jose said is it not the case that in connection with animal offerings if one said let the foot of this animal be a burnt offering the whole animal is consecrated as a burnt offering and even according to our mayor who declares that the whole animal does not thereby become consecrated as a burnt offering that is so only where one consecrated a limb were on the life of the animal does not depend but if one consecrated a limb were on the life of the animal depends he agrees that the whole animal becomes consecrated Rabbi said our mission refers to the case where a man consecrated the fleece only now I might have said that he must shear it redeem it and give it to the priest scripture therefore states the fleece of the sheep shalt thou give him this applies only to that which lacks shearing and giving but not to that which lacks shearing Redeeming and giving and what does the expression of thy sheep come to teach us the following which has been taught an animal which is held jointly is subject to the law of the first of the fleece our ally declares it exempt what is the reason for our ally's view because scripture states of thy sheep but not of that which is held jointly and the rabbis they say that it serves to exclude only that which is held jointly with the gentile and whence does our ally know that that which is held jointly with the gentile is exempt he derives it from the beginning of the verse which reads the first of that corn but not that which is held jointly with the gentile and the rabbis the word first they say interrupts the subject matter and our ally and he says connects this with the above subject talmud mosul and b and the rabbis they say the divine law then should have stated neither and nor first and our ally he says since the one has no sanctity whatsoever whereas the other is Itself sacred, the two had to be in the first place stated separately and later connected. Alternatively, you may say the rabbis are of the opinion that what is held jointly with a gentile is subject to terim. Offer it has been taught if an Israelite and a gentile bought a field jointly, Tebal and Hullen are inextricably mixed up in it. So Rabbi Rabbi Simeon B. Gamaliel says the part belonging to the Israelite is subject to the tithe, and the part belonging to the gentile is exempt. Now the extent of their difference consists in this that the one authority our Simeon holds the principle of Berah, while the other does not hold the principle of Berah. But both are agreed that whatsoever is held jointly with a gentile is subject to tithe. In the further alternative, you may say that both rules are derived according to our ally from the expression that sheep. For why is it that what is held jointly with a gentile is exempt from the law of the first of the fleece because it is not solely as then. What is held jointly with another Israelite should also be exempt for it is not solely as and the rabbis they distinguish thus a Gentile is not subject to this law whereas an Israelite is rabbi said our ally agrees as regards terim offer although it is written that corn from which it would appear that thy only is subject to terim and not what is held jointly the divine law stated your heave offerings what then is the significance of that corn it excludes what is held jointly with a Gentile as regards the dough offering although there is written the word first and one could draw an analogy by reason of the common word first from the law of the first of the fleece as there what is held jointly is exempt so here what is held jointly is exempt the divine law stated your dough now this is so only because scripture stated your dough but had it not stated it I should have said that we should draw an analogy by reason of the common word first from the law of the first of it. Please, but on the contrary, we would rather draw the
Significance of the tithe of that corn it excludes what is held jointly with the Gentile as regards the priestly dues although it is written and he shall give in by reason of the common expression giving one might draw an analogy from the law of the first of the fleece as there what is held jointly is exempt so here what is held jointly is exempt the divine law stated from them that slaughter is slaughtering now this is so only because scripture stated from them that slaughter is slaughtering but had it not stated it I should have said that one should draw the analogy from the law of the first of the fleece but on the contrary one should rather draw the analogy from Terah this is indeed so what then is the significance of from them that slaughter is slaughtering it is as Rabbah said for Rabbah said the claim is made against the slaughter as regards the first fruits although it is written by land from which it would follow that thy only is subject but not what is held jointly the Divine law stated the first ripe fruits of all that is in their land what then is the significance of thy land it excludes land that is outside the land of Israel as regards the law of Sitsis although it is written thy covering from which it would follow that thy only is subject but not what is held jointly the divine law stated in the corners of their garments what then is the significance of thy covering it is as Rab Judah said for Rab Judah said a borrowed garment is for the first thirty days exempt from Sitsis as regards the law of the parapet although it is written for thy roof from which it would follow that thy only is subject but not what is held jointly the divine law stated if any man fall from hence what then is the significance of thy roof it excludes the roofs of synagogues and houses of study RBBB Abbe said these cases are all wrong for it has been taught an animal that is held jointly is subject to the law of the first ling R.I.L.I. I declares it Exempt what is the reason for RLIS view because it is written thy herd and thy flock but it is also written your herd and your flock that means of all Israel are handed up Surah said these cases are all wrong for it has been taught an animal that is held jointly is subject to the priestly dues RLI declares it exempt what is his reason he draws an analogy by means of the common expression giving from the law of the first of the fleece just as there what is held jointly is exempt so here what is held jointly is exempt now if you could say that in respect of Terimah what is jointly held is liable then surely one would have to draw the analogy by means of the common expression giving from Terimah this proves therefore that even in respect of Terimah what is jointly held is exempt but just as Terimah obtains in the land of Israel only and not outside it so the law of the first of the fleece should obtain in the land only and not outside it or Hosea of Nihar Bil said it is Indeed so for it has been taught RLI says the law of the priestly dues obtains only in the land of Israel likewise RLI used to say the law of the first of the fleece obtains only in the land what is RLI's reason Rob answered he draws an analogy by means of the common expression giving from Terimah as Terimah obtains in the land only and not outside it so the law of the first of the fleece obtains in the land only and not outside it said to him Abbe then just as Terimah produces the condition of Tebal so should the first of the fleece produce the condition of Tebal should it not he replied scripture says and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shalt thou give him that is you have no right to it except after it has been separated as the first again just as Terimah is subject to the penalty of death and the additional fifth so the first of the fleece should be subject to the death penalty and the additional fifth should it not scripture says and die for it and he Shall add unto it that is unto it he shall add the fifth but not unto the first of the fleece for it they shall die but not for the first of the fleece again just as there follow after Terimah the first and second tithe so there should follow after the first of the fleece the first and second tithe should there not scripture says the first thus you have only to give the first of the fleece again just as in the case of Terimah one must not set aside new grain as Terimah for old. So in the case of the first of the fleece one should not give new fleece as the due for old this is indeed so for it has been taught if a man had two lambs and he sheared them and kept the wool and next year again sheared them and kept the wool and so he did for two or three years they are not to be reckoned together it follows however that if he had five lambs they would be reckoned together yet in another berry it has been taught that they would not be reckoned together it is. Clear therefore that one berry that gives RLIS opinion and the other that of the rabbis again just as with regard to Terimah it is the law that what grows on land in the possession of one subject to Terimah is liable to it but what grows on land in the possession of one not subject to Terimah is exempt from it so it should be with regard to the first of the fleece what grows on sheep in the possession of one subject to this law is liable but what grows on sheep in the possession of one not subject to this law is exempt whence do we know this with regard to Terimah from the following berry which was taught if an Israelite bought a field in Syria from a Gentile before the produce had reached the third of its growth it is subject to tithe if it had already reached the third of its growth our Akiva declares the increase subject to tithe but the sages declare it exempt and should you say that this is indeed so but we have learned if a man bought the fleeces of a flock belonging to a Gentile he is exempt from the law of the first of the fleece so it follows that if he bought the flock with its fleece which was ready for shearing he would be liable our Mishnah Talmud, Mastul and B is not in accordance with our ally again just as in the case of Terimah one may not give one kind as Terimah for another kind so in the case of the first of the fleece one should not give one kind as a do for another kind whence do we know this in the case of Terimah from the following berry which was taught if a man had two kinds of figs black and white likewise if he had two kinds of wheat he may not give one kind as Terimah or as tithe for the other kind our Isaac reports in the name of our ally Beth Shammai say that he may not give one kind as Terimah for another kind but Bethilel say that he may so in the case of the first of the fleece one should not be permitted to give one kind as a do for another kind this is indeed so for we have learned if he had two kinds of wool gray and white and he sold the gray but not the white each must give the first of the fleece for himself but if so in the last clause which reads if he sold the wool of the males but not of the females each must give the first of the fleece for himself is the reason also because there are two different kinds we must therefore say that the tanna was merely giving a piece of good advice is that he should give him of the heart as well as the soft wool. Likewise in the former clause he also gives a piece of good advice is that he should give him of both kinds we have already stated that our mission is not in accordance with our ally again just as in the case of Terimah there must be a first offering such as leaves a perceptible remainder so in the case of the first of the fleece there should also be a first offering such as leaves a perceptible remainder should there not this is indeed so for we have learned if a man said let all the corn in. My threshing floor be Terimah or let all my dough be dough offering his words are of no effect it follows however that if he said let all my fleeces be the first of the fleeces words would hold good yet another berry that taught that his words are of no effect it is clear therefore that one berry that gives RLIS opinion and the other that of the rabbis Arnam and B. Isaac said nowadays the world has adopted the views of the following three elders that of RLI with regard to the first of the fleece for it has been taught RLI says the law of the first of the fleece obtains only in the land of Israel that of our Judah be Bethera with regard to the words of the Torah for it has been taught our Judah be Bethera says the words of the Torah do not contract uncleanness and that of our Josiah with regard to diverse kinds for it has been taught our Josiah says a man does not incur guilt for the infringement of this law until he sows wheat barley and great kernels with one throw of it. And the law of the shoulder is more strict, etc. Wherefore does not the Tana state that the law of the first of the fleece is more strict in that it applies to a trip animal, which is not so with regard to the priestly dues. Rabbin said the author of the view in our mission is Arsimian, for it has been taught Arsimian exempts trip animals from the first of the fleece. What is the reason for Arsimian's view? He draws an analogy by means of the common expression giving from the priestly dues, just as the priestly dues do not apply to a trip animal, so the law of the first of the fleece does not apply to trip animals. But since he draws an analogy by means of the common expression giving from the priestly dues, he should also draw an analogy by means of this common expression giving from Terimah, just as Terimah obtains only in the land of Israel, but not outside it. So the law of the first of the fleece obtains only in the land of Israel, but not outside it. Wherefore then have we learned the law of the first of the fleece applies both within the Holy Land and outside IT. Rather, we must say that this is the reason for our Simeon's view. He draws an analogy by means of the common expression sheep from the cattle tithe, just as the tithe does not apply to a trip animal. So the law of the first of the fleece does not apply to a trip animal. And whence do we know it? Therefore, it is written, Whatsoever passeth under the rod, thus excluding a trip animal, since it cannot
I only know that an ox may not be put to any work and that the sheep may not be shorn once do I know to apply the restriction of the one to the other the text therefore states thou shalt do no work nor shear scripture says thou shalt give him and not for his sack if so then goat's hair should also be subject to this law should it not it is necessary that it be shorn which is not the case with goat's hair but whom have you heard holding this view it is our Jose is it not and our Jose agrees that what is the general practice is included as our Joshua believe I said elsewhere the expression to stand to minister indicates something serviceable for ministering so here too it must be something serviceable for ministering what then is the significance of the analogy by reason of the common expression fleece it is in respect of the following teaching of a tana of the school of our Ishmael for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught sheep with hard wool are exempt from the law of the first of the fleece since it is written and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep one bury the teaches if a man shears the hair of goats or washes the sheep and plucks their wool he is exempt from the first of the fleece another bury the teaches if a man shears the hair of goats he is exempt from the first of the fleece if he washes the sheep and then plucks their wool he is liable there is however no difficulty for one bury the sets forth our Jose's view the other that of the rabbis for it has been taught scripture says the gleaning of thy harvest but not the gleaning of plucking our Jose says gleaning is only that which falls at the reaping is not our Jose's view identical with that of the first hand of the whole of the berry that sets forth our Jose's view render therefore for our Jose says gleaning is only that which falls at the reaping our Aha the son of Rabba said to our Ashi our Jose nevertheless agrees that what is the general practice is included for it has been taught our Jose says scripture states harvest from which I only know that reaping is subject to the law of gleanings whence would I know uprooting the text therefore states to reap and whence would I know plucking the text therefore states when our reapest Rabba said to our Ashi we have also learned the same if rose of onions are planted among vegetables our Jose says the corner must be left in each row but the sages say in one for all what is meant by many now Beth Shammai's view is Clear for we see that two sheep are also referred to as son but what is the reason for Beth Hillel's view Arkahana answered the verse says five sheep ready dressed that is ready now for the fulfillment of two precepts is the first of the fleece and the priestly dues but perhaps it refers to the law of the firstling and the priestly dues this cannot be for is not one sheep subject to the law of the firstling then according to your suggestion it can also be asked is not one sheep subject to the priestly dues rather said Arashi the verse says five sheep ready dressed that is they bid their owner to be ready addressing him up perform the commandment it was taught our Ishmael son of our Jose says in the name of his father four sheep are subject to the law of the first of the fleece as it is written four sheep for a sheep it was taught Rabbi said had their views been based on words from the Torah and Gurabai's view on words from the prophets we should nevertheless have had to adopt the Rabbi's view, how much more now that their views are based on words from the prophets and the Rabbi's view on words of the Torah, but has not a master said a compromise of a third independent opinion is no true compromise. Talmud, Mosul and B. R. Yohanan said he had it as a tradition deriving from Hadi Isaac and Malachi or Dosa B. Harkina says whatever their fleeces weigh, what is meant by whatever Rab said at least a mina and a half provided each supplies no less than a fifth of this quantity. Samuel said at least sixty sellers and he gives thereof one seller to the priest. Rabbi B. said in the name of R. Yohanan at least six sellers and he gives five to the priest and retains one for himself. Ola said in the name of R. Eliezer, our mission expressly says whatever we have learned and how much should one give him the weight of five sellers in Judah, which is equal to ten sellers in Galilee. Now this is in order according to the views of Rab and R. Yohanan. But it surely presents a difficulty, does it not to Samuel and our Eliezer? Then, as you would have it, it also presents a difficulty to Rab, for did not Rab and Samuel both rule that the proper measure for the first of the fleece is one sixtieth part? But the fact is, as has already been taught in connection with this mission, that Rab and Samuel both said it speaks of the case of an Israelite who has many fleeces and who wishes to distribute them among a number of priests, and we tell him that he must not give less than the weight of five cellars to each to turn to the main text. Rab and Samuel both ruled the proper measure for the first of the fleece is one sixtieth part for Teramah, one sixtieth part, and for the corner, one sixtieth part for Teramah, one sixtieth part. But we have learned the proper measure for Teramah if a man is liberal is one fortieth part according to the law of the Torah, the measure is one sixtieth part, but by rabbinic enactment it is one fortieth part, but has not. Samuel stated that one grain of wheat frees the stack. The law of the Torah is as Samuel stated it, but the rabbinic enactment is that in respect of that which is subject to Teramah by the Torah, the measure is one fortieth part, and in respect of that which is subject to Teramah only by the rabbis, the measure is one sixtieth part for the corner, one sixtieth part. But we have learned these are the things which have no fixed measure: the corner of the field, the first fruits, and the appearance. Offering by law of the Torah, there is no fixed measure, but by rabbinic enactment, it is fixed as one sixtieth part. And what does he teach us? We have learned that the corner should not be less than one sixtieth part, even though they have said that no fixed measure is prescribed for the corner that gives the rule for the land of Israel. Your rabbi and Samuel give the rule for outside the land of Israel. When I behind, I went up to Palestine. Our Yohanan found him teaching his son our mission and. Using the term Rehelim here, Yohanan said to him, Use the term Rehelim, the other retorted, but it is written 200 Rehelim. He replied, The Torah uses its own language, and the sages their own here, Yohanan, and inquired who is the head of the academy in Babylon, Abarika. He replied, And you simply call him Abarika, said, Are Yohanan, I remember when I was sitting before Rabbi 17 rows behind Rab, seeing sparks of fire leaping from the mouth of Rabbi into the mouth of Rab, and from the mouth of Rab into the mouth of Rabbi, and I could not understand what they were saying, and you simply call him Abarika. Then the other asked, What is the minimum quantity subject to the law of the first of the fleece? 60 sellers, he replied, But said, The other, We have learned whatever their fleeces weigh, then what difference is there between me and you? He retorted, When Ardimi came from Palestine, he reported with regard to the first of the fleece, Rab said, 60 Yohanan said in the name of our Jan A6 thereupon Abbe said to our Dimi one opinion is quite in order but the other presents to us a difficulty there is indeed no contradiction between the one opinion of our Yohanan and the other for one is his own opinions the other that of his master but surely there is a contradiction between this opinion of Rab and the other for Rab has said at least a mina and a half there is also no contradiction between this opinion of Rab and the other for by a mina he meant a mina of 40. Sellers so that a mina and a half is equal to Talmud, Mosul and a 60 sellers but do we know of any tanna that refers to a mina of 40 sellers we do indeed for it has been taught a new water skin even though it can hold pomegranates is clean if it had been sown and then was torn it thereby becomes clean provided the rent was of such a size as to let through pomegranates or Eliezer B. Jacob says of such a size as to let through a work which weighs one fourth part of a mina of 40 cellars and now much should one give him a bleach will attend it taught it does not mean that one must first bleach it and give it him but that after the priest has bleached it there should be the weight of five cellars sufficient to make from it a small garment whence is this derived our Joshua believe I said the expression to stand to minister indicates that it must be something serviceable for ministering and that is the girdle perhaps it is the robe that is meant if you grasp a lot you cannot hold it if you grasp a little you can hold it perhaps it is a woolen cap that is meant for it has been taught upon the high priest's head there lay a woolen cap upon which was placed the plate of gold in order to fulfill literally what is said and thou shalt put it on a lace of blue wool the verse says him and his sons that is an article worn alike by Aaron and his sons but the girdle is not worn alike by high priest and priest is it this however presents no difficulty to him who holds that the girdle worn by the high priest on the day of atonement was not similar to that worn by an ordinary priest the whole year round. But what can be said according to him who holds that the girdle worn by the high priest on the day of atonement was similar to that worn by an ordinary priest the whole year round. The name girdle, however, is to be found with Egypt. The owner did not manage to give, etc. It was stated if a man sheared the first sheep and immediately sold it, our Hista says he is liable to give the first of the fleece. But our Nathan Bihashai says he is
To suggest in this case to provided the owner of the sheep had begun to shear I reply that the cases are not alike for it is right in that case since it is written and when you reap the harvest of your land that is the moment one begins to reap one becomes bound to leave the corner for the whole field but in this case the moment one begins to shear one does not become liable for the whole flock rather said Rabbah it is the following tanna for we have learned if a man said sell me the entrails of this cow and among them were the priestly dues he must give them to the priest and the seller need not allow any reduction in the purchase price on that account but if he bought them from him by weight he must give them to a priest and the seller must allow reduction in the price on that account Talmud, Mastral and Behance it is clear that no man sells the priestly dues here to the priest to no man sells therefore if the seller kept back some fleece for himself the seller is Solely liable to give the first of the fleece for the buyer can say to him the priest's due still remains with you if he did not keep back anything for himself the buyer is liable for the seller can say to him I never sold you the priest's due C-H-A-P-T-E-R-X-I-I mission the law of letting the dam go from the nest is enforced both within the holy land and outside it both during the existence of the temple and after it in respect of unconsecrated birds but not consecrated birds the law of covering up the blood is of wider application than the law of letting the dam go for the law of covering up the blood applies to wild animals as well as birds whether they are at once disposal or not whereas the law of letting the dam go from the nest applies only to birds and only to those which are not at once disposal which are they that are not at once disposal such as geese and fowls that made their nest in the open field but if they made their nest within a house or in the case of Herodian ducks one is not bound to let the dam go an unclean bird one is not bound to let go if an unclean bird was sitting on the eggs of a clean bird or a clean bird on the eggs of an unclean bird one is not bound to let it go as to a cock partridge our Eliezer says one is bound to let it go but the sages say one is not bound Gemara Aravin and Armeishan taught the following one said that the expression both within the holy land and outside it was in every case unnecessary except in the mission of the first of the fleece where it had to be stated in order to exclude the view of Arlai who holds that the law of the first of the fleece obtains only in the land of Israel the other said the expression both during the existence of the temple and after it was in every case unnecessary except in the mission of it and its young where it had to be stated for I might have argued that since that law is stated in connection with laws concerning sacrifices it is in force only as Long as sacrifices continue but it is not enforced once sacrifices are no more the tanna therefore found it necessary to teach us that it is binding for all time furthermore both said that the expression in respect of unconsecrated and consecrated animals was in every case necessary except in the mission of the sciatic nerve for it is obvious that the prohibition of the nerve has not vanished merely because the animal has been consecrated but did we not establish that mission as dealing with the young of consecrated animals yes but why did we establish the mission in that way was it not because we were faced with the difficulty why did the tanna state it in reality however this at the very outset should offer no difficulty for since this expression was stated in one mission where it was necessary it was also stated in the other where it was not necessary at all in respect of unconsecrated birds but not consecrated birds why not because the verse thou shalt in any wise let the dam go clearly refers only to such as you are bound to let go excluding such as you are not bound to let go but rather to bring to the temple treasurer Rubin has said it follows therefore that if a clean bird killed a man one is not bound to let it go because the verse thou shalt in any wise let the dam go clearly refers only to such as you are bound to let go excluding such as you are not bound to let go but rather to bring to the Beth Din but what are the circumstances here if it had already been condemned Talmud, Mastul and then surely it would have been put to death rather we must say that it had not yet been condemned in which case one is bound to bring it to the Beth Din so as to carry into effect the verse so shalt thou put away the evil from the midst of thee what are the circumstances with regard to consecrated birds if you say that a man had a nest in his home and consecrated it but in that case the law does not apply for the verse if a bird's nest chanced to be before thee excludes what is at once disposal you will say then that a man saw a nest somewhere and consecrated it but in that case would it become consecrated does not the divine law say and when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy from which we conclude that just as his house is in his possession so must everything that he may wish to sanctify be in his possession you will then say that a man lifted up the young ones consecrated them and put them back again but in such a case even though they were not consecrated the law would not apply for we have learned if a man took the young and brought them back again into the nest and afterwards the dam returned to them he is not bound to let it go you will therefore say that he lifted up the dam consecrated it and put it back again but in that case at the very outset even before he consecrated it he was bound to let it go for it was taught our Yohanan B. Joseph says if a man consecrated a wild animal and then slaughtered it he is Exempt from covering up the blood if he slaughtered it and afterwards consecrated it he is bound to cover up the blood since he was already bound to cover up the blood before it was consecrated Rab suggested the case where a man consecrated the young of his dovecot and they later broke loose Samuel suggested the case where a man consecrated his hand to the temple treasury now one can understand why Samuel does not suggest the case of Rab it is because he wishes to state the law even in respect of that which is consecrated to the temple treasury only but why does not Rab suggest the case of Samuel Rab would answer thus it is only in the case where a man consecrated the young of his dovecot that one is not bound to let the dam go for they are consecrated for the altar and inasmuch as they are themselves consecrated for an offering even though they break loose their sanctity has not gone but where a man consecrated his hand to the temple treasury inasmuch as it was not Consecrated for the altar but only for its value as soon as it breaks loose its sanctity has gone and the law of letting the dam go applies but Samuel says wherever it happens to be it is in the Lord's treasury for it is written the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and so too did our Yohanan say it is a case where a man consecrated his hand to the temple treasury and afterwards it broke loose thereupon our Simeon Belakish said to him surely as soon as it breaks loose its sanctity has gone he replied wherever it happens to be it is in the Lord's treasury for it is written the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof I can point out a contradiction between the words of our Yohanan here and the words of our Yohanan elsewhere and I can point out a contradiction between the words of Rush Lakish here and the words of Rush Lakish elsewhere for it has been stated if a man said let this man be for the temple treasury and it was stolen or lost our Yohanan says he is Responsible for it until it reaches the hands of the temple treasurer, but Rush Lakish says wherever it is, it is in the Lord's treasury, for it is written, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Hence, there is a contradiction between our Yohanan's statements and between Rush Lakish's statements. I can see that there is not necessarily a contradiction between Rush Lakish's statements for this. The former view he expressed before he had learned the true view from his master, our Yohanan, whilst that the latter view he expressed after he had learned it from his master, our Yohanan. But surely there is a contradiction between the statements of our Yohanan. There is no contradiction even between the statements of our Yohanan. For in one case, the man said, I take upon myself an offering, and in the other case, he said, Let this be an offering. It follows then that according to Rush Lakish, a man is not responsible for his offering, even though he said, I take upon myself, but we have learned what is. A votive offering and what a free will offering it is a votive offering when a man says I take upon myself a burnt offering it is a free will offering when a man says let this be a burnt offering and wherein do votive offerings differ from free will offerings with a votive offering if it dies or is stolen or lost he is responsible for it and must replace it but with a free will offering if it dies or is stolen or lost he is not responsible for it Rush Lakish can answer thus that is so only with regard to what is consecrated for the altar since it still needs to be offered as a sacrifice but with regard to what is consecrated to the temple treasury since it has not to be offered as a sacrifice he is not responsible for it even though he said I take upon myself but we have learned if a man said let this ox be a burnt offering or let this house be an offering and the ox died or the house fell down he is not bound to make restitution but if he said I take upon myself to offer this ox for a burnt offering or I take upon myself to present this house as an offering and the ox died or the house fell down he must make restitution that is so only where the ox died or the house fell down then indeed he must make restitution since they are no more in existence but where they are in existence wherever they happen to be they are still within the Lord's treasury
unto the Lord that is to say it is still consecrated in thy hand until it reaches the hand of the temple treasurer rather if the statement was reported it must have been reported as follows our Hamana said all agree that regarding vows of valuation even though a man did not say I take upon myself he is bound to make restitution for it is written and he shall give thy valuation etc that is to say it is still consecrated in thy hand until it reaches the hand of the temple treasurer the law of Covering up the blood is of wider application, etc. Our rabbis taught it is written if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, what does scripture teach thereby? But because it is also written, thou shalt in any wise let the dam go, but the young thou mayest take unto thyself. I might suppose that one should go searching over mountains and hills to find a nest. The text therefore states chance to be that is if it happens to be before you a nest that is any nest. Whatsoever a bird's that is of a clean but not of an unclean bird before thee that is in a private domain in the way that is in a public place, whence do I know even if found on trees, the text states in any tree, whence do I know even if found in cisterns, ditches, or caverns, the text states or on the ground, but since in the end we include everything, wherefore does scripture say before thee in the way to teach you just as on the way the nest cannot be said to be ready at your hand, so. Everywhere the nest must not be ready at your hand, hence they said while doves of the dovecote and doves of the loft and birds which made their nests in the cornices in the walls in large houses and geese and fowls that made their nests in the open field one is bound to let the dam go but if they made their nests within a house or in the case of Herodian doves one is not bound to let the dam go the master said just as on the way the nest cannot be said to be ready at your hand so everywhere. The nest must not be ready at your hand is this teaching necessary it is surely inferred from the expression chance to be thus chance to be but not what is at once disposal moreover what is the significance of the expression before thee rather we must say the expression before thee serves to include those birds that were once before you and which later broke loose and the expression in the way points to the teaching of Rab Judah in the name of Rab for Rab Judah said in the name of Rab Ife. Man found a nest in the sea, he is bound to let the dam go, since it is written, Thus saith the Lord who make the way in the sea, then in like manner if a man found a nest in the sky, inasmuch as it is written, the way of an eagle in the sky, he should also should he not be bound to let the dam go if the sky is referred to as the way of an eagle, but never simply as way the Papunians asked of our man, and what if one found a nest upon a man's head, he replied, LT is written, and earth upon his head. Whereas Moses indicated in the Torah, they asked in the verse for that he also is flesh, whereas Haman indicated in the Torah, in the verse is it heaven from the tree, whereas Esther indicated in the Torah, in the verse, and I will surely hide Esther my face, whereas Mordecai indicated in the Torah, in the verse flowing more, which the Targum renders as Myrodachia, which are they that are not at once disposal, etc., are high and are Simeon, be rabbi, differ, one reads in the Mishnah Hadrasiath. And the other reads Hardesioth, he who reads Hardesioth derives the word from the name of Herod, and he who reads Hadrasioth derives it from their place of origin. Archahana said, I once saw them, and there were sixteen rows of the metro extending over one mill, and they were calling out Kirikiri. One, however, did not call out Kirikiri, and its neighbor said to it, You blind fool, call out Kirikiri. The other replied, You blind fool, call out rather Kirikiri. Straightway she was taken and slaughtered. Ar. As she said, Ar Hananan told me that all this was empty words, empty words. Surely not say, rather, all this conversation was affected by magic spells. An unclean bird, one is not bound to let go. Whence is this derived? Our Isaac said from the verse, If a nest of a bird's zipper chance to be before thee, now the term of applies both to clean and unclean birds. But as for the term zipper, we find clean birds referred to as zipper, but not unclean birds come, and here it is written the likeness of any wind. Zipper surely zipper includes both clean and unclean birds and winged includes locusts. No zipper refers only to clean birds and winged includes both unclean birds and locusts. Come and here it is written beasts and all cattle creeping things and winged zipper surely zipper includes both clean and unclean birds and winged includes locusts. No zipper refers only to clean birds and winged includes both unclean birds and locusts. Come and here it is written every zipper of every sort surely the interpretation is as suggested in the above objection. No, it is as suggested in the above reply. Come and here it is written and thou son of man thus saith the Lord God speak unto the zipper of every sort surely the interpretation is as suggested in the above objection. No, it is as suggested in the above reply. Come and here Talmud, Mostulan it is written and the zipper of the heaven dwelt in the branches thereof they are designated the zipper of the heaven but not zipper alone. Come and here it is written every zipper that is clean you may eat from which we may deduce that there is a zipper that is unclean no we may deduce that there is a zipper that is forbidden but which is that if it is one that is true but this is expressly stated to be forbidden and if it is a slaughtered bird of the leper but this is inferred from the next verse and these are the of which ye shall not eat which includes the slaughtered bird of the leper it is in truth the slaughtered bird of the leper and it is repeated so as to teach that one infringes on that account a positive and also a negative precept but why not say that it is a true bird that is meant and it teaches that one infringes on that account a positive and also a negative precept the meaning of a verse is to be deduced from its context and the context deals with those that are slaughtered come and here it is written to living zipper now what is meant by living it means does it not those that are fit for your mouth and from which follows that there are also those zippering that are not fit for your mouth no by living is meant those whose principal limbs are living come and here from the next word in the above verse clean is not the inference that there are unclean zippering no the inference is that there are trifle clean birds but are not trifle birds excluded by the term living of course this presents no difficulty to him who says that a trifle can continue to live but according to him who says that a trifle cannot continue to live what can be said moreover both according to him who says that a trifle can continue to live and him who says that it cannot continue to live this is inferred from the teaching of a tana of the school of our Ishmael for a tana of the school of our Ishmael taught there have been prescribed qualifying and atoning sacrifices within the temple and there have been prescribed qualifying and atoning sacrifices outside the temple just as with regard to the Qualifying and atoning sacrifices prescribed within the temple the qualifying sacrifices are equal to the atoning sacrifices so with regard to the qualifying and atoning sacrifices prescribed outside the temple the qualifying sacrifices are equal to the atoning sacrifices rather said Arnam and B. Isaac the expression clean serves to exclude the birds of a beguiled city but for which one if for the one that must be set free but surely the Torah would not enjoin to set it free if it would thereby lead to transgression rather it could serve for the one that must be slaughtered Rabbah said the expression clean serves to exclude the following case that one may not use this bird before it is set free so as to make up the pair of birds for the purification rites of another leper but for which one if for the one that was to be slaughtered but surely it must be set free rather it could serve for the one that was to be set free our Papa said the expression clean serves to exclude Birds that were obtained in exchange for an idol for it is written and become a devoted thing like unto it whatever you bring into being from a devoted thing is to be treated like it but for which one if for the one that must be set free but surely the Torah would not enjoin to set it free if it would thereby lead to transgression rather it could serve for the one that must be slaughtered Rubin has said we are dealing here with a bird that had killed a man but what are the circumstances if it had already been condemned and it must be put to death we must therefore say that it had not yet been condemned but for which one of the leper's birds might this be used if for the one that must be set free but surely it must be brought to the beth in so as to carry into effect the verse so shalt thou put away the evil from the midst of thee rather it could serve for the one that must be slaughtered if an unclean bird was sitting on the eggs of a clean bird one is not bound to let it go this is indeed clear of an unclean bird sitting on the eggs of a clean bird for the law of letting the dam go applies only to a zipper and this is not the case here but why is one not bound to let go the clean bird that was sitting on the eggs of an unclean bird it is a zipper is it not as Arkahana said in another connection it is written but the young thou mayest take for thyself for thyself but not for thy dogs here too we say the same thou mayest take for thyself but not for thy dogs in what connection was the statement of Arkahana said in connection with the following barrier which was taught if the dam is trifle one is still bound to let it go if the young ones are trifle one is not bound to let the dam go whence is this derived Arkahana said it is written but the young thou mayest take for thyself for thyself but not for th
One is not bound to let it go, it follows, does it not that if a clean bird was sitting upon the eggs of another clean bird, one is bound to let it go? Perhaps this is so only with a hand partridge as to a cock partridge. Aralizer says one is bound to let it go, but the sages say one is not bound. Aravav said, What is the reason of Aralizer? He draws an analogy between the expressions brood, for it is written here as the partridge brood death over young which he has not brought forth, and it is written there she shall hash and brood under her shadow. Aralizer said they differ only with regard to a cock partridge, but as for a hand partridge, all agree that one is bound to let it go is not this obvious for the mission expressly says a cock partridge. One might have thought that even the hand partridge, the rabbis exempt from letting go, but the reason why the cock partridge was stated in the mission was to set forth the extent of Aralizer's view. We are therefore taught that it is not. So R. Eliezer also said they differ only with regard to a cock partridge, but as for the male of any other bird, all agree that one is exempt from letting it go is not this obvious for the mission expressly says as to a cock partridge, one might have thought that even the male of any other bird, R. Eliezer declares one bound to let go, but the reason why the cock partridge was stated was to set forth the extent of the rabbi's view. We are therefore taught that it is not so. There has also been taught a very to this effect the male of any other bird, one is not bound to let go as to a cock partridge, R. Eliezer declares one bound to let it go, but the sages say one is not bound. Mishnah, if the dam was hovering over the nest and her wings touched the nest, one is bound to let her go. If her wings do not touch the nest, one is not bound to let her go. If there was but one young bird or one egg in the nest, one is still bound to let the dam go, for it is written a nest that is any nest. Whatsoever if there were their young birds able to fly or adult eggs one is not bound to let the dam go for it is written and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs as the young are living beings so the eggs must be such as would produce living beings hence adult eggs are excluded and as the eggs need the care of the dam so the young must be such as need the care of the dam hence those that are able to fly are excluded tomorrow our rabbis taught it is written sitting but not hovering I might then suppose that even when her wings touch the nest the law does not apply the text therefore stated sitting how is this implied because it is not written brooding Rab Judah said in the name of Rab if she was perched upon two branches of a tree we must consider if when the branches slip away from each other she would fall upon them one is bound to let her go but if not one is not bound to let her go an objection was raised it was taught if she was sitting among them one is not bound to let her go if upon them one is bound to let her go if she was hovering over the nest even though her wings touch the nest one is not bound to let her go now presumably the expression upon them bears the same meaning as among them and just as among them means that she is actually touching them so upon them also means that she is actually touching them it follows however that if she was upon the branches of a tree one is not bound to let her go no the expression upon them bears the same meaning as among them and just as among them clearly means that she is not touching them from above so upon them also means that she is not touching them from above and that must be the case where she was upon the branches of a tree it is indeed more logical to argue thus for if you were to hold that when perched upon the branches of a tree one is not bound to let her go then the tana in place of the case if she was hovering over the nest even though her wings touch the nest one is not bound to let her go should rather have taught the case where she was perched upon the branches of a tree and it would go without saying that where she was hovering over the nest one is not bound to let her go this argument is not conclusive for he wished to state the case where she was hovering over the nest to teach that even though her wings actually touch the nest one is not bound to let her go but have we not learned if the dam was hovering over the nest and her wings touch the nest one is bound to let her go our jeremiah answered the very that deals with the case where her wings touch the side of the nest another version reads as follows shall we say that the following very is a support for his view for it was taught if she was sitting among them one is not bound to let her go if upon them one is bound to let her go if she was hovering over the nest even though her wings touch the nest one is not bound to let her go now presumably the expression upon them bears the same meaning as among them and just as among them clearly means that she is not touching them from above so upon them also means that she is not touching them from above and that must be the case where she was upon the branches of a tree no the expression upon them bears the same meaning as among them and just as among them means that she is actually touching them so upon them also means that she is actually touching them but if she was perched upon the branches of a tree one would not be bound to let her go but if so the tana in place of the last case if she was hovering over the nest even though her wings touch the nest one is not bound to let her go Talmud, Mosul and should rather have taught the case where she was perched upon the branches of a tree and it would go without saying that where she was hovering over the nest one is not bound to let her go he wished to state the case where she was hovering over the nest to teach that even though her wings actually Touch the nest one is not bound to let her go, but have we not learned if the dam was hovering over the nest and her wings touch the nest one is bound to let her go? Our Jeremiah answered the very that deals with the case where her wings touch the side of the nest. If there was but one young bird or one egg, etc. A certain rabbi said to Rabbi, perhaps it should be the reverse. Thus, if there was but one young bird or one egg in the nest, one is not bound to let the dam go for according to the verse there. Must be young or eggs, which is not the case here. And if there were their young birds able to fly or adult eggs, one is bound to let the dam go for it is written a nest that is any nest whatsoever. He replied, if that were so, the verse should have stated, and the dam sitting upon them, why is it written and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs to compare the young with the eggs and the eggs with the young mission? If a man let the dam go and she returned even four or five times, he is. Still bound to let her go again for it is written thou shalt in any wise let the dam go if a man said I will take the dam and let the young go he is still bound to let her go for it is written thou shalt in any wise let the dam go if a man took the young and brought them back again to the nest and afterwards the dam returned to them he is not bound to let her go Gemara a certain rabbi said to Rabba perhaps Shalia means once and Teshala twice he replied Shalia implies even a hundred times and as for Teshala it is required for the following teaching I only know this law in the case where the dam is required for matters of choice once do I know that this law applies even when it is required for the fulfillment of a precept the text therefore states Teshala thou shalt let her go under all circumstances our Abba the son of our Joseph B. Rabba said to our Kahana then the only reason for this is that the divine law stated Teshala but otherwise I should have said that where one required the dam for the fulfillment of a precept the law did not apply but there is here is there not both a positive and a negative precept and it is established law that a positive precept cannot override a positive and negative precept it is necessary for the case where one had transgressed and had taken the dam now he has already transgressed the negative precept and there remains only the positive precept and one might suppose that now a positive precept can override this remaining positive precept scripture therefore teaches us that it is not so this is in order however according to him who teaches that it depends upon whether he has fulfilled or not fulfilled the positive precept but according to him who teaches that it depends upon whether he has nullified or not nullified the positive precept and so long as this man has not slaughtered the dam he has not transgressed the negative precept moreover according to our Judah who maintains that the precept of letting the dam go was intended only in the first instance there is now after the transgression of the law not even a positive precept rather said Marsan of Arashi we suppose the case where a man took up the dam in order to let it go in which case there is no infringement of the negative precept there is however a positive precept and it might be suggested that the positive precept of the leper's offering should override this positive precept but in what way is this positive precept more potent than that because one might argue since a master has said great is the peace between man and wife for the Torah has permitted the name of the Holy One blessed be he which is to be written in all sanctity to be washed away in the waters of bitterness and since a leper so long as he has not been cleansed is forbidden marital intercourse for it is written and he shall dwell outside his tent seven days his tent signifies his wife hence he is forbidden marital intercourse one might therefore argue since he is forbidden marital intercourse the positive precept in his case should override the positive precept of letting the dam go we are therefore taught that it is not so mission if a man took the dam with the young Arjuna says he has incurred forty stripes and he need not now let her go but the sages say he must let her go and he does not incur stripes this is the general rule for the transgression of any negative precept which admits of a remedy by the subsequent fulfillment of a positive command one does not incur stripes Gemara our Abu Bimel ra
And our high taught it is written thou shalt not go back to fetch it but if a man went back and gathered the forgotten sheep it is written thou shalt not wholly reap but if a man did reap the whole field he is subject to the penalty of forty stripes so our Judah you may infer from this that the reason for our Judah's view is that he is of the opinion that for the transgression of a negative precept which can be remedied by a subsequent act of the transgressor one incurs stripes. Perhaps the reason here is that he maintains that the precept of leaving the gleanings etc for the poor was intended only in the first instance Robin has said to our Ashi come and here it is written and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire scripture here came and provided a positive precept as a remedy for the disregarded prohibition to indicate that the prohibition is not punishable by stripes so our Judah. You may then infer from this that the reason for our Judah's view in our mission is that he maintains that the precept of letting the dam go was intended only in the first instance. This indeed proves it. Our EDB Abin said to our Ashi, our mission also proves it. For it states if a man took the dam with the young, our Judah says he has incurred forty stripes and he need not now let her go. Now, if you were to say that the reason for our Judah's view is that he is of the opinion that for the transgression of a negative precept which can be remedied by a subsequent act of the transgressor one incurs guilt, then it should have stated he has incurred forty stripes and must also let her go. Perhaps the mission is to be interpreted thus he has not cleared himself by merely letting her go until he has suffered stripes. How far must he let it go? Rab Judah said until it is out of his reach. How should he let it go? Arhuna said with its feet. Rab Judah said with its wings. Arhuna said. With its feet for it is written that let go freely the feet of the ox and the ass Rab Judah said with its wings for its wings are also regarded as feet a man once clipped the wings of the dam before letting it go let it go and then caught it again Rab Judah had him flogged and ordered him go keep it until it grows its wing feathers again and then let it go but whose view did he adopt for according to our Judah he suffered stripes but need not let it go and according to the sages he must let it go but does not suffer stripes in truth he adopted the view of the sages but the flogging was chastisement of the rabbis a man once came to Rabbah and asked what is the law with regard to the Tamas and Rabbah to himself does not this man know that one is bound to let go a clean bird he Rabbah then said to him perhaps you inquire because there was in the nest but one young bird or one egg he replied that is so then said Rabbah to him this surely should not give rise to any doubt it is Expressly stated in our mission, if there was but one young bird or one egg in the nest, one is still bound to let the dam go, the other then sent it away, whereupon Rabbah set snares for it and caught it. But is there not ground here for suspicion? He acted in an indirect manner as did not give rise to suspicion. Our rabbis taught while doves of the dovecote and doves of the loft are subject to the law of letting the dam go and are forbidden as coming within the category of theft in the interest of peace. Now, if the dictum of our Jose B. Hanna that a man's courtyard acquires property for him even without his knowledge is correct, then apply to this case the verse if a bird's nest chance to be before thee, which excludes that which is always at one's disposal. Rabbah said, as soon as the greater part of the egg has emerged from the body of the bird, the law of letting the dam go applies, whereas the owner of the dovecote does not acquire it until it falls into his courtyard. Therefore the ruling are subject to the law of letting the dam go means before it falls into his courtyard if so why are they forbidden as theft that refers to the mother bird alternatively you may say it refers indeed to the eggs for when the greater part of the egg has emerged his mind is set upon it but now that Rab Judah has said in Rab's name that it is forbidden to take the egg so long as the dam is sitting on them for it is written thou shalt in any wise let the dam go and then only thou mayest take the young to thee you may even say that if the egg fell into his courtyard nevertheless the law of letting the dam go applies for whenever he himself may acquire it his courtyard acquires it for him but whenever he himself may not acquire it his courtyard cannot acquire it for him either if so why are they forbidden as theft in the interest of peace if he let the dam go then to take the eggs is actual theft and if he did not let it go then he is bound to let it go we are referring to a minor but is a minor subject to provisions enacted in the interest of peace it means this the father of the minor must return the eggs in the interest of peace Levi B. Simon assigned to Rab Judah the young of his dovecot when the latter came before Samuel he advised him go knock on the nest so that the brooding birds shall rise up and then take possession but why was this necessary if in order to take possession of them but surely he could have acquired them by means of a cloth and if for the purpose of the festival Talmud Mosulan it is sufficient to stand by and say this one and that one I shall take these eggs were newly laid and Levi B. Simon himself had not yet acquired them Samuel therefore said this to him Rab Judah go knock on the nest so that the brooding birds shall rise up and Levi B. Simon shall acquire them and afterwards let him assign them to you by means of a cloth mission a man may not take the dam with the young even for the Sake of cleansing the leper if in respect of so light a precept which deals with that which is but worth it is so the Torah said that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest prolong thy days how much more must be the reward for the observance of the more difficult precepts of the Torah Gemara it was taught our Jacob says there is no precept in the Torah where reward is stated by its side from which you cannot infer the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead thus in connection with honoring parents it is written that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee again in connection with the law of letting the dam go from the nest it is written that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest prolong thy days now in the case where a man's father said to him go up to the top of the building and bring me down some young birds and he went up to the top of the building let the dam go and took the young ones and on his return he fell and was killed where is this man's length of days and where is this man's happiness but that thy days may be prolonged refers to the world that is holy long and that it may go well with thee refers to the world that is holy good but perhaps such a thing could not happen our Jacob actually saw this occurrence then perhaps that person had conceived in his mind a sinful thought the holy one blessed be he does not reckon the sinful thought for the deed perhaps then he had conceived in his mind idolatry and it is written that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart which according to our Ahabi Jacob refers to thoughts of idolatry this was what he or Jacob meant to convey if there is a reward for precepts in this world then surely that reward should have stood him in good stead and guarded him from such thoughts that he come not to any hurt we must therefore say that there is no reward for precepts in this world but did not our Eliezer say that those engaged in the performance of a precept Never come to harm when returning from the performance of a precept it is different but did not our Eliezer say that those engaged in a precept never come to harm either when going to perform it or when returning from the performance thereof it must have been a broken ladder that was used so that injury was likely and where injury is likely it is different as TT is written and Samuel said how can I go if Saul hear it he will kill me or Joseph said had I here interpreted this verse as our Jacob his daughter's son did he would not have sinned what actually did he see some say he saw such an occurrence others say he saw the tongue of our husband the interpreter lying on a dung heap and he exclaimed shall the mouth that uttered pearls lick the dust but he knew not that the verse that it may go well with thee refers to the world that is holy good and that the verse that thy days may be prolonged refers to the world that is holy long.